The Outline of History By H. G. Wells Book 1 The Making of Our World The Earth in Space and Time The Earth on which we live is a spinning globe. Vast though it seems to us, it is a mere speck of matter in the greater vastness of space. Space is, for the most part, emptiness. At great intervals there are in this emptiness flaring centers of heat and light, the fixed stars. They are all moving about in space, notwithstanding that they are called fixed stars, but for a long time men did not realize their motion. They are so vast and at such tremendous distances that their motion is not perceived. Only in the course of many thousands of years is it appreciable. These fixed stars are so far off that, for all their immensity, they seem to be, even when we look at them through the most powerful telescopes, mere points of light, brighter or less bright. A few, however, when we turn a telescope upon them, are seen to be whirls and clouds of shining vapor which we call nebulae. They are so far off that a movement of millions of miles would be imperceptible. One star, however, is so near to us that it is like a great ball of flame. This one is the sun. The sun is itself in its nature like a fixed star, but it differs from the other fixed stars in appearance because it is beyond comparison nearer than they are, and because it is nearer men have been able to learn something of its nature. Its mean distance from the earth is 93 million miles. It is a mass of flaming matter, having a diameter of 866,000 miles. Its bulk is a million and a quarter times the bulk of our earth. These are difficult figures for the imagination. If a bullet fired from a Maxim gun at the sun kept its muzzle velocity unimpaired, it would take seven years to reach the sun. And yet we say the sun is near, measured by the scale of the stars. If the earth were a small ball, one inch in diameter, the sun would be a globe of nine feet diameter, it would fill a small bedroom. It is spinning round on its axis, but since it is an incandescent fluid, its polar regions do not travel with the same velocity as its equator, the surface of which rotates in about 25 days. The surface visible to us consists of clouds of incandescent metallic vapor. At what lies below we can only guess. So hot is the sun's atmosphere that iron, nickel, copper, and tin are present in it in a gaseous state. About it at great distances circle not only our earth, but certain kindred bodies called the planets. These shine in the sky because they reflect the light of the sun, they are near enough for us to note their movements quite easily. Night by night their positions change with regard to the fixed stars. It is well to understand how empty space is. If, as we have said, the sun were a ball nine feet across, our earth would, in proportion, be the size of a one-inch ball, and at a distance of 323 yards from the sun. The moon would be a speck the size of a small pea, 30 inches from the earth. Nearer to the sun than the earth would be two other very similar specks, the planets Mercury and Venus, at a distance of 125 and 250 yards respectively. Beyond the earth would come the planets Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, at distances of 500, 1806, 3000, 6000, and 9500 yards respectively. There would also be a certain number of very much smaller specks, flying about amongst these planets, more particularly a number called the asteroids circling between Mars and Jupiter. And occasionally a little puff of more or less luminous vapor and dust would drift into the system from the almost limitless emptiness beyond. Such a puff is what we call a comet. All the rest of the space about us and around us and for unfathomable distances beyond is cold, lifeless, and void. The nearest fixed star to us, on this minute scale, be it remembered, the earth as a one-inch ball, and the moon a little pea, would be over 40,000 miles away. The science that tells of these things and how men have come to know about them is astronomy, and to books of astronomy the reader must go to learn more about the sun and stars. The science and description of the world on which we live are called respectively geology and geography. The diameter of our world is a little under 8,000 miles. Its surface is rough. The more projecting parts of the roughness are mountains, and in the hollows of its surface there is a film of water, the oceans, and seas. 
This film of water is about 5 miles thick at its deepest part, that is to say, the deepest oceans have a depth of 5 miles. This is very little in comparison with the bulk of the world. About this sphere is a thin covering of air, the atmosphere. As we ascend in a balloon or go up a mountain from the level of the seashore the air is continually less dense, until at last it becomes so thin that it cannot support life. At a height of 20 miles there is scarcely any air at all, not one hundredth part of the density of air at the surface of the sea. The highest point to which a bird can fly is about four miles up, the condor, it is said, can struggle up to that. But most small birds and insects which are carried up by aeroplanes or balloons drop off insensible at a much lower level, and the greatest height to which any mountaineer has ever climbed is under five miles. Men have flown in aeroplanes to a height of over four miles, and balloons with men in them have reached very nearly seven miles, but at the cost of considerable physical suffering. Small experimental balloons, containing not men, but recording instruments, have gone as high as 22 miles. It is in the upper few hundred feet of the crust of the earth, in the sea, and in the lower levels of the air below four miles that life is found. We do not know of any life at all except in these films of air and water upon our planet. So far as we know, all the rest of space is as yet without life. Scientific men have discussed the possibility of life, or of some process of a similar kind, occurring upon such kindred bodies as the planets Venus and Mars. But they point merely to questionable possibilities. Astronomers and geologists and those who study physics have been able to tell us something of the origin and history of the Earth. They consider that, vast ages ago, the Sun was a spinning, flaring mass of matter, not yet concentrated into a compact center of heat and light, considerably larger than it is now, and spinning very much faster, and that as it whirled. A series of fragments detached themselves from it, which became the planets. Our Earth is one of these planets. The flaring mass that was the material of the Earth broke as it spun into two masses, a larger, the Earth itself, and a smaller, which is now the dead, still moon. Astronomers give us convincing reasons for supposing that Sun and Earth and Moon and all that system were then whirling about at a speed much greater than the speed at which they are moving today. And that at first our Earth was a flaming thing upon which no life could live. The way in which they have reached these conclusions is by a very beautiful and interesting series of observations and reasoning, too long and elaborate for us to deal with here. But they oblige us to believe that the Sun, incandescent though it is, is now much cooler than it was, and that it spins more slowly now than it did, and that it continues to cool and slow down. And they also show that the rate at which the Earth spins is diminishing and continues to diminish, that is to say, that our day is growing longer and longer, and that the heat at the center of the Earth wastes slowly. There was a time when the day was not a half and not a third of what it is today, when a blazing hot sun, much greater than it is now, must have moved visibly, had there been an eye to mark it, from its rise to its setting across the skies. There will be a time when the day will be as long as a year is now, and the cooling sun, shorn of its beams, will hang motionless in the heavens. It must have been in days of a much hotter sun, a far swifter day and night, high tides, great heat, tremendous storms and earthquakes, that life, of which we are a part, began upon the world. The moon also was nearer and brighter in those days and had a changing face. 2. The Record of the Rocks Section 1. The First Living Things Section 2. How Old Is the World? Section 1. We do not know how life began upon the earth. Biologists, that is to say, students of life, have made guesses about these beginnings, but we will not discuss them here. Let us only note that they all agree that life began where the tides of those swift days spread and receded over the steaming beaches of mud and sand. The atmosphere was much denser then, usually great cloud masses obscured the sun, frequent storms darkened the heavens. The land of those days, upheaved by violent volcanic forces, was a barren land, without vegetation, without soil. 
The almost incessant rainstorms swept down upon it, and rivers and torrents carried great loads of sediment out to sea, to become muds that hardened later into slates and shales, and sands that became sandstones. The geologists have studied the whole accumulation of these sediments as it remains today, from those of the earliest ages to the most recent. Of course the oldest deposits are the most distorted and changed and worn, and in them there is now no certain trace to be found of life at all. Probably the earliest forms of life were small and soft, leaving no evidence of their existence behind them. It was only when some of these living things developed skeletons and shells of lime and such like hard material that they left fossil vestiges after they died, and so put themselves on record for examination. The literature of geology is very largely an account of the fossils that are found in the rocks, and of the order in which layers after layers of rocks lie one on another. The very oldest rocks must have been formed before there was any sea at all, when the earth was too hot for a sea to exist, and when the water that is now sea was an atmosphere of steam mixed with the air. Its higher levels were dense with clouds, from which a hot rain fell towards the rocks below, to be converted again into steam long before it reached their incandescence. Below this steam atmosphere the molten world stuff solidified as the first rocks. These first rocks must have solidified as a cake over glowing liquid material beneath, much as cooling lava does. They must have appeared first as crusts and clinkers. They must have been constantly remelted and recrystallized before any thickness of them became permanently solid. The name of fundamental gneiss is given to a great underlying system of crystalline rocks which probably formed age by age as this hot youth of the world drew to its close. The scenery of the world in the days when the fundamental gneiss was formed must have been more like the interior of a furnace than anything else to be found upon earth at the present time. After long ages the steam in the atmosphere began also to condense and fall right down to earth, pouring at last over these warm primordial rocks in rivulets of hot water and gathering in depressions as pools and lakes and the first seas. Into those seas the streams that poured over the rocks brought with them dust and particles to form a sediment, and this sediment accumulated in layers, or as geologists call them, strata, and formed the first sedimentary rocks. Those earliest sedimentary rocks sank into depressions and were covered by others, they were bent, tilted up, and torn by great volcanic disturbances and by tidal strains that swept through the rocky crust of the earth. We find these first sedimentary rocks still coming to the surface of the land here and there. Either not covered by later strata or exposed after vast ages of concealment by the wearing off of the rock that covered them later, there are great surfaces of them in Canada especially. They are cleft and bent, partially remelted, recrystallized, hardened and compressed, but recognizable for what they are. And they contain no single certain trace of life at all. They are frequently called azoic, lifeless, rocks. But since in some of these earliest sedimentary rocks a substance called graphite, black lead, occurs, and also red and black oxide of iron, and since it is asserted that these substances need the activity of living things for their production. Which may or may not be the case, some geologists prefer to call these earliest sedimentary rocks archaeozoic, primordial life. They suppose that the first life was soft living matter that had no shells or skeletons or any such structure that could remain as a recognizable fossil after its death. And that its chemical influence caused the deposition of graphite and iron oxide. This is pure guessing, of course, and there is at least an equal probability that in the time of formation of the Azoic rocks, life had not yet begun. Long ago there were found in certain of these ancient first formed rocks in Canada, curious striped masses, and thin layers of white and green mineral substance which Sir William Dawson considered were fossil vestiges. The walls or coverings of some very simple sort of living thing which has now vanished from the earth. He called these markings Eazun Canadense, the Canadian dawn animal. There has been much discussion and controversy over this Eazun, but today it is agreed that Eazun is nothing more than a crystalline marking. Mixed minerals will often intercrystallize in blobs or branching shapes that are very suggestive of simple plant or animal forms. Anyone who has made a lead tree in his school days, or lit those queer indoor fireworks known as serpent's eggs, which unfold like a long snake, or who has seen the curious markings often found in quartz crystals. 
or noted the tree-like pattern on old stoneware beer mugs, will realize how closely non-living matter can sometimes mock the shapes of living things. Overlying or overlapping these Azoic or Archaeozoic rocks come others, manifestly also very ancient and worn, which do contain traces of life. These first remains are of the simplest description. They are the vestiges of simple plants, called algae, or marks like the tracks made by worms in the sea mud. There are also the skeletons of the microscopic creatures called radiolaria. This second series of rocks is called the Proterozoic, beginning of life, series, and marks a long age in the world's history. Lying over and above the Proterozoic rocks is a third series, which is found to contain a considerable number and variety of traces of living things. First comes the evidence of a diversity of shellfish, crabs, and such like crawling things, worms, seaweeds, and the like, then of a multitude of fishes and of the beginnings of land plants and land creatures. These rocks are called the Paleozoic, ancient life, rocks. They mark a vast era, during which life was slowly spreading, increasing, and developing in the seas of our world. Through long ages, through the earliest Paleozoic time, it was no more than a proliferation of such swimming and creeping things in the water. There were creatures called trilobites. They were crawling things like big sea woodlice that were probably related to the American king crab of today. There were also sea scorpions, the prefects of that early world. The individuals of certain species of these were nine feet long. These were the very highest sorts of life. There were abundant different sorts of an order of shellfish called brachiopods. There were plant animals, rooted and joined together like plants, and loose weeds that waved in the waters. It was not a display of life to excite our imaginations. There was nothing that ran or flew or even swam swiftly or skillfully. Except for the size of some of the creatures, it was not very different from, and rather less various than, the kind of life a student would gather from any summertime ditch nowadays for microscopic examination. Such was the life of the shallow seas through a hundred million years or more in the early Paleozoic period. The land during that time was apparently absolutely barren. We find no trace nor hint of land life. Everything that lived in those days lived underwater for most or all of its life. Life in the early Paleozoic. Note its general resemblance, except for size, to the microscopic summer ditch water life of today. Between the formation of these lower Paleozoic rocks in which the sea scorpion and trilobite ruled, and our own time, there have intervened almost immeasurable ages, represented by layers and masses of sedimentary rocks. There are first the upper Paleozoic rocks, and above these the geologists distinguish two great divisions. Next above the Paleozoic come the Mesozoic, middle life, rocks, a second vast system of fossil-bearing rocks, representing perhaps a hundred millions of swift years, and containing a wonderful array of fossil remains. Bones of giant reptiles and the like, which we will presently describe. And above these again are the Kinozoic, recent life, rocks, a third great volume in the history of life, an unfinished volume of which the sand and mud that was carried out to sea yesterday by the rivers of the world. To bury the bones and scales and bodies and tracks that will become at last fossils of the things of today, constitute the last written leaf. It is, we may note, the practice of many geologists to make a break between the rest of the Kinozoic system of rocks and those which contain traces of humanity, which latter are cut off as a separate system under the name of Quaternary. But that, as we shall see, is rather like taking the last page of a book, which is really the conclusion of the last chapter, and making a separate chapter of it and calling it the last chapter. These markings and fossils in the rocks and the rocks themselves are our first historical documents. The history of life that men have puzzled out and are still puzzling out from them is called the record of the rocks. By studying this record men are slowly piecing together a story of life's beginnings, and of the beginnings of our kind, of which our ancestors a century or so ago had no suspicion. But when we call these rocks and the fossils a record and a history, it must not be supposed that there is any sign of an orderly keeping of a record. It is merely that whatever happens leaves some trace, if only we are intelligent enough to detect the meaning of that trace. Nor are the rocks of the world in orderly layers one above the other, 
convenient for men to read. They are not like the books and pages of a library. They are torn, disrupted, interrupted, flung about, defaced, like a carelessly arranged office after it has experienced in succession a bombardment, a hostile military occupation, looting, an earthquake, riots, and a fire. And so it is that for countless generations this record of the rocks lay unsuspected beneath the feet of men. Fossils were known to the Ionian Greeks in the 6th century BC. They were discussed at Alexandria by Eratosthenes and others in the 3rd century BC, a discussion which is summarized in Strabo's Geography, 20-10 BC. They were known to the Latin poet Ovid, but he did not understand their nature. He thought they were the first rude efforts of creative power. They were noted by Arabic writers in the 10th century. Leonardo da Vinci, who lived so recently as the opening of the 16th century, 1452-1519, was one of the first Europeans to grasp the real significance of fossils. And it has been only within the last century and a half that man has begun the serious and sustained deciphering of these long-neglected early pages of his world's history. Section 2. Speculations about geological time vary enormously. Estimates of the age of the oldest rocks by geologists and astronomers starting from different standpoints have varied between 1 billion 600 million and 25 million. The lowest estimate was made by Lord Kelvin in 1867. Professor Huxley guessed at 400 million years. There is a summary of views and the grounds upon which the estimates have been made in Osborne's Origin and Evolution of Life. He inclines to the moderate total of 100 million. It must be clearly understood by the reader how sketchy and provisional all these time estimates are. They rest nearly always upon theoretical assumptions of the slenderest kind. That the period of time has been vast, that it is to be counted by scores and possibly by hundreds of millions of years, is the utmost that can be said with certainty in the matter. It is quite open to the reader to divide every number in the appended time diagram by ten or multiply it by two, no one can gainsay him. Of the relative amount of time as between one age and another we have, however, stronger evidence. If the reader cuts down the 800 million we have given here to 400 million, then he must reduce the 40 million of the Kinozoic to 20 million. And be it noted that whatever the total sum may be, most geologists are in agreement that half or more than half of the whole of geological time had passed before life had developed to the later Paleozoic level. The reader reading quickly through these opening chapters may be apt to think of them as a mere swift prelude of preparation to the apparently much longer history that follows. But in reality that subsequent history is longer only because it is more detailed and more interesting to us. It looms larger in perspective. For ages that stagger the imagination this earth spun hot and lifeless, and again for ages of equal vastness it held no life above the level of the animalculae in a drop of ditch water. Not only is space from the point of view of life and humanity empty, but time is empty also. Life is like a little glow, scarcely kindled yet, in these void immensities. 3. Natural Selection and the Changes of Species Now here it will be well to put plainly certain general facts about this new thing, life, that was creeping in the shallow waters and intertidal muds of the early Paleozoic period and which is perhaps confined to our planet alone in all the immensity of space. Life differs from all things whatever that are without life in certain general aspects. There are the most wonderful differences among living things today, but all living things past and present agree in possessing a certain power of growth, all living things take nourishment, all living things move about as they feed and grow. Though the movement may be no more than the spread of roots through the soil, or of branches in the air. Moreover, living things reproduce, they give rise to other living things, either by growing and then dividing or by means of seeds or spores or eggs or other ways of producing young. Reproduction is a characteristic of life. No living thing goes on living forever. There seems to be a limit of growth for every kind of living thing. Among very small and simple living things, such as that microscopic blob of living matter the amoeba, an individual may grow and then divide completely into two new individuals, which again may divide in their turn. 
many other microscopic creatures live actively for a time, grow, and then become quiet and inactive, enclose themselves in an outer covering and break up wholly into a number of still smaller things, spores, which are released and scattered and again grow into the likeness of their parent. Among more complex creatures the reproduction is not usually such simple division, though division does occur even in the case of many creatures big enough to be visible to the unassisted eye. But the rule with almost all larger beings is that the individual grows up to a certain limit of size. Then, before it becomes unwieldy, its growth declines and stops. As it reaches its full size it matures, it begins to produce young, which are either born alive or hatched from eggs. But all of its body does not produce young. Only a special part does that. After the individual has lived and produced offspring for some time, it ages and dies. It does so by a sort of necessity. There is a practical limit to its life as well as to its growth. These things are as true of plants as they are of animals. And they are not true of things that do not live. Non-living things, such as crystals, grow, but they have no set limits of growth or size, they do not move of their own accord and there is no stir within them. Crystals once formed may last unchanged for millions of years. There is no reproduction for any non-living thing. This growth and dying and reproduction of living things leads to some very wonderful consequences. The young which a living thing produces are either directly, or after some intermediate stages and changes, such as the changes of a caterpillar and butterfly, like the parent living thing. But they are never exactly like it or like each other. There is always a slight difference, which we speak of as individuality. A thousand butterflies this year may produce two or three thousand next year. These latter will look to us almost exactly like their predecessors, but each one will have just that slight difference. It is hard for us to see individuality in butterflies because we do not observe them very closely, but it is easy for us to see it in men. All the men and women in the world now are descended from the men and women of A.D. 1800, but not one of us now is exactly the same as one of that vanished generation. And what is true of men and butterflies is true of every sort of living thing, of plants as of animals. Every species changes all its individualities in each generation. That is as true of all the minute creatures that swarmed and reproduced and died in the Archaeozoic and Proterozoic seas, as it is of men today. Every species of living things is continually dying and being born again, as a multitude of fresh individuals. Consider, then, what must happen to a newborn generation of living things of any species. Some of the individuals will be stronger or sturdier or better suited to succeed in life in some way than the rest, many individuals will be weaker or less suited. In particular single cases any sort of luck or accident may occur, but on the whole the better equipped individuals will live and grow up and reproduce themselves and the weaker will as a rule go under. The latter will be less able to get food, to fight their enemies and pull through. So that in each generation there is as it were a picking over of a species, a picking out of most of the weak or unsuitable and a preference for the strong and suitable. This process is called natural selection or the survival of the fittest. It follows, therefore, from the fact that living things grow and breed and die, that every species, so long as the conditions under which it lives remain the same, becomes more and more perfectly fitted to those conditions in every generation. But now suppose those conditions change, then the sort of individual that used to succeed may now fail to succeed and a sort of individual that could not get on at all under the old conditions may now find its opportunity. These species will change, therefore, generation by generation. The old sort of individual that used to prosper and dominate will fail and die out and the new sort of individual will become the rule, until the general character of the species changes. Suppose, for example, there is some little furry whitey brown animal living in a bitterly cold land which is usually under snow. Such individuals as have the thickest, whitest fur will be least hurt by the cold, less seen by their enemies, and less conspicuous as they seek their prey. The fur of this species will thicken and its whiteness increase with every generation, until there is no advantage in carrying any more fur. Diagram of Life in the Later Paleozoic Age Life is creeping out of the water. 
an insect like a dragonfly is shown. There were amphibia-like gigantic newts and salamanders, and even primitive reptiles in these swamps. Imagine now a change of climate that brings warmth into the land, sweeps away the snows, makes white creatures glaringly visible during the greater part of the year and thick fur and encumbrance. Then every individual with a touch of brown in its coloring and a thinner fur will find itself at an advantage, and very white and heavy fur will be a handicap. There will be a weeding out of the white in favor of the brown in each generation. If this change of climate come about too quickly, it may of course exterminate the species altogether. But if it come about gradually, the species, although it may have a hard time, may yet be able to change itself and adapt itself generation by generation. This change and adaptation is called the modification of species. Perhaps this change of climate does not occur all over the lands inhabited by the species, maybe it occurs only on one side of some great arm of the sea or some great mountain range or such like divide, and not on the other. A warm ocean current like the Gulf Stream may be deflected, and flow so as to warm one side of the barrier, leaving the other still cold. Then on the cold side this species will still be going on to its utmost possible furriness and whiteness and on the other side it will be modifying towards brownness and a thinner coat. At the same time there will probably be other changes going on. A difference in the pause perhaps, because one half of the species will be frequently scratching through snow for its food, while the other will be scampering over brown earth. Probably also the difference of climate will mean differences in the sort of food available, and that may produce differences in the teeth and the digestive organs. And there may be changes in the sweat and oil glands of the skin due to the changes in the fur, and these will affect the excretory organs and all the internal chemistry of the body. And so through all the structure of the creature. A time will come when the two separated varieties of this formerly single species will become so unlike each other as to be recognizably different species. Such a splitting up of a species in the course of generations into two or more species is called the differentiation of species. And it should be clear to the reader that given these elemental facts of life, given growth and death and reproduction with individual variation in a world that changes, life must change in this way, modification and differentiation must occur. Old species must disappear, and new ones appear. We have chosen for our instance here a familiar sort of animal, but what is true of furry beasts in snow and ice is true of all life. And equally true of the soft jellies and simple beginnings that flowed and crawled for hundreds of millions of years between the tidal levels and in the shallow, warm waters of the Proterozoic seas. The early life of the early world, when the blazing sun rose and set in only a quarter of the time it now takes, when the warm seas poured in great tides over the sandy and muddy shores of the rocky lands and the air was full of clouds and steam, must have been modified and varied and species must have developed at a great pace. Life was probably as swift and short as the days and years, the generations, which natural selection picked over, followed one another in rapid succession. Natural selection is a slower process with man than with any other creature. It takes twenty years or more before an ordinary human being in Western Europe grows up and reproduces. In the case of most animals the new generation is on trial in a year or less. With such simple and lowly beings, however, as first appeared in the primordial seas, growth and reproduction was probably a matter of a few brief hours or even of a few brief minutes. Modification and differentiation of species must accordingly have been extremely rapid, and life had already developed a very great variety of widely contrasted forms before it began to leave traces in the rocks. The record of the rocks does not begin, therefore, with any group of closely related forms from which all subsequent and existing creatures are descended. It begins in the midst of the game, with nearly every main division of the animal kingdom already represented. Plants are already plants, and animals animals. The curtain rises on a drama in the sea that has already begun, and has been going on for some time. The brachiopods are discovered already in their shells, accepting and consuming much the same sort of food that oysters and mussels do now. The great water scorpions crawl among the seaweeds, the trilobites roll up into balls and unroll and scuttle away. 
In that ancient mud and among those early weeds there was probably as rich and abundant and active a life of infusoria and the like as one finds in a drop of ditch water today. In the ocean waters, too, down to the utmost downward limit to which light could filter, then as now, there was an abundance of minute and translucent, and in many cases phosphorescent, beings. But though the ocean and intertidal waters already swarmed with life, the land above the high tide line was still, so far as we can guess, a stony wilderness without a trace of life. 4. The Invasion of the Dry Land by Life Section 1. Life and Water Section 2. The Earliest Animals Section 1. Wherever the shoreline ran there was life, and that life went on in and by and with water as its home, its medium, and its fundamental necessity. The first jelly-like beginnings of life must have perished whenever they got out of the water, as jellyfish dry up and perish on our beaches today. Drying up was the fatal thing for life in those days, against which at first it had no protection. But in a world of rain pools and shallow seas and tides, any variation that enabled a living thing to hold out and keep its moisture during hours of low tide of drought met with every encouragement in the circumstances of the time. There must have been a constant risk of stranding. And, on the other hand, life had to keep rather near the shore and beaches in the shallows because it had need of air, dissolved of course in the water, and light. No creature can breathe, no creature can digest its food, without water. We talk of breathing air, but what all living things really do is to breathe oxygen dissolved in water. The air we ourselves breathe must first be dissolved in the moisture in our lungs, and all our food must be liquefied before it can be assimilated. Water living creatures which are always under water, wave the freely exposed gills by which they breathe in that water, and extract the air dissolved in it. But a creature that is to be exposed for any time out of the water, must have its body and its breathing apparatus protected from drying up. Before the seaweeds could creep up out of the early Paleozoic seas into the intertidal line of the beach, they had to develop a tougher outer skin to hold their moisture. Before the ancestor of the sea scorpion could survive being left by the tide it had to develop its casing and armor. The trilobites probably developed their tough covering and rolled up into balls, far less as a protection against each other and any other enemies they may have possessed, than as a precaution against drying. And when presently, as we ascend the Paleozoic rocks, the fish appear, first of all the backboned or vertebrate animals. It is evident that a number of them are already adapted by the protection of their gills with gill covers and by a sort of primitive lung swimming bladder, to face the same risk of temporary stranding. Now the weeds and plants that were adapting themselves to intertidal conditions were also bringing themselves into a region of brighter light, and light is very necessary and precious to all plants. Any development of structure that would stiffen them and hold them up to the light, so that instead of crumpling and flopping when the waters receded, they would stand up outspread, was a great advantage. And so we find them developing fiber and support, and the beginning of woody fiber in them. The early plants reproduced by soft spores, or half-animal, gametes, that were released in water, were distributed by water and could only germinate under water. The early plants were tied, and most lowly plants today are tied, by the conditions of their life cycle, to water. But here again there was a great advantage to be got by the development of some protection of the spores from drought that would enable reproduction to occur without submergence. So soon as a species could do that, it could live and reproduce and spread above the high water mark, bathed in light and out of reach of the beating and distress of the waves. The main classificatory divisions of the larger plants mark stages in the release of plant life from the necessity of submergence by the development of woody support and of a method of reproduction that is more and more defiant of drying up. The lower plants are still the prisoner attendants of water. The lower mosses must live in damp, and even the development of the spore of the ferns demands at certain stages extreme wetness. The highest plants have carried freedom from water so far that they can live and reproduce if only there is some moisture in the soil below them. They have solved their problem of living out of water altogether. The essentials of that problem were worked out through the vast eons of the Proterozoic Age and the early Paleozoic Age by nature's method of experiment and trial. Then slowly, but in great abundance, 
a variety of new plants began to swarm away from the sea and over the lower lands, still keeping to swamp and lagoon and watercourse as they spread. Section 2 And after the plants came the animal life. There is no sort of land animal in the world, as there is no sort of land plant. Whose structure is not primarily that of a water-inhabiting being which has been adapted through the modification and differentiation of species to life out of the water. This adaptation is attained in various ways. In the case of the land scorpion the gill plates of the primitive sea scorpion are sunken into the body so as to make the lung book secure from rapid evaporation. The gills of crustaceans, such as the crabs which run about in the air, are protected by the gill cover extensions of the back shell or carapace. The ancestors of the insects developed a system of air pouches and air tubes, the tracheal tubes, which carry the air all over the body before it is dissolved. In the case of the vertebrate land animals, the gills of the ancestral fish were first supplemented and then replaced by a bag-like growth from the throat, the primitive lung swimming bladder. To this day there survive certain mudfish which enable us to understand very clearly the method by which the vertebrate land animals worked their way out of the water. These creatures, e.g. The African lung fish, are found in tropical regions in which there is a rainy full season and a dry season, during which the rivers become mere ditches of baked mud. During the rainy season these fish swim about and breathe by gills like any other fish. As the waters of the river evaporate, these fish bury themselves in the mud, their gills go out of action, and the creature keeps itself alive until the waters return by swallowing air, which passes into its swimming bladder. The Australian lung fish, when it is caught by the drying up of the river in stagnant pools, and the water has become deaerated and foul, rises to the surface and gulps air. A newt in a pond does exactly the same thing. These creatures still remain at the transition stage, the stage at which the ancestors of the higher vertebrate animals were released from their restriction to an underwater life. The amphibia, frogs, newts, tritons, etc still show in their life history all the stages in the process of this liberation. They are still dependent on water for their reproduction, their eggs must be laid in sunlit water, and there they must develop. The young tadpole has branching external gills that wave in the water, then a gill cover grows back over them and forms a gill chamber. Then, as the creature's legs appear and its tail is absorbed, it begins to use its lungs, and its gills dwindle and vanish. The adult frog can live all the rest of its days in the air, but it can be drowned if it is kept steadfastly below water. When we come to the reptile, however, we find an egg which is protected from evaporation by a tough egg case, and this egg produces young which breathe by lungs from the very moment of hatching. The reptile is on all fours with the seeding plant in its freedom from the necessity to pass any stage of its life cycle in water. Australian Lungfish Breathing Air the later Paleozoic rocks of the Northern Hemisphere give us the materials for a series of pictures of this slow spreading of life over the land. Geographically, all round the northern half of the world it was an age of lagoons and shallow seas very favorable to this invasion. The new plants, now that they had acquired the power to live this new aerial life, developed with an extraordinary richness and variety. Some Reptiles of the Late Paleozoic Age there were as yet no true flowering plants, no grasses, nor trees that shed their leaves in winter, the first flora consisted of great tree ferns, gigantic equisetums, cycad ferns, and kindred vegetation. Many of these plants took the form of huge stem trees, of which great multitudes of trunks survive fossilized to this day. Some of these trees were over a hundred feet high, of orders and classes now vanished from the world. They stood with their stems in the water, in which no doubt there was a thick tangle of soft mosses and green slime and fungoid growths that left few plain vestiges behind them. The abundant remains of these first swamp forests constitute the main coal measures of the world today. Amidst this luxuriant primitive vegetation crawled and glided and flew the first insects. They were rigid-winged, four-winged creatures, often very big, some of them having wings measuring a foot in length. There were numerous dragonflies, one found in the Belgian coal measures had a wingspan of 29 inches. There were also a great variety of flying cockroaches. 
scorpions abounded, and a number of early spiders, which, however, had no spinnerets for web making. Land snails appeared. So too did the first known step of our own ancestry upon land, the amphibia. As we ascend the higher levels of the later Paleozoic record, we find the process of air adaptation has gone as far as the appearance of true reptiles amidst the abundant and various amphibia. The land life of the Upper Paleozoic Age was the life of a green swamp forest without flowers or birds or the noises of modern insects. There were no big land beasts at all. Wallowing amphibia and primitive reptiles were the very highest creatures that life had so far produced. Whatever land lay away from the water or high above the water was still altogether barren and lifeless. But steadfastly, generation by generation, life was creeping away from the shallow sea water of its beginning. V. Changes in the World's Climate. Section 1. Why Life Must Change Continually. Section 2. The Sun a Steadfast Star. Section 3. Changes from Within the Earth. Section 4. Life May Control Change. Section 1. The record of the rocks is like a great book that has been carelessly misused. All its pages are torn, worn, and defaced, and many are altogether missing. The outline of the story that we sketch here has been pieced together slowly and painfully in an investigation that is still incomplete and still in progress. The Carboniferous Rocks, the Coal Measures, give us a vision of the first great expansion of life over the wet lowlands. Then come the torn pages known as the Permian Rocks, which count as the last of the Paleozoic, that preserve very little for us of the land vestiges of their age. Only after a long interval of time does the history spread out generously again. It must be borne in mind that great changes of climate have always been in progress, that have sometimes stimulated and sometimes checked life. Every species of living thing is always adapting itself more and more closely to its conditions. And conditions are always changing. There is no finality in adaptation. There is a continuing urgency towards fresh change. About these changes of climate some explanations are necessary here. They are not regular changes. They are slow fluctuations between heat and cold. The reader must not think that because the sun and earth were once incandescent, the climatic history of the world is a simple story of cooling down. The center of the earth is certainly very hot to this day, but we feel nothing of that internal heat at the surface, the internal heat, except for volcanoes and hot springs, has not been perceptible at the surface since first the rocks grew solid. Even in the Azoic or Archaeozoic age there are traces in ice-worn rocks and the like of periods of intense cold. Such cold waves have always been going on everywhere, alternately with warmer conditions. And there have been periods of great wetness and periods of great dryness throughout the earth. A complete account of the causes of these great climatic fluctuations has still to be worked out, but we may perhaps point out some of the chief of them. Prominent among them is the fact that the earth does not spin in a perfect circle round the sun. Its path or orbit is like a hoop that is distorted. It is, roughly speaking, elliptical, ovo-elliptical, and the sun is nearer to one end of the ellipse than the other. It is at a point which is a focus of the ellipse. And the shape of this orbit never remains the same. It is slowly distorted by the attractions of the other planets, for ages it may be nearly circular, for ages it is more or less elliptical. As the ellipse becomes most nearly circular, then the focus becomes most nearly the center. When the orbit becomes most elliptical, then the position of the sun becomes most remote from the middle or, to use the astronomer's phrase, most eccentric. When the orbit is most nearly circular, then it must be manifest that all the year round the earth must be getting much the same amount of heat from the sun. When the orbit is most distorted, then there will be a season in each year when the earth is nearest the sun, this phase is called perihelion, and getting a great deal of heat comparatively. And a season when it will be at its farthest from the sun, aphelion, and getting very little warmth. A planet at aphelion is traveling its slowest, and its fastest at perihelion, so that the hot part of its year will last for a much less time than the cold part of its year. 
Sir Robert Ball calculated that the greatest difference possible between the seasons was 33 days. During ages when the orbit is most nearly circular there will therefore be least extremes of climate, and when the orbit is at its greatest eccentricity, there will be an age of cold with great extremes of seasonal temperature. These changes in the orbit of the Earth are due to the varying pull of all the planets, and Sir Robert Ball declared himself unable to calculate any regular cycle of orbital change, but Professor G. H. Darwin maintained that it is possible to make out a kind of cycle between greatest and least eccentricity of about 200,000 years. But this change in the shape of the orbit is only one cause of the change of the world's climate. There are many others that have to be considered with it. As most people know, the change in the seasons is due to the fact that the equator of the Earth is inclined at an angle to the plane of its orbit. If the Earth stood up straight in its orbit, so that its equator was in the plane of its orbit, there would be no change in the seasons at all. The sun would always be overhead at the equator, and the day and night would each be exactly 12 hours long throughout the year everywhere. It is this inclination which causes the difference in the seasons and the unequal length of the day in summer and winter. There is, according to Laplace, a possible variation of nearly 3 degrees, from 22 degrees 6 minutes to 24 degrees 50 minutes, in this inclination of the equator to the orbit, and when this is at a maximum, the difference between summer and winter is at its greatest. Great importance has been attached to this variation in the inclination of the equator to the orbit by Dr. Kral in his book Climate and Time. At present the angle is 23 degrees 27 minutes. Manifestly when the angle is at its least, the world's climate, other things being equal, will be most equable. And as a third important factor there is what is called the precession of the equinoxes. This is a slow wobble of the pole of the spinning earth that takes 25,000 odd years. Anyone who watches a spinning top as it sleeps will see its axis making a slow circular movement, exactly after the fashion of this circling movement of the earth's axis. The north pole, therefore, does not always point to the same north point among the stars, its pointing traces out a circle in the heavens every 25,000 years. Now, there will be times when the Earth is at its extreme of aphelion or of perihelion, when one hemisphere will be most turned to the Sun in its midsummer position and the other most turned away at its midwinter position. And as the precession of the equinoxes goes on, a time will come when the summer-winter position will come not at aphelion and perihelion, but at the halfway points between them. When the summer of one hemisphere happens at perihelion and the winter at aphelion, it will be clear that the summer of the other hemisphere will happen at aphelion and its winter at perihelion. One hemisphere will have a short hot summer and a very cold winter, and the other a long cold summer and a briefer warmish winter. But when the summer winter positions come at the halfway point of the orbit, and it is the spring of one hemisphere and the autumn of the other that is at aphelion or perihelion, there will not be the same wide difference between the climate of the two hemispheres. Here are three wavering systems of change all going on independently of each other, the precession of the equinoxes, the change in the obliquity of the equator to the orbit, and the changes in the eccentricity of the orbit. Each system tends by itself to produce periods of equability and periods of greater climatic contrast. And all these systems of change interplay with each other. When it happens that at the same time the orbit is most nearly circular, the equator is at its least inclination from the plane of the Earth's orbit, and the spring and autumn are at perihelion and aphelion. Then all these causes will be conspiring to make climate warm and uniform. There will be least difference of summer and winter. When, on the other hand, the orbit is in its most eccentric stage of deformation, when also the equator is most tilted up and when further the summer and winter are at aphelion and perihelion. Then climates will be at their extremest and winter at its bitterest. There will be great accumulations of ice and snow in winter. The heat of the brief hot summer will be partly reflected back into space by the white snow, and it will be unequal to the task of melting all the winter's ice before the earth spins away once more towards its chilly aphelion. The earth will accumulate cold so long as this conspiracy of extreme conditions continues. Diagram to illustrate one set of causes, the astronomical variations, which make the climate of the world change slowly but continuously. 
it does not change in regular periods. It fluctuates through vast ages. As the world's climate changes, life must change too or perish. So our Earth's climate changes and wavers perpetually as these three systems of influence come together with a common tendency towards warmth or severity, or as they contradict and cancel each other. We can trace in the record of the rocks an irregular series of changes due to the interplay of these influences. There have been great ages when the separate rhythms of these three systems kept them out of agreement and the atmosphere was temperate, ages of worldwide warmth, and other ages when they seemed to concentrate bitterly to their utmost extremity. To freeze out and inflict the utmost stresses and hardship upon life. And in accordance we find from the record in the rocks that there have been long periods of expansion and multiplication when life flowed and abounded and varied, and harsh ages when there was a great weeding out and disappearance of species. Genera, and classes, and the learning of stern lessons by all that survived. Such a propitious conjunction it must have been that gave the age of luxuriant low-grade growth of the coal measures, such an adverse series of circumstances that chilled the closing eons of the Paleozoic time. It is probable that the warm spells have been long relatively to the cold ages. Our world today seems to be emerging with fluctuations from a prolonged phase of adversity and extreme conditions. Half a million years ahead it may be a winterless world with trees and vegetation even in the polar circles. At present we have no certainty in such a forecast, but later on, as knowledge increases, it may be possible to reckon with more precision, so that our race will make its plans thousands of years ahead to meet the coming changes. Section 2 Another entirely different cause of changes in the general climate of the earth may be due to variations in the heat of the sun. We do not yet understand what causes the heat of the sun or what sustains that undying fire. It is possible that in the past there have been periods of greater and lesser intensity. About that we know nothing, human experience has been too short, and so far we have been able to find no evidence on this matter in the geological record. On the whole, scientific men are inclined to believe that the sun has blazed with a general steadfastness throughout geological time. It may have been cooling slowly, but, speaking upon the scale of things astronomical, it has certainly not cooled very much. Section 3 A third great group of causes influencing climate are to be found in the forces within the world itself. Throughout the long history of the earth there has been a continuous wearing down of the hills and mountains by frost and rain and a carrying out of their material to become sedimentary rocks under the seas. There has been a continuous process of wearing down the land and filling up the seas, by which the seas, as they became shallower, must have spread more and more over the land. The reverse process, a process of crumpling and upheaval, has also been in progress, but less regularly. The forces of upheaval have been spasmodic, the forces of wearing down continuous. For long ages there has been comparatively little volcanic upheaval, and then have come periods in which vast mountain chains have been thrust up and the whole outline of land and sea changed. Such a time was the opening stage of the Kinozoic period, in which the Alps, the Himalayas, and the Andes were all thrust up from the sea level to far beyond their present elevations. And the main outlines of the existing geography of the world were drawn. Now, a time of high mountains and deep seas would mean a larger dry land surface for the world, and a more restricted sea surface, and a time of low lands would mean a time of wider and shallower seas. High mountains precipitate moisture from the atmosphere and hold it out of circulation as snow and glaciers, while smaller oceans mean a lesser area for surface evaporation. Other things being equal, Lowland stages of the world's history would be ages of more general atmospheric moisture than periods of relatively greater height of the mountains and greater depth of the seas. But even small increases in the amount of moisture in the air have a powerful influence upon the transmission of radiant heat through that air. The sun's heat will pass much more freely through dry air than through moist air, and so a greater amount of heat would reach the land surfaces of the globe under the conditions of extremes of elevation and depth then during the periods of relative lowness and shallowness. Dry phases in the history of the earth mean, therefore, hot days. But they also mean cold nights, because for the same reason that the heat comes abundantly to the earth, it will be abundantly radiated away. 
Moist phases mean, on the other hand, cooler days and warmer nights. The same principle applies to the seasons, and so a phase of great elevations and depressions of the surface would also be another contributory factor on the side of extreme climatic conditions. And a stage of greater elevation and depression would intensify its extreme conditions by the gradual accumulation of ice caps upon the polar regions and upon the more elevated mountain masses. This accumulation would be at the expense of the sea, whose surface would thus be further shrunken in comparison with the land. Here, then, is another set of varying influences that will play in with and help or check the influence of the astronomical variations stated in section 1 and section 2. There are other more localized forces at work into which we cannot go in any detail here, but which will be familiar to the student of the elements of physical geography. The influence of great ocean currents in carrying warmth from equatorial to more temperate latitudes, the interference of mountain chains with the moisture borne by prevalent winds and the like. As in the slow processes of nature these currents are deflected or the mountain chains worn down or displaced by fresh upheavals, the climate over great areas will be changed and all the conditions of life changed with it. Under the incessant slow variations of these astronomical, telluric, and geographical influences life has no rest. As its conditions change it must change or perish. Section 4. And while we are enumerating the forces that change climate and the conditions of terrestrial life, we may perhaps look ahead a little and add a fourth set of influences. At first unimportant in the history of the world so far as the land surface is concerned, but becoming more important after the age of reptiles, to which we shall proceed in our next chapter. These are the effects produced upon climate by life itself. Particularly great is the influence of vegetation, and especially that of forests. Every tree is continually transpiring water vapor into the air. The amount of water evaporated in summer by a lake surface is far less than the amount evaporated by the same area of beech forest. As in the later Mesozoic and the Kinozoic age, great forests spread over the world. Their action in keeping the air moist and mitigating and stabilizing climate by keeping the summer cool and the winter mild must have become more and more important. Moreover, forests accumulate and protect soil and so prepare the possibility of agricultural life. Water weeds again may accumulate to choke and deflect rivers, flood and convert great areas into marshes, and so lead to the destruction of forests or the replacement of grasslands by boggy wildernesses. Finally, with the appearance of human communities, came what is perhaps the most powerful of all living influences upon climate. By fire and plow and axe man alters his world. By destroying forests and by irrigation man has already affected the climate of great regions of the world's surface. The destruction of forests makes the seasons more extreme. This has happened, for instance, in the northeastern states of the United States of America. Moreover, the soil is no longer protected from the scour of rain, and is washed away, leaving only barren rock beneath. This has happened in Spain and Dalmatia and, some thousands of years earlier, in South Arabia. By irrigation, on the other hand, man restores the desert to life and mitigates climate. This process is going on in northwest India and Australia. In the future, by making such operations worldwide and systematic, man may be able to control climate to an extent at which as yet we can only guess. 6. The Age of Reptiles Section 1. The Age of Lowland Life Section 2. Flying Dragons Section 3. The First Birds Section 4. An Age of Hardship and Death Section 5. The First Appearance of Fur and Feathers Section 1 We know that for hundreds of thousands of years the wetness and warmth, the shallow lagoon conditions that made possible the vast accumulations of vegetable matter which, compressed and mummified, are now coal, prevailed over most of the world. There were some cold intervals, it is true, but they did not last long enough to destroy the growths. Then that long age of luxuriant low-grade vegetation drew to its end, and for a time life on the earth seems to have undergone a period of worldwide bleakness. When the story resumes again, we find life entering upon a fresh phase of richness and expansion. 
vegetation has made great advances in the art of living out of water. While the Paleozoic plants of the coal measures probably grew with swamp water flowing over their roots. The Mesozoic flora from its very outset included palm-like cycads and low-ground conifers that were distinctly land plants growing on soil above the water level. The lower levels of the Mesozoic land were no doubt covered by great fern breaks and shrubby bush and a kind of jungle growth of trees. But there existed as yet no grass, no small flowering plants, no turf nor greensward. Probably the Mesozoic was not an age of very brightly colored vegetation. It must have had a flora green in the wet season and brown and purple in the dry. There were no gay flowers, no bright autumn tints before the fall of the leaf, because there was as yet no fall of the leaf. And beyond the lower levels the world was still barren, still unclothed, still exposed without any mitigation to the wear and tear of the wind and rain. When one speaks of conifers in the Mesozoic the reader must not think of the pines and firs that clothe the high mountain slopes of our time. He must think of low-growing evergreens. The mountains were still as bare and lifeless as ever. The only color effects among the mountains were the color effects of naked rock, such colors as make the landscape of Colorado so marvelous today. Amidst this spreading vegetation of the lower plains the reptiles were increasing mightily in multitude and variety. They were now in many cases absolutely land animals. There are numerous anatomical points of distinction between a reptile and an amphibian, they held good between such reptiles and amphibians as prevailed in the Carboniferous time of the Upper Paleozoic. But the fundamental difference between reptiles and amphibia which matters in this history is that the amphibian must go back to the water to lay its eggs, and that in the early stages of its life it must live in and underwater. The reptile, on the other hand, has cut out all the tadpole stages from its life cycle, or, to be more exact, its tadpole stages are got through before the young leave the egg case. The reptile has come out of the water altogether. Some had gone back to it again, just as the hippopotamus and the otter among mammals have gone back, but that is a further extension of the story to which we cannot give much attention in this outline. In the Paleozoic period, as we have said, life had not spread beyond the swampy river valleys and the borders of sea lagoons and the like. But in the Mesozoic, life was growing ever more accustomed to the thinner medium of the air, was sweeping boldly up over the plains and towards the hillsides. It is well for the student of human history and the human future to note that. If a disembodied intelligence with no knowledge of the future had come to earth and studied life during the early Paleozoic age, he might very reasonably have concluded that life was absolutely confined to the water. And that it could never spread over the land. It found a way. In the later Paleozoic period that visitant might have been equally sure that life could not go beyond the edge of a swamp. The Mesozoic period would still have found him setting bounds to life far more limited than the bounds that are set today. And so today, though we mark how life and man are still limited to five miles of air and a depth of perhaps a mile or so of sea, we must not conclude from that present limitation that life, through man, may not presently spread out and up and down to a range of living as yet inconceivable. The earliest known reptiles were beasts with great bellies and not very powerful legs, very like their kindred amphibia, wallowing as the crocodile wallows to this day. But in the Mesozoic they soon began to stand up and go stoutly on all fours, and several great sections of them began to balance themselves on tail and hind legs, rather as the kangaroos do now, in order to release the four limbs for grasping food. The bones of one notable division of reptiles which retained a quadrupedal habit, a division of which many remains have been found in South African and Russian early Mesozoic deposits. Display a number of characters which approach those of the mammalian skeleton, and because of this resemblance to the mammals, beasts, this division is called the Theriomorpha, beast-like. Another division was the crocodile branch, and another developed towards the tortoises and turtles. The plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs were two groups which have left no living representatives. They were huge reptiles returning to a whale-like life in the sea. Pliosaurus, one of the largest plesiosaurs, measured 30 feet from snout to tail tip, of which half was neck. The mosasaurs were a third group of great porpoise-like marine lizards. 
But the largest and most diversified group of these Mesozoic reptiles was the group we have spoken of as kangaroo-like, the dinosaurs, many of which attained enormous proportions. In bigness these greater dinosaurs have never been exceeded, although the sea can still show in the whale's creatures as great. Some of these, and the largest among them, were herbivorous animals. They browsed on the rushy vegetation and among the ferns and bushes, or they stood up and grasped trees with their four legs while they devoured the foliage. Among the browsers, for example, were the Diplodocus carnegii, which measured 80 equals 4 feet in length, and the Atlantosaurus. The Gigantosaurus, disinterred by a German expedition in 1912 from rocks in East Africa, was still more colossal. It measured well over a hundred feet. These greater monsters had legs, and they are usually figured as standing up on them, but it is very doubtful if they could have supported their weight in this way, out of water. Buoyed up by water or mud, they may have got along. Another noteworthy type we have figured is the Triceratops. There were also a number of great flesh eaters who preyed upon these herbivores. Of these, Tyrannosaurus seems almost the last word in frightfulness among living things. Some species of this genus measured 40 feet from snout to tail. Apparently, it carried this vast body kangaroo fashion on its tail and hind legs. Probably, it reared itself up. Some authorities even suppose that it leapt through the air. If so, it possessed muscles of a quite miraculous quality. A leaping elephant would be a far less astounding idea. Much more probably it waded half submerged in pursuit of the herbivorous river saurians. Section 2 One special development of the dinosaurian type of reptile was a light, hopping, climbing group of creatures which developed a bat-like web between the fifth finger and the side of the body which was used in gliding from tree to tree after the fashion of the flying squirrels. These bat lizards were the pterodactyls. They are often described as flying reptiles, and pictures are drawn of Mesozoic scenery in which they are seen soaring and swooping about. But their breastbone has no keel such as the breastbone of a bird has for the attachment of muscles strong enough for long-sustained flying. They must have flitted about like bats. They must have had a grotesque resemblance to heraldic dragons, and they played the part of bat-like birds in the Mesozoic jungles. But bird-like though they were, they were not birds nor the ancestors of birds. The structure of their wings was altogether different from that of birds. The structure of their wings was that of a hand with one long finger and a web, the wing of a bird is like an arm with feathers projecting from its hind edge. And these pterodactyls had no feathers. Section 3. Far less prevalent at this time were certain other truly bird-like creatures, of which the earlier sorts also hopped and clambered and the later sorts skimmed and flew. These were at first, by all the standards of classification, reptiles. They developed into true birds as they developed wings and as their reptilian scales became long and complicated, fronds rather than scales, and so at last, by much spreading and splitting, feathers. Feathers are the distinctive covering of birds, and they give a power of resisting heat and cold far greater than that of any other integumentary covering except perhaps the thickest fur. At a very early stage this novel covering of feathers, this new heat-proof contrivance that life had chanced upon, enabled many species of birds to invade a province for which the pterodactyl was ill-equipped. They took to sea fishing, if indeed they did not begin with it, and spread to the north and south polewards beyond the temperature limits set to the true reptiles. The earliest birds seem to have been carnivorous divers and water birds. To this day some of the most primitive bird forms are found among the sea birds of the Arctic and Antarctic seas, and it is among these sea birds that zoologists still find lingering traces of teeth, which have otherwise vanished completely from the beak of the bird. The earliest known bird, the Archaeopteryx, had no beak, it had a row of teeth in a jaw like a reptile's. It had three claws at the forward corner of its wing. Its tail too was peculiar. All modern birds have their tail feathers set in a short compact bony rump, the Archaeopteryx had a long bony tail with a row of feathers along each side. Section 4 This great period of Mesozoic life, this second volume of the Book of Life, 
is indeed an amazing story of reptilian life proliferating and developing. But the most striking thing of all the story remains to be told. Right up to the latest Mesozoic rocks we find all these reptilian orders we have enumerated still flourishing unchallenged. There is no hint of an enemy or competitor to them in the relics we find of their world. Then the record is broken. We do not know how long a time the break represents, many pages may be missing here, pages that may represent some great cataclysmal climatic change. When next we find abundant traces of the land plants and the land animals of the earth, this great multitude of reptile species had gone. For the most part they have left no descendants. They have been, wiped out. The pterodactyls have gone absolutely, of the plesiosaurs nichthyosaurs none is alive, the mosasaurs have gone, of the lizards a few remain, the monitor of the Dutch East Indies is the largest. All the multitude and diversity of the dinosaurs have vanished. Only the crocodiles and the turtles and tortoises carry on in any quantity into Kinozoic times. The place of all these types in the picture at the Kinozoic fossils presently unfold to us is taken by other animals not closely related to the Mesozoic reptiles and certainly not descended from any of their ruling types. A new kind of life is in possession of the world. This apparently abrupt ending up of the reptiles is, beyond all question, the most striking revolution in the whole history of the earth before the coming of mankind. It is probably connected with the close of a vast period of equable warm conditions and the onset of a new austerer age, in which the winters were bitterer and the summers brief but hot. The Mesozoic life, animal and vegetable alike, was adapted to warm conditions and capable of little resistance to cold. The new life, on the other hand, was before all things capable of resisting great changes of temperature. Whatever it was that led to the extinction of the Mesozoic reptiles, it was probably some very far-reaching change indeed, for the life of the seas did at the same time undergo a similar catastrophic alteration. The crescendo and ending of the reptiles on land was paralleled by the crescendo and ending of the ammonites, a division of creatures like squids with coiled shells which swarmed in those ancient seas. All through the rocky record of this Mesozoic period there is a vast multitude and variety of these coiled shells, there are hundreds of species, and towards the end of the Mesozoic period they increased in diversity and produced exaggerated types. When the record resumes, these two have gone. So far as the reptiles are concerned, people may perhaps be inclined to argue that they were exterminated because the mammals that replaced them competed with them, and were more fitted to survive. But nothing of the sort can be true of the Ammonites, because to this day their place has not been taken. Simply they are gone. Unknown conditions made it possible for them to live in the Mesozoic seas, and then some unknown change made life impossible for them. No genus of Ammonite survives today of all that vast variety, but there still exists one isolated genus very closely related to the Ammonites, the pearly Nautilus. It is found, it is to be noted, in the warm waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And as for the mammals competing with and ousting the less fit reptiles, a struggle of which people talk at times, there is not a scrap of evidence of any such direct competition. To judge by the record of the rocks as we know it today, there is much more reason for believing that first the reptiles in some inexplicable way perished, and then that later on, after a very hard time for all life upon the earth, the mammals. As conditions became more genial again, developed and spread to fill the vacant world. Section 5. Were there mammals in the Mesozoic period? This is a question not yet to be answered precisely. Patiently and steadily the geologists gather fresh evidence and reason out completer conclusions. At any time some new deposit may reveal fossils that will illuminate this question. Certainly either mammals, or the ancestors of the mammals, must have lived throughout the Mesozoic period. In the very opening chapter of the Mesozoic volume of the record there were those theriomorphous reptiles to which we have already alluded, and in the later Mesozoic a number of small jawbones are found, entirely mammalian in character. But there is not a scrap, not a bone, to suggest that there lived any Mesozoic mammal which could look a dinosaur in the face. The Mesozoic mammals or mammal-like reptiles, for we do not know clearly which they were, seem to have been all obscure little beasts of the size of mice and rats, 
more like a downtrodden order of reptiles than a distinct class. Probably they still laid eggs and were developing only slowly their distinctive covering of hair. They lived away from big waters, and perhaps in the desolate uplands, as marmots do now. Probably they lived there beyond the pursuit of the carnivorous dinosaurs. Some perhaps went on all fours, some chiefly went on their hind legs and clambered with their four limbs. They became fossils only so occasionally that chance has not yet revealed a single complete skeleton in the whole vast record of the Mesozoic rocks by which to check these guesses. These little theriomorphs, these ancestral mammals, developed hair. Hairs, like feathers, are long and elaborately specialized scales. Hair is perhaps the clue to the salvation of the early mammals. Leading lives upon the margin of existence, away from the marshes and the warmth, they developed an outer covering only second in its warmth holding, or heat resisting, powers to the down and feathers of the Arctic seabirds. And so they held out through the age of hardship between the Mesozoic and Kinozoic ages, to which most of the true reptiles succumbed. All the main characteristics of this flora and sea and land fauna that came to an end with the end of the Mesozoic age were such as were adapted to an equable climate and to shallow and swampy regions. But in the case of their Kinozoic successors, both hair and feathers gave a power of resistance to variable temperatures such as no reptile possessed, and with it they gave a range far greater than any animal had hitherto attained. The range of life of the lower Paleozoic period was confined to warm water. The range of life of the Upper Paleozoic period was confined to warm water or to warm swamps and wet ground. The range of life of the Mesozoic period as we know it was confined to water and fairly low-lying valley regions under equable conditions. Meanwhile in each of these periods there were types involuntarily extending the range of life beyond the limits prevailing in that period. And when ages of extreme conditions prevailed, it was these marginal types which survived to inherit the depopulated world. That perhaps is the most general statement we can make about the story of the geological record. It is a story of widening range. Classes, genera, and species of animals appear and disappear, but the range widens. It widens always. Life has never had so great a range as it has today. Life today, in the form of man, goes higher in the air than it has ever done before. Man's geographical range is from pole to pole, he goes under the water in submarines, he sounds the cold, lifeless darkness of the deepest seas, he burrows into virgin levels of the rocks. And in thought and knowledge he pierces to the center of the earth and reaches out to the uttermost star. Yet in all the relics of the Mesozoic time we find no certain memorials of his ancestry. His ancestors, like the ancestors of all the kindred mammals, must have been creatures so rare, so obscure, and so remote that they have left scarcely a trace amidst the abundant vestiges of the monsters that wallowed rejoicing in the steamy air and lush vegetation of the Mesozoic lagoons, or crawled or hopped or fluttered over the great river plains of that time. 7. The Age of Mammals. Section 1. A New Age of Light. Section 2. Tradition comes into the world. Section 3. An age of brain growth. Section 4. The world grows hard again. Section 5. Chronology of the Ice Age. Section 1. The third great division of the geological record, the Kinozoic, opens with a world already physically very like the world we live in today. Probably the day was at first still perceptibly shorter, but the scenery had become very modern in its character. Climate was, of course, undergoing, age by age, its incessant and irregular variations. Lands that are temperate today have passed, since the Kinozoic Age began, through phases of great warmth, intense cold, and extreme dryness. But the landscape, if it altered, altered to nothing that cannot still be paralleled today in some part of the world or other. In the place of the cycads, sequoias, and strange conifers of the Mesozoic, the plant names that now appear in the lists of fossils include birch, beech, holly, tulip trees, ivy, sweet gum, breadfruit trees. Flowers had developed concurrently with bees and butterflies. Palms were now very important. 
Such plants had already been in evidence in the later levels of the American Cretaceous, Mesozoic, but now they dominated the scene altogether. Grass was becoming a great fact in the world. Certain grasses, too, had appeared in the later Mesozoic, but only with the Kinozoic period came grass plains and turf spreading wide over a world that was once barren stone. The period opened with a long phase of considerable warmth, then the world cooled. And in the opening of this third part of the record, this Kinozoic period, a gigantic crumpling of the Earth's crust and an upheaval of mountain ranges was in progress. The Alps, the Andes, the Himalayas, are all Kinozoic mountain ranges. The background of an early Kinozoic scene, to be typical, should display an active volcano or so. It must have been an age of great earthquakes. Geologists make certain main divisions of the Kinozoic period, and it will be convenient to name them here and to indicate their climate. First comes the Eocene, dawn of recent life, an age of exceptional warmth in the world's history, subdivided into an older and newer Eocene, then the Oligocene, but little of recent life, in which the climate was still equable. The Miocene, with living species still in a minority, was the great age of mountain building, and the general temperature was falling. In the Pliocene, more living than extinct species, climate was very much at its present phase. But with the Pleistocene, a great majority of living species, there set in a long period of extreme conditions, it was the Great Ice Age. Glaciers spread from the poles towards the equator, until England to the Thames was covered in ice. Thereafter to our own time came a period of partial recovery. Section 2 In the forests and following the grass over the Eocene plains there appeared for the first time a variety and abundance of mammals. Before we proceed to any description of these mammals, it may be well to note in general terms what a mammal is. From the appearance of the vertebrate animals in the lower Paleozoic age, when the fish first swarmed out into the sea, there has been a steady progressive development of vertebrate creatures. A fish is a vertebrate animal that breathes by gills and can live only in water. An amphibian may be described as a fish that has added to its gill breathing the power of breathing air with its swimming bladder in adult life, and that has also developed limbs with five toes to them in place of the fins of a fish. A tadpole is for a time a fish, it becomes a land creature as it develops. A reptile is a further stage in this detachment from water, it is an amphibian that is no longer amphibious. It passes through its tadpole stage, its fish stage, that is, in an egg. From the beginning it must breathe in air, it can never breathe underwater as a tadpole can do. Now, a modern mammal is really a sort of reptile that has developed a peculiarly effective protective covering, hair. And that also retains its eggs in the body until they hatch so that it brings forth living young, viviparous, and even after birth it cares for them and feeds them by its mammy for a longer or shorter period. Some reptiles, some vipers for example, are viviparous, but none stand by their young as the real mammals do. Both the birds and the mammals, which escaped whatever destructive forces made an end to the Mesozoic reptiles, and which survived to dominate the Kinozoic world, have these two things in common, first. A far more effective protection against changes of temperature than any other variation of the reptile type ever produced. And, secondly, a peculiar care for their eggs, the bird by incubation and the mammal by retention, and a disposition to look after the young for a certain period after hatching or birth. There is by comparison the greatest carelessness about offspring in the reptile. Hair was evidently the earliest distinction of the mammals from the rest of the reptiles. It is doubtful if the particular theriodont reptiles who were developing hair in the early Mesozoic were viviparous. Two mammals survive to this day which not only do not suckle their young, but which lay eggs, the ornithorhynchus and the echidna, and in the Eocene there were a number of allied forms. They are the survivors of what was probably a much larger number and variety of small egg-laying hairy creatures, hairy reptiles, hoppers, climbers, and runners, which included the Mesozoic ancestors of all existing mammals up to and including man. Now we may put the essential facts about mammalian reproduction in another way. The mammal is a family animal. And the family habit involved the possibility of a new sort of continuity of experience in the world. 
Compare the completely closed-in life of an individual lizard with the life of even a quite lowly mammal of almost any kind. The former has no mental continuity with anything beyond itself. It is a little self-contained globe of experience that serves its purpose and ends, but the latter picks up from its mother and hands on to its offspring. All the mammals, except for the two genera we have named, had already before the lower Eocene age arrived at this stage of pre-adult dependence and imitation. They were all more or less imitative in youth and capable of a certain modicum of education, they all, as a part of their development, received a certain amount of care and example and even direction from their mother. This is as true of the hyena and rhinoceros as it is of the dog or man, the difference of educability is enormous, but the fact of protection and educability in the young stage is undeniable. So far as the vertebrate animals go, these new mammals, with their viviparous, young protecting disposition, and these new birds, with their incubating, young protecting disposition. Introduce at the opening of the Kinozoic period a fresh thing into the expanding story of life, namely, social association, the addition to hard and inflexible instinct of tradition, and the nervous organization necessary to receive tradition. All the innovations that come into the history of life begin very humbly. The supply of blood vessels in the swimming bladder of the mudfish in the lower Paleozoic torrent river, that enabled it to pull through a season of drought. Would have seemed at that time to that bodiless visitant to our planet we have already imagined, a very unimportant side fact in that ancient world of great sharks and plated fishes, sea scorpions, and coral reefs and seaweed. But it opened the narrow way by which the land vertebrates arose to predominance. The mudfish would have seemed then a poor refugee from the too crowded and aggressive life of the sea. But once lungs were launched into the world, every line of descent that had lungs went on improving them. So, too, in the Upper Paleozoic, the fact that some of the amphibia were losing their amphibiousness, by a retardation of hatching of their eggs, would have appeared a mere response to the distressful dangers that threatened the young tadpole. Yet that prepared the conquest of the dry land for the triumphant multitude of the Mesozoic reptiles. It opened a new direction towards a free and vigorous land life along which all the reptilian animals moved. And this viviparous, young tending training that the ancestral mammalia underwent during that age of inferiority and hardship for them, set going in the world a new continuity of perception. Of which even man today only begins to appreciate the significance. Section 3. A number of types of mammal already appear in the Eocene. Some are differentiating in one direction, and some in another, some are perfecting themselves as herbivorous quadrupeds, some leap and climb among the trees, some turn back to the water to swim. But all types are unconsciously exploiting and developing the brain which is the instrument of this new power of acquisition and educability. In the Eocene rocks are found small early predecessors of the horse, Eohippus, tiny camels, pigs, early tapers, early hedgehogs, monkeys and lemurs, possums and carnivores. Now, all these were more or less ancestral to living forms, and all have brains relatively much smaller than their living representatives. There is, for instance, an early rhinoceros, Titanotherium, with a brain not one-tenth the size of that of the existing rhinoceros. The latter is by no means a perfect type of the attentive and submissive student, but even so it is ten times more observant and teachable than its predecessor. This sort of thing is true of all the orders and families that survive until today. All the Kinozoic mammals were doing this one thing in common under the urgency of a common necessity, they were all growing brain. It was a parallel advance. In the same order or family today, the brain is usually from six to ten times what it was in the Eocene ancestor. Grass was now spreading over the world, and with this extension arose some huge graminivorous brutes of which no representative survives today. Such were the Uintotheres and the Titanotheres. And in pursuit of such beasts came great swarms of primitive dogs, some as big as bears, and the first cats, one in particular, Smilodon, a small fierce-looking creature with big knife-like canines, the first saber-toothed tiger. Which was to develop into greater things. American deposits in the Miocene display a great variety of camels, giraffe camels with long necks, gazelle camels, llamas, and true camels. North America, 
throughout most of the Kinozoic period, appears to have been in open and easy continuation with Asia, and when at last the glaciers of the Great Ice Age, and then the Bering Strait, came to separate the two great continental regions. The last camels were left in the Old World and the llamas in the New. In the Eocene the first ancestors of the elephants appear in northern Africa as snout creatures, the elephant's trunk dawned on the world in the Miocene. One group of creatures is of peculiar interest in a history that is mainly to be the story of mankind. We find fossils in the Eocene of monkeys and lemurs, but of one particular creature we have as yet not a single bone. It was half ape, half monkey, it clambered about the trees and ran, and probably ran well, on its hind legs upon the ground. It was small-brained by our present standards, but it had clever hands with which it handled fruits and beat nuts upon the rocks and perhaps caught up sticks and stones to smite its fellows. It was our ancestor. Section 4 Through millions of simian generations the spinning world circled about the sun. Slowly its orbit, which may have been nearly circular during the equable days of the early Eocene, was drawn by the attraction of the circling outer planets into a more elliptical form. Its axis of rotation, which had always heeled over to the plane of its orbit, as the mast of a yacht under sail heels over to the level of the water, heeled over by imperceptible degrees a little more and a little more. And each year its summer point shifted a little further from perihelion round its path. These were small changes to happen to a one-inch ball, circling at a distance of 330 yards from a flaming sun nine feet across, in the course of a few million years. They were changes an immortal astronomer in Neptune, watching the Earth from age to age, would have found almost imperceptible. But from the point of view of the surviving mammalian life of the Miocene, they mattered profoundly. Age by age the winters grew on the whole colder and harder and a few hours longer relatively to the summers in a thousand years, age by age the summers grew briefer. On an average the winter snow lay a little later in the spring in each century, and the glaciers in the northern mountains gained an inch this year, receded half an inch next, came on again a few inches. The record of the rocks tells of the increasing chill. The Pliocene was a temperate time, and many of the warmth-loving plants and animals had gone. Then, rather less deliberately, some feet or some inches every year, the ice came on. An arctic fauna, musk ox, woolly mammoth, woolly rhinoceros, lemming, ushers in the Pleistocene. Over North America, and Europe and Asia alike, the ice advanced. For thousands of years it advanced, and then for thousands of years it receded, to advance again. Europe down to the Baltic shores, Britain down to the Thames, North America down to New England, and more centrally as far south as Ohio, lay for ages under the glaciers. Enormous volumes of water were withdrawn from the ocean and locked up in those stupendous ice caps so as to cause a worldwide change in the relative levels of land and sea. Vast areas were exposed that are now again sea bottom. The world today is still coming slowly out of the last of four great waves of cold. It is not growing warmer steadily. There have been fluctuations. Remains of bog oaks, for example, which grew two or three thousand years ago, are found in Scotland at latitudes in which not even a stunted oak will grow at the present time. And it is amidst this crescendo and diminuendo of frost and snow that we first recognize forms that are like the forms of men. The age of mammals culminated in ice and hardship and man. Section 5 Guesses about the duration of the Great Age of Cold are still vague, but in the time diagram on we follow H. F. Osborne in accepting as our guides the estimates of Albrecht Penck and C. Reeds. Time Diagram of the Glacial Ages The reader should compare this diagram carefully with our first time diagram, Chapter 2, Section 2. That diagram, if it were on the same scale as this one, would be between 41 and 410 feet long. The position of the Eoanthropus is very uncertain, it may be as early as the Pliocene. Book 2. The Making of Men. 8. The Ancestry of Man. Section 1. Man Descended from a Walking Ape. Section 2. First Traces of Man-like Creatures. Section 3. The Heidelberg Subman. Section 4. 
The Piltdown Subman. Section 5. The Riddle of the Piltdown Remains. Section 1. The origin of man is still very obscure. It is commonly asserted that he is descended from some man-like ape such as the chimpanzee, the orangutan, or the gorilla. But that of course is as reasonable as saying that I am descended from some Hottentot or Eskimo as young or younger than myself. Others, alive to this objection, say that man is descended from the common ancestor of the chimpanzee, the orangutan, and the gorilla. Some anthropologists have even indulged in a speculation whether mankind may not have a double or treble origin, the Negro being descended from a gorilla-like ancestor, the Chinese from a chimpanzee-like ancestor, and so on. These are very fanciful ideas, to be mentioned only to be dismissed. It was formerly assumed that the human ancestor was, probably arboreal, but the current idea among those who are qualified to form an opinion seems to be that he was a, ground ape. And that the existing apes have developed in the arboreal direction. Of course, if one puts the skeleton of a man and the skeleton of a gorilla side by side, their general resemblance is so great that it is easy to jump to the conclusion that the former is derived from such a type as the latter by a process of brain growth and general refinement. But if one examines closely into one or two differences, the gap widens. Particular stress has recently been laid upon the tread of the foot. Man walks on his toe and his heel. His great toe is his chief lever in walking, as the reader may see for himself if he examines his own footprints on the bathroom floor and notes where the pressure falls as the footprints become fainter. His great toe is the king of his toes. Among all the apes and monkeys, the only group that have their great toes developed on anything like the same fashion as man are some of the lemurs. The baboon walks on a flat foot and all his toes, using his middle toe as his chief throw off, much as the bear does. And the three great apes all walk on the outer side of the foot in a very different manner from the walking of man. Possible appearance of the subman Pithecanthropus. The face, jaws, and teeth are mere guesswork, see text. The creature may have been much less human looking than this. The great apes are forest dwellers. Their walking even now is incidental, they are at their happiest among trees. They have very distinctive methods of climbing, they swing by the arms much more than the monkeys do, and do not, like the latter, take off with a spring from the feet. They have a specially developed climbing style of their own. But man walks so well and runs so swiftly as to suggest a very long ancestry upon the ground. Also, he does not climb well now, he climbs with caution and hesitation. His ancestors may have been running creatures for long ages. Moreover, it is to be noted that he does not swim naturally, he has to learn to swim, and that seems to point to a long-standing separation from rivers and lakes and the sea. Almost certainly that ancestor was a smaller and slighter creature than its human descendants. Conceivably the human ancestor at the opening of the Kinozoic period was a running ape, living chiefly on the ground, hiding among rocks rather than trees. It could still climb trees well and hold things between its great toe and its second toe, as the Japanese can to this day, but it was already coming down to the ground again from a still remoter, a Mesozoic arboreal ancestry. It is quite understandable that such a creature would very rarely die in water in such circumstances as to leave bones to become fossilized. It must always be borne in mind that among its many other imperfections the geological record necessarily contains abundant traces only of water or marsh creatures or of creatures easily and frequently drowned. The same reasons that make any traces of the ancestors of the mammals rare and relatively unprocurable in the Mesozoic rocks, probably make the traces of possible human ancestors rare and relatively unprocurable in the Kinozoic rocks. Such knowledge as we have of the earliest men, for example, is almost entirely got from a few caves, into which they went and in which they left their traces. Until the hard Pleistocene times they lived and died in the open, and their bodies were consumed or decayed altogether. But it is well to bear in mind also that the record of the rocks has still to be thoroughly examined. It has been studied only for a few generations, and by only a few men in each generation. Most men have been too busy making war, 
making profits out of their neighbors, toiling at work that machinery could do for them in a tenth of the time, or simply playing about, to give any attention to these more interesting things. There may be, there probably are, thousands of deposits still untouched containing countless fragments and vestiges of man and his progenitors. In Asia particularly, in India or the East Indies, there may be hidden the most illuminating clues. What we know today of early men is the merest scrap of what will presently be known. The apes and monkeys already appear to have been differentiated at the beginning of the Kinozoic Age, and there are a number of Oligocene and Miocene apes whose relations to one another and to the human line have still to be made out. Among these we may mention Dryopithecus of the Miocene Age, with a very human-looking jaw. In the Siwalik Hills of northern India remains of some very interesting apes have been found, of which Sivapithecus and Paleopithecus were possibly related closely to the human ancestor. Possibly these animals already used implements. Charles Darwin represents baboons as opening nuts by breaking them with stones, using stakes to prize up rocks in the hunt for insects, and striking blows with sticks and stones. The chimpanzee makes itself a sort of tree hut by intertwining branches. Stones apparently chipped for use have been found in strata of Oligocene age at Boncelles in Belgium. Possibly the implement using disposition was already present in the Mesozoic ancestry from which we are descended. Section 2 Among the earliest evidences of some creature, either human or at least more man-like than any living ape upon earth, are a number of flints and stones very roughly chipped and shaped so as to be held in the hand. These were probably used as hand axes. These early implements, aeoliths, are often so crude and simple that there was for a long time a controversy whether they were to be regarded as natural or artificial productions. The date of the earliest of them is put by geologists as Pliocene, that is to say, before the first glacial age. They occur also throughout the first interglacial period. We know of no bones or other remains in Europe or America of the quasi-human beings of half a million years ago, who made and used these implements. They used them to hammer with, perhaps they used them to fight with, and perhaps they used bits of wood for similar purposes. But at Trinil, in Java, in strata which are said to correspond either to the later Pliocene or to the American and European First Ice Age, there have been found some scattered bones of a creature. Such as the makers of these early implements may have been. The top of a skull, some teeth, and a thigh bone have been found. The skull shows a brain case about halfway in size between that of the chimpanzee and man, but the thigh bone is that of a creature as well adapted to standing and running as a man, and as free, therefore, to use its hands. The creature was not a man, nor was it an arboreal ape like the chimpanzee. It was a walking ape. It has been named by naturalists Pithecanthropus erectus, the walking ape man. We cannot say that it is a direct human ancestor, but we may guess that the creatures who scattered these first stone tools over the world must have been closely similar in kindred, and that our ancestor was a beast of like kind. This little trayful of bony fragments from Trinil is, at present, apart from stone implements, the oldest relic of early humanity, or of the close blood relations of early humanity, that is known. While these early men, or sub-men, were running about Europe four or five hundred thousand years ago, there were mammoths, rhinoceroses, a huge hippopotamus, a giant beaver, and a bison and wild cattle in their world. There were also wild horses, and the saber-toothed tiger still abounded. There are no traces of lions or true tigers at that time in Europe, but there were bears, otters, wolves, and a wild boar. It may be that the early subman sometimes played jackal to the saber-toothed tiger, and finished up the bodies on which the latter had gorged itself. Section 3 After this first glimpse of something at least subhuman in the record of geology, there is not another fragment of human or man-like bone yet known from that record for an interval of hundreds of thousands of years. It is not until we reach deposits which are stated to be of the second interglacial period, 200,000 years later, 200,000 or 250,000 years ago, that another little scrap of bone comes to hand. Then we find a jawbone. This jawbone was found in a sandpit near Heidelberg, at a depth of 80 feet from the surface, and it is not the jawbone of a man as we understand man, 
but it is manlike in every respect, except that it has absolutely no trace of a chin. It is more massive than a man's, and its narrowness behind could not, it is thought, have given the tongue sufficient play for articulate speech. It is not an ape's jawbone, the teeth are human. The owner of this jawbone has been variously named Homo heidelbergensis and Paleoanthropus heidelbergensis, according to the estimate formed of its humanity or subhumanity by various authorities. He lived in a world not remotely unlike the world of the still earlier subman of the first implements. The deposits in which it is found show that there were elephants, horses, rhinoceroses, bison, a moose, and so forth with it in the world, but the saber-toothed tiger was declining and the lion was spreading over Europe. The implements of this period, known as the Chilean period, are a very considerable advance upon those of the Pliocene age. They are well made but very much bigger than any truly human implements. The Heidelberg man may have had a very big body and large forelimbs. He may have been a woolly strange-looking creature. Section 4 We must turn over the record for, it may be, another 100,000 years for the next remains of anything human or subhuman. Then in a deposit ascribed to the third interglacial period, which may have begun 100,000 years ago and lasted 50,000 years, the smashed pieces of a whole skull turn up. The deposit is a gravel which may have been derived from the washing out of still earlier gravel strata and this skull fragment may be in reality as old as the first glacial period. The bony remains discovered at Piltdown in Sussex display a creature still ascending only very gradually from the subhuman. The first scraps of this skull were found in an excavation for road gravel in Sussex. Bit by bit other fragments of this skull were hunted out from the quarry heaps until most of it could be pieced together. It is a thick skull, thicker than that of any living race of men, and it has a brain capacity intermediate between that of Pithecanthropus and man. This creature has been named Eoanthropus, the Dawn Man. In the same gravel pits were found teeth of rhinoceros, hippopotamus, and the leg bone of a deer with marks upon it that may be cuts. A curious bat-shaped instrument of elephant bone has also been found. There was, moreover, a jawbone among these scattered remains, which was at first assumed naturally enough to belong to Eoanthropus, but which it was afterwards suggested was probably that of a chimpanzee. It is extraordinarily like that of a chimpanzee, but Dr. Keith, one of the greatest authorities in these questions, assigns it, after an exhaustive analysis in his Antiquity of Man, 1915, to the skull with which it is found. It is, as a jawbone, far less human in character than the jaw of the much more ancient Homo heidelbergensis, but the teeth are in some respects more like those of living men. Diagram to illustrate the riddle of the Piltdown. Subman. Dar. Keith, swayed by the jawbone, does not think that Eoanthropus, in spite of its name, is a creature in the direct ancestry of man. Much less is it an intermediate form between the Heidelberg man and the Neanderthal man we shall presently describe. It was only related to the true ancestor of man as the orang is related to the chimpanzee. It was one of a number of subhuman running apes of more than ape-like intelligence, and if it was not on the line royal, it was at any rate a very close collateral. After this glimpse of a skull, the record for very many centuries gives nothing but flint implements, which improve steadily in quality. A very characteristic form is shaped like a sole, with one flat side stricken off at one blow and the other side worked. The archaeologists, as the record continues, are presently able to distinguish scrapers, borers, knives, darts, throwing stones, and the like. Progress is now more rapid. In a few centuries the shape of the hand axe shows distinct and recognizable improvements. And then comes quite a number of remains. The fourth glacial age is rising towards its maximum. Man is taking to caves and leaving vestiges there. At Krapina in Croatia, at Neanderthal near Dusseldorf, at Spy, human remains have been found, skulls and bones of a creature that is certainly a man. Somewhere about 50,000 years ago, if not earlier, appeared Homo neanderthalensis, also called Homo antiquus and Homo primigenius, a quite passable human being. His thumb was not quite equal in flexibility and usefulness to a human thumb, he stooped forward, and could not hold his head erect, 
as all living men do, he was chinless and perhaps incapable of speech. There were curious differences about the enamel and the roots of his teeth from those of all living men, he was very thick-set, he was, indeed, not quite of the human species. But there is no dispute about his attribution to the genus Homo. He was certainly not descended from Eoanthropus, but his jawbone is so like the Heidelberg jawbone as to make it possible that the clumsier and heavier Homo heidelbergensis, a thousand centuries before him, was of his blood and race. Section 5. Upon this question of the Piltdown jawbone, it may be of interest to quote here a letter to the writer from Sir Ray Lancaster, discussing the question in a familiar and luminous manner. It will enable the reader to gauge the extent and quality of the evidence that we possess at present upon the nature of these early human and subhuman animals. Upon these fragile Piltdown fragments alone more than a hundred books, pamphlets, and papers have been written. These scraps of bone are guarded more carefully from theft and willful damage than the most precious jewels, and in the museum cases one sees only carefully executed FAC similes. As to the Piltdown jaw bone, the best study of it is that by Smith Woodward, who first described it and the canine found later. The jaw is imperfect in front, but has the broad, flat symphysis of the apes. G. S. Miller, an American anthropologist, has made a very good comparison of it with a chimpanzee's jaw, and concludes that it is a chimpanzee's. His monograph is in the A.M. Jour, of Phys. Anthrop, Volume 1, Number 1. The one point in the Piltdown jaw itself against chimpanzee identification is the smooth, flat, worn surface of the molars. This is a human character, and is due to lateral movement of the jaw, and hence rubbing down of the tubercles of the molars. This is not worth much. But the serious question is, are we to associate this jaw with the cranium found close by it? If so, it is certainly not chimpanzee nor close to the apes, but decidedly hominid. Two other small fragments of crania and a few more teeth have been found in the gravel two miles from Piltdown, which agree with the Piltdown cranium in having superciliary ridges fairly strong for a human skull but not anything like the great superciliary ridges of apes. The fact one has to face is this, here you have an imperfect cranium, very thick-walled and of small cubical contents, 1100 or so, but much larger in that respect than any apes. A few yards distant from it in the same layer of gravel is found a jawbone having rather large pointed canines, a flat, broad symphysis, and other points about the inner face of the ramus and ridges which resemble those of the chimpanzee. Which is the more likely, a, that these two novel fragments tending ape wards from man were parts of the same individual? Or, b, that the sweeping of the Wealden Valley has brought there together a half-jaw and a broken cranium both more ape-like in character than any known human corresponding bits, and yet derived from two separate anthropoid beasts? 1, the jaw, more simian, and the other, the cranium, much less so. As to the probabilities, we must remember that this patch of gravel at Piltdown, clearly and definitely, is a wash-up of remains of various later tertiary and post-tertiary deposits. It contains fragments of Miocene mastodon and rhinoceros teeth. These latter differ entirely in mineral character from the Eoanthropus jaw and the cranium. But, and this needs re-examination and chemical analysis, the Piltdown jaw and the Piltdown cranium do not seem to me to be quite alike in their mineral condition. The jaw is more deeply iron-stained, and I should say, but not confidently, harder than the cranium. Now, it is easy to attribute too much importance to that difference, since in a patch of iron-stained gravel, such as that at Piltdown, the soaking of water and iron salts into bones embedded may be much greater in one spot than in another only a yard off, or a few inches deeper. So I think we are stumped and baffled. The most prudent way is to keep the jaw and the cranium apart in all argument about them. On the other hand, on the principle that hypotheses are not to be multiplied beyond necessity, there is a case for regarding the two, jaw and cranium, as having been parts of one beast, or man. To which Sir H. H. Johnston adds, 
Against the chimpanzee hypothesis it must be borne in mind that so far no living chimpanzee or fossil chimpanzee-like remains have been found nearer England than North Equatorial Africa or Northwest India. And no remains of great apes at all nearer than southern France and the Upper Rhine, and those widely different from the Eoanthropus jaw. 9. The Neanderthal men, an extinct race. The Early Paleolithic Age. Section 1. The World 50,000 Years Ago. Section 2. The Daily Life of the First Men. Section 3. The Last Paleolithic Men. Section 1. I in the time of the Third Interglacial Period the outline of Europe and Western Asia was very different from what it is today. Vast areas to the west and northwest which are now under the Atlantic waters were then dry land. The Irish Sea and the North Sea were river valleys. Over these northern areas there spread and receded and spread again a great ice cap such as covers central Greenland today, sea map, on. This vast ice cap, which covered both polar regions of the earth, withdrew huge masses of water from the ocean, and the sea level consequently fell, exposing great areas of land that are now submerged again. The Mediterranean area was probably a great valley below the general sea level, containing two inland seas cut off from the general ocean. The climate of this Mediterranean basin was perhaps cold temperate, and the region of the Sahara to the south was not then a desert of baked rock and blown sand, but a well-watered and fertile country. Between the ice sheets to the north and the Alps and Mediterranean valley to the south stretched a bleak wilderness whose climate changed from harshness to a mild kindliness and then hardened again for the fourth glacial age. Across this wilderness, which is now the great plain of Europe, wandered a various fauna. At first there were hippopotami, rhinoceroses, mammoths, and elephants. The saber-toothed tiger was diminishing towards extinction. Then, as the air chilled, the hippopotamus, and then other warmth-loving creatures, ceased to come so far north, and the saber-toothed tiger disappeared altogether. The woolly mammoth, the woolly rhinoceros, the musk ox, the bison, the aurochs, and the reindeer became prevalent, and the temperate vegetation gave place to plants of a more arctic type. The glaciers spread southward to the maximum of the fourth glacial age, about 50,000 years ago, and then receded again. In the earlier phase, the third interglacial period, a certain number of small family groups of men, Homo neanderthalensis, and probably of sub-men, Eoanthropus, wandered over the land, leaving nothing but their flint implements to witness to their presence. They probably used a multitude and variety of wooden implements also, they had probably learnt much about the shapes of objects and the use of different shapes from wood, knowledge which they afterwards applied to stone. But none of this wooden material has survived, we can only speculate about its forms and uses. As the weather hardened to its maximum of severity, the Neanderthal men, already it would seem acquainted with the use of fire, began to seek shelter under rock ledges and in caves, and so leave remains behind them. Hitherto they had been accustomed to squat in the open about the fire, and near their water supply. But they were sufficiently intelligent to adapt themselves to the new and harder conditions. As for the submen, they seem to have succumbed to the stresses of this fourth glacial age altogether. At any rate, the rudest type of Paleolithic implements presently disappears. This map represents the present state of our knowledge of the geography of Europe and Western Asia at a period which we guess to be about 50,000 years ago, the Neanderthaler age. Much of this map is of course speculative, but its broad outlines must be fairly like those of the world in which men first became men. Not merely man was taking to the caves. This period also had a cave lion, a cave bear, and a cave hyena. These creatures had to be driven out of the caves and kept out of the caves in which these early men wanted to squat and hide, and no doubt fire was an effective method of eviction and protection. Probably early men did not go deeply into the caves, because they had no means of lighting their recesses. They got in far enough to be out of the weather, and stored wood and food in odd corners. Perhaps they barricaded the cave mouths. Their only available light for going deeply into the caverns would be torches. What did these Neanderthal men hunt? 
Their only possible weapons for killing such giant creatures as the mammoth or the cave bear, or even the reindeer, were spears of wood, wooden clubs, and those big pieces of flint they left behind them, the Chilean and Mysterian implements. And probably their usual quarry was smaller game. But they did certainly eat the flesh of the big beasts when they had a chance, and perhaps they followed them when sick or when wounded by combats, or took advantage of them when they were bogged or in trouble with ice or water. The Labrador Indians still kill the caribou with spears at awkward river crossings. At Dulish in Dorset, an artificial trench has been found which is supposed to have been a Paleolithic trap for elephants. We know that the Neanderthalers partly ate their kill where it fell. But they brought back the big marrow bones to the cave to crack and eat at leisure, because few ribs and vertebrae are found in the caves, but great quantities of cracked and split long bones. They used skins to wrap about them, and the women probably dressed the skins. We know also that they were right-handed like modern men, because the left side of the brain, which serves the right side of the body, is bigger than the right. But while the back parts of the brain which deal with sight and touch and the energy of the body are well developed, the front parts, which are connected with thought and speech, are comparatively small. It was as big a brain as ours, but different. This species of Homo had certainly a very different mentality from ours, its individuals were not merely simpler and lower than we are, they were on another line. It may be they did not speak at all, or very sparingly. They had nothing that we should call a language. Section 2 In Worthington Smith's Man the Primeval Savage there is a very vividly written description of early Paleolithic life, from which much of the following account is borrowed. In the original, Mr. Worthington Smith assumes a more extensive social life, a larger community, and a more definite division of labor among its members than is altogether justifiable in the face of such subsequent writings as J. J. Atkinson's memorable essay on primal law. For the little tribe Mr. Worthington Smith described there has been substituted, therefore, a family group under the leadership of one old man, and the suggestions of Mr. Atkinson as to the behavior of the old man have been worked into the sketch. Mr. Worthington Smith describes a squatting place near a stream, because primitive man, having no pots or other vessels, must needs have kept close to a water supply, and with some chalk cliffs adjacent from which flints could be got to work. The air was bleak, and the fire was of great importance, because fires once out were not easily relit in those days. When not required to blaze it was probably banked down with ashes. The most probable way in which fires were started was by hacking a bit of iron parietes with a flint amidst dry dead leaves, concretions of iron parietes and flints are found together in England where the galt and chalk approach each other. The little group of people would be squatting about amidst a litter of fern, moss, and such like dry material. Some of the women and children would need to be continually gathering fuel to keep up the fires. It would be a tradition that had grown up. The young would imitate their elders in this task. Perhaps there would be rude wind shelters of boughs on one side of the encampment. The old man, the father and master of the group, would perhaps be engaged in hammering flints beside the fire. The children would imitate him and learn to use the sharpened fragments. Probably some of the women would hunt good flints. They would fish them out of the chalk with sticks and bring them to the squatting place. There would be skins about. It seems probable that at a very early time primitive men took to using skins. Probably they were wrapped about the children, and used to lie upon when the ground was damp and cold. A woman would perhaps be preparing a skin. The inside of the skin would be well scraped free of superfluous flesh with trimmed flints, and then strained and pulled and pegged out flat on the grass, and dried in the rays of the sun. Early Stone Implements The Mysterian Age implements, and all above it, are those of Neanderthal men or, possibly in the case of the Rostrocarinates, of submen. The Lower Row, Reindeer Age, are the work of true men. The student should compare this diagram with the time diagram attached to Chapter 7, Section 6, and he should note the relatively large size of the prehuman implements. Away from the fire other members of the family group prowl in search of food, but at night they all gather closely round the fire and build it up, 
for it is their protection against the wandering bear and such like beasts of prey. The old man is the only fully adult male in the little group. There are women, boys and girls, but so soon as the boys are big enough to rouse the old man's jealousy, he will fall foul of them and either drive them off or kill them. Some girls may perhaps go off with these exiles, or two or three of these youths may keep together for a time, wandering until they come upon some other group, from which they may try to steal a mate. Then they would probably fall out among themselves. Some day, when he is forty years old perhaps or even older, and his teeth are worn down and his energy abating, some younger male will stand up to the old man and kill him and reign in his stead. There is probably short shrift for the old at the squatting place. So soon as they grow weak and bad-tempered, trouble and death come upon them. What did they eat at the squatting place? Primeval man is commonly described as a hunter of the great hairy mammoth, of the bear, and the lion, but it is in the highest degree improbable that the human savage ever hunted animals much larger than the hare, the rabbit, and the rat. Man was probably the hunted rather than the hunter. Australia and the Western Pacific in the Glacial Age The primeval savage was both herbivorous and carnivorous. He had for food hazelnuts, beech nuts, sweet chestnuts, earth nuts, and acorns. He had crab apples, wild pears, wild cherries, wild gooseberries, bull aces, sorbs, sloes, blackberries, yewberries, hips and haws, watercress, fungi, the larger and softer leaf buds. Nostoc, the vegetable substance called fallen stars by country folk, the fleshy, juicy, asparagus-like rhizomes or subterranean stems of the labiati and like plants, as well as other delicacies of the vegetable kingdom. He had birds' eggs, young birds, and the honey and honeycomb of wild bees. He had newts, snails, and frogs, the two latter delicacies are still highly esteemed in Normandy and Brittany. He had fish, dead and alive, and freshwater mussels. He could easily catch fish with his hands and paddle and dive for and trap them. By the seaside he would have fish, mollusca, and seaweed. He would have many of the larger birds and smaller mammals, which he could easily secure by throwing stones and sticks, or by setting simple snares. He would have the snake, the slowworm, and the crayfish. He would have various grubs and insects, the large larvae of beetles and various caterpillars. The taste for caterpillars still survives in China, where they are sold in dried bundles in the markets. A chief and highly nourishing object of food would doubtlessly be bones smashed up into a stiff and gritty paste. A fact of great importance is this, primeval man would not be particular about having his flesh food over fresh. He would constantly find it in a dead state, and, if semi-putrid, he would relish it nonetheless, the taste for high or half-putrid game still survives. If driven by hunger and hard-pressed, he would perhaps sometimes eat his weaker companions or unhealthy children who happened to be feeble or unsightly or burdensome. The larger animals in a weak and dying state would no doubt be much sought for. When these were not forthcoming, dead and half-rotten examples would be made to suffice. An unpleasant odor would not be objected to, it is not objected to now in many continental hotels. The savages sat huddled close together round their fire, with fruits, bones, and half-putrid flesh. We can imagine the old man and his women twitching the skin of their shoulders, brows, and muzzles as they were annoyed or bitten by flies or other insects. We can imagine the large human nostrils, indicative of keen scent, giving rapidly repeated sniffs at the foul meat before it was consumed. The bad odor of the meat, and the various other disgusting odors belonging to a haunt of savages, being not in the least disapproved. Man at that time was not a degraded animal, for he had never been higher. He was therefore an exalted animal, and, low as we esteem him now, he yet represented the highest stage of development of the animal kingdom of his time. That is at least an acceptable sketch of a Neanderthal squatting place. But before extinction overtook them, even the Neanderthalers learnt much and went far. Whatever the older Paleolithic men did with their dead, there is reason to suppose that the later Homo neanderthalensis buried some individuals at least with respect and ceremony. 
One of the best-known Neanderthal skeletons is that of a youth who apparently had been deliberately interred. He had been placed in a sleeping posture, head on the right forearm. The head lay on a number of flint fragments carefully piled together, pillow fashion. A big hand axe lay near his head, and around him were numerous charred and split ox bones, as though there had been a feast or an offering. To this appearance of burial during the later Neanderthal age we shall return when we are considering the ideas that were inside the heads of primitive men. This sort of men may have wandered, squatted about their fires, and died in Europe for a period extending over 100,000 years, if we assume, that is, that the Heidelberg jawbone belongs to a member of the species. A period so vast that all the subsequent history of our race becomes a thing of yesterday. Along its own line this species of men was accumulating a dim tradition, and working out its limited possibilities. Its thick skull imprisoned its brain, and to the end it was low-browed and brutish. Section 3. When the Dutch discovered Tasmania, they found a detached human race not very greatly advanced beyond this lower Paleolithic stage. But over most of the world the lower Paleolithic culture had developed into a more complicated and higher life twenty or thirty thousand years ago. The Tasmanians were not racially Neanderthalers. Their brain cases, their neck bones, their jaws and teeth, show that, they had no Neanderthal affinities, they were of the same species as ourselves. There can be little doubt that throughout the hundreds of centuries during which the scattered little groups of Neanderthal men were all that represented men in Europe, real men, of our own species, in some other part of the world, were working their way along parallel lines from much the same stage as the Neanderthalers ended at, and which the Tasmanians preserved, to a higher level of power and achievement. The Tasmanians, living under unstimulating conditions, remote from any other human competition or example, lagged behind the rest of the human brotherhood. About two hundred centuries ago or earlier, real men of our own species, if not of our own race, came drifting into the European area. X. The later post-glacial Paleolithic men, the first true men. Later Paleolithic Age. Section 1. The coming of men like ourselves. Section 2. Subdivision of the Later Paleolithic. Section 3. The earliest true men were splendid savages. Section 4. Hunters give place to herdsmen. Section 5. No submen in America. Section 1. The Neanderthal type of man prevailed in Europe at least for tens of thousands of years. For ages that make all history seem a thing of yesterday, these nearly human creatures prevailed. If the Heidelberg jaw was that of a Neanderthaler, and if there is no error in the estimate of the age of that jaw, then the Neanderthal race lasted out for more than 200,000 years. Finally, between 40,000 and 25,000 years ago, as the fourth glacial age softened towards more temperate conditions, see map on. A different human type came upon the scene, and, it would seem, exterminated Homo neanderthalensis. This new type was probably developed in South Asia or North Africa, or in lands now submerged in the Mediterranean basin, and, as more remains are collected and evidence accumulates, men will learn more of their early stages. At present we can only guess where and how, through the slow ages, parallel with the Neanderthal cousin, these first true men arose out of some more ape-like progenitor. For hundreds of centuries they were acquiring skill of hand and limb, and power and bulk of brain, in that still unknown environment. They were already far above the Neanderthal level of achievement and intelligence, when first they come into our ken, and they had already split into two or more very distinctive races. These newcomers did not migrate into Europe in the strict sense of the word, but rather, as century by century the climate ameliorated, they followed the food and plants to which they were accustomed. As those spread into the new realms that opened to them. The ice was receding, vegetation was increasing, big game of all sorts was becoming more abundant. Step-like conditions, conditions of pasture and shrub, were bringing with them vast herds of wild horse. Ethnologists, students of race, class these new human races in one same species as ourselves, and with all human races subsequent to them, under one common specific name of Homo sapiens. 
they had quite human brain cases and hands. Their teeth and their necks were anatomically as ours are. Now here again, with every desire to be plain and explicit with the reader, we have still to trouble him with qualified statements and notes of interrogation. There is now an enormous literature about these earliest true men, the men of the later Paleolithic age, and it is still for the general reader a very confusing literature indeed. It is confusing because it is still confused at the source. We know of two distinct sorts of skeletal remains in this period, the first of these known as the Cro-Magnon race, and the second the Grimaldi race. But the great bulk of the human traces and appliances we find are either without human bones or with insufficient bones for us to define their associated physical type. There may have been many more distinct races than these two. There may have been intermediate types. In the grotto of Cro-Magnon it was that complete skeletons of one main type of these newer Paleolithic men, these true men, were first found, and so it is that they are spoken of as Cro-Magnards. Map showing Europe and Western Asia about the time the true men were replacing the Neanderthalers in Western Europe. These Cro-Magnards were a tall people with very broad faces, prominent noses, and, all things considered, astonishingly big brains. The brain capacity of the woman in the Cro-Magnon cave exceeded that of the average male today. Her head had been smashed by a heavy blow. There were also in the same cave with her the complete skeleton of an older man, nearly six feet high, the fragments of a child skeleton, and the skeletons of two young men. There were also flint implements and perforated seashells, used no doubt as ornaments. Such is one sample of the earliest true men. But at the Grimaldi cave, near Mentone, were discovered two skeletons also of the later Paleolithic period, but of a widely contrasted type, with negroid characteristics that point rather to the negroid type. There can be no doubt that we have to deal in this period with at least two, and probably more, highly divergent races of true men. They may have overlapped in time, or Cro-Magnards may have followed the Grimaldi race, and either or both may have been contemporary with the late Neanderthal men. Various authorities have very strong opinions upon these points, but they are, at most, opinions. The whole story is further fogged at present by our inability to distinguish, in the absence of skeletons, which race has been at work in any particular case. In what follows the reader will ask of this or that particular statement, yes, but is this the Cro-Magnard or the Grimaldi man or some other that you are writing about? To which in most cases the honest answer is, as yet we do not know. Confessedly our account of the newer Paleolithic is a jumbled account. There are probably two or three concurrent and only roughly similar histories of these newer Paleolithic men as yet, inextricably mixed up together. Some authorities appear to favor the Cro-Magnards unduly and to dismiss the Grimaldi people with as little as possible of the record. The appearance of these truly human post-glacial Paleolithic peoples was certainly an enormous leap forward in the history of mankind. Both of these main races had a human forebrain, a human hand, an intelligence very like our own. They dispossessed Homo neanderthalensis from his caverns and his stone quarries. And they agreed with modern ethnologists, it would seem, in regarding him as a different species. Unlike most savage conquerors, who take the women of the defeated side for their own and interbreed with them, it would seem that the true men would have nothing to do with the Neanderthal race, women or men. There is no trace of any intermixture between the races, in spite of the fact that the newcomers, being also flint users, were establishing themselves in the very same spots that their predecessors had occupied. We know nothing of the appearance of the Neanderthal man, but this absence of intermixture seems to suggest an extreme hairiness, an ugliness, or a repulsive strangeness in his appearance over and above his low forehead, his beetle brows, his ape neck, and his inferior stature. Or he, and she, may have been too fierce to tame. Says Sir Harry Johnston, in a survey of the rise of modern man in his views and reviews, the dim racial remembrance of such gorilla-like monsters, with cunning brains, shambling gait, hairy bodies, strong teeth, and possibly cannibalistic tendencies, may be the germ of the ogre in folklore. These true men of the Paleolithic age, who replaced the Neanderthalers, were coming into a milder climate, 
and although they used the caves and shelters of their predecessors, they lived largely in the open. They were hunting peoples, and some or all of them appear to have hunted the mammoth and the wild horse as well as the reindeer, bison, and aurochs. They ate much horse. At a great open-air camp at Sawyer, where they seem to have had animal gatherings for many centuries, it is estimated that there are the bones of 100,000 horses, besides reindeer, mammoth, and bison bones. They probably followed herds of horses, the little bearded ponies of that age, as these moved after pasture. They hung about on the flanks of the herd, and became very wise about its habits and dispositions. A large part of these men's lives must have been spent in watching animals. Whether they tamed and domesticated the horse is still an open question. Perhaps they learned to do so by degrees as the centuries passed. At any rate, we find late Paleolithic drawings of horses with marks about the heads that are strongly suggestive of bridles, and there exists a carving of a horse's head showing what is perhaps a rope of twisted skin or tendon. But even if they tamed the horse, it is still more doubtful whether they rode it or had much use for it when it was tamed. The horse they knew was a wild pony with a beard under its chin, not up to carrying a man for any distance. It is improbable that these men had yet learnt the rather unnatural use of animals' milk as food. If they tamed the horse at last, it was the only animal they seemed to have tamed. They had no dogs, and they had little to do with any sort of domesticated sheep or cattle. It greatly aids us to realize their common humanity that these earliest true men could draw. Both races, it would seem, drew astonishingly well. They were by all standard savages, but they were artistic savages. They drew better than any of their successors down to the beginnings of history. They drew and painted on the cliffs and cave walls that they had wrested from the Neanderthal men. And the surviving drawings come to the ethnologist, puzzling over bones and scraps, with the effect of a plain message shining through guesswork and darkness. They drew on bones and antlers, they carved little figures. These late Paleolithic people not only drew remarkably well for our information, and with an increasing skill as the centuries passed, but they have also left us other information about their lives and their graves. They buried. They buried their dead, often with ornaments, weapons, and food, they used a lot of color in the burial, and evidently painted the body. From that one may infer that they painted their bodies during life. Paint was a big fact in their lives. They were inveterate painters, they used black, brown, red, yellow, and white pigments, and the pigments they used endure to this day in the caves of France and Spain. Of all modern races, none have shown so pictorial a disposition. The nearest approach to it has been among the American Indians. These drawings and paintings of the later Paleolithic people went on through a long period of time, and present wide fluctuations in artistic merit. We give here some early sketches, from which we learn of the interest taken by these early men in the bison, horse, ibex, cave bear, and reindeer. In its early stages the drawing is often primitive like the drawing of clever children. Quadrupeds are usually drawn with one hind leg and one foreleg, as children draw them to this day. The legs on the other side were too much for the artist's technique. Possibly the first drawings began as children's drawings begin, out of idle scratchings. The savage scratched with a flint on a smooth rock surface, and was reminded of some line or gesture. But their solid carvings are at least as old as their first pictures. The earlier drawings betray a complete incapacity to group animals. As the centuries progressed, more skillful artists appeared. The representation of beasts became at last astonishingly vivid and like. But even at the crest of their artistic time they still drew in profile as children do. Perspective and the foreshortening needed for back and front views were too much for them. They rarely drew themselves. The vast majority of their drawings represent animals. The mammoth and the horse are among the commonest themes. Some of the people, whether Grimaldi people or Cro-Magnon people, also made little ivory and soapstone statuettes, and among these are some very fat female figures. These latter suggest the physique of Grimaldi rather than of Cro-Magnon artists. They are like Bushman women. 
The human sculpture of the earlier times inclined to caricature, and generally such human figures as they represent are far below the animal studies in vigor and veracity. Later on there was more grace and less coarseness in the human representations. One little ivory head discovered is that of a girl with an elaborate coiffure. These people at a later stage also scratched and engraved designs on ivory and bone. Some of the most interesting groups of figures are carved very curiously round bone, and especially round rods of deer bone, so that it is impossible to see the entire design altogether. Figures have also been found modeled in clay, although no Paleolithic people made any use of pottery. Many of the paintings are found in the depths of unlit caves. They are often difficult of access. The artists must have employed lamps to do their work, and shallow soapstone lamps in which fat could have been burnt have been found. Whether the seeing of these cavern paintings was in some way ceremonial or under what circumstances they were seen, we are now altogether at a loss to imagine. Section 2 Archaeologists distinguish at present three chief stages in the history of these newer Paleolithic men in Europe, and we must name these stages here. But it may be as well to note at the same time that it is a matter of the utmost difficulty to distinguish which of two deposits in different places is the older or newer. We may very well be dealing with the work of more or less contemporary in different races when we think we are dealing with successive ones. We are dealing, the reader must bear in mind, with little disconnected patches of material, a few score altogether. The earliest stage usually distinguished by the experts is the Aurignacian, from the Grotto of Aurignac. It is characterized by very well-made flint implements, and by a rapid development of art and more particularly of statuettes and wall paintings. The most esteemed of the painted caves is ascribed to the latter part of this the first of the three subdivisions of the newer Paleolithic. The second subdivision of this period is called the Salutrian, from Saluter, and is distinguished particularly by the quality and beauty of its stone implements. Some of its razor-like blades are only equaled and not surpassed by the very best of the Neolithic work. They are of course unpolished, but the best specimens are as thin as steel blades and almost as sharp. Finally, it would seem, came the Magdalenian, from La Madeline, stage, in which the horse and reindeer were dwindling in numbers and the red deer coming into Europe. The stone implements are smaller, and there is a great quantity of bone harpoons, spearheads, needles, and the like. The hunters of the third and last stage of the later Paleolithic age appear to have supplemented a diminishing food supply by fishing. The characteristic art of the period consists of deep reliefs done upon bone and line engraving upon bone. It is to this period that the designs drawn round bones belong, and it has been suggested that these designs upon round bones were used to print colored designs upon leather. Some of the workmanship on bone was extraordinarily fine. Parkin quotes from de Mortillet, about the reindeer age, Magdalenian, bone needles, that they, are much superior to those of later, even historical, times, down to the Renaissance. The Romans, for example, never had needles comparable to those of the Magdalenian epoch. Time diagram showing the estimated duration of the true human periods. This time diagram again is on a larger scale than its predecessors. The time diagram on, if it were on this scale, would be nearly four feet long, and the diagram of the whole geological time on, between 500 and 5,000 feet long, or perhaps even as much as 10,000 feet long. It is quite impossible at present to guess at the relative lengths of these ages. We are not even positive about their relative relationship. Each lasted perhaps for four or five more thousand years, more than double the time from the Christian era to our own day. At last it would seem that circumstances began to turn altogether against these hunting newer Paleolithic people who had flourished for so long in Europe. They disappeared. New kinds of men appeared in Europe replacing them. These latter seem to have brought in bow and arrows, they had domesticated animals and cultivated the soil. A new way of living, the Neolithic way of living, spread over the European area. And the life of the reindeer age and of the races of reindeer men, the later Paleolithic men, after a reign vastly greater than the time between ourselves and the very earliest beginnings of recorded history, passed off the European stage. Section 3 
There is a disposition on the part of many writers to exaggerate the intellectual and physical qualities of these later Paleolithic men and make a wonder of them. Collectively considered, these people had remarkable gifts, but a little reflection will show they had almost as remarkable deficiencies. The tremendous advance they display upon their Neanderthalian predecessors and their special artistic gift must not blind us to their very obvious limitations. For all the quantity of their brains, the quality was narrow and special. They had vivid perceptions, an acute sense of animal form, they had the real artist's impulse to render, so far they were fully grown human beings. But that disposition to paint and draw is shown today by the Bushmen, by Californian Indians, and by Australian black fellows, it is not a mark of all-round high intellectual quality. The cumulative effect of their drawings and paintings is very great, but we must not make the mistake of crowding all these achievements together in our minds as though they had suddenly flashed out upon the world in a brief interval of time. Or as though they were all the achievements of one people. These races of reindeer men were in undisturbed possession of Western Europe for a period at least ten times as long as the interval between ourselves and the beginning of the Christian era. And through all that immense time they were free to develop and vary their life to its utmost possibilities. Their art constitutes their one claim to be accounted more than common savages. They were in close contact with animals, but they never seemed to have got to terms with any animal unless it was the horse. They had no dogs. They had no properly domesticated animals at all. They watched and drew and killed and ate. They do not seem to have cooked their food. Perhaps they scorched and grilled it, but they could not have done much more, because they had no cooking implements. Although they had clay available, and although there are several Paleolithic clay figures on record, they had no pottery. Although they had a great variety of flint and bone implements, they never rose to the possibilities of using timber for permanent shelters or such like structures. They never made hafted axes or the like that would enable them to deal with timber. There is a suggestion in some of the drawings of offensive stakes in which a mammoth seems to be entangled. But here we may be dealing with superimposed scratchings. They had no buildings. It is not even certain that they had tents or huts. They may have had simple skin tents. Some of the drawings seem to suggest as much. It is doubtful if they knew of the bow. They left no good arrowheads behind them. Certain of their implements are said to be arrow straighteners by distinguished authorities, but that is about as much evidence as we have of arrows. They may have used sharpened sticks as arrows. They had no cultivation of grain or vegetables of any sort. Their women were probably squaws, smaller than the men, the earlier statuettes represent them as grossly fat, almost as the Bushman women are often fat today. But this may not be true of the Cro-Magnards. They clothed themselves, it would seem, in skins, if they clothed themselves at all. These skins they prepared with skill and elaboration, and towards the end of the age they used bone needles, no doubt to sew these pelts. One may guess pretty safely that they painted these skins, and it has even been supposed, printed off designs upon them from bone cylinders. But their garments were mere wraps, there are no clasps or catches to be found. They do not seem to have used grass or such like fiber for textiles. Their statuettes are naked. They were, in fact, except for a fur wrap in cold weather, naked painted savages. These hunters lived on open steppes for two hundred centuries or so, ten times the length of the Christian era. They were, perhaps, overtaken by the growth of the European forests, as the climate became milder and damper. When the wild horse and the reindeer diminished in Europe, and a newer type of human culture, with a greater power over food supply, a greater tenacity of settlement, and probably a larger social organization, arose. The reindeer men had to learn fresh ways of living or disappear. How far they learnt and mingled their strain with the new European populations, and how far they went under we cannot yet guess. Opinions differ widely. Wright lays much stress on the great hiatus between the Paleolithic and Neolithic remains, while Osborne traces the likeness of the former in several living populations. In the region of the Dew and of the Dordogne in France, many individuals are to be met with to this day with skulls of the Cro-Magnon type. 
apparently the Grimaldi type of men has disappeared altogether from Europe. Whether the Cro-Magnon type of men mingled completely with the Neolithic peoples, or whether they remained distinct and held their own in favorable localities to the north and west, following the reindeer over Siberia and towards America, which at that time was continuous with Siberia, or whether they disappeared altogether from the world, is a matter that can be only speculated about at present. There is not enough evidence for a judgment. Possibly they mingled to a certain extent. There is little to prevent our believing that they survived without much intermixture for a long time in North Asia, that pockets of them remained here and there in Europe, that there is a streak of their blood in most European peoples today. And that there is a much stronger streak, if not a predominant strain, in the Mongolian and American races. Section 4 It was about 12,000 or fewer years ago that, with the spread of forests and a great change of the fauna, the long prevalence of the hunting life in Europe drew to its end. Reindeer vanished. Changing conditions frequently bring with them new diseases. There may have been prehistoric pestilences. For many centuries there may have been no men in Britain or Central Europe, right? For a time there were in Southern Europe drifting communities of some little-known people who are called the Azilians. They may have been transition generations, they may have been a different race. We do not know. Some authorities incline to the view that the Azilians were the first wave of a race which, as we shall see later, has played a great part in populating Europe, the dark white or Mediterranean or Iberian race. These Azilian people have left behind them a multitude of pebbles, roughly daubed with markings of an unknown purport, see illustrated. The use or significance of these Azilian pebbles is still a profound mystery. Was this some sort of token writing? Were they counters in some game? Did the Azilians play with these pebbles or tell a story with them, as imaginative children will do with bits of wood and stone nowadays? At present we are unable to cope with any of these questions. We will not deal here with the other various peoples who left their scanty traces in the world during the close of the New Paleolithic period, the spread of the forests where formerly there had been steppes, and the wane of the hunters, some ten. 000 or 12,000 years ago. We will go on to describe the new sort of human community that was now spreading over the northern hemisphere, whose appearance marks what is called the Neolithic Age. The map of the world was assuming something like its present outlines, the landscape and the flora and fauna were taking on their existing characteristics. The prevailing animals in the spreading woods of Europe were the royal stag, the great ox, and the bison, the mammoth and the musk ox had gone. The great ox, or aurochs, is now extinct, but it survived in the German forests up to the time of the Roman Empire. It was never domesticated. It stood eleven feet high at the shoulder, as high as an elephant. There were still lions in the Balkan Peninsula, and they remained there until about 1000 or 1200 BC. The lions of Württemberg and South Germany in those days were twice the size of the modern lion. South Russia and Central Asia were thickly wooded then, and there were elephants in Mesopotamia and Syria, and a fauna in Algeria that was tropical African in character. Hitherto men in Europe had never gone farther north than the Baltic Sea or the English Midlands, but now Ireland, the Scandinavian Peninsula, and perhaps Great Russia were becoming possible regions for human occupation. There are no Paleolithic remains in Sweden or Norway, nor in Ireland or Scotland. Man, when he entered these countries, was apparently already at the Neolithic stage of social development. Section 5 Nor is there any convincing evidence of man in America before the end of the Pleistocene. The same relaxation of the climate that permitted the retreat of the reindeer hunters into Russia and Siberia, as the Neolithic tribes advanced, may have allowed them to wander across the land that is now cut by Bering Strait. And so reach the American continent. They spread thence southward, age by age. When they reached South America, they found the giant sloth, the megatherium, the glyptodon, and many other extinct creatures, still flourishing. The glyptodon was a monstrous South American armadillo, and a human skeleton has been found by Roth buried beneath its huge tortoise-like shell. All the human remains in America, even the earliest, it is to be noted, are of an Amerindian character. 
In America there does not seem to have been any preceding races of submen. Man was fully man when he entered America. The old world was the nursery of the sub-races of mankind. 11. Neolithic Man in Europe Section 1. The Age of Cultivation Begins Section 2. Where did the Neolithic culture arise? Section 3. Everyday Neolithic Life Section 4. How did sewing begin? Section 5. Primitive Trade Section 6. The Flooding of the Mediterranean Valley Section 1. The Neolithic phase of human affairs began in Europe about 10,000 or 12,000 years ago. But probably men had reached the Neolithic stage elsewhere some thousands of years earlier. Neolithic men came slowly into Europe from the south or southeast as the reindeer and the open steppes gave way to forest and modern European conditions. The Neolithic stage in culture is characterized by, 1, the presence of polished stone implements, and in particular the stone axe, which was perforated so as to be the more effectually fastened to a wooden handle, and which was probably used rather for working wood than in conflict. There are also abundant arrowheads. The fact that some implements are polished does not preclude the presence of great quantities of implements of unpolished stone. But there are differences in the make between even the unpolished tools of the Neolithic and of the Paleolithic period. 2. The beginning of a sort of agriculture, and the use of plants and seeds. But at first there are abundant evidences that hunting was still of great importance in the Neolithic age. Neolithic man did not at first sit down to his agriculture. He took snatch crops. He settled later. 3. Pottery and proper cooking. The horse is no longer eaten. 4. Domesticated animals. The dog appears very early. The Neolithic man had domesticated cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs. He was a huntsman turned herdsman of the herds he once hunted. 5. Plating and weaving. These Neolithic people probably migrated into Europe in the same way that the reindeer men had migrated before them, that is to say, generation by generation and century by century, as the climate changed, they spread after their accustomed food. They were not nomads. Nomadism, like civilization, had still to be developed. At present we are quite unable to estimate how far the Neolithic peoples were newcomers and how far their arts were developed or acquired by the descendants of some of the hunters and fishers of the later Paleolithic age. Whatever our conclusions in that matter, this much we may say with certainty. There is no great break, no further sweeping away of one kind of man and replacement by another kind between the appearance of the Neolithic way of living in our own time. There are invasions, conquests, extensive emigrations and intermixtures, but the races as a whole carry on and continue to adapt themselves to the areas into which they began to settle in the opening of the Neolithic age. The Neolithic men of Europe were white men ancestral to the modern Europeans. They may have been of a darker complexion than many of their descendants. Of that we cannot speak with certainty. But there is no real break in culture from their time onward until we reach the age of coal, steam, and power-driven machinery that began in the 18th century. After a long time gold, the first known of the metals, appears among the bone ornaments with jet and amber. Irish Neolithic remains are particularly rich in gold. Then, perhaps 6,000 or 7,000 years ago in Europe, Neolithic people began to use copper in certain centers, making out of it implements of much the same pattern as their stone ones. They cast the copper in molds made to the shape of the stone implements. Possibly they first found native copper and hammered it into shape. Later, we will not venture upon figures, men had found out how to get copper from its ore. Perhaps, as Lord Avery suggested, they discovered the secret of smelting by the chance putting of lumps of copper or among the ordinary stones with which they built the fire pits they used for cooking. In China, Hungary, Cornwall, and elsewhere copper ore and tinstone occur in the same veins. It is a very common association, and so, rather through dirtiness than skill, the ancient smelters, it may be, hit upon the harder and better bronze, which is an alloy of copper and tin. Bronze is not only harder than copper, 
but the mixture of tin and copper is more fusible and easier to reduce. The so-called pure copper implements usually contain a small proportion of tin, and there are no tin implements known, nor very much evidence to show that early men knew of tin as a separate metal. The plant of a prehistoric copper smelter has been found in Spain, and the material of bronze foundries in various localities. The method of smelting revealed by these finds carries out Lord Avebury's suggestion. In India, where zinc and copper ore occur together, brass, which is an alloy of the two metals, was similarly hit upon. So slight was the change in fashions and methods produced by the appearance of bronze, that for a long time such bronze axes and so forth as were made were cast in molds to the shape of the stone implements they were superseding. Finally, perhaps as early as 3,000 years ago in Europe, and even earlier in Asia Minor, men began to smelt iron. Once smelting was known to men, there is no great marvel in the finding of iron. They smelted iron by blowing up a charcoal fire, and wrought it by heating and hammering. They produced it at first in comparatively small pieces, its appearance worked a gradual revolution in weapons and implements. But it did not suffice to change the general character of men's surroundings. Much the same daily life that was being led by the more settled Neolithic men 10,000 years ago was being led by peasants in out-of-the-way places all over Europe at the beginning of the 18th century. People talk of the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age in Europe, but it is misleading to put these ages as if they were of equal importance in history. Much truer is it to say that there was. 1. An early Paleolithic Age, of vast duration. 2. A later Paleolithic Age, that lasted not a tithe of the time. And, 3. The Age of Cultivation, the Age of the White Men in Europe, which began 10,000 or at most 12,000 years ago, of which the Neolithic period was the beginning, and which is still going on. Section 2. We do not know yet the region in which the ancestors of the white and whitish Neolithic peoples worked their way up from the Paleolithic stage of human development. Probably it was somewhere about southwestern Asia, or in some region now submerged beneath the Mediterranean Sea or the Indian Ocean, that, while the Neanderthal men still lived their hard lives in the bleak climate of a glaciated Europe. The ancestors of the white men developed the rude arts of their later Paleolithic period. But they do not seem to have developed the artistic skill of their more northerly kindred, the European later Paleolithic races. And through the hundred centuries or so while reindeer men were living under comparatively unprogressive conditions upon the steppes of France, Germany, and Spain, these more favored and progressive people to the south were mastering agriculture. Learning to develop their appliances, taming the dog, domesticating cattle, and, as the climate to the north mitigated and the equatorial climate grew more tropical, spreading northward. All these early chapters of our story have yet to be disinterred. They will probably be found in Asia Minor, Persia, Arabia, India, or North Africa, or they lie beneath the Mediterranean waters. Twelve thousand years ago, or thereabouts, we are still too early for anything but the roughest chronology, Neolithic peoples were scattered all over Europe, North Africa, and Asia. They were peoples at about the level of many of the Polynesian islanders of the last century, and they were the most advanced peoples in the world. Section 3. It will be of interest here to give a brief account of the life of the European Neolithic people before the appearance of metals. We get our light upon that life from various sources. They scattered their refuse about, and in some places, e.g. On the Danish coast, it accumulated in great heaps, known as the kitchen middens. They buried some of their people, but not the common herd, with great care and distinction, and made huge heaps of earth over their sepulchres. These heaps are the barrows or dolmens which contribute a feature to the European, Indian, and American scenery in many districts to this day. In connection with these mounds, or independently of them, they set up great stones, megaliths, either singly or in groups, of which Stonehenge in Wiltshire and Karnak in Brittany are among the best known examples. In various places their villages are still traceable. One fruitful source of knowledge about Neolithic life comes from Switzerland, and was first revealed by the very dry winter of 1854, when the water level of one of the lakes, sinking to an unheard of lowness. 
revealed the foundations of prehistoric pile dwellings of the Neolithic and Early Bronze Ages, built out over the water after the fashion of similar homes that exist today in Celebes and elsewhere. Not only were the timbers of those ancient platforms preserved, but a great multitude of wooden, bone, stone, and earthenware utensils and ornaments, remains of food and the like, were found in the peaty accumulations below them. Even pieces of net and garments have been recovered. Similar lake dwellings existed in Scotland, Ireland, and elsewhere, there are well-known remains at Glastonbury in Somersetshire. In Ireland lake dwellings were inhabited from prehistoric times up to the days when O'Neill of Tyrone was fighting against the English before the plantation of Scotch colonists to replace the Irish in Ulster in the reign of James I of England. These lake villages had considerable defensive value, and there was a sanitary advantage in living over flowing water. Probably these Neolithic Swiss pile dwellings did not shelter the largest communities that existed in those days. They were the homes of small patriarchal groups. Elsewhere upon fertile plains and in more open country there were probably already much larger assemblies of homes than in those mountain valleys. There are traces of such a large community of families in Wiltshire in England, for example, the remains of the stone circle of Avebury near Silbury Mound were once the finest megalithic ruin in Europe. It consisted of two circles of stones surrounded by a larger circle and a ditch, and covering altogether twenty-eight and a half acres. From it two avenues of stones, each a mile and a half long, ran west and south on either side of Silbury Hill. Silbury Hill is the largest prehistoric artificial mound in England. The dimensions of this centre of a faith and a social life now forgotten altogether by men indicate the concerted efforts and interests of a very large number of people. Widely scattered though they may have been over the west and south and centre of England. Possibly they assembled at some particular season of the year in a primitive sort of fair. The whole community lent a hand in building the mounds and hauling the stones. The Swiss pile dwellers, on the contrary, seem to have lived in practically self-contained villages. These lake village people were considerably more advanced in methods and knowledge, and probably much later in time than the early Neolithic people who accumulated the shell mounds, known as kitchen middens, on the Danish and Scotch coasts. These kitchen midden folk may have been as early as 10,000 BC or earlier, the lake dwellings were probably occupied continuously from 1500 or 4000 BC down almost to historic times. Those early kitchen midden people were among the most barbaric of Neolithic peoples, their stone axes were rough, and they had no domesticated animal except the dog. The lake dwellers, on the other hand, had, in addition to the dog, which was of a medium-sized breed, oxen, goats, and sheep. Later on, as they were approaching the Bronze Age, they got swine. The remains of cattle and goats prevail in their debris, and, having regard to the climate and country about them, it seems probable that these beasts were sheltered in the buildings upon the piles in winter, and that fodder was stored for them. Probably the beasts lived in the same houses with the people, as the men and beasts do now in Swiss chalets. The people in the houses possibly milked the cows and goats, and milk perhaps played as important a part in their economy as it does in that of the mountain Swiss of today. But of that we are not sure at present. Milk is not a natural food for adults, it must have seemed queer stuff to take at first, and it may have been only after much breeding that a continuous supply of milk was secured from cows and goats. Some people think that the use of milk, cheese, butter, and other milk products came later into human life when men became nomadic. The writer is, however, disposed to give the Neolithic men credit for having discovered milking. The milk, if they did use it, and, no doubt, in that case sour curdled milk also, but not well-made cheese and butter, they must have kept in earthenware pots, for they had pottery. Though it was roughly handmade pottery and not the shapely product of the potter's wheel. They eked out this food supply by hunting. They killed and ate red deer and roe deer, bison and wild boar. And they ate the fox, a rather high-flavored meat, and not what any one would eat in a world of plenty. Oddly enough, they do not seem to have eaten the hare, although it was available as food. They are supposed to have avoided eating it, as some savages are said to avoid eating it to this day, 
because they feared that the flesh of so timid a creature might make them, by a sort of infection, cowardly. Of their agricultural methods we know very little. No plows and no hoes have been found. They were of wood and have perished. Neolithic men cultivated and ate wheat, barley, and millet, but they knew nothing of oats or rye. Their grain they roasted, ground between stones and stored in pots, to be eaten when needed. And they made exceedingly solid and heavy bread, because round flat slabs of it have been got out of these deposits. Apparently they had no yeast. If they had no yeast, then they had no fermented drink. One sort of barley that they had is the sort that was cultivated by the ancient Greeks, Romans, and Egyptians, and they also had an Egyptian variety of wheat, showing that their ancestors had brought or derived this cultivation from the southeast. The center of diffusion of wheat was somewhere in the eastern Mediterranean region. A wild form is still found in the neighborhood of Emt Hermon, see footnote to ch 16, section 1. When the lake dwellers sowed their little patches of wheat in Switzerland, they were already following the immemorial practice of mankind. The seed must have been brought age by age from that distant center of diffusion. In the ancestral lands of the southeast men had already been sowing wheat perhaps for thousands of years. Those lake dwellers also ate peas, and crab apples, the only apples that then existed in the world. Cultivation and selection had not yet produced the apple of today. They dressed chiefly in skins, but they also made a rough cloth of flax. Fragments of that flaxen cloth have been discovered. Their nets were made of flax. They had as yet no knowledge of hemp and hempen rope. With the coming of bronze, their pins and ornaments increased in number. There is reason to believe they set great store upon their hair, wearing it in large shocks with pins of bone and afterwards of metal. To judge from the absence of realistic carvings or engravings or paintings, they either did not decorate their garments or decorated them with plaids, spots, interlacing designs, or similar conventional ornament. Before the coming of bronze there is no evidence of stools or tables, the Neolithic people probably squatted on their clay floors. There were no cats in these lake dwellings, no mice or rats had yet adapted themselves to human dwellings. The cluck of the hen was not as yet added to the sounds of human life, nor the domestic egg to its diet. The chief tool and weapon of Neolithic man was his axe, his next the bow and arrow. His arrow heads were of flint, beautifully made, and he lashed them tightly to their shafts. Probably he prepared the ground for his sowing with a pole, or a pole upon which he had stuck a stag's horn. Fish he hooked or harpooned. These implements no doubt stood about in the interior of the house, from the walls of which hung his fowling nets. On the floor, which was of clay or trodden cow dung, after the fashion of hut floors in India today, stood pots and jars and woven baskets containing grain, milk, and such like food. Some of the pots and pans hung by rope loops to the walls. At one end of the room, and helping to keep it warm in winter by their animal heat, stabled the beasts. The children took the cows and goats out to graze, and brought them in at night before the wolves and bears came prowling. Hut urns, the first probably representing a lake dwelling. After Lubbock. Since Neolithic man had the bow, he probably also had stringed instruments, for the rhythmic twanging of a bowstring seems almost inevitably to lead to that. He also had earthenware drums across which skins were stretched. Perhaps also he made drums by stretching skins over hollow tree stems. We do not know when man began to sing, but evidently he was making music, and since he had words, songs were no doubt being made. To begin with, perhaps, he just let his voice loose as one may hear Italian peasants now behind their plows singing songs without words. After dark in the winter he sat in his house and talked and sang and made implements by touch rather than sight. His lighting must have been poor, and chiefly firelight, but there was probably always some fire in the village, summer or winter. Fire was too troublesome to make for men to be willing to let it out readily. Sometimes a great disaster happened to those pile villages, the fire got free, and they were burnt out. The Swiss deposits contain clear evidence of such catastrophes. 
All this we gather from the remains of the Swiss pile dwellings, and such was the character of the human life that spread over Europe, coming from the south and from the east with the forests as, ten thousand or twelve thousand years ago. The reindeer and the reindeer men passed away. It is evident that we have here a way of life already separated by a great gap of thousands of years of invention from its original Paleolithic stage. The steps by which it rose from that condition we can only guess at. From being a hunter hovering upon the outskirts of flocks and herds of wild cattle and sheep, and from being a co-hunter with the dog. Man by insensible degrees may have developed a sense of proprietorship in the beasts and struck up a friendship with his canine competitor. He learned to turn the cattle when they wandered too far, he brought his better brain to bear to guide them to fresh pasture. He hemmed the beasts into valleys and enclosures where he could be sure to find them again. He fed them when they starved, and so slowly he tamed them. Perhaps his agriculture began with the storage of fodder. He reaped, no doubt, before he sowed. The Paleolithic ancestor away in that unknown land of origin to the southeast first supplemented the precarious meat supply of the hunter by eating roots and fruits and wild grains. Man storing graminiferous grasses for his cattle might easily come to beat out the grain for himself. Section 4 How did man learn to sow in order that he might reap? We may hesitate here to guess at the answer to that question. But a very great deal has been made of the fact that wherever sowing occurs among primitive people in any part of the world, it is accompanied by a human sacrifice or by some ceremony which may be interpreted as the mitigation and vestige of an ancient sacrificial custom. This is the theme of Sir J. G. Fraser's Golden Bough. From this it has been supposed that the first sowings were in connection with the burial of a human being, either through wild grain being put with the dead body as food or through the scattering of grain over the body. It may be argued that there is only one reason why man should have disturbed the surface of the earth before he took to agriculture, and that was to bury his dead. And in order to bury a dead body and make a mound over it, it was probably necessary for him to disturb the surface over a considerable area. Neolithic man's chief apparatus for mound making consisted of picks of deer's horn and shovels of their shoulder blades, and with this he would have found great difficulty in making a deep excavation. Nor do we find such excavations beside the barrows. Instead of going down into tough subsoil, the mound makers probably scraped up some of the surface soil and carried it to the mound. All this seems probable, and it gives just that wide area of bared and turned over earth upon which an eared grass, such as barley, millet, or primitive wheat, might have seeded and grown. Moreover, the mound makers, being busy with the mound, would not have time to hunt meat, and if they were accustomed to store and eat wild grain, they would be likely to scatter grain. And the grain would be blown by the wind out of their rude vessels over the area they were disturbing. And if they were bringing up seed in any quantity in baskets and pots to bury with the corpse, some of it might easily blow and be scattered over the fresh earth. Returning later to the region of the mound, they would discover an exceptionally vigorous growth of food grain, and it would be a natural thing to associate it with the buried person, and regard it as a consequence of his death and burial. He had given them back the grain they gave him increased a hundredfold. At any rate, there is apparently all over the world a traceable association in ancient ceremonial and in the minds of barbaric people between the death and burial of a person and the ploughing and sowing of grain. From this it is assumed that there was once a worldwide persuasion that it was necessary that someone should be buried before a crop could be sown, and that out of this persuasion arose a practice and tradition of human sacrifice at seed time. Which has produced profound effects in the religious development of the race. There may have been some idea of refreshing the earth by a blood draft or revivifying it with the life of the sacrificed person. We state these considerations here merely as suggestions that have been made of the way in which the association of seed time and sacrifice arose. They are, at the best, speculations. They have a considerable vogue at the present time, and we have to note them, but we have neither the space nor the time here to examine them at length. The valuable accumulations of suggestions due to the industry and ingenuity of Sir J. G. Fraser still await a thorough critical examination, and to his works the reader must go for the indefatigable expansion of this idea. Section 5. 
All these early beginnings must have taken place far back in time, and in regions of the world that have still to be effectively explored by the archaeologists. They were probably going on in Asia or Africa, in what is now the bed of the Mediterranean, or in the region of the Indian Ocean, while the reindeer man was developing his art in Europe. The Neolithic men who drifted over Europe and Western Asia 12,000 or 10,000 years ago were long past these beginnings, they were already close, a few thousand years, to the dawn of written tradition and the remembered history of mankind. Without any very great shock or break, bronze came at last into human life, giving a great advantage in warfare to those tribes who first obtained it. Written history had already begun before weapons of iron came into Europe to supersede bronze. Already in those days a sort of primitive trade had sprung up. Bronze and bronze weapons, and such rare and hard stones as jade, gold because of its plastic and ornamental possibilities, and skins and flax net and cloth, were being swapped and stolen and passed from hand to hand over great stretches of country. Salt also was probably being traded. On a meat dietary men can live without salt, but grain-consuming people need it just as herbivorous animals need it. Hop says that bitter tribal wars have been carried on by the desert tribes of the Sudan in recent years for the possession of the salt deposits between Fezan and Merzak. To begin with, barter, blackmail, tribute, and robbery by violence passed into each other by insensible degrees. Men got what they wanted by such means as they could. Section 6 So far we have been telling of a history without events, a history of ages and periods and stages in development. But before we conclude this portion of the human story, we must record what was probably an event of primary importance and at first perhaps of tragic importance to developing mankind. And that was the breaking in of the Atlantic waters to the great Mediterranean valley. The reader must keep in mind that we are endeavoring to give him plain statements that he can take hold of comfortably. But both in the matter of our time charts and the three maps we have given of prehistoric geography there is necessarily much speculative matter. We have dated the last glacial age and the appearance of the true men as about 40,000 or 35,000 years ago. Please bear that, about, in mind. The truth may be 60,000 or 20,000. But it is no good saying, a very long time, or ages, ago, because then the reader will not know whether we mean centuries or millions of years. And similarly in these maps we give, they represent not the truth, but something like the truth. The outline of the land was, some such outline. There were such seas and such land masses. But both Mr. Horobin, who has drawn these maps, and I, who have incited him to do so, have preferred to err on the timid side. We are not geologists enough to launch out into original research in these matters, and so we have stuck to the 40-fathom line and the recent deposits as our guides for our post-glacial map and for the map of 12,000 to 10,000 BC. But in one matter we have gone beyond these guides. It is practically certain that at the end of the last glacial age the Mediterranean was a couple of landlocked sea basins, not connected, or only connected by a torrential overflow river. The eastern basin was the fresher. It was fed by the Nile, the Adriatic River, the Red Sea River, and perhaps by a river that poured down amidst the mountains that are now the Greek archipelago from the very much bigger sea of Central Asia that then existed. Almost certainly human beings, and possibly even Neolithic men, wandered over that now lost Mediterranean valley. The reasons for believing this are very good and plain. To this day the Mediterranean is a sea of evaporation. The rivers that flow into it do not make up for the evaporation from its surface. There is a constant current of water pouring into the Mediterranean from the Atlantic, and another current streaming in from the Bosphorus and Black Sea. For the Black Sea gets more water than it needs from the big rivers that flow into it, it is an overflowing sea, while the Mediterranean is a thirsty sea. From which it must be plain that when the Mediterranean was cut off both from the Atlantic Ocean and the Black Sea it must have been a shrinking sea with its waters sinking to a much lower level than those of the ocean outside. This is the case of the Caspian Sea today. Still more so is it the case with the Dead Sea. But if this reasoning is sound, then where today roll the blue waters of the Mediterranean there must once have been great areas of land, and land with a very agreeable climate. 
This was probably the case during the last glacial age, and we do not know how near it was to our time when the change occurred that brought back the ocean waters into the Mediterranean basin. Certainly there must have been Grimaldi people, and perhaps even Azilian and Neolithic people going about in the valleys and forests of these regions that are now submerged. The Neolithic Dark Whites, the people of the Mediterranean race, may have gone far towards the beginnings of settlement and civilization in that great lost Mediterranean valley. Mr. W. B. Wright gives us some very stimulating suggestions here. He suggests that in the Mediterranean basin there were two lakes, one a freshwater lake, in the eastern depression, which drained into the other in the western depression. It is interesting to think what must have happened when the ocean level rose once more as a result of the dissipation of the ice sheets, and its waters began to pour over into the Mediterranean area. The inflow, small at first, must have ultimately increased to enormous dimensions, as the channel was slowly lowered by erosion and the ocean level slowly rose. If there were any unconsolidated materials on the sill of the strait, the result must have been a genuine debacle, and if we consider the length of time which even an enormous torrent would take to fill such a basin as that of the Mediterranean, we must conclude that this result was likely to have been attained in any case. Now, this may seem all the wildest speculation, but it is not entirely so, for if we examine a submarine contour map of the Straits of Gibraltar, we find there is an enormous valley running up from the Mediterranean deep, right through the Straits and trenching some distance out on to the Atlantic shelf. This valley or gorge is probably the work of the inflowing waters of the ocean at the termination of the period of interior drainage. This refilling of the Mediterranean, which by the rough chronology we are employing in this book may have happened somewhere between 30,000 and 10,000 BC, must have been one of the greatest single events in the prehistory of our race. If the later date is the truer, then, as the reader will see plainly enough after reading the next two chapters, the crude beginnings of civilization, the first lake dwellings and the first cultivation, were probably round that eastern Levantine lake into which there flowed not only the Nile, but the two great rivers that are now the Adriatic and the Red Sea. Suddenly the ocean waters began to break through over the westward hills and to pour in upon these primitive peoples, the lake that had been their home and friend became their enemy, its waters rose and never abetted, their settlements were submerged. The waters pursued them in their flight. Day by day and year by year the waters spread up the valleys and drove mankind before them. Many must have been surrounded and caught by the continually rising salt flood. It knew no check. It came faster and faster, it rose over the treetops, over the hills, until it had filled the whole basin of the present Mediterranean and until it lapped the mountain cliffs of Arabia and Africa. Far away, long before the dawn of history, this catastrophe occurred. 12. Early Thought Section 1. Primitive Philosophy Section 2. The Old Man in Religion Section 3. Fear and Hope in Religion Section 4. Stars and Seasons. Section 5. Storytelling and Mythmaking. Section 6. Complex Origins of Religion. Section 1. Before we go on to tell how 6,000 or 7,000 years ago men began to gather into the first towns and to develop something more than the loose knit tribes that had hitherto been their highest political association. Something must be said about the things that were going on inside these brains of which we have traced the growth and development through a period of 500,000 years from the Pithecanthropus stage. What was man thinking about himself and about the world in those remote days? At first he thought very little about anything but immediate things. At first he was busy thinking such things as, here is a bear, what shall I do? Or, there is a squirrel, how can I get it? Until language had developed to some extent there could have been little thinking beyond the range of actual experience, for language is the instrument of thought as bookkeeping is the instrument of business. It records and fixes and enables thought to get on to more and more complex ideas. It is the hand of the mind to hold and keep. Primordial man, before he could talk, probably saw very vividly, mimicked very cleverly, gestured, laughed, danced, and lived, without much speculation about whence he came or why he lived. 
He feared the dark, no doubt, and thunderstorms and big animals and queer things and whatever he dreamt about, and no doubt he did things to propitiate what he feared or to change his luck and please the imaginary powers in rock and beast and river. He made no clear distinction between animate and inanimate things, if a stick hurt him, he kicked it, if the river foamed and flooded, he thought it was hostile. His thought was probably very much at the level of a bright little contemporary boy of four or five. He had the same subtle unreasonableness of transition and the same limitations. But since he had little or no speech he would do little to pass on the fancies that came to him, and develop any tradition or concerted acts about them. The drawings even of late Paleolithic man do not suggest that he paid any attention to sun or moon or stars or trees. He was preoccupied only with animals and men. Probably he took day and night, sun and stars, trees and mountains, as being in the nature of things, as a child takes its meal times and its nursery staircase for granted. So far as we can judge, he drew no fantasies, no ghosts or anything of that sort. The reindeer men's drawings are fearless familiar things, with no hint about them of any religious or occult feelings. There is scarcely anything that we can suppose to be a religious or mystical symbol at all in his productions. No doubt he had a certain amount of what is called fetishism in his life. He did things we should now think unreasonable to produce desired ends, for that is all fetishism amounts to, it is only incorrect science based on guesswork or false analogy, and entirely different in its nature from religion. No doubt he was excited by his dreams, and his dreams mixed up at times in his mind with his waking impressions and puzzled him. Since he buried his dead, and since even the later Neanderthal men seem to have buried their dead, and apparently with food and weapons, it has been argued that he had a belief in a future life. But it is just as reasonable to suppose that early men buried their dead with food and weapons because they doubted if they were dead, which is not the same thing as believing them to have immortal spirits. And that their belief in their continuing vitality was reinforced by dreams of the departed. They may have ascribed a sort of werewolf existence to the dead, and wished to propitiate them. The reindeer man, we feel, was too intelligent and too like ourselves not to have had some speech, but quite probably it was not very serviceable for anything beyond direct statement or matter-of-fact narrative. He lived in a larger community than the Neanderthaler, but how large we do not know. Except when game is swarming, hunting communities must not keep together in large bodies or they will starve. The Indians who depend upon the caribou in Labrador must be living under circumstances rather like those of the reindeer men. They scatter in small family groups, as the caribou scatter in search of food. But when the deer collect for the seasonal migration, the Indians also collect. That is the time for trade and feasts and marriages. The simplest American Indian is 10,000 years more sophisticated than the reindeer man, but probably that sort of gathering and dispersal was also the way of reindeer men. At Salyuter in France there are traces of a great camping and feasting place. There was no doubt an exchange of news there, but one may doubt if there was anything like an exchange of ideas. One sees no scope in such a life for theology or philosophy or superstition or speculation. Fears, yes, but unsystematic fears. Fancies and freaks of the imagination, but personal and transitory freaks and fancies. Perhaps there was a certain power of suggestion in these encounters. A fear really felt needs few words for its transmission. A value set upon something may be very simply conveyed. In these questions of primitive thought and religion, we must remember that the lowly and savage peoples of today probably throw very little light on the mental state of men before the days of fully developed language. Primordial man could have had little or no tradition before the development of speech. All savage and primitive peoples of today, on the contrary, are soaked in tradition, the tradition of thousands of generations. They may have weapons like their remote ancestors and methods like them. But what were slight and shallow impressions on the minds of their predecessors are now deep and intricate grooves worn throughout the intervening centuries generation by generation. Section 2 Certain very fundamental things there may have been in men's minds long before the coming of speech. Chief among these must have been fear of the old man of the tribe. 
the young of the primitive squatting place grew up under that fear. Objects associated with him were probably forbidden. Everyone was forbidden to touch his spear or to sit in his place, just as today little boys must not touch father's pipe or sit in his chair. He was probably the master of all the women. The youths of the little community had to remember that. The idea of something forbidden, the idea of things being, as it is called, taboo, not to be touched, not to be looked at, may thus have got well into the human mind at a very early stage indeed. J. J. Atkinson, in an ingenious analysis of these primitive taboos which are found among savage peoples all over the world, the taboos that separate brother and sister, the taboos that make a man run and hide from his stepmother, traces them to such a fundamental cause as this. Only by respecting this primal law could the young male hope to escape the old man's wrath. And the old man must have been an actor in many a primordial nightmare. A disposition to propitiate him even after he was dead is quite understandable. One was not sure that he was dead. He might only be asleep or shamming. Long after an old man was dead, when there was nothing to represent him but a mound and a megalith, the women would convey to their children how awful and wonderful he was. And being still a terror to his own little tribe, it was easy to go on to hoping that he would be a terror to other and hostile people. In his life he had fought for his tribe, even if he had bullied it. Why not when he was dead? One sees that the old man idea was an idea very natural to the primitive mind and capable of great development. Section 3 Another idea probably arose early out of the mysterious visitation of infectious diseases, and that was the idea of uncleanness and of being accursed. From that, too, there may have come an idea of avoiding particular places and persons, and persons in particular phases of health. Here was the root of another set of taboos. Then man, from the very dawn of his mental life, may have had a feeling of the sinister about places and things. Animals, who dread traps, have that feeling. A tiger will abandon its usual jungle route at the sight of a few threads of cotton. Like most young animals, young human beings are easily made fearful of this or that by their nurses and seniors. Here is another set of ideas, ideas of repulsion and avoidance, that sprang up almost inevitably in men. As soon as speech began to develop, it must have got to work upon such fundamental feelings and begun to systematize them, and keep them in mind. By talking together men would reinforce each other's fears, and establish a common tradition of taboos of things forbidden and of things unclean. With the idea of uncleanness would come ideas of cleansing and of removing a curse. The cleansing would be conducted through the advice and with the aid of wise old men or wise old women, and in such cleansing would lie the germ of the earliest priestcraft and witchcraft. Speech from the first would be a powerful supplement to the merely imitative education and to the education of cuffs and blows conducted by a speechless parent. Mothers would tell their young and scold their young. As speech developed, men would find they had experiences and persuasions that gave them or seemed to give them power. They would make secrets of these things. There is a double streak in the human mind, a streak of cunning secretiveness and a streak perhaps of later origin that makes us all anxious to tell and astonish and impress each other. Many people make secrets in order to have secrets to tell. These secrets of early men they would convey to younger, more impressionable people, more or less honestly and impressively in some process of initiation. Moreover, the pedagogic spirit overflows in the human mind. Most people like telling other people not to. Extensive arbitrary prohibitions for the boys, for the girls, for the women, also probably came very early into human history. Then the idea of the sinister has for its correlative the idea of the propitious, and from that to the idea of making things propitious by ceremonies is an easy step. Section 4 Out of such ideas and a jumble of kindred ones grew the first quasi-religious elements in human life. With every development of speech it became possible to intensify and develop the tradition of taboos and restraints and ceremonies. There is not a savage or barbaric race today that is not held in a net of such tradition. And with the coming of the primitive herdsmen there would be a considerable broadening out of all this sort of practice. Things hitherto unheeded would be found of importance in human affairs. 
Neolithic man was nomadic in a different spirit from the mere daylight drift after food of the primordial hunter. He was a herdsman, upon whose mind a sense of direction and the lie of the land had been forced. He watched his flock by night as well as by day. The sun by day and presently the stars by night helped to guide his migrations. He began to find after many ages that the stars are steadier guides than the sun. He would begin to note particular stars and star groups, and to distinguish any individual thing was, for primitive man, to believe it individualized and personal. He would begin to think of the chief stars as persons, very shining and dignified and trustworthy persons looking at him like bright eyes in the night. His primitive tillage strengthened his sense of the seasons. Particular stars ruled his heavens when seed time was due. The beginnings of agriculture were in the subtropical zone, or even nearer the equator, where stars of the first magnitude shine with a splendor unknown in more temperate latitudes. And Neolithic man was counting, and falling under the spell of numbers. There are savage languages that have no word for any number above five. Some peoples cannot go above two. But Neolithic man in the lands of his origin in Asia and Africa even more than in Europe was already counting his accumulating possessions. He was beginning to use tallies, and wondering at the triangularity of three and the squareness of four, and why some quantities like twelve were easy to divide in all sorts of ways, and others, like thirteen, impossible. Twelve became a noble, generous, and familiar number to him, and thirteen rather an outcast and disreputable one. A carved statue, Menhir, of the Neolithic period, a contrast to the freedom and vigor of Paleolithic art. Probably man began reckoning time by the clock of the full and new moons. Moonlight is an important thing to herdsmen who no longer merely hunt their herds, but watch and guard them. Moonlight, too, was perhaps his time for lovemaking, as indeed it may have been for primordial man and the ground ape ancestor before him. But from the phases of the moon, as his tillage increased, man's attitude would go on to the greater cycle of the seasons. Primordial man probably only drifted before the winter as the days grew cold. Neolithic man knew surely that the winter would come, and stored his fodder and presently his grain. He had to fix a seed time, a propitious seed time, or his sowing was a failure. The earliest recorded reckoning is by moons and by generations of men. The former seems to be the case in the book of Genesis, where, if one reads the great ages of the patriarchs who lived before the flood as lunar months instead of years, Methuselah and the others are reduced to a credible length of life. But with agriculture began the difficult task of squaring the lunar month with the solar year, a task which has left its scars on our calendar today. Easter shifts uneasily from year to year, to the great discomfort of holidaymakers. It is now inconveniently early and now late in the season because of this ancient reference of time to the moon. And when men began to move with set intention from place to place with their animal and other possessions, then they would begin to develop the idea of other places in which they were not, and to think of what might be in those other places. And in any valley where they lingered for a time, they would, remembering how they got there, ask, how did this or that other thing get here? They would begin to wonder what was beyond the mountains, and where the sun went when it set, and what was above the clouds. Section 5 the capacity for telling things increased with their vocabulary. The simple individual fancies, the unsystematic fetish tricks and fundamental taboos of Paleolithic man began to be handed on and made into a more consistent system. Men began to tell stories about themselves, about the tribe, about its taboos and why they had to be, about the world and the why for the world. A tribal mind came into existence, a tradition. Paleolithic man was certainly more of a free individualist, more of an artist, as well as more of a savage, than Neolithic man. Neolithic man was coming under prescription. He could be trained from his youth and told to do things and not to do things, he was not so free to form independent ideas of his own about things. He had thoughts given to him, he was under a new power of suggestion. And to have more words and to attend more to words is not simply to increase mental power, words themselves are powerful things and dangerous things. Paleolithic man's words, perhaps, were chiefly just names. 
he used them for what they were. But Neolithic man was thinking about these words, he was thinking about a number of things with a great deal of verbal confusion, and getting to some odd conclusions. In speech he had woven a net to bind his race together, but also it was a net about his feet. Man was binding himself into new and larger and more efficient combinations indeed, but at a price. One of the most notable things about the Neolithic age is the total absence of that free direct artistic impulse which was the supreme quality of later Paleolithic man. We find much industry, much skill, polished implements, pottery with conventional designs, cooperation upon all sorts of things, but no evidence of personal creativeness. Self-suppression is beginning for men. Man has entered upon the long and tortuous and difficult path towards a life for the common good, with all its sacrifice of personal impulse, which he is still treading today. Certain things appear in the mythology of mankind again and again. Neolithic man was enormously impressed by serpents, and he no longer took the sun for granted. Nearly everywhere that Neolithic culture went, there went a disposition to associate the sun and the serpent in decoration and worship. This primitive serpent worship spread ultimately far beyond the regions where the snake is of serious practical importance in human life. Section 6 With the beginnings of agriculture a fresh set of ideas arose in men's minds. We have already indicated how easily and naturally men may have come to associate the idea of sowing with a burial. Sir J. G. Fraser has pursued the development of this association in the human mind, linking up with it the conception of special sacrificial persons who are killed at seed time, the conception of a specially purified class of people to kill these sacrifices. The first priests, and the conception of a sacrament, a ceremonial feast in which the tribe eats portions of the body of the victim in order to share in the sacrificial benefits. Out of all these factors, out of the old man tradition, out of the desire to escape infection and uncleanness, out of the desire for power and success through magic, out of the sacrificial tradition of seed time, and out of a number of like beliefs and mental experiments and misconceptions, a complex something was growing up in the lives of men which was beginning to bind them together mentally and emotionally in a common life and action. This something we may call religion, lat religor, to bind. It was not a simple or logical something, it was a tangle of ideas about commanding beings and spirits, about gods, about all sorts of musts and must-nots. Like all other human matters, religion has grown. It must be clear from what has gone before that primitive man, much less his ancestral apes and his ancestral Mesozoic mammals, could have had no idea of God or religion. Only very slowly did his brain and his powers of comprehension become capable of such general conceptions. Religion is something that has grown up with and through human association, and God has been and is still being discovered by man. This book is not a theological book, and it is not for us to embark upon theological discussion. But it is a part, a necessary and central part, of the history of man to describe the dawn and development of his religious ideas and their influence upon his activities. All these factors we have noted must have contributed to this development, and various writers have laid most stress upon one or other of them. Sir J. G. Fraser we have already noted as the leading student of the derivation of sacraments from magic sacrifices. Grant Allen, in his Evolution of the Idea of God, laid stress chiefly on the posthumous worship of the old man. Sir E. B. Tyler, Primitive Culture, gave his attention mainly to the disposition of primitive man to ascribe a soul to every object animate and inanimate. Mr. A. E. Crawley, in The Tree of Life, has called attention to other centers of impulse and emotion, and particularly to sex as a source of deep excitement. The thing we have to bear in mind is that Neolithic man was still mentally undeveloped, he could be confused and illogical to a degree quite impossible to an educated modern person. Conflicting and contradictory ideas could lie in his mind without challenging one another, now one thing ruled his thoughts intensely and vividly and now another, his fears, his acts, were still disconnected as children's are. Time diagram showing the general duration of the Neolithic period in which early thought developed. Confusedly under the stimulus of the need and possibility of cooperation and a combined life, 
Neolithic mankind was feeling out for guidance and knowledge. Men were becoming aware that personally they needed protection and direction, cleansing from impurity, power beyond their own strength. Confusedly in response to that demand, bold men, wise men, shrewd and cunning men were arising to become magicians, priests, chiefs, and kings. They are not to be thought of as cheats or usurpers of power, nor the rest of mankind as their dupes. All men are mixed in their motives, a hundred things move men to seek ascendancy over other men, but not all such motives are base or bad. The magicians usually believed more or less in their own magic, the priests in their ceremonies, the chiefs in their rite. The history of mankind henceforth is a history of more or less blind endeavors to conceive a common purpose in relation to which all men may live happily. And to create and develop a common consciousness and a common stock of knowledge which may serve and illuminate that purpose. In a vast variety of forms this appearance of kings and priests and magic men was happening all over the world under Neolithic conditions. Everywhere mankind was seeking where knowledge and mastery and magic power might reside. Everywhere individual men were willing, honestly or dishonestly, to rule, to direct, or to be the magic beings who would reconcile the confusions of the community. In many ways the simplicity, directness, and detachment of a later Paleolithic rock painter appeal more to modern sympathies than does the state of mind of these Neolithic men. Full of the fear of some ancient old man who had developed into a tribal god, obsessed by ideas of sacrificial propitiation and magic murder. No doubt the reindeer hunter was a ruthless hunter and a combative and passionate creature, but he killed for reasons we can still understand. Neolithic man, under the sway of talk and a confused thought process, killed on theory, he killed for monstrous and now incredible ideas, he killed those he loved through fear and under direction. Those Neolithic men not only made human sacrifices at seed time, there is every reason to suppose they sacrificed wives and slaves at the burial of their chieftains. They killed men, women, and children whenever they were under adversity and thought the gods were athirst. They practiced infanticide. All these things passed on into the Bronze Age. Hitherto a social consciousness had been asleep and not even dreaming in human history. Before it awakened it produced nightmares. Away beyond the dawn of history, 3,000 or 4,000 years ago, one thinks of the Wiltshire uplands in the twilight of a midsummer day's morning. The torches pale in the growing light. One has a dim apprehension of a procession through the avenue of stone, of priests. Perhaps fantastically dressed with skins and horns and horrible painted masks, not the robed and bearded dignitaries our artists represent the druids to have been, of chiefs in skins adorned with necklaces of teeth and bearing spears and axes. Their great heads of hair held up with pins of bone, of women in skins or flaxen robes, of a great peering crowd of shock-headed men and naked children. They have assembled from many distant places, the ground between the avenues and Silbury Hill is dotted with their encampments. A certain festive cheerfulness prevails. And amidst the throng march the appointed human victims, submissive, helpless, staring towards the distant smoking altar at which they are to die, that the harvests may be good and the tribe increase. To that had life progressed three thousand or four thousand years ago from its starting place in the slime of the tidal beaches. 13. The Races of Mankind Section 1. Is Mankind Still Differentiating? Section 2. The Main Races of Mankind Section 3. Was There an Alpine Race? Section 4. The Brunette Peoples Section 5. How Existing Races May Be Related to Each Other Section 1. IT is necessary now to discuss plainly what is meant by a phrase, used often very carelessly, the races of mankind. It must be evident from what has already been explained in Chapter 3 that man, so widely spread and subjected therefore to great differences of climate, consuming very different food in different regions, attacked by different enemies, must always have been undergoing considerable local modification and differentiation. Man, like every other species of living thing, has constantly been tending to differentiate into several species. Wherever a body of men has been cut off, in islands or oceans or by deserts or mountains, 
from the rest of humanity, it must have begun very soon to develop special characteristics, specially adapted to the local conditions. But, on the other hand, man is usually a wandering and enterprising animal, for whom there exist few insurmountable barriers. Men imitate men, fight and conquer them, interbreed, one people with another. Concurrently for thousands of years there have been two sets of forces at work, one tending to separate men into a multitude of local varieties, and another to remix and blend these varieties together before a separate species has been established. These two sets of forces may have fluctuated in this relative effect in the past. Paleolithic man, for instance, may have been more of a wanderer, he may have drifted about over a much greater area, than later Neolithic man. He was less fixed to any sort of home or lair, he was tied by fewer possessions. Being a hunter, he was obliged to follow the migrations of his ordinary quarry. A few bad seasons may have shifted him hundreds of miles. He may therefore have mixed very widely and developed few varieties over the greater part of the world. The appearance of agriculture tended to tie those communities of mankind that took it up to the region in which it was most conveniently carried on, and so to favor differentiation. Mixing or differentiation is not dependent upon a higher or lower stage of civilization, many savage tribes wander now for hundreds of miles. Many English villagers in the 18th century, on the other hand, had never been more than eight or ten miles from their villages, neither they nor their fathers nor grandfathers before them. Hunting peoples often have enormous range. The Labrador country, for instance, is inhabited by a few thousand Indians, who follow the one great herd of caribou as it wanders yearly north and then south again in pursuit of food. This mere handful of people covers a territory as large as France. Nomad peoples also range very widely. Some Kalmuk tribes are said to travel nearly a thousand miles between summer and winter pasture. It carries out this suggestion, that Paleolithic man ranged widely and was distributed, thinly indeed but uniformly, throughout the world, that the Paleolithic remains we find are everywhere astonishingly uniform. To quote Sir John Evans, the implements in distant lands are so identical in form and character with the British specimens that they might have been manufactured by the same hands. On the banks of the Nile, many hundreds of feet above its present level, implements of the European types have been discovered, while in Somaliland, in an ancient river valley at a great elevation above the sea, Sir H. W. Seton Carr has collected a large number of implements formed of flint and quartzite, which, judging from their form and character, might have been dug out of the drift deposits of the Psalm and the Seine, the Thames, or the ancient Solent. Phases of spreading and intermixture have probably alternated with phases of settlement and specialization in the history of mankind. But up to a few hundred years ago it is probable that since the days of the Paleolithic Age at least mankind has on the whole been differentiating. The species has differentiated in that period into a very great number of varieties, many of which have reblended with others, which have spread and undergone further differentiation or become extinct. Wherever there has been a strongly marked local difference of conditions and a check upon intermixture, there one is almost obliged to assume a variety of mankind must have appeared. Of such local varieties there must have been a great multitude. In one remote corner of the world, Tasmania, a little cut-off population of people remained in the early Paleolithic stage until the discovery of that island by the Dutch in 1642. They are now, unhappily, extinct. The last Tasmanian died in 1877. They may have been cut off from the rest of mankind for 15,000 or 20,000 or 25,000 years. But among the numerous obstacles and interruptions to intermixture there have been certain main barriers, such as the Atlantic Ocean, the highlands, once higher, and the now vanished seas of Central Asia and the like. Which have cut off great groups of varieties from other great groups of varieties over long periods of time. These separated groups of varieties developed very early certain broad resemblances and differences. Most of the varieties of men in Eastern Asia and America, but not all, have now this in common, that they have yellowish buff skins, straight black hair, and often high cheekbones. Most of the native peoples of Africa south of the Sahara, but not all, have black or blackish skins, flat noses, thick lips, and frizzy hair. 
In North and Western Europe a great number of peoples have fair hair, blue eyes, and ruddy complexions. And about the Mediterranean there is a prevalence of white-skinned peoples with dark eyes and black hair. The black hair of many of these dark whites is straight, but never so strong and waveless as the hair of the yellow peoples. It is straighter in the east than in the west. In southern India we find brownish and darker peoples with straight black hair, and these as we pass eastward give place to more distinctly yellow peoples. In scattered islands and in Papua and New Guinea we find another series of black and brownish peoples of a more lowly type with frizzy hair. But it must be borne in mind that these are very loose-fitting generalizations. Some of the areas and isolated pockets of mankind in the Asiatic area may have been under conditions more like those in the European area, some of the African areas are of a more Asiatic and less distinctively African type. We find a wavy-haired, fairish, hairy-skinned race, the Ainu, in Japan. They are more like the Europeans in their facial type than the surrounding yellow Japanese. They may be a drifted patch of the whites or they may be a quite distinct people. We find primitive black people in the Andaman Islands far away from Australia and far away from Africa. There is a streak of very negroid blood traceable in South Persia and some parts of India. These are the Asiatic Negroids. There is little or no proof that all black people, the Australians, the Asiatic Negroids and the Negroes, derive from one origin, but only that they have lived for vast periods under similar conditions. We must not assume that human beings in the Eastern Asiatic area were all differentiating in one direction and all the human beings in Africa in another. There were great currents of tendency, it is true, but there were also backwaters, eddies, admixtures, reed mixtures, and leakages from one main area to the other. A colored map of the world to show the races would not present just four great areas of color, it would have to be dabbed over with a multitude of tints and intermediate shades, simple here, mixed and overlapping there. In the early Neolithic period in Europe, it may be 10,000 or 12,000 years ago or so, Man was differentiating all over the world, and he had already differentiated into a number of varieties, but he has never differentiated into different species. A species, we must remember, in biological language is distinguished from a variety by the fact that varieties can interbreed, while species either do not do so or produce offspring which, like mules, are sterile. All mankind can interbreed freely, can learn to understand the same speech, can adapt itself to cooperation. And in the present age, man is probably no longer undergoing differentiation at all. Reed mixture is now a far stronger force than differentiation. Men mingle more and more. Mankind from the view of a biologist is an animal species in a state of arrested differentiation and possible reed mixture. Section 2 it is only in the last fifty or sixty years that the varieties of men came to be regarded in this light, as a tangle of differentiations recently arrested or still in progress. Before that time students of mankind, influenced, consciously or unconsciously, by the story of Noah and the Ark and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japhet, were inclined to classify men into three or four great races. And they were disposed to regard these races as having always been separate things, descended from originally separate ancestors. They ignored the great possibilities of blended races and of special local isolations and variations. The classification has varied considerably, but there has been rather too much readiness to assume that mankind must be completely divisible into three or four main groups. Ethnologists, students of race, have fallen into grievous disputes about a multitude of minor peoples, as to whether they were of this or that primary race or mixed or straight early forms, or what not. But all races are more or less mixed. There are, no doubt, for main groups, but each is a miscellany, and there are little groups that will not go into any of the four main divisions. Subject to these reservations, when it is clearly understood that when we speak of these main divisions we mean not simple and pure races, but groups of races, then they have a certain convenience in discussion. Over the European and Mediterranean area and Western Asia there are, and have been for many thousand years, white peoples, usually called the Caucasians, subdivided into two or three subdivisions, the Northern Blondes. 
an alleged intermediate race about which many authorities are doubtful, and the Southern Dark Whites. Over Eastern Asia and America a second group of races prevails, the Mongolians, generally with yellow skins, straight black hair, and sturdy bodies. Over Africa the Negroes, and in the region of Australia and New Guinea the black, primitive Australoids. These are convenient terms, provided the student bears in mind that they are not exactly defined terms. They represent only the common characteristics of certain main groups of races, they leave out a number of little peoples who belong properly to none of these divisions, and they disregard the perpetual mixing where the main groups overlap. Section 3. Mongolian Types whether the Caucasian race is to be divided into two or three main subdivisions depends upon the classificatory value to be attached to certain differences in the skeleton and particularly to the shape of the skull. The student in his further reading will meet with constant references to round-skulled, brachycephalic, and long-skulled peoples, dolichocephalic. No skull looked at from above is completely round, but some skulls, the dolichocephalic, are much more oblong than others when the width of a skull is four-fifths or more of its length from back to front, that skull is called brachycephalic. When the width is less than four-fifths of the length, the skull is dolichocephalic. While some ethnologists regard the difference between brachycephaly and dolichocephaly as a difference of quite primary importance. Another school, which the writer must confess has entirely captured his convictions, dismisses this as a mere secondary distinction. It seems probable that the skull shapes of a people may under special circumstances vary in comparatively few generations. We do not know what influences alter the shape of the skull, just as we do not know why people of British descent in the Darling region of Australia, cornstalks, grow exceptionally tall. Or why in New England their jawbones seem to become slighter and their teeth in consequence rather crowded. Even in Neolithic times dolichocephalic and brachycephalic skulls are found in the same group of remains and often buried together, and that is true of most peoples today. Some peoples, such as the mountain people of Central Europe, have more brachycephalic individuals per cent than others, some, as the Scandinavians, are more prevalently dolichocephalic. In Neolithic Britain and in Scandinavia the earliest barrows, equals two mounds, are long grave-shaped barrows and the late ones round, and the skulls found in the former are usually dolichocephalic and in the latter most frequently brachycephalic. This points perhaps to a succession of races in Western Europe in the Neolithic period, see chapter 45, but it may also point to changes of diet, habit, or climate. Caucasian Types but it is this study of skull shapes which has led many ethnologists to divide the Caucasian race, not, as it was divided by Huxley, into two, the northern blondes and the Mediterranean and North African dark whites or brunettes. But into three. They split his blondes into two classes. They distinguish a northern European type, blonde and dolichocephalic, the Nordic. A Mediterranean or Iberian race, Huxley's dark whites, which is dark-haired and dolichocephalic, and between these two they describe this third race, their brachycephalic race, the alpine race. The opposite school would treat the alleged alpine race simply as a number of local brachycephalic varieties of Nordic or Iberian peoples. The Iberian peoples were the Neolithic people of the Long Barrows, and seem at first to have pervaded most of Europe and Western Asia. Section 4 this Mediterranean or Iberian race certainly had a wider range in early times, and was a less specialized and distinctive race than the Nordic. It is very hard to define its southward boundaries from the Negro, or to mark off its early traces in Central Asia from those of early Dravidians or Mongolians. Wilfred Scon Blunt says that Huxley had long suspected a common origin of the Egyptians and the Dravidians of India, perhaps a long belt of brown-skinned men from India to Spain in very early days. Across France and Great Britain these dark-white Iberian or Mediterranean people were ousted by a round barrow-making Alpine or Alpine Nordic race. And the dawn of history in Europe sees them being pressed westward and southward everywhere by the expansion of the fairer northern peoples. It is possible that this belt of Huxleys of dark-white and brown-skinned men, this race of brunette-brown folk, ultimately spread even farther than India. That they reached to the shores of the Pacific, 
and that they were everywhere the original possessors of the Neolithic culture and the beginners of what we call civilization. The Nordic and the Mongolian peoples may have been but northwestern and northeastern branches from this more fundamental stem. Or the Nordic race may have been a branch, while the Mongolian, like the Negro, may have been another equal and distinct stem with which the brunette browns met and mingled in South China. Or the Nordic peoples also may have developed separately from a Paleolithic stage. At some period in human history, see Elliot Smith's Migrations of Early Culture, there seems to have been a special type of Neolithic culture widely distributed in the world which had a group of features so curious and so unlikely to have been independently developed in different regions of the earth. As to compel us to believe that it was in effect one culture. It reached through all the regions inhabited by the brunette Mediterranean race, and beyond through India, further India, up the Pacific coast of China, and it spread at last across the Pacific and to Mexico and Peru. It was a coastal culture not reaching deeply inland. Here again we cover the ground of Huxley's belt of brown-skinned men, and extend it far to the east across the stepping stones of Polynesia. There are, we may note, some very striking resemblances between early Japanese pottery and so forth and similar Peruvian productions. This peculiar development of the Neolithic culture, which Elliot Smith called the Heliolithic culture, included many or all of the following odd practices, 1. Circumcision. 2. The very queer custom of sending the father to bed when a child is born, known as the kavad, 3. The practice of massage, 4. The making of mummies, 5. Megalithic monuments, e. g. Stonehenge, 6. Artificial deformation of the heads of the young by bandages, 7. Tattooing, 8. Religious association of the sun and the serpent, and, 9, the use of the symbol known as the swastika, see figure, for good luck. This odd little symbol spins gaily round the world, it seems incredible that men would have invented and made a pet of it twice over. Elliot Smith traces these practices in a sort of constellation all over this great Mediterranean Indian Ocean Pacific area. Where one occurs, most of the others occur. They link Brittany with Borneo and Peru. But this constellation of practices does not crop up in the primitive homes of Nordic or Mongolian peoples, nor does it extend southward much beyond equatorial Africa. For thousands of years, from 15,000 to 1000 BC, such a Heliolithic Neolithic culture and its brownish possessors may have been oozing round the world through the warmer regions of the world, drifting by canoes often across wide stretches of sea. And its region of origin may have been, as Elliot Smith suggests, the Mediterranean and North African region. It must have been spreading up the Pacific coast and across the island stepping stones to America, long after it had passed on into other developments in its areas of origin. Many of the peoples of the East Indies, Melanesia and Polynesia were still in this Heliolithic stage of development when they were discovered by European navigators in the 18th century. The first civilizations in Egypt and the Euphrates Tigris Valley probably developed directly out of this widespread culture. We will discuss later whether the Chinese civilization had a different origin. The Semitic nomads of the Arabian Desert seem also to have had a Heliolithic stage. Section 5. It may clear up the necessarily rather confused discussion of this chapter to give a summary of the views expressed here in a diagram. This, on, should be compared later with the language diagram on. We have put the Australoids as a Negroid branch, but many authorities would set back the Australoid stem closer to the Tasmanian. And there may even be sound reasons for transferring both Australoids and Tasmanians as separate branches to the left of the later Paleolithic races. To avoid crowding we have omitted the hairy Ainu. They may be the last vestiges of an ancient primitive pre-Nordic pre-Mongolian strain from which the Nordic races are descended. 14. The Languages of Mankind. Section 1. No one primitive language. Section 2. The Aryan languages. Section 3. The Semitic languages. Section 4. The Hamitic languages. Section 5. The Ural Altaic languages. Section 6. The Chinese languages. Section 7. Other language groups. Section 8. 
Submerged and Lost Languages Section 9 How Languages May Be Related Section 1 IT is improbable that there was ever such a thing as a common human language. We know nothing of the language of Paleolithic man, we do not even know whether Paleolithic man talked freely. We know that Paleolithic man had a keen sense of form and attitude, because of his drawings, and it has been suggested that he communicated his ideas very largely by gesture. Probably such words as the earlier men used were mainly cries of alarm or passion or names for concrete things, and in many cases they were probably imitative sounds made by or associated with the things named. The first languages were probably small collections of such words, they consisted of interjections and nouns. Probably the nouns were said in different intonations to convey different meanings. If Paleolithic man had a word for horse or bear, he probably showed by tone or gesture whether he meant bear is coming, bear is going, bear is to be hunted, dead bear, bear has been here, bear did this, and so on. Only very slowly did the human mind develop methods of indicating action and relationship in a formal manner. Modern languages contain many thousands of words, but the earlier languages could have consisted only of a few hundred. It is said that even modern European peasants can get along with something less than a thousand words, and it is quite conceivable that so late as the early Neolithic period that was the limit of the available vocabulary. Probably men did not indulge in those days in conversation or description. For narrative purposes they danced and acted rather than told. They had no method of counting beyond a method of indicating two by a dual number, and some way of expressing many. The growth of speech was at first a very slow process indeed, and grammatical forms and the expression of abstract ideas may have come very late in human history, perhaps only 400 or 500 generations ago. Section 2 The students of languages, philologists, tell us that they are unable to trace with certainty any common features in all the languages of mankind. They cannot even find any elements common to all the Caucasian languages. They find over great areas groups of languages which have similar root words and similar ways of expressing the same idea, but then they find in other areas languages which appear to be dissimilar down to their fundamental structure. Which express action and relation by entirely dissimilar devices, and have an altogether different grammatical scheme. One great group of languages, for example, now covers nearly all Europe and stretches out to India, it includes English, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Greek, Russian, Armenian, Persian, and various Indian tongues. It is called the Indo-European or Aryan family. The same fundamental roots, the same grammatical ideas, are traceable through all this family. Compare, for example, English father, mother, Gothic fadar, mutar, German fata, mutter, Latin pater, mater, Greek pater, meter, French pair, mare, Armenian hare, mare, Sanskrit patar, matar, etc., etc. In a similar manner the Aryan languages ring the changes on a great number of fundamental words, f in the Germanic languages becoming p in Latin, and so on. They follow a law of variation called Grimm's Law. These languages are not different things, they are variations of one thing. The people who use these languages think in the same way. At one time in the remote past, in the Neolithic age, that is to say 6,000 years or more ago, there may have been one simple original speech from which all these Aryan languages have differentiated. Somewhere between Central Europe and Western Asia there must have wandered a number of tribes sufficiently intermingled to develop and use one tongue. It is convenient here to call them the Aryan peoples. Sir H. H. Johnston has called them Therian Russians. They belonged mostly to the Caucasian group of races and to the blonde and northern subdivision of the group, to the Nordic race that is. Here one must sound a note of warning. There was a time when the philologists were disposed to confuse languages and races, and to suppose that people who once all spoke the same tongue must be all of the same blood. That, however, is not the case, as the reader will understand if he will think of the Negroes of the United States who now all speak English, or of the Irish. Who, except for purposes of political demonstration, no longer speak the old Erse language but English, or of the Cornish people, who have lost their ancient Celtic speech. 
But what a common language does do, is to show that a common intercourse has existed, and the possibility of intermixture, and if it does not point to a common origin, it points at least to a common future. But even this original Aryan language, which was a spoken speech perhaps 4000 or 3000 BC, was by no means a primordial language or the language of a savage race. Its speakers were in or past the Neolithic stage of civilization. It had grammatical forms and verbal devices of some complexity. The vanished methods of expression of the later Paleolithic peoples, of the Azilians, or of the early Neolithic Kitchen Midden people for instance, were probably much cruder than the most elementary form of Aryan. Probably the Aryan group of languages became distinct in a wide region of which the Danube, Dnieper, Don, and Volga were the main rivers, a region that extended eastward beyond the Ural Mountains north of the Caspian Sea. The area over which the Aryan speakers roamed probably did not for a long time reach to the Atlantic or to the south of the Black Sea beyond Asia Minor. There was no effectual separation of Europe from Asia then at the Bosphorus. The Danube flowed eastward to a great sea that extended across the Volga region of southeastern Russia right into Turkestan, and included the Black, Caspian, and Aral Seas of today. Perhaps it sent out arms to the Arctic Ocean. It must have been a pretty effective barrier between the Aryan speakers and the people in northeastern Asia. South of this sea stretched a continuous shore from the Balkans to Afghanistan. Northwest of it a region of swamps and lagoons reached to the Baltic. Section 3. Next to Aryan, philologists distinguish another group of languages which seem to have been made quite separately from the Aryan languages, the Semitic. Hebrew and Arabic are kindred, but they seem to have even a different set of root words from the Aryan tongues, they express their ideas of relationship in a different way, the fundamental ideas of their grammars are generally different. They were in all probability made by human communities quite out of touch with the Aryans, separately and independently. Hebrew, Arabic, Abyssinian, Ancient Assyrian, Ancient Phoenician, and a number of associated tongues are put together, therefore, as being derived from a second primary language, which is called the Semitic. In the very beginnings of recorded history we find Aryan-speaking peoples and Semitic-speaking peoples carrying on the liveliest intercourse of war and trade round and about the eastern end of the Mediterranean. But the fundamental differences of the primary Aryan and primary Semitic languages oblige us to believe that in early Neolithic times, before the historical period, there must for thousands of years have been an almost complete separation of the Aryan-speaking and the Semitic-speaking peoples. The latter seem to have lived either in South Arabia or in Northeast Africa. In the opening centuries of the Neolithic age the original Aryan speakers and the original Semitic speakers were probably living, so to speak, in different worlds, with a minimum of intercourse. Racially, it would seem, they had a remote common origin, both Aryan speakers and Semites are classed as Caucasians, but while the original Aryan speakers seem to have been of Nordic race, the original Semites were rather of the Mediterranean type. Section 4. Philologists speak with less unanimity of a third group of languages, the Hamitic, which some declare to be distinct from, and others allied to, the Semitic. The weight of opinion inclines now towards the idea of some primordial connection of these two groups. The Hamitic group is certainly a much wider and more various language group than the Semitic or the Aryan, and the Semitic tongues are more of a family, have more of a common likeness, than the Aryan. The Semitic languages may have arisen as some specialized proto-Hamitic group, just as the birds arose from a special group of reptiles, chapter 4. It is a tempting speculation, but one for which there is really no basis of justifying fact. To suppose that the rude primordial ancestor group of the Aryan tongues branched off from the Proto-Hamitic speech forms at some still earlier date than the separation and specialization of Semitic. The Hamitic speakers today, like the Semitic speakers, are mainly of the Mediterranean Caucasian race. Among the Hamitic languages are the ancient Egyptian and Coptic, the Berber languages, of the mountain people of North Africa, the Masque Tuaregs, and other such peoples and what are called the Ethiopic group of African languages in Eastern Africa, including the speech of the Galas and the Somalis. The general grouping of these various tongues suggests that they originated over some great area to the west, 
as the primitive Semitic may have arisen to the east of the Red Sea Divide. That divide was probably much more effective in Pleistocene times, the sea extended across to the west of the Isthmus of Suez, and a great part of Lower Egypt was underwater. Long before the dawn of history, however, Asia and Africa had joined at Suez, and these two language systems were in contact in that region. And if Asia and Africa were separated then at Suez, they may, on the other hand, have been joined by way of Arabia and Abyssinia. These Hamitic languages may have radiated from a center on the African coast of the Mediterranean, and they may have extended over the then existing land connections very widely into Western Europe. All these three great groups of languages, it may be noted, the Aryan, Semitic, and Hamitic, have one feature in common which they do not share with any other language, and that is grammatical gender. But whether that has much weight as evidence of a remote common origin of Aryan, Semitic, and Hamitic, is a question for the philologist rather than for the general student. It does not affect the clear evidence of a very long and very ancient prehistoric separation of the speakers of these three diverse groups of tongues. The bulk of the Semitic and Hamitic-speaking peoples are put by ethnologists with the Aryans among the Caucasian group of races. They are white. The Semitic and Nordic races have a much more distinctive physiognomy. They seem, like their characteristic languages, to be more marked and specialized than the Hamitic-speaking peoples. Section 5. Across to the northeast of the Aryan and Semitic areas there must once have spread a further distinct language system which is now represented by a group of languages known as the Turanian, or Uralaltaic group. This included the Lapish of Lapland and the Samoyed speech of Siberia, the Finnish language, Magyar, Turkish or Tartar, Manchu and Mongol. It has not as a group been so exhaustively studied by European philologists, and there is insufficient evidence yet whether it does or does not include the Korean and Japanese languages. A Japanese writer, Mr. K. Hirai, has attempted to show that Japanese and Aryan may have had a common parent tongue. Section 6. A fifth region of language formation was Southeastern Asia, where there still prevails a group of languages consisting of monosyllables without any inflections, in which the tone used in uttering a word determines its meaning. This may be called the Chinese or monosyllabic group, and it includes Chinese, Burmese, Siamese, and Tibetan. The difference between any of these Chinese tongues and the more Western languages is profound. In the Pekingese form of Chinese there are only about 420 primary monosyllables, and consequently each of these has to do duty for a great number of things. And the different meanings are indicated either by the context or by saying the word in a distinctive tone. The relations of these words to each other are expressed by quite different methods from the Aryan methods, Chinese grammar is a thing different in nature from English grammar, it is a separate and different invention. Many writers declare there is no Chinese grammar at all, and that is true if we mean by grammar anything in the European sense of inflections and concords. Consequently any such thing as a literal translation from Chinese into English is an impossibility. The very method of the thought is different. Their philosophy remains still largely a sealed book to the European on this account, and vice versa, because of the different nature of the expressions. Section 7. In addition the following other great language families are distinguished by the philologist. All the American Indian languages, which vary widely among themselves, are separable from any old world group. Here we may lump them together not so much as a family as a miscellany. There is one great group of languages in Africa, from a little way north of the equator to its southern extremity, the Bantu, and in addition a complex of other languages across the center of the continent about which we will not trouble here. There are also two probably separate groups, the Dravidian in South India, and the Malay Polynesian stretched over Polynesia, and also now including Indian tongues. Now it seems reasonable to conclude from these fundamental differences that about the time when men were passing from the Paleolithic to Neolithic conditions, and beginning to form rather larger communities than the family herd. When they were beginning to tell each other long stories and argue and exchange ideas, human beings were distributed about the world in a number of areas which communicated very little with each other. They were separated by oceans, seas, thick forests, deserts or mountains from one another. 
There may have been in that remote time, it may be 10,000 years ago or more, Aryan, Semitic, Hamitic, Turanian, American, and Chinese-speaking tribes and families, wandering over their several areas of hunting and pasture. All at very much the same stage of culture, and each developing its linguistic instrument in its own way. Probably each of these original tribes was not more numerous altogether than the Indians in Hudson Bay Territory today. Agriculture was barely beginning, and until agriculture made a denser population possible men may have been almost as rare as the great apes have always been. In addition to these early Neolithic tribes, there must have been various varieties of still more primitive forest folk in Africa and in India. Central Africa, from the Upper Nile, was then a vast forest, impenetrable to ordinary human life, a forest of which the Congo forests of today are the last shrunken remains. Possibly the spread of men of a race higher than primitive Australoids into the East Indies, and the development of the languages of the Malay Polynesian type came later in time than the origination of these other language groups. The language divisions of the philologist do tally, it is manifest, in a broad sort of way with the main race classes of the ethnologist, and they carry out the same idea of age long separations between great divisions of mankind. In the glacial age, ice, or at least a climate too severe for the free spreading of peoples, extended from the North Pole into Central Europe and across Russia and Siberia to the great tablelands of Central Asia. After the last glacial age, this cold north mitigated its severities very slowly, and was for long without any other population than the wandering hunters who spread eastward and across Bering Strait. North and Central Europe and Asia did not become sufficiently temperate for agriculture until quite recent times, times that is within the limit of 12,000 or possibly even 10,000 years. And a dense forest period intervened between the age of the hunter and the agricultural clearings. This forest period was also a very wet period. It has been called the pluvial or lacustrine age, the rain or pond period. It has to be remembered that the outlines of the land of the world have changed greatly even in the last hundred centuries. Across European Russia, from the Baltic to the Caspian Sea, as the ice receded there certainly spread much water in many impassable swamps. The Caspian Sea and the Sea of Aral and parts of the desert of Turkestan, are the vestiges of a great extent of sea that reached far up to the Volga Valley and sent an arm westward to join the Black Sea. Mountain barriers much higher than they are now, and the arm of the sea that is now the region of the Indus, completed the separation of the early Caucasian races from the Mongolians and the Dravidians. And made the broad racial differentiation of those groups possible. Again the blown sand desert of Sahara, it is not a dried up sea, but a wind desert, and was once fertile and rich in life, becoming more and more dry and sandy cut the Caucasians off from the sparse primitive Negro population in the central forest region of Africa. The Persian Gulf extended very far to the north of its present head, and combined with the Syrian desert to cut off the Semitic peoples from the eastern areas, while on the other hand the south of Arabia, much more fertile than it is today, may have reached across what is now the Gulf of Aden towards Abyssinia and Somaliland. The Mediterranean and Red Sea were probably still joined at Suez. The Himalayas and the higher and vaster massif of Central Asia and the northward extension of the Bay of Bengal up to the present Ganges Valley divided off the Dravidians from the Mongolians. The canoe was the chief link between Dravidian and southern Mongol, and the Gobi system of seas and lakes which presently became the Gobi Desert. And the great system of mountain chains which follow one another across Asia from the center to the northeast, split the Mongolian races into the Chinese and the Ural-Altaic language groups. Bering Strait, when this came into existence, before or after the pluvial period, isolated the Amerindians. These ancient separations must have remained effectual well into Neolithic times. The barriers between Africa, Asia, and Europe were lowered or bridged by that time, but mixing had not gone far. The practical separation of the West from Dravidian India and China continued indeed down almost into historical times. But the Semite, the Hamite, and the Aryan were already in close contact and vigorous reaction again in the very dawn of history. We are not suggesting here, be it noted, that these ancient separations were absolute separations. 
but that they were effectual enough at least to prevent any great intermixture of blood or any great intermixture of speech in those days of man's social beginnings. There was, nevertheless, some amount of meeting and exchange even then, some drift of knowledge that spread the crude patterns and use of various implements, and the seeds of a primitive agriculture about the world. Section 8. The fundamental tongues of these nine main language groups we have noted were not by any means all the human speech beginnings of the Neolithic age. There may have been other, and possibly many other, ineffective centers of speech which were afterwards overrun by the speakers of still surviving tongues, and of elementary languages which faded out. We find strange little patches of speech still in the world which do not seem to be connected with any other language about them. Sometimes, however, an exhaustive inquiry seems to affiliate these disconnected patches, seems to open out to us tantalizing glimpses of some simpler, wider, and more fundamental and universal form of human speech. One language group that has been keenly discussed is the Basque group of dialects. The Basques live now on the north and south slopes of the Pyrenees. They number perhaps 600,000 altogether in Europe, and to this day they are a very sturdy and independent spirited people. Their language, as it exists today, is a fully developed one. But it is developed upon lines absolutely different from those of the Aryan languages about it. Basque newspapers have been published in the Argentine and in the United States to supply groups of prosperous emigrants. The earliest French settlers in Canada were Basque, and Basque names are frequent among the French Canadians to this day. Ancient remains point to a much wider distribution of the Basque speech and people over Spain. For a long time this Basque language was a profound perplexity to scholars, and its structural character led to the suggestion that it might be related to some Amerindian tongue. A. H. Keen, in Man Past and Present, assembles reasons for linking it, though remotely, with the Berber language of North Africa, and through the Berber with the general body of Hamitic languages, but this relationship is questioned by other philologists. They find Basque more akin to certain similarly stranded vestiges of speech found in the Caucasian mountains, and they are disposed to regard it as a last surviving member, much changed and specialized. Of a once very widely extended group of pre-Hamitic languages, otherwise extinct, spoken chiefly by peoples of that brunette Mediterranean race, round barrow men, which once occupied most of Western and Southern Europe and Western Asia and which may have been very closely related to the Dravidians of India and the peoples with a Heliolithic culture who spread eastward thence through the East Indies to Polynesia and beyond. It is quite possible that over Western and Southern Europe language groups extended 10,000 years ago that have completely vanished before Aryan tongues. Later on we shall note, in passing, the possibility of three lost language groups represented by, one, ancient Cretan, Lydian, and the like, though these may have belonged, says Sir H. H. Johnston, to the Basque Caucasian Dravidian. Group, 2, Sumerian, and, 3, Elamite. The suggestion has been made, it is a mere guess, that ancient Sumerian may have been a linking language between the early Basque Caucasian and early Mongolian groups. If this is true, then we have in this Basque Caucasian Dravidian Sumerian Proto Mongolian group a still more ancient and more ancestral system of speech than the fundamental Hamitic. The Hottentot language is said to have affinities with the Hamitic tongues, from which it is separated by the whole breadth of Bantu speaking Central Africa. A Hottentot like language with Bushman affinities is still spoken in equatorial East Africa, and this strengthens the idea that the whole of East Africa was once Hamitic speaking. The Bantu languages and peoples spread, in comparatively recent times, from some center of origin in West Central Africa and cut off the Hottentots from the other Hamitic peoples. But it is at least equally probable that the Hottentot is a separate language group. Among other remote and isolated little patches of language are the Papuan speech of New Guinea and the native Australian. The now extinct Tasmanian language is little known. What we know of it is in support of what we have guessed about the comparative speechlessness of Paleolithic man. We may quote a passage from Hutchinson's Living Races of Mankind upon this matter. The language of the natives is irretrievably lost, only imperfect indication of its structure and a small proportion of its words having been preserved. In the absence of sibilance and some other features, their dialects resembled the Australian, 
but were of ruder, of less developed structure, and so imperfect that, according to Joseph Milligan, our best authority on the subject. They observed no settled order or arrangement of words in the construction of their sentences, but conveyed in a supplementary fashion by tone, manner, and gesture those modifications of meaning which we express by mood, tense, number, etc. Abstract terms were rare, for every variety of gum tree or wattle tree there was a name, but no word for tree, in general, nor for qualities such as hard, soft, warm, cold, long, short, round, etc. Anything hard was like a stone, anything round like the moon, and so on, usually suiting the action to the word and confirming by some sign the meaning to be understood. Section 9 in reading this chapter it is well to remember how laborious and difficult are the tasks of comparative philology, and how necessary it is to understand the qualifications and limitations that are to be put upon its conclusions. The Aryan group of languages is much better understood than any other, for the simple reason that it has been more familiar and accessible to European science. The other groups have been less thoroughly investigated, because so far they have not been studied exhaustively by men accustomed to use them, and whose minds are set in the key of their structure. Even the Semitic languages have been approached at a disadvantage because few Jews think in Hebrew. But a time is fast approaching when Japanese, Chinese, Arabic, and Indian philologists will come to the rescue in these matters, and good reason may be found for revising much that has been said above about the Native American, Ural-Altaic, Primitive Chinese, and Polynesian groups of tongues. Book 3 the Dawn of History. 15. The Aryan-speaking peoples in prehistoric times. Section 1. The Spreading of the Aryan Speakers. Section 2. Primitive Aryan Life. Section 3. Early Aryan Daily Life. Section 1. We have spoken of the Aryan language as probably arising in the region of the Danube and South Russia and spreading from that region of origin. We say, probably, because it is by no means certainly proved that that was the center. There have been vast discussions upon this point and wide divergences of opinion. We give the prevalent view. As it spread widely, Aryan began to differentiate into a number of subordinate languages. To the west and south it encountered the Basque language, which was then widely spread in Spain, and also possibly various Hamitic Mediterranean languages. The Neolithic Mediterranean race, the Iberian race, was distributed over Great Britain, Ireland, France, Spain, North Africa, South Italy, and, in a more civilized state, Greece and Asia Minor. It was probably closely related to the Egyptian. To judge by its European vestiges it was a rather small human type, generally with an oval face and a long head. It buried its chiefs and important people in megalithic chambers, i.e. made of big stones, covered over by great mounds of earth. And these mounds of earth, being much longer than they are broad, are spoken of as the long barrows. These people sheltered at times in caves, and also buried some of their dead therein. And from the traces of charred, broken, and cut human bones, including the bones of children, it is inferred that they were cannibals. These short dark Iberian tribes, and the Basques also if they were a different race, were thrust back westward, and conquered and enslaved by slowly advancing waves of a taller and fairer Aryan-speaking people. Coming southward and westward through Central Europe, who are spoken of as the Celts. Only the Basque resisted the conquering Aryan speech. Gradually these Celtic speakers made their way to the Atlantic, and all that now remains of the Iberians is mixed into the Celtic population. How far the Celtic invasion affected the Irish population is a matter of debate at the present time, the Celts may have been a mere caste of conquerors who imposed their language on a larger subject population. It is even doubtful if the north of England is more Aryan than pre-Celtic in blood. There is a sort of short dark Welshman, and certain types of Irishmen, who are Iberians by race. The modern Portuguese are also largely of Iberian blood. The Celts spoke a language, Celtic, which was also in its turn to differentiate into the language of Gaul, Welsh, Breton, Scotch and Irish Gaelic, and other tongues. They buried the ashes of their chiefs and important people in round barrows. While these Nordic Celts were spreading westward, 
other Nordic Aryan peoples were pressing down upon the dark white Mediterranean race in the Italian and Greek peninsulas, and developing the Latin and Greek groups of tongues. Certain other Aryan tribes were drifting towards the Baltic and across into Scandinavia, speaking varieties of the Aryan which became ancient Norse, the parent of Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, and Icelandic, Gothic, and Low and High German. While the primitive Aryan speech was thus spreading and breaking up into daughter languages to the west, it was also spreading and breaking up to the east. North of the Carpathians and the Black Sea, Aryan-speaking tribes were increasing and spreading and using a distinctive dialect called Slavonian, from which came Russian, Serbian, Polish, Bulgarian, and other tongues. Other variations of Aryan distributed over Asia Minor and Persia were also being individualized as Armenian and Indo-Iranian, the parent of Sanskrit and Persian. In this book we have used the word Aryan for all this family of languages, but the term Indo-European is sometimes used for the entire family, and Aryan itself restricted in a narrower sense to the Indo-Iranian speech. This Indo-Iranian speech was destined to split later into a number of languages, including Persian and Sanskrit. The latter being the language of certain tribes of fair-complexioned Aryan speakers who pushed eastward into India somewhere between 300 and 1000 B. C. and conquered dark Dravidian peoples who were then in possession of that land. Section 2. What sort of life did these prehistoric Aryans lead? these Nordic Aryans who were the chief ancestors of most Europeans and most white Americans and European colonists of today, as well as of the Armenians, Persians, and high caste Hindus. In answering that question we are able to resort to a new source of knowledge in addition to the dug-up remains and vestiges upon which we have had to rely in the case of Paleolithic man. We have language. By careful study of the Aryan languages it has been found possible to deduce a number of conclusions about the life of these Aryan peoples 5,000 or 4,000 years ago. All these languages have a common resemblance, as each, as we have already explained, rings the changes upon a number of common roots. When we find the same root word running through all or most of these tongues, it seems reasonable to conclude that the thing that root word signifies must have been known to the common ancestors. Of course, if they have exactly the same word in their languages, this may not be the case, it may be the new name of a new thing or of a new idea that has spread over the world quite recently. Gas, for instance is a word that was made by Van Helmont, a Dutch chemist, about 1625, and has spread into most civilized tongues, and tobacco, again is an American Indian word which followed the introduction of smoking almost everywhere. But if the same word turns up in a number of languages, and if it follows the characteristic modifications of each language, we may feel sure that it has been in that language, and a part of that language, since the beginning. Suffering the same changes with the rest of it. We know, for example, that the words for wagon and will run in this fashion through the Aryan tongues, and so we are able to conclude that the primitive Aryans, the more purely Nordic Aryans, had wagons. Though it would seem from the absence of any common roots for spokes, rim, or axle that their wheels were not wheelwrights wheels with spokes, but made of the trunks of trees shaped out with an axe between the ends. These primitive wagons were drawn by oxen. The early Aryans did not ride or drive horses, they had very little to do with horses. The reindeer men were a horse people, but the Neolithic Aryans were a cow people. They ate beef, not horse. And after many ages they began this use of draft cattle. They reckoned wealth by cows. They wandered, following pasture, and trekking, their goods, as the South African boars do, in ox wagons, though of course their wagons were much clumsier than any to be found in the world today. They probably ranged over very wide areas. They were migratory, but not in the strict sense of the word, nomadic, they moved in a slower, clumsier fashion than did the later, more specialized nomadic peoples. They were forest and parkland people without horses. They were developing a migratory life out of the more settled, forest-clearing life of the earlier Neolithic period. Changes of climate which were replacing forest by pasture, and the accidental burning of forests by fire may have assisted this development. When these early Aryans came to big rivers or open water, they built boats, at first hollow tree trunks and then skin-covered frameworks of lighter wood. 
Before history began there was already some Aryan canoe traffic across the English Channel and in the Baltic, and also among the Greek islands. But the Aryans, as we shall see later, were probably not the first peoples to take to the sea. We have already described the sort of home the primitive Aryan occupied and his household life, so far as the remains of the Swiss pile dwellings enable us to describe these things. Mostly his houses were of too flimsy a sort, probably of wattle and mud, to have survived, and possibly he left them and trekked on for very slight reasons. The Aryan peoples burnt their dead, a custom they still preserve in India, but their predecessors, the Long Barrow people, the Iberians, buried their dead in a sitting position. In some ancient Aryan burial mounds, round barrows, the urns containing the ashes of the departed are shaped like houses, and these represent rounded huts with thatched roofs. See Fig. The grazing of the primitive Aryan was far more important to him than his agriculture. At first he cultivated with a rough wooden hoe. Then, after he had found out the use of cattle for draft purposes, he began real plowing with oxen, using at first a suitably bent tree bough as his plow. His first cultivation before that came about must have been rather in the form of garden patches near the house buildings than of fields. Most of the land his tribe occupied was common land on which the cattle grazed together. He never used stone for building house walls until upon the very verge of history. He used stone for hearths, e.g. at Glastonbury, and sometimes stone substructures. He did, however, make a sort of stone house in the center of the great mounds in which he buried his illustrious dead. He may have learnt this custom from his Iberian neighbors and predecessors. It was these dark whites of the Heliolithic culture, and not the primitive Aryans, who were responsible for such primitive temples as Stonehenge or Karnak in Brittany. His social life was growing. Man was now living in clans and tribal communities. These clans and communities clashed, they took each other's grazing land, they sought to rob each other, there began a new thing in human life, war. For war is not a primeval thing, it has not been in this world for more than 20,000 years. To this day very primitive peoples, such as the Australian Blackfellows, do not understand war. The Paleolithic Age was an age of fights and murder, no doubt, but not of the organized collective fighting of numbers of men. But now men could talk together and group themselves under leaders, and they found a need of centers where they could come together with their cattle in time of raids and danger. They began to make camps with walls of earth and palisades, many of which are still to be traced in the history-worn contours of the European scenery. The leaders under whom men fought in war were often the same men as the sacrificial purifiers who were their early priests. The knowledge of bronze spread late in Europe. Neolithic man had been making his slow advances age by age for 7,000 or 8,000 years before the metals came. By that time his social life had developed so that there were men of various occupations and men and women of different ranks in the community. There were men who worked wood and leather, potters and carvers. The women span and wove and embroidered. There were chiefs and families that were distinguished as leaderly and noble. And man varied the monotony of his herding and wandering, he consecrated undertakings and celebrated triumphs, held funeral assemblies, and distinguished the traditional seasons of the year, by feasts. His meats we have already glanced at. But somewhere between 10,000 BC and the broadening separation of the Aryan peoples towards 2000 or 1000 BC, mankind discovered fermentation, and began to brew intoxicating drinks. He made these of honey, of barley, and, as the Aryan tribe spread southward, of the grape. And he got merry and drunken. Whether he first used yeast to make his bread light or to ferment his drink we do not know. At his feasts there were individuals with a gift for, playing the fool, who did so no doubt to win the laughter of their friends, but there was also another sort of men, of great importance in their time, and still more important to the historian. Certain singers of songs and stories, the bards, or rhapsodists. These bards existed among all the Aryan-speaking peoples, they were a consequence of and a further factor in that development of spoken language which was the chief of all the human advances made in Neolithic times. They chanted or recited stories of the past, or stories of the living chief and his people, they told other stories that they invented, 
they memorized jokes and catches. They found and seized upon and improved the rhythms, rhymes, alliterations, and such like possibilities latent in language, they probably did much to elaborate and fix grammatical forms. They were the first great artists of the year, as the later Aurignacian rock painters were the first great artists of the eye and hand. No doubt they used much gesture, probably they learned appropriate gestures when they learnt their songs. But the order and sweetness and power of language was their primary concern. And they mark a new step forward in the power and range of the human mind. They sustained and developed in men's minds the sense of a greater something than themselves, the tribe, and of a life that extended back into the past. They not only recalled old hatreds and battles, they recalled old alliances and a common inheritance. The feats of dead heroes lived again. A new thought came into men's minds, the desire to be remembered. Men began to live in thought before they were born and after they were dead. Like most human things, this bardic tradition grew first slowly and then more rapidly. By the time bronze was coming into Europe there was not an Aryan people that had not a profession and training of bards. In their hands language became as beautiful as it is ever likely to be. These bards were living books, man histories, guardians and makers of a new and more powerful tradition in human life. Every Aryan people had its long poetical records thus handed down, its sagas, Teutonic, its epics, Greek, its Vedas, Old Sanskrit. The earliest Aryan people were essentially a people of the voice. The recitation seems to have predominated even in those ceremonial and dramatic dances and that, dressing up, which among most human races have also served for the transmission of tradition. At that time there was no writing, and when first the art of writing crept into Europe, as we shall tell later, it must have seemed far too slow, clumsy. And lifeless a method of record for men to trouble very much about writing down these glowing and beautiful treasures of the memory. Writing was at first kept for accounts and matters of fact. The bards and rhapsodists flourished for long after the introduction of writing. They survived, indeed, in Europe as the minstrels into the Middle Ages. Unhappily their tradition had not the fixity of a written record. They amended and reconstructed, they had their fashions and their phases of negligence. Accordingly we have now only the very much altered and revised vestiges of that spoken literature of prehistoric times. One of the most interesting and informing of these prehistoric compositions of the Aryans survives in the Greek Iliad. An early form of Iliad was probably recited by 1000 BC, but it was not written down until perhaps 700 or 600 BC. Many men must have had to do with it as authors and improvers, but later Greek tradition attributed it to a blind bard named Homer, to whom also is ascribed the Odyssey, a composition of a very different spirit and outlook. To be a bard was naturally a blind man's occupation. The Slavs called all bards slypak, which was also their word for a blind man. The original recited version of the Iliad was older than that of the Odyssey. The Iliad as a complete poem is older than the Odyssey, though the material of the Odyssey, being largely undateable folklore, is older than any of the historical material in the Iliad. Both epics were probably written over and rewritten by some poet of a later date, in much the same manner that Lord Tennyson, the poet laureate of Queen Victoria, in his Idols of the King, wrote over the Mort d'Arthur, which was itself a writing over by Sir Thomas Mallory, Cirque. 1450, of pre-existing legends, making the speeches and sentiments and the characters more in accordance with those of his own time. But the events of the Iliad and the Odyssey, the way of living they describe, the spirit of the acts recorded, belong to the closing centuries of the prehistoric age. These sagas, epics, and Vedas do supply, in addition to archaeology and philology, a third source of information about those vanished times. Here, for example, is the concluding passage of the Iliad, describing very exactly the making of a prehistoric barrow. We have taken here Chapman's rhyme translation, correcting certain words with the help of the prose version of Lang, Leaf, and Myers. Thus oxen, mules, in wagons straight they put. Went forth, and an unmeasured pile of sylvan matter cut. Nine days employed in carriage, but when the tenth morn shinned. On wretched mortals, 
then they brought the bravest of his kind. Fourth to be burned. Troy swam in tears. Upon the pile's most height. They laid the body, and gave fire. All day it burned, all night. But when th eleventh morn let on earth her rosy fingers shine. The people flocked about the pile, and first with gleaming wine. Quenched all the flames. His brothers then, and friends, the snowy bones. Gathered into an urn of gold, still pouring out their moans. Then wrapped they in soft purple veils the rich urn, digged a pit. Grabbed it, built up the grave with stones, and quickly piled on it. A barrow. The barrow heaped once, all the town. In Jovna's Priam's court partook a sumptuous funeral feast. And so horse-taming Hector's rites gave up his soul to rest. There remains also an old English saga, Beowulf, made long before the English had crossed from Germany into England, which winds up with a similar burial. The preparation of a pyre is first described. It is hung round with shields and coats of mail. The body is brought and the pyre fired, and then for ten days the warriors built a mighty mound to be seen afar by the traveller on sea or land. Beowulf, which is at least a thousand years later than the Iliad, is also interesting because one of the main adventures in it is the looting of the treasures of a barrow already ancient in those days. Section 3 The Greek epics reveal the early Greeks with no knowledge of iron, without writing, and before any Greek-founded cities existed in the land into which they had evidently come quite recently as conquerors. They were spreading southward from the Aryan region of origin. They seem to have been a fair people, newcomers in Greece, newcomers to a land that had been held hitherto by a darker people, people who are now supposed to have belonged to a dark white aboriginal race. A Mediterranean people allied to those Iberians whom the Celts pressed westward, and to the Hamitic white people of North Africa. Combat between Menelaus and Hector, in the Iliad. From a platter ascribed to the end of the 7th century in the British. Museum. This is probably the earliest known vase bearing a Greek. Inscription. Greek writing was just beginning. Note the swastika. Let us, at the risk of a slight repetition, be perfectly clear upon one point. The Iliad does not give us the primitive Neolithic life of that Aryan region of origin. It gives us that life already well on the move towards a new state of affairs. The primitive Neolithic way of living, with its tame and domesticated animals, its pottery and cooking, and its patches of rude cultivation, we have sketched in chapter 11. We have already discussed in section 4 of chapter 13 the probability of a widespread Heliolithic culture, a sort of sub-civilization, very like the Polynesian and Indonesian life of a hundred years ago, an elaboration of the earlier Neolithic stage. Between 15,000 and 1600 BC the Neolithic way of living had spread with the forests and abundant vegetation of the pluvial period, over the greater part of the Old World, from the Niger to the Huang Ho and from Ireland to the south of India. Now, as the climate of great portions of the earth was swinging towards drier and more open conditions again, the primitive Neolithic life was developing along two divergent directions. One was leading to a more wandering life, towards at last a constantly migratory life between summer and winter pasture, which is called nomadism. The other, in certain sunlit river valleys, was towards a water-treasuring life of irrigation, in which men gathered into the first towns and made the first civilization. The nature and development of civilization we shall consider more fully in the next chapter, but here we have to note that the Greeks, as the Iliad presents them, are neither simple Neolithic nomads, innocent of civilization. Nor are they civilized men. They are primitive nomads in an excited state, because they have just come upon civilization, and regard it as an opportunity for war and loot. So far they are exceptional and not representative. But our interest in them in this chapter is not in their distinctively Greek and predatory aspect, but in what they reveal of the ordinary northward life from which they are coming. These early Greeks of the Iliad are sturdy fighters, but without discipline, their battles are a confusion of single combats. They have horses, but no cavalry. They use the horse, which is a comparatively recent addition to Aryan resources, to drag a rude fighting chariot into battle. 
the horse is still novel enough to be something of a terror in itself. For ordinary draft purposes, as in the quotation from the Iliad we have just made, oxen were employed. The only priests of these Aryans are the keepers of shrines and sacred places. There are chiefs, who are heads of families and who also perform sacrifices, but there does not seem to be much mystery or sacramental feeling in their religion. When the Greeks go to war, these heads and elders meet in council and appoint a king, whose powers are very loosely defined. There are no laws, but only customs, and no exact standards of conduct. The social life of the early Greeks centered about the households of these leading men. There were no doubt huts for herds and the like, and outlying farm buildings. But the hall of the chief was a comprehensive center, to which everyone went to feast, to hear the bards, to take part in games and exercises. The primitive craftsmen were gathered there. About it were cowsheeds and stabling and such like offices. Unimportant people slept about anywhere as retainers did in the medieval castles and as people still do in Indian households. Except for quite personal possessions, there was still an air of patriarchal communism about the tribe. The tribe, or the chief as the head of the tribe, owned the grazing lands, forest and rivers were the wild. The Aryan civilization seems, and indeed all early communities seem, to have been without the little separate households that make up the mass of the population in Western Europe or America today. The tribe was a big family. The nation a group of tribal families, a household often contained hundreds of people. Human society began, just as herds and droves begin among animals, by the family delaying its breaking up. Nowadays the lions in East Africa are apparently becoming social animals in this way, by the young keeping with the mother after they are fully grown, and hunting in a group. Hitherto the lion has been much more of a solitary beast. If men and women do not cling to their families nowadays as much as they did, it is because the state and the community now supply safety and help and facilities that were once only possible in the family group. In the Hindu community of today these great households of the earlier stages of human society are still to be found. Mr. Bupendranath Basu has recently described a typical Hindu household. It is an Aryan household refined and made gentle by thousands of years of civilization, but its social structure is the same as that of the households of which the Aryan epics tell. The joint family system, he said, has descended to us from time immemorial, the Aryan patriarchal system of old still holding sway in India. The structure, though ancient, remains full of life. The joint family is a cooperative corporation, in which men and women have a well-defined place. At the head of the corporation is the senior member of the family, generally the eldest male member, but in his absence the senior female member often assumes control. C.P. Penelope in the Odyssey All able-bodied members must contribute their labor and earnings, whether of personal skill or agriculture and trade, to the common stock, weaker members, widows, orphans, and destitute relations, all must be maintained and supported. Sons, nephews, brothers, cousins, all must be treated equally, for any undue preference is apt to break up the family. We have no word for cousins, they are either brothers or sisters, and we do not know what are cousins two degrees removed. The children of a first cousin are your nephews and nieces, just the same as the children of your brothers and sisters. A man can no more marry a cousin, however removed, than he can marry his own sister, except in certain parts of Madras, where a man may marry his maternal uncle's daughter. The family affections, the family ties, are always very strong, and therefore the maintenance of an equal standard among so many members is not so difficult as it may appear at first sight. Moreover, life is very simple. Until recently shoes were not in general use at home, but sandals without any leather fastenings. I have known of a well-to-do middle-class family of several brothers and cousins who had two or three pairs of leather shoes between them, these shoes being only used when they had occasion to go out. And the same practice is still followed in the case of the more expensive garments, like shawls, which last for generations, and with their age are treated with loving care, as having been used by ancestors of revered memory. The joint family remains together sometimes for several generations, until it becomes too unwieldy, 
when it breaks up into smaller families, and you thus see whole villages peopled by members of the same clan. I have said that the family is a cooperative society, and it may be likened to a small state, and is kept in its place by strong discipline based on love and obedience. You see nearly every day the younger members coming to the head of the family and taking the dust of his feet as a token of benediction, whenever they go on an enterprise, they take his leave and carry his blessing. There are many bonds which bind the family together, the bonds of sympathy, of common pleasures, of common sorrows, when a death occurs, all the members go into mourning, when there is a birth or a wedding, the whole family rejoices. Then above all is the family deity, some image of Vishnu, the preserver, his place is in a separate room, generally known as the room of God, or in well-to-do families in a temple attached to the house, where the family performs its daily worship. There is a sense of personal attachment between this image of the deity and the family, for the image generally comes down from past generations, often miraculously acquired by a pious ancestor at some remote time. With the household gods is intimately associated the family priest. The Hindu priest is a part of the family life of his flock, between whom and himself the tie has existed for many generations. The priest is not generally a man of much learning. He knows, however, the traditions of his faith. He is not a very heavy burden, for he is satisfied with little, a few handfuls of rice, a few homegrown bananas or vegetables, a little unrefined sugar made in the village, and sometimes a few pieces of copper are all that is needed. A picture of our family life would be incomplete without the household servants. A female servant is known as the Tijai, or daughter, in Bengal, she is like the daughter of the house. She calls the master and the mistress father and mother, and the young men and women of the family brothers and sisters. She participates in the life of the family. She goes to the holy places along with her mistress, for she could not go alone, and generally she spends her life with the family of her adoption, her children are looked after by the family. The treatment of men's servants is very similar. These servants, men and women, are generally people of the humbler castes, but a sense of personal attachment grows up between them and the members of the family. And as they get on in years they are affectionately called by the younger members elder brothers, uncles, aunts, etc. In a well-to-do house there is always a resident teacher, who instructs the children of the family as well as other boys of the village. There is no expensive school building, but room is found in some veranda or shed in the courtyard for the children and their teacher, and into this school low-caste boys are freely admitted. These indigenous schools were not of a very high order, but they supplied an agency of instruction for the masses which was probably not available in many other countries. With Hindu life is bound up its traditional duty of hospitality. It is the duty of a householder to offer a meal to any stranger who may come before midday and ask for one. The mistress of the house does not sit down to her meal until every member is fed, and, as sometimes her food is all that is left, she does not take her meal until well after midday lest a hungry stranger should come and claim one. We have been tempted to quote Mr. Basu at some length because here we do get to something like a living understanding of the type of household which has prevailed in human communities since Neolithic days, which still prevails today in India, China, and the Far East. But which in the West is rapidly giving ground before a state and municipal organization of education and a large-scale industrialism within which an amount of individual detachment and freedom is possible. Such as these great households never knew. But let us return now to the history preserved for us in the Aryan epics. The Sanskrit epics tell a very similar story to that underlying the Iliad, the story of a fair. Beef-eating people, only later did they become vegetarians, coming down from Persia into the plain of North India and conquering their way slowly towards the Indus. From the Indus they spread over India, but as they spread they acquired much from the dark Dravidians they conquered, and they seem to have lost their bardic tradition. The Vedas, says Mr. Basu, were transmitted chiefly in the households by the women. The oral literature of the Celtic peoples who pressed westward has not been preserved so completely as that of the Greeks or Indians. It was written down many centuries later, and so, like the barbaric, primitive English Beowulf, has lost any clear evidence of a period of migration into the lands of an antecedent people. 
If the pre Aryans figure in it at all, it is as the fairy folk of the Irish stories. Ireland, most cut off of all the Celtic speaking communities, retained to the latest date its primitive life. And the Tain, the Irish Iliad, describes a cattle keeping life in which war chariots are still used, and war dogs also, and the heads of the slain are carried off slung round the horses' necks. The Tain is the story of a cattle raid. Here too the same social order appears as in the Iliad, the chiefs sit and feast in great halls, they build halls for themselves, there is singing and storytelling by the bards and drinking and intoxication. Priests are not very much in evidence, but there is a sort of medicine man who deals in spells and prophecy. 16. The First Civilizations Section 1. Early Cities and Early Nomads Section 2a. The Riddle of the Sumerians Section 2b. The Empire of Sargon I. Section 2c. The Empire of Hammurabi. Section 2d. The Assyrians and their Empire. Section 2e. The Chaldean Empire. Section 3. The Early History of Egypt. Section 4. The Early Civilization of India. Section 5. The Early History of China. Section 6. While the Civilizations Were Growing. Section 1. When the Aryan way of speech and life was beginning to spread to the east and west of the region in which it began, and breaking up as it spread into a number of languages and nations. Considerable communities of much more civilized men were already in existence in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, and probably also in China and in, still purely Dravidian, India. Our story has overshot itself in its account of the Aryans and of their slow progress from early Neolithic conditions to the heroic barbarism of the Bronze Age. We must now go back. Such a pre-Celtic gathering as we sketched at Avebury would have happened about 2000 BC, and the building of the barrow for Hector as the Iliad describes it, 1300 BC or even later. It is perhaps natural for a European writer writing primarily for English reading students to overrun his subject in this way. No great harm is done if the student does clearly grasp that there has been an overlap. Here then we take up the main thread of human history again. We must hark back to 600 BC or even earlier. But although we shall go back so far, the people we shall describe are people already in some respects beyond the Neolithic Aryans of 3000 years later more particularly in their social organization and their material welfare. While in Central Europe and Central Asia the primitive Neolithic way of life was becoming more migratory and developing into nomadism, in the great river valleys it is becoming more settled and localized. It is still doubtful whether we are to consider Mesopotamia or Egypt the earlier scene of the two parallel beginnings of settled communities living in towns. By 400 BC. In both these regions of the earth, such communities existed, and had been going on for a very considerable time. The excavations of the American expedition at Nippur have unearthed evidence of a city community existing there at least as early as 500 BC, and probably as early as 600 BC, an earlier date than anything we know of in Egypt. The Kandal asserts that it is only in the Euphrates Tigris district that wheat has ever been found growing wild. It may be that from Mesopotamia as a center the cultivation of wheat spread over the entire eastern hemisphere. Or it may be that wheat grew wild in some regions now submerged. There may have been a wild wheat region in what is now the sea bottom of the eastern Mediterranean. But cultivation is not civilization. The growing of wheat had spread from the Atlantic to the Pacific with the distribution of the Neolithic culture by perhaps 10,000 or 9,000 BC, before the beginnings of civilization. Civilization is something more than the occasional seasonal growing of wheat. It is the settlement of men upon an area continuously cultivated and possessed, who live in buildings continuously inhabited with a common rule and a common city or citadel. For a long time civilization may quite possibly have developed in Mesopotamia without any relations with the parallel beginnings in Egypt. The two settlements may have been quite independent, arising separately out of the widely diffused Heliolithic Neolithic culture. Or they may have had a common origin in the region of the Mediterranean, 
the Red Sea, and southern Arabia. The first condition necessary to a real settling down of Neolithic men, as distinguished from a mere temporary settlement among abundant food, was of course a trustworthy all the year round supply of water, fodder for the animals, food for themselves, and building material for their homes. There had to be everything they could need at any season, and no want that would tempt them to wander further. This was a possible state of affairs, no doubt, in many European and Asiatic valleys. And in many such valleys, as in the case of the Swiss lake dwellings, men settled from a very early date indeed. But nowhere, of any countries now known to us, were these favorable conditions found upon such a scale. And nowhere did they hold good so surely year in and year out as in Egypt and in the country between the upper waters of the Euphrates and Tigris and the Persian Gulf. Here was a constant water supply under enduring sunlight, trustworthy harvests year by year, in Mesopotamia wheat yielded, says Herodotus, two hundredfold to the sower, Pliny says that it was cut twice and afterwards yielded good fodder for sheep. There were abundant palms and many sorts of fruits, and as for building material, in Egypt there was clay and easily worked stone, and in Mesopotamia a clay that becomes a brick in the sunshine. In such countries men would cease to wander and settle down almost unawares, they would multiply and discover themselves numerous and by their numbers safe from any casual assailant. They multiplied, producing a denser human population than the earth had ever known before. Their houses became more substantial, wild beasts were exterminated over great areas, the security of life increased so that ordinary men went about in the towns and fields without encumbering themselves with weapons, and, among themselves at least, they became peaceful peoples. Men took root as man had never taken root before. But in the less fertile and more seasonal lands outside these favored areas, there developed on the other hand a thinner, more active population of peoples, the primitive nomadic peoples. In contrast with the settled folk, the agriculturists, these nomads lived freely and dangerously. They were in comparison lean and hungry men. Their herding was still blended with hunting. They fought constantly for their pastures against hostile families. The discoveries in the elaboration of implements and the use of metals made by the settled people spread to them and improved their weapons. They followed the settled folk from Neolithic phase to Bronze phase. It is possible that, in the case of iron, the first users were nomadic. They became more warlike with better arms, and more capable of rapid movements with the improvement of their transport. One must not think of a nomadic stage as a predecessor of a settled stage in human affairs. To begin with, man was a slow drifter, following food. Then one sort of men began to settle down, and another sort became more distinctly nomadic. The settled sort began to rely more and more upon grain for food. The nomad began to make a greater use of milk for food. He bred his cows for milk. The two ways of life specialized in opposite directions. It was inevitable that nomad folk and the settled folk should clash, that the nomads should seem hard barbarians to the settled peoples, and the settled peoples soft and effeminate and very good plunder to the nomad peoples. Along the fringes of the developing civilizations there must have been a constant raiding and bickering between hardy nomad tribes and mountain tribes and the more numerous and less warlike peoples in the towns and villages. For the most part this was a mere raiding of the borders. The settled folk had the weight of numbers on their side, the herdsmen might raid and loot, but they could not stay. That sort of mutual friction might go on for many generations. But ever and again we find some leader or some tribe amidst the disorder of free and independent nomads, powerful enough to force a sort of unity upon its kindred tribes, and then woe betide the nearest civilization. Down pour the united nomads on the unwarlike, unarmed plains, and there ensues a war of conquest. Instead of carrying off the booty, the conquerors settle down on the conquered land, which becomes all booty for them. The villagers and townsmen are reduced to servitude and tribute paying, they become hewers of wood and drawers of water, and the leaders of the nomads become kings and princes, masters and aristocrats. They too settle down, they learn many of the arts and refinements of the conquered, they cease to be lean and hungry, but for many generations they retain traces of their old nomadic habits, they hunt and indulge in open-air sports. 
They drive and race chariots, they regard work, especially agricultural work, as the lot of an inferior race and class. This in a thousand variations has been one of the main stories in history for the last seventy centuries or more. In the first history that we can clearly decipher we find already in all the civilized regions a distinction between a non-working ruler class and the working mass of the population. And we find too that after some generations, the aristocrat, having settled down, begins to respect the arts and refinements and law-abidingness of settlement, and to lose something of his original hardihood. He intermarries, he patches up a sort of toleration between conqueror and conquered, he exchanges religious ideas and learns the lessons upon which soil and climate insist. He becomes a part of the civilization he has captured. And as he does so, events gather towards a fresh invasion by the free adventurers of the outer world. Section 2a. This alternation of settlement, conquest, refinement, fresh conquest, refinement, is particularly to be noted in the region of the Euphrates and Tigris which lay open in every direction to great areas which are not arid enough to be complete deserts, but which were not fertile enough to support civilized populations. Perhaps the earliest people to form real cities in this part of the world, or indeed in any part of the world, were a people of mysterious origin called the Sumerians. They were neither Semites nor Aryans, and whence they came we do not know. Whether they were dark whites of Iberian or Dravidian affinities is less certainly to be denied. They used a kind of writing which they scratched upon clay, and their language has been deciphered. It was a language more like the unclassified Caucasic language groups than any others that now exist. These languages may be connected with Basque, and may represent what was once a widespread group extending from Spain and Western Europe to Eastern India, and reaching southwards to Central Africa. These people shaved their heads and wore simple tunic-like garments of wool. They settled first on the lower courses of the Great River and not very far from the Persian Gulf, which in those days ran up for a hundred and thirty miles and more beyond its present head. They fertilized their fields by letting water run through irrigation trenches, and they gradually became very skillful hydraulic engineers, they had cattle, asses, sheep, and goats, but no horses. Their collections of mud huts grew into towns, and their religion raised up tower-like temple buildings. Clay, dried in the sun, was a very great fact in the lives of these people. This lower country of the Euphrates-Tigris valleys had little or no stone. They built of brick, they made pottery in earthenware images, and they drew and presently wrote upon thin tile-like cakes of clay. They do not seem to have had paper or to have used parchment. Their books and memoranda, even their letters, were potsherds. At Nippur they built a great tower of brick to their chief god, El-Lil, in Lil, the memory of which is supposed to be preserved in the story of the Tower of Babel. They seem to have been divided up into city-states, which warred among themselves and maintained for many centuries their military capacity. Their soldiers carried long spears and shields, and fought in close formation. Sumerians conquered Sumerians. Sumeria remained unconquered by any stranger race for a very long period of time indeed. They developed their civilization, their writing, and their shipping, through a period that may be twice as long as the whole period from the Christian era to the present time. The first of all known empires was that founded by the high priest of the god of the Sumerian city of Iraq. It reached, says an inscription at Nippur, from the lower, Persian Gulf, to the upper, Mediterranean or red? C. Among the mud heaps of the Euphrates-Tigris Valley the record of that vast period of history, that first half of the age of cultivation, is buried. There flourished the first temples and the first priest rulers that we know of among mankind. Section 2b. Upon the western edge of this country appeared nomadic tribes of Semitic-speaking peoples who traded, raided, and fought with the Sumerians for many generations. Then arose at last a great leader among these Semites, Sargon, 2750 BC, who united them, and not only conquered the Sumerians, but extended his rule from beyond the Persian Gulf on the east to the Mediterranean on the west. His own people were called the Akkadians and his empire is called the Sumerian Akkadian Empire. It endured for over two hundred years. 
But though the Semites conquered and gave a king to the Sumerian cities, it was the Sumerian civilization which prevailed over the simpler Semitic culture. The newcomers learnt the Sumerian writing, the cuneiform writing, and the Sumerian language, they set up no Semitic writing of their own. The Sumerian language became for these barbarians the language of knowledge and power, as Latin was the language of knowledge and power among the barbaric peoples of the Middle Ages in Europe. This Sumerian learning had a very great vitality. It was destined to survive through a long series of conquests and changes that now began in the valley of the two rivers. Section 2c As the people of the Sumerian Akkadian Empire lost their political and military vigor, fresh inundations of a warlike people began from the east, the Elamites, while from the west came the Semitic Amorites, pinching the Sumerian Akkadian Empire between them. The Amorites settled in what was at first a small upriver town, named Babylon, and after a hundred years of warfare became masters of all Mesopotamia under a great king, Hammurabi, 2100 BC, who founded the first Babylonian Empire. Again came peace and security and a decline in aggressive prowess, and in another hundred years fresh nomads from the east were invading Babylonia, bringing with them the horse and the war chariot, and setting up their own king in Babylon. Section 2d. Higher up the Tigris, above the clay lands and with easy supplies of workable stone, a Semitic people, the Assyrians, while the Sumerians were still unconquered by the Semites, were settling about a number of cities of which Assur and Nineveh were the chief. Their peculiar physiognomy, the long nose and thick lips, was very like that of the commoner type of Polish Jew today. They wore great beards and ringlet long hair, tall caps and long robes. They were constantly engaged in mutual raiding with the Hittites to the west, they were conquered by Sargani and became free again, a certain Tushrata, king of Mitanni, to the northwest, captured and held their capital, Nineveh, for a time. They intrigued with Egypt against Babylon and were in the pay of Egypt, they developed the military art to a very high pitch, and became mighty raiders and exactors of tribute. And at last, adopting the horse and the war chariot, they settled accounts for a time with the Hittites, and then, under tiglath pileser I, conquered Babylon for themselves, about 1100 BC. But their hold on the lower, older, and more civilized land was not secure, and Nineveh, the stone city, as distinguished from Babylon, the brick city, remained their capital. For many centuries power swayed between Nineveh and Babylon, and sometimes it was an Assyrian and sometimes a Babylonian who claimed to be king of the world. For four centuries Assyria was restrained from expansion towards Egypt by a fresh northward thrust and settlement of another group of Semitic peoples, the Arameans, whose chief city was Damascus, and whose descendants are the Syrians of today. There is, we may note, no connection whatever between the words Assyrian and Syrian. It is an accidental similarity. Across these Syrians the Assyrian kings fought for power and expansion southwestward. In 745 BC, arose another Tiglath Pileser, Tiglath Pileser III, the Tiglath Pileser of the Bible. He not only directed the transfer of the Israelites to Media, the lost ten tribes whose ultimate fate has exercised so many curious minds, but he conquered and ruled Babylon, so founding what historians know as the new Assyrian Empire. His son, Shalmaneser IV, died during the siege of Samaria, and was succeeded by a usurper, who, no doubt to flatter Babylonian susceptibilities, took the ancient Akkadian Sumerian name of Sargon, Sargon II. He seems to have armed the Assyrian forces for the first time with iron weapons. It was probably Sargon II who actually carried out the deportation of the ten tribes. Such shiftings about of population became a very distinctive part of the political methods of the Assyrian New Empire. Whole nations who were difficult to control in their native country would be shifted en masse to unaccustomed regions and amidst strange neighbors, where their only hope of survival would lie in obedience to the supreme power. Sargon's son, Sennacherib, led the Assyrian hosts to the borders of Egypt. Their Sennacherib's army was smitten by a pestilence, a disaster described in the nineteenth chapter of the second book of Kings. And it came to pass that night, that the angel of the Lord went out, and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred fourscore and five thousand, 
and when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib king of Assyria departed, and went and returned, and dwelt at Nineveh. Sennacherib's grandson, Asurbanipal, called by the Greek Sardanapalus, did succeed in conquering and for a time holding Lower Egypt. Section 2e The Assyrian Empire lasted only 150 years after Sargon II. Fresh nomadic Semites coming from the southeast, the Chaldeans, assisted by two Aryan peoples from the north, the Medes and Persians, combined against it, and took Nineveh in 606 BC. The Chaldean Empire, with its capital at Babylon, Second Babylonian Empire, lasted under Nebuchadnezzar the Great, Nebuchadnezzar II, and his successors until 539 BC. When it collapsed before the attack of Cyrus, the founder of the Persian power. So the story goes on. In 330 BC. As we shall tell later in some detail, a Greek conqueror, Alexander the Great, is looking on the murdered body of the last of the Persian rulers. The story of the Tigris and Euphrates civilizations, of which we have given as yet only the bare outline, is a story of conquest following after conquest, and each conquest replaces old rulers and ruling classes by new. Races like the Sumerian and the Elamite are swallowed up, their languages vanish, they interbreed, and are lost, the Assyrian melts away into Chaldean and Syrian, the Hittites become Aryanized and lose distinction. The Semites who swallowed up the Sumerians give place to Aryan rulers, Medes and Persians appear in the place of the Elamites, the Aryan-Persian language dominates the empire until the Aryan Greek ousts it from official life. Meanwhile the plow does its work year by year, the harvests are gathered, the builders build as they are told, the tradesmen work and acquire fresh devices. The knowledge of writing spreads, novel things, the horse and wheeled vehicles and iron, are introduced and become part of the permanent inheritance of mankind. The volume of trade upon sea and desert increases, men's ideas widen, and knowledge grows. There are setbacks, massacres, pestilence, but the story is, on the whole, one of enlargement. For four thousand years this new thing, civilization, which had set its root into the soil of the two rivers, grew as a tree grows, now losing a limb, now stripped by a storm, but always growing and resuming its growth. After four thousand years the warriors and conquerors were still going to and fro over this growing thing they did not understand, but men had now, 330 BC. Got iron, horses, writing and computation, money, a greater variety of foods and textiles, a wider knowledge of their world. The time that elapsed between the empire of Sargon I and the conquest of Babylon by Alexander the Great was as long, be it noted, at the least estimate, as the time from Alexander the Great to the present day. And before the time of Sargon, men had been settled in the Sumerian land, living in towns, worshipping in temples, following an orderly Neolithic agricultural life in an organized community for at least as long again. Eridu, Lagash, Ur, Uruk, Larsa, have already an immemorial past when first they appear in history. One of the most difficult things for both the writer and student of history is to sustain the sense of these time intervals and prevent these ages becoming shortened by perspective in his imagination. Half the duration of human civilization and the keys to all its chief institutions are to be found before Sargon I. Moreover, the reader cannot too often compare the scale of the dates in these latter fuller pages of man's history with the succession of countless generations to which the time diagrams given on pages 14, 60, and 89 bear witness. Section 3 the story of the Nile Valley from the dawn of its traceable history until the time of Alexander the Great is not very dissimilar from that of Babylonia. But while Babylonia lay open on every side to invasion, Egypt was protected by desert to the west and by desert and sea to the east, while to the south she had only Negro peoples. Consequently her history is less broken by the invasions of strange races than is the history of Assyria and Babylon, and until towards the 8th century BC. When she fell under an Ethiopian dynasty, whenever a conqueror did come into her story, he came in from Asia by way of the Isthmus of Suez. The Stone Age remains in Egypt are of very uncertain date. There are Paleolithic and then Neolithic remains. 
It is not certain whether the Neolithic pastoral people who left those remains were the direct ancestors of the later Egyptians. In many respects they differed entirely from their successors. They buried their dead, but before they buried them they cut up the bodies and apparently ate portions of the flesh. They seem to have done this out of a feeling of reverence for the departed. The dead were eaten with honor, according to the phrase of Mr. Flinders Petrie. It may have been that the survivors hoped to retain thereby some vestige of the strength and virtue that had died. Traces of similar savage customs have been found in the long barrows that were scattered over Western Europe before the spreading of the Aryan peoples, and they have pervaded Negro Africa, where they are only dying out at the present time. About 5000 BC, or earlier, the traces of these primitive peoples cease, and the true Egyptians appear on the scene. The former people were hut builders and at a comparatively low stage of Neolithic culture, the latter were already a civilized Neolithic people, they used brick and wood buildings instead of their predecessors' hovels, and they were working stone. Very soon they passed into the Bronze Age. They possessed a system of picture writing almost as developed as the contemporary writing of the Sumerians, but quite different in character. Possibly there was an eruption from southern Arabia by way of Aden, of a fresh people, who came into Upper Egypt and descended slowly towards the delta of the Nile. Dr. Wallace Budge writes of them as, conquerors from the east. But their gods and their ways, like their picture writing, were very different indeed from the Sumerian. One of the earliest known figures of a deity is that of a hippopotamus goddess, and so very distinctively African. The clay of the Nile is not so fine and plastic as the Sumerian clay, and the Egyptians made no use of it for writing. But they early resorted to strips of the papyrus reed fastened together, from whose name comes our word, paper. The broad outline of the history of Egypt is simpler than the history of Mesopotamia. It has long been the custom to divide the rulers of Egypt into a succession of dynasties, and in speaking of the periods of Egyptian history it is usual to speak of the first, fourth, fourteenth, and so on, dynasty. The Egyptians were ultimately conquered by the Persians after their establishment in Babylon, and when finally Egypt fell to Alexander the Great in 332 BC, it was dynasty XXXI that came to an end. In that long history of over 4,000 years, a much longer period than that between the career of Alexander the Great and the present day, certain broad phases of development may be noted here. There was a phase known as the Bold Kingdom, which culminated in the IVTH dynasty. This dynasty marks a period of wealth and splendor, and its monarchs were obsessed by such a passion for making monuments for themselves as no men have ever before or since had a chance to display and gratify. It was Cheops and Chephren and Mycerinus of this IVTH dynasty who raised the vast piles of the Great and the Second and the Third Pyramids at Gizeh. These unmeaning sepulchral piles, of an almost incredible vastness, erected in an age when engineering science had scarcely begun, exhausted the resources of Egypt through three long reigns, and left her wasted as if by a war. The story of Egypt from the IVTH to the XVTH dynasty is a story of conflicts between alternative capitals and competing religions, of separations into several kingdoms and reunions. It is, so to speak, an internal history. Here we can name only one of that long series of pharaohs, Pepi II, who reigned ninety years, the longest reign in history, and left a great abundance of inscriptions and buildings. At last there happened to Egypt what happened so frequently to the civilizations of Mesopotamia. Egypt was conquered by nomadic Semites who founded a shepherd dynasty, the Hyksos, Xvith, which was finally expelled by native Egyptians. This invasion probably happened while that first Babylonian empire which Hammurabi founded was flourishing, but the exact correspondences of dates between early Egypt and Babylonia are still very doubtful. Only after a long period of servitude did a popular uprising expel these foreigners again. After the War of Liberation, circa 1600 BC, there followed a period of great prosperity in Egypt, the new empire. Egypt became a great and united military state, and pushed her expeditions at last as far as the Euphrates, and so the age-long struggle between the Egyptian and Babylonian Assyrian power began. For a time Egypt was the ascendant power. Thothmes III and his son Amenophis III, 
XVI dynasty, ruled from Ethiopia to the Euphrates in the 15th century BC. For various reasons these names stand out with unusual distinctness in the Egyptian record. They were great builders, and left many monuments and inscriptions. Amenophis III founded Luxor, and added greatly to Karnak. At Tel El Amarna a mass of letters has been found, the royal correspondence with Babylonian and Hittite and other monarchs, including that Tushrata who took Nineveh. Throwing a flood of light upon the political and social affairs of this particular age. Of Amenophis for we shall have more to tell later, but of one, the most extraordinary and able of Egyptian monarchs, Queen Hadassu, the aunt and stepmother of Thotmes III, we have no space to tell. She is represented upon her monuments in masculine garb, and with a long beard as a symbol of wisdom. Thereafter there was a brief Syrian conquest of Egypt, a series, of changing dynasties, among which we may note the XXTH, which included Ramesses II, a great builder of temples, who reigned seventy-seven years, about 1317 to 1250 BC. And who is supposed by some to have been the pharaoh of Moses, and the XXND, which included Shishak, who plundered Solomon's temple, circa 930 BC. An Ethiopian conqueror from the Upper Nile founded the XXVTH dynasty, a foreign dynasty, which went down, 670 BC, before the new Assyrian Empire created by Tiglath Pileser III, Sargon II, and Sennacherib, of which we have already made mention. The days of any Egyptian predominance over foreign nations were drawing to an end. For a time under Semeticus I of the XXVth dynasty, 664-610 BC, native rule was restored, and Necho II recovered for a time the old Egyptian possessions in Syria up to the Euphrates while the Medes and Chaldeans were attacking Nineveh. From those gains Necho II was routed out again after the fall of Nineveh and the Assyrians by Nebuchadnezzar II, the great Chaldean king, the Nebuchadnezzar of the Bible. The Jews, who had been the allies of Necho II, were taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. When, in the 6th century BC, Chaldea fell to the Persians, Egypt followed suit, a rebellion later made Egypt independent once more for sixty years, and in 332 BC. She welcomed Alexander the Great as her conqueror, to be ruled thereafter by foreigners, first by Greeks, then by Romans, then in succession by Arabs, Turks, and British, until the present day. Such briefly is the history of Egypt from its beginnings. A history first of isolation and then of increasing entanglement with the affairs of other nations, as increasing facilities of communication drew the peoples of the world into closer and closer interaction. Section 4 The history we need to tell here of India is simpler even than this brief record of Egypt. Somewhere about the time of Hammurabi or later, a branch of the Aryan-speaking people who then occupied North Persia and Afghanistan, pushed down the northwest passes into India. They conquered their way until they prevailed over all the darker populations of North India, and spread their rule or influence over the whole peninsula. They never achieved any unity in India. Their history is a history of warring kings and republics. The Persian Empire, in the days of its expansion after the capture of Babylon, pushed its boundaries beyond the Indus, and later Alexander the Great marched as far as the border of the desert that separates the Punjab from the Ganges Valley. But with this bare statement we will for a time leave the history of India. Section 5 Meanwhile, as this triple system of white man civilization developed in India and in the lands about the meeting places of Asia, Africa, and Europe, Another and quite distinct civilization was developing and spreading out from the then fertile but now dry and desolate valley of the Darim and from the slopes of the Kunluan Mountains in two directions, down the course of the Huang Ho. And into the valley of the Yangtze Kiang. We know practically nothing as yet of the archaeology of China, we do not know anything of the Stone Age in that part of the world. And at present our ideas of this early civilization are derived from the still very imperfectly explored Chinese literature. It has evidently been from the first and throughout a Mongolian civilization. Until after the time of Alexander the Great there are few traces of any Aryan or Semitic, much less of Hamitic influence. All such influences were still in another world, separated by mountains, deserts, 
and wild nomadic tribes until that time. The Chinese seem to have made their civilization spontaneously and unassisted. Some recent writers suppose indeed a connection with ancient Sumeria. Of course both China and Sumeria arose on the basis of the almost worldwide early Neolithic culture. But the Darim Valley and the lower Euphrates are separated by such vast obstacles of mountain and desert as to forbid the idea of any migration or interchange of peoples who had once settled down. But though the civilization of China is wholly Mongolian, as we have defined Mongolian, it does not follow that the northern roots are the only ones from which it grew. If it grew first in the Darim Valley, then unlike all other civilizations, including the Mexican and Peruvian, it did not grow out of the Heliolithic culture. We Europeans know very little as yet of the ethnology and prehistory of southern China. There the Chinese mingle with such kindred peoples as the Siamese and Burmese, and seem to bridge over towards the darker Dravidian peoples and towards the Malays. It is quite clear from the Chinese records that there were southern as well as northern beginnings of a civilization, and that the Chinese civilization that comes into history 2000 years BC is the result of a long process of conflicts, minglings, and interchanges between a southern and a northern culture of which the southern may have been the earlier. The southern Chinese perhaps played the role towards the northern Chinese that the Hamites or Sumerians played to the Aryan and Semitic peoples in the west, or that the settled Dravidians played towards the Aryans in India. They may have been the first agriculturists and the first temple builders. But so little is known as yet of this attractive chapter in prehistory, that we cannot dwell upon it further here. The chief foreigners mentioned in the early annals of China were a Ural-Altaic people on the northeast frontier, the Huns, against whom certain of the earlier emperors made war. Chinese history is still very imperfectly known to European students, and our accounts of the early records are particularly unsatisfactory. About 2700 to 2400 BC reigned five emperors, who seem to have been almost incredibly exemplary beings. There follows upon these first five emperors a series of dynasties, of which the accounts become more and more exact and convincing as they become more recent. China has to tell a long history of border warfare and of graver struggles between the settled and nomad peoples. To begin with, China, like Sumer and like Egypt, was a land of city-states. The government was at first a government of numerous kings. They became loosely feudal under an emperor, as the Egyptians did, and then later, as with the Egyptians, came a centralizing empire. Shang, 1750-1125 BC, and Chao, 1125-250 BC, are named as being the two great dynasties of the feudal period. Bronze vessels of these earlier dynasties, beautiful, splendid, and with a distinctive style of their own, still exist, and there can be no doubt of the existence of a high state of culture even before the days of Shang. It is perhaps a sense of symmetry that made the later historians of Egypt and China talk of the earlier phases of their national history as being under dynasties comparable to the dynasties of the later empires. And of such early emperors, as Menes, in Egypt, or the first five emperors, in China. The early dynasties exercised far less centralized powers than the later ones. Such unity as China possessed under the Shang dynasty was a religious rather than an effective political union. The Son of Heaven offered sacrifices for all the Chinese. There was a common script, a common civilization, and a common enemy in the Huns of the northwestern borders. The last of the Shang dynasty was a cruel and foolish monarch who burned himself alive, 1125 BC, in his palace after a decisive defeat by Wu Wang, the founder of the Chao dynasty. Wu Wang seems to have been helped by allies from among the southwestern tribes as well as by a popular revolt. For a time China remained loosely united under the Chao emperors, as loosely united as was Christendom under the popes in the Middle Ages. The Chao emperors had become the traditional high priests of the land in the place of the Shang dynasty and claimed a sort of overlordship in Chinese affairs. But gradually the loose ties of usage and sentiment that held the empire together lost their hold upon men's minds. Hunnish peoples to the north and west took on the Chinese civilization without acquiring a sense of its unity. Feudal princes began to regard themselves as independent. Mr. 
Liang Qichao, one of the Chinese representatives at the Paris Conference of 1919, states that between the 8th and 4th centuries BC, there were in the Huanghou and Yangtze valleys no less than five or six thousand small states with about a dozen powerful states dominating over them. The land was subjected to perpetual warfare, age of confusion. In the 6th century BC, the great powers in conflict were TSI and TSN, which were northern Huanghou states, and CHU, which was a vigorous, aggressive power in the Yangtze Valley. A confederation against CHU laid the foundation for a league that kept the peace for a hundred years, the league subdued and incorporated CHU and made a general treaty of disarmament. It became the foundation of a new Pacific Empire. The knowledge of iron entered China at some unknown date, but iron weapons began to be commonly used only about 500 BC, that is to say two or three hundred years or more after this had become customary in Assyria, Egypt, and Europe. Iron was probably introduced from the north into China by the Huns. The last rulers of the Chao dynasty were ousted by the kings of Tsin, the latter seized upon the sacred sacrificial bronze tripods, and so were able to take over the imperial duty of offering sacrifices to heaven. In this manner was the Tsin dynasty established. It ruled with far more vigor and effect than any previous family. The reign of Shi Huang Ti, meaning, first universal emperor, of this dynasty is usually taken to mark the end of feudal and divided China. He seems to have played the unifying role in the East that Alexander the Great might have played in the West, but he lived longer, and the unity he made, or restored, was comparatively permanent. While the empire of Alexander the Great fell to pieces, as we shall tell, at his death. Shi Huang Ti, among other feats in the direction of common effort, organized the building of the Great Wall of China against the Huns. A civil war followed close upon his reign, and ended in the establishment of the Han Dynasty. Under this Han Dynasty the empire grew greatly beyond its original two river valleys, the Huns were effectively restrained. And the Chinese penetrated westward until they began to learn at last of civilized races and civilizations other than their own. By 100 BC the Chinese had heard of India, their power had spread across Tibet and into western Turkestan, and they were trading by camel caravans with Persia and the western world. So much for the present must suffice for our account of China. We shall return to the distinctive characters of its civilization later. Section 6 And in these thousands of years during which man was making his way step by step from the barbarism of the Heliolithic culture to civilization at these old world centers, what was happening in the rest of the world. To the north of these centers, from the Rhine to the Pacific, the Nordic and Mongolian peoples, as we have told, were also learning the use of metals. But while the civilizations were settling down these men of the Great Plains were becoming migratory and developing from a slow wandering life towards a complete seasonal nomadism. To the south of the civilized zone, in central and southern Africa, the Negro was making a slower progress, and that, it would seem, under the stimulus of invasion by whiter tribes from the Mediterranean regions. Bringing with them in succession cultivation and the use of metals. These white men came to the black by two routes, across the Sahara to the west as Berbers and Tuaregs and the like, to mix with the Negro and create such quasi-white races as the Fulas. And also by way of the Nile, where the Baganda, equals Gandafolk, of Uganda, for example, may possibly be of remote white origin. The African forests were denser then, and spread eastward and northward from the upper Nile. The islands of the East Indies, 3,000 years ago, were probably still only inhabited here and there by stranded patches of Paleolithic Australoids, who had wandered thither in those immemorial ages when there was a nearly complete land bridge by way of the East Indies to Australia. The islands of Oceania were uninhabited. The spreading of the Heliolithic peoples by seagoing canoes into the islands of the Pacific came much later in the history of man, at earliest a thousand years BC. Still later did they reach Madagascar. The beauty of New Zealand also was as yet wasted upon mankind, its highest living creatures were a great ostrich-like bird, the moa, now extinct, and the little kiwi which has feathers like coarse hair and the merest rudiment of wings. 
In North America a group of Mongoloid tribes were now cut off altogether from the Old World. They were spreading slowly southward, hunting the innumerable bison of the plains. They had still to learn for themselves the secrets of a separate agriculture based on maize. And in South America to tame the llama to their service and so build up in Mexico and Peru two civilizations roughly parallel in their nature to that of Sumer, but different in many respects, and later by six or seven thousand years. When men reached the southern extremity of America, the Megatherium, the giant sloth, and the Glyptodon, the giant armadillo, were still living. There is a considerable imaginative appeal in the obscure story of the early American civilizations. It was largely a separate development. Someone at last the southward drift of the Amerindians must have met and mingled with the eastward, canoe-born drift of the Heliolithic culture. But it was the Heliolithic culture still at a very lowly stage and probably before the use of metals. It has to be noted as evidence of this canoe-born origin of American culture, that elephant-headed figures are found in Central American drawings. American metallurgy may have arisen independently of the Old World use of metal, or it may have been brought by these elephant carvers. These American peoples got to the use of bronze and copper, but not to the use of iron, they had gold and silver. And their stonework, their pottery, weaving, and dyeing were carried to a very high level. In all these things the American product resembles the Old World product generally, but always it has characteristics that are distinctive. The American civilizations had picture writing of a primitive sort, but it never developed even to the pitch of the earliest Egyptian hieroglyphics. In Yucatan only was there a kind of script, the Maya writing, but it was used simply for keeping a calendar. In Peru the beginnings of writing were superseded by a curious and complicated method of keeping records by means of knots tied upon strings of various colors and shapes. It is said that even laws and orders could be conveyed by this code. These string bundles were called quipus, but though quipus are still to be found in collections, the art of reading them is altogether lost. The Chinese histories, Mr. L. Y. Chen informs us, state that a similar method of record by knots was used in China before the invention of writing there. The Peruvians also got to making maps and the use of counting frames. But with all this there was no means of handing on knowledge and experience from one generation to another, nor was anything done to fix and summarize these intellectual possessions, which are the basis of literature and science. When the Spaniards came to America, the Mexicans knew nothing of the Peruvians nor the Peruvians of the Mexicans. Intercourse there was none. Whatever links had ever existed were lost and forgotten. The Mexicans had never heard of the potato, which was a principal article of Peruvian diet. In 1500 BC the Sumerians and Egyptians probably knew as little of one another. America was 6,000 years behind the Old World. 17. Sea Peoples and Trading Peoples Section 1. The Earliest Ships and Sailors Section 2. The Aegean Cities Before History Section 3. The First Voyages of Exploration Section 4. Early Traders Section 5. Early Travelers Section 1. The first boats were made very early indeed in the Neolithic stage of culture by riverside and lakeside peoples. They were no more than trees and floating wood, used to assist the imperfect natural swimming powers of men. Then came the hollowing out of the trees, and then, with the development of tools and a primitive carpentry, the building of boats. Men in Egypt and Mesopotamia also developed a primitive type of basketwork boat, caulked with bitumen. Such was the Ark of Bulrushes, in which Moses was hidden by his mother. A kindred sort of vessel grew up by the use of skins and hides expanded upon a wicker framework. To this day cowhide wicker boats, coracles, are used upon the west coast of Ireland, where there is plenty of cattle and a poverty of big trees. They are also still used on the Euphrates, and on the Toei in South Wales. Inflated skins may have preceded the coracle, and are still used on the Euphrates and Upper Ganges. In the valleys of the great rivers, boats must early have become an important means of communication. 
and it seems natural to suppose that it was from the mouths of the great rivers that man, already in a reasonably seaworthy vessel, first ventured out upon what must have seemed to him then the trackless and homeless sea. No doubt he ventured at first as a fisherman, having learnt the elements of sea craft in creeks and lagoons. Men may have navigated boats upon the Levantine Lake before the refilling of the Mediterranean by the Atlantic waters. The canoe was an integral part of the Heliolithic culture, it drifted with that culture upon the warm waters of the earth from the Mediterranean to, at last, America. There were not only canoes, but Sumerian boats and ships upon the Euphrates and Tigris, when these rivers in 700 BC fell by separate mouths into the Persian Gulf. The Sumerian city of Eridu, which stood at the head of the Persian Gulf, from which it is now separated by 130 miles of alluvium, had ships upon the sea then. We also find evidence of a fully developed sea life 6,000 years ago at the eastern end of the Mediterranean, and possibly at that time there were already canoes on the seas among the islands of the nearer East Indies. There are pre-dynastic Neolithic Egyptian representations of Nile ships of a fair size, capable of carrying elephants. Very soon the seafaring men must have realized the peculiar freedom and opportunities the ship gave them. They could get away to islands, no chief nor king could pursue a boat or ship with any certainty, every captain was a king. The seamen would find it easy to make nests upon islands and in strong positions on the mainland. There they could harbor, there they could carry on a certain agriculture and fishery, but their speciality and their main business was, of course, the expedition across the sea. That was not usually a trading expedition. It was much more frequently a piratical raid. From what we know of mankind, we are bound to conclude that the first sailors plundered when they could, and traded when they had to. Because it developed in the comparatively warm and tranquil waters of the eastern Mediterranean, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the western horn of the Indian Ocean. The shipping of the ancient world retained throughout certain characteristics that make it differ very widely from the ocean-going sailing shipping, with its vast spread of canvas, of the last four hundred years. The Mediterranean, says Mr. Tor, is a sea where a vessel with sails may lie becalmed for days together, while a vessel with oars would easily be traversing the smooth waters, with coasts and islands everywhere at hand to give her shelter in case of storm. In that sea, therefore, oars became the characteristic instruments of navigation, and the arrangement of oars the chief problem in shipbuilding. And so long as the Mediterranean nations dominated Western Europe, vessels of the southern type were built upon the northern coasts, though there generally was wind enough here for sails and too much wave for oars. The art of rowing can first be discerned upon the Nile. Boats with oars are represented in the earliest pictorial monuments of Egypt, dating from about 2500 BC. And although some crews are paddling with their faces towards the bow, others are rowing with their faces towards the stern. The paddling is certainly the older practice, for the hieroglyph chin depicts two arms grasping an oar in the attitude of paddling, and the hieroglyphs were invented in the earliest ages. And that practice may really have ceased before 2500 BC. Despite the testimony of monuments of that date, for in monuments dating from about 1250 BC, crews are represented unmistakably rowing with their faces towards the stern and yet grasping their oars in the attitude of paddling. So that even then Egyptian artists mechanically followed the turn of the hieroglyph to which their hands were accustomed. In these reliefs there are twenty rowers on the boats on the Nile, and thirty on the ships on the Red Sea, but in the earliest reliefs the number varies considerably, and seems dependent on the amount of space at the sculptor's disposal. Egyptian ship on the Red Sea, about 1250 BC, from Tours' ancient ships. Mr. Langton Cole calls attention to the rope truss in this illustration, stiffening the beam of the ship. No other such use of the truss is known until the days of modern engineering. The Aryan peoples came late to the sea. The earliest ships on the sea were either Sumerian or Hamitic, the Semitic peoples followed close upon these pioneers. Along the eastern end of the Mediterranean, the Phoenicians, a Semitic people, set up a string of independent harbor towns of which Acre, Tyre, and Sidon were the chief. And later they pushed their voyages westward and founded Carthage and Utica in North Africa. 
possibly Phoenician keels were already in the Mediterranean by 2000 BC. Both Tyre and Sidon were originally on islands, and so easily defensible against a land raid. But before we go on to the marine exploits of this great seagoing race, we must note a very remarkable and curious nest of early sea people whose remains have been discovered in Crete. Section 2 These early Cretans were of unknown race, but probably of a race akin to the Iberians of Spain and Western Europe and the dark whites of Asia Minor and North Africa, and their language is unknown. This race lived not only in Crete, but in Cyprus, Greece, Asia Minor, Sicily, and South Italy. It was a civilized people for long ages before the fair Aryan Greeks spread southward through Macedonia. At Knossos, in Crete, there have been found the most astonishing ruins and remains, and Knossos, therefore, is apt to overshadow the rest of these settlements in people's imaginations, but it is well to bear in mind that. Though Knossos was no doubt a chief city of this Aegean civilization, these Aegeans had in the fullness of their time many cities and a wide range. Possibly, all that we know of them now are but the vestiges of a far more extensive Heliolithic Neolithic civilization which is now submerged under the waters of the Mediterranean. At Knossos there are Neolithic remains as old or older than any of the predynastic remains of Egypt. The Bronze Age began in Crete as soon as it did in Egypt, and there have been vases found by Flinders Petrie in Egypt and referred by him to the Ist dynasty, which he declared to be importations from Crete. Stone vessels have been found in Crete of forms characteristic of the IVTH, pyramid building, dynasty, and there can be no doubt that there was a vigorous trade between Crete and Egypt in the time of the Exiath dynasty. This continued until about 1000 BC. It is clear that this island civilization arising upon the soil of Crete is at least as old as the Egyptian, and that it was already launched upon the sea as early as 400 BC. The great days of Crete were not so early as this. It was only about 2500 BC that the island appears to have been unified under one ruler. Then began an age of peace and prosperity unexampled in the history of the ancient world. Secure from invasion, living in a delightful climate, trading with every civilized community in the world, the Cretans were free to develop all the arts and amenities of life. This Knossos was not so much a town as the vast palace of the king and his people. It was not even fortified. The kings, it would seem, were called Minas always, as the kings of Egypt were all called Pharaoh. The king of Knossos figures in the early legends of the Greeks as King Minas, who lived in the labyrinth and kept there a horrible monster, half man, half bull, the Minotaur. To feed which he levied a tribute of youths and maidens from the Athenians. Those stories are a part of Greek literature, and have always been known, but it is only in the last few decades that the excavations at Knossos have revealed how close these legends were to the reality. The Cretan labyrinth was a building as stately, complex, and luxurious as any in the ancient world. Among other details we find water pipes, bathrooms, and the like conveniences, such as have hitherto been regarded as the latest refinements of modern life. The pottery, the textile manufactures, the sculpture and painting of these people, their gem and ivory work, their metal and inlaid work, is as admirable as any that mankind has produced. They were much given to festivals and shows, and, in particular, they were addicted to bullfights and gymnastic entertainments. Their female costume became astonishingly modern, in style, their women wore corsets and flounced dresses. They had a system of writing which has not yet been deciphered. It is the custom nowadays to make a sort of wonder of these achievements of the Cretans, as though they were a people of incredible artistic ability living in the dawn of civilization. But their great time was long past that dawn, as late as 2000 BC. It took them many centuries to reach their best in art and skill, and their art and luxury are by no means so great a wonder if we reflect that for three thousand years they were immune from invasion, that for a thousand years they were at peace. Century after century their artisans could perfect their skill, and their men and women refine upon refinement. Wherever men of almost any race have been comparatively safe in this fashion for such a length of time, they have developed much artistic beauty. Given the opportunity, all races are artistic. 
Green legend has it that it was in Crete that Daedalus attempted to make the first flying machine. Daedalus, equals cunning artificer, was a sort of personified summary of mechanical skill. It is curious to speculate what germ of fact lies behind him and those waxen wings that, according to the legend, melted and plunged his son Icarus in the sea. Fiance figure from Gnosis. A votary of the snake goddess. J.F.H. From photos by British School at Athens. There came at last a change in the condition of the lives of these Cretans, for other peoples, the Greeks and the Phoenicians, were also coming out with powerful fleets upon the seas. We do not know what led to the disaster nor who inflicted it, but someone about 1400 BC. Gnosis was sacked and burnt, and though the Cretan life struggled on there rather lamely for another four centuries, there came at last a final blow about 1000 BC, that is to say, in the days of the Assyrian ascendancy in the east. The palace at Gnosis was destroyed, and never rebuilt nor re-inhabited. Possibly this was done by the ships of those newcomers into the Mediterranean, the barbaric Greeks, a group of Aryan tribes, who may have wiped out Gnosis as they wiped out the city of Troy. The legend of Theseus tells of such a raid. He entered the labyrinth, which may have been the Gnosis palace, by the aid of Ariadne, the daughter of Minos, and slew the Minotaur. The Iliad makes it clear that destruction came upon Troy because the Trojans stole Greek women. Modern writers, with modern ideas in their heads, have tried to make out that the Greeks assailed Troy in order to secure a trade route or some such fine-spun commercial advantage. If so, the authors of the Iliad hid the motives of their characters very skillfully. It would be about as reasonable to say that the Homeric Greeks went to war with the Trojans in order to be well ahead with a station on the Berlin to Baghdad railway. The Homeric Greeks were a healthy barbaric Aryan people, with very poor ideas about trade and trade routes, they went to war with the Trojans because they were thoroughly annoyed about this stealing of women. It is fairly clear from the Minos legend and from the evidence of the Gnosis remains, that the Cretans kidnapped or stole youths and maidens to be slaves, bullfighters, athletes, and perhaps sacrifices. They traded fairly with the Egyptians, but it may be they did not realize the gathering strength of the Greek barbarians, they traded violently with them, and so brought sword and flame upon themselves. Another great sea people were the Phoenicians. They were great seamen because they were great traders. Their colony of Carthage, founded before 800 BC. By Tyre, became at last greater than any of the older Phoenician cities, but already before 1500 BC both Sidon and Tyre had settlements upon the African coast. Carthage was comparatively inaccessible to the Assyrian and Babylonian hosts, and, profiting greatly by the long siege of Tyre by Nebuchadnezzar II, became the greatest maritime power the world had hitherto seen. She claimed the western Mediterranean as her own, and seized every ship she could catch west of Sardinia. Roman writers accuse her of great cruelties. She fought the Greeks for Sicily, and later, in the 2nd century BC, she fought the Romans. Alexander the Great formed plans for her conquest, but he died, as we shall tell later, before he could carry them out. Section 3 At her zenith Carthage probably had the hitherto unheard of population of a million. This population was largely industrial, and her woven goods were universally famous. As well as a coasting trade, she had a considerable land trade with Central Africa, and she sold Negro slaves, ivory, metals, precious stones, and the like, to all the Mediterranean people. She worked Spanish copper mines, and her ships went out into the Atlantic and coasted along Portugal and France northward as far as the Cassiterides, the Scilly Isles, or Cornwall, in England, to get tin. About 520 BC. A certain Hanno made a voyage that is still one of the most notable in the world. This Hanno, if we may trust the Periplus of Hanno, the Greek translation of his account which still survives, followed the African coast southward from the Straits of Gibraltar as far as the confines of Liberia. He had sixty big ships, and his main task was to found or reinforce certain Carthaginian stations upon the Morocco coast. Then he pushed southward. He founded a settlement in the Rio de Oro, on Caron or Hearn Island, and sailed on past the Senegal River. 
The voyagers passed on for seven days beyond the Gambia, and landed at last upon some island. This they left in a panic, because, although the day was silent with the silence of the tropical forest, at night they heard the sound of flutes, drums, and gongs, and the sky was red with the blaze of the bush fires. The coast country for the rest of the voyage was one blaze of fire, from the burning of the bush. Streams of fire ran down the hills into the sea, and at length a blaze arose so loftily that it touched the skies. Three days further brought them to an island containing a lake. Sherbro Island. In this lake was another island. Macaulay Island, and on this were wild, hairy men and women, whom the interpreters called gorilla. The Carthaginians. Having caught some of the females of these gorillas, they were probably chimpanzees, turned back and eventually deposited the skins of their captives, who had proved impossibly violent guests to entertain on board ship, in the temple of Juno. A still more wonderful Phoenician sea voyage, long doubted, but now supported by some archaeological evidence, is related by Herodotus. Who declares that the pharaoh Necho of the XXVth dynasty commissioned some Phoenicians to attempt the circumnavigation of Africa, and that starting from the Gulf of Suez southward. They did finally come back through the Mediterranean to the Nile Delta. They took nearly three years to complete their voyage. Each year they landed, and sowed and harvested a crop of wheat before going on. Section 4. The great trading cities of the Phoenicians are the most striking of the early manifestations of the peculiar and characteristic gift of the Semitic peoples to mankind, trade and exchange. While the Semitic Phoenician peoples were spreading themselves upon the seas, another kindred Semitic people, the Arameans, whose occupation of Damascus we have already noted, were developing the caravan routes of the Arabian and Persian deserts. And becoming the chief trading people of Western Asia. The Semitic peoples, earlier civilized than the Aryan, have always shown, and still show today, a far greater sense of quality and quantity in marketable goods than the latter. It is to their need of account keeping that the development of alphabetical writing is to be ascribed, and it is to them that most of the great advances in computation are due. Our modern numerals are Arabic. Our arithmetic and algebra are essentially Semitic sciences. The Semitic peoples, we may point out here, are to this day counting people strong in their sense of equivalence and reparation. The moral teaching of the Hebrews was saturated by such ideas. With what measure ye meet, the same shall be meted unto you. Other races and peoples have imagined diverse and fitful and marvelous gods, but it was the trading Semites who first began to think of God as a righteous dealer, whose promises were kept, who failed not the humblest creditor and called to account every spurious act. The trade that was going on in the ancient world before the 6th or 7th century BC was almost entirely a barter trade. There was little or no credit or coined money. The ordinary standard of value with the early Aryans was cattle, as it still is with the Zulus and Kafirs today. In the Iliad, the respective values of two shields are stated in head of cattle, and the Roman word for monies, pecunia, is derived from picus, cattle. Cattle as money had this advantage. It did not need to be carried from one owner to another, and if it needed attention and food, at any rate it bred. But it was inconvenient for ship or caravan transit. Many other substances have at various times been found convenient as a standard. Tobacco was once legal tender in the colonial days in North America, and in West Africa fines are paid and bargains made in bottles of trade gin. The early Asiatic trade included metals. And weighed lumps of metal, since they were in general demand and were convenient for hoarding and storage, costing nothing for fodder and needing small house room, soon asserted their superiority over cattle and sheep. Iron, which seems to have been first reduced from its ores by the Hittites, was, to begin with, a rare and much desired substance. It is stated by Aristotle to have supplied the first currency. In the collection of letters found at Tel Elamarna, addressed to and from Amenophis III, already mentioned, and his successor Amenophis IV, one from a Hittite king promises iron as an extremely valuable gift. Gold, then as now, was the most precious and therefore most portable, security. 
In early Egypt silver was almost as rare as gold until after the Xviith dynasty. Later the general standard of value in the Eastern world became silver, measured by weight. To begin with, metals were handed about in ingots and weighed at each transaction. Then they were stamped to indicate their fineness and guarantee their purity. The first recorded coins were minted about 600 BC in Lydia, a gold-producing country in the west of Asia Minor. The first known gold coins were minted in Lydia by Croesus, whose name has become a proverb for wealth, he was conquered, as we shall tell later, by that same Cyrus the Persian who took Babylon in 539 BC. But very probably coined money had been used in Babylonia before that time. That sealed shekel, a stamped piece of silver, came very near to being a coin. The promise to pay so much silver or gold on leather equals parchment, with the seal of some established firm is probably as old or older than coinage. The Carthaginians used such leather money. We know very little of the way in which small traffic was conducted. Common people, who in those ancient times were in dependent positions, seem to have had no money at all, they did their business by barter. Early Egyptian paintings show this going on. Section 5. When one realizes the absence of small money or of any conveniently portable means of exchange in the pre-Alexandrian world, one perceives how impossible was private travel in those days. The first, inns, no doubt a sort of caravanserai, are commonly said to have come into existence in Lydia in the 3rd or 4th century BC. That, however, is too late a date. They are certainly older than that. There is good evidence of them at least as early as the 6th century. Aeschylus twice mentions inns. His word is, all receiver, or, all receiving house. Private travelers must have been fairly common in the Greek world, including its colonies, by this time. But such private travel was a comparatively new thing then. The early historians Hecateus and Herodotus traveled widely. I suspect, says Professor Gilbert Murray, that this sort of travel, for history or, for discovery, was rather a Greek invention. Solon is supposed to have practiced it, and even Lycurgus. The earlier travelers were traders traveling in a caravan or in a shipload, and carrying their goods and their minas and shekels of metal or gems or bales of fine stuff with them. Or government officials traveling with letters of introduction and a proper retinue. Possibly there were a few mendicants, and, in some restricted regions, religious pilgrims. That earlier world before 600 BC was one in which a lonely, stranger, was a rare and suspected and endangered being. He might suffer horrible cruelties, for there was little law to protect such as he. Few individuals strayed therefore. One lived and died attached and tied to some patriarchal tribe if one was a nomad, or to some great household if one was civilized, or to one of the big temple establishments which we will presently discuss. Or one was a herded slave. One knew nothing, except for a few monstrous legends, of the rest of the world in which one lived. We know more today, indeed, of the world of 600 BC than any single living being knew at that time. We map it out, see it as a whole in relation to past and future. We begin to learn precisely what was going on at the same time in Egypt and Spain and Media and India and China. We can share in imagination, not only the wonder of Hanno's sailors, but of the men who lit the warning beacons on the shore. We know that those, mountains flaming to the sky, were only the customary burning of the dry grass at that season of the year. Year by year, more and more rapidly, our common knowledge increases. In the years to come men will understand still more of those lives in the past until perhaps they will understand them altogether. 18. Writing. Section 1. Picture writing. Section 2. Syllable writing. Section 3. Alphabet writing. Section 4. The place of writing in human life. Section 1. I end the five preceding chapters. 13 to 17, we have sketched in broad outline the development of the chief human communities from the primitive beginnings of the Heliolithic culture to the great historical kingdoms and empires in the 6th century B.C. 
we must now study a little more closely the general process of social change, the growth of human ideas, and the elaboration of human relationships that were going on during these ages between 10,000 BC and 500 BC. What we have done so far is to draw the map and name the chief kings and empires, to define the relations in time and space of Babylonia, Assyria, Egypt, Phoenicia, Gnosis, and the like. We come now to the real business of history, which is to get down below these outer forms to the thoughts and lives of individual men. By far the most important thing that was going on during those fifty or sixty centuries of social development was the invention of writing and its gradual progress to importance in human affairs. It was a new instrument for the human mind, an enormous enlargement of its range of action, a new means of continuity. We have seen how in later Paleolithic and early Neolithic times the elaboration of articulate speech gave men a mental handhold for consecutive thought and a vast enlargement of their powers of cooperation. For a time this new acquirement seems to have overshadowed their earlier achievement of drawing, and possibly it checked the use of gesture. But drawing presently reappeared again, for record, for signs, for the joy of drawing. Before real writing came picture writing, such as is still practiced by the Amerindians, the Bushmen, and savage and barbaric people in all parts of the world. It is essentially a drawing of things and acts, helped out by heraldic indications of proper names, and by strokes and dots to represent days and distances and such like quantitative ideas. Quite kindred to such picture writing is the pictograph that one finds still in use today in international railway timetables upon the continent of Europe, where a little black sign of a cup indicates a stand-up buffet for light refreshments. A crossed knife and fork, a restaurant, a little steamboat, a transfer to a steamboat, and a postillion's horn, a diligence. Similar signs are used in the well-known Michelin guides for automobilists in Europe, to show a post office, envelope, or a telephone, telephone receiver. The quality of hotels is shown by an inn with one, two, three, or four gables, and so forth. Similarly, the roads of Europe are marked with wayside signs representing a gate, to indicate a level crossing ahead, a sinuous bend for a dangerous curve, and the like. From such pictographic signs to the first elements of Chinese writing is not a very long stretch. In Chinese writing there are still traceable a number of pictographs. Most are now difficult to recognize. A mouth was originally written as a mouth-shaped hole and is now, for convenience of brushwork, squared, a child, originally a recognizable little mannequin, is now a hasty wriggle and a cross. The sun, originally a large circle with a dot in the center, has been converted, for the sake of convenience of combination, into a crossed oblong, which is easier to make with a brush. By combining these pictographs, a second order of ideas is expressed. For example, the pictograph for mouth combined with pictograph for vapor expressed words. Specimens of American Indian picture writing. After schoolcraft. No. 1. Painted on a rock on the shore of Lake Superior, records an expedition across the lake, in which five canoes took part. The upright strokes in each indicate the number of the crew, and the bird represents a chief, the kingfisher. The three circles, suns, under the arch, of heaven, indicate that the voyage lasted three days, and the tortoise, a symbol of land, denotes a safe arrival. No. 2 is a petition sent to the United States Congress by a group of Indian tribes, asking for fishing rights in certain small lakes. The tribes are represented by their totems, martens, bear, manfish, and catfish, led by the crane. Lines running from the heart and eye of each animal to the heart and eye of the crane denote that they are all of one mind, and a line runs from the eye of the crane to the lakes, shown in the crude little map in the lower left-hand corner. From such combinations one passes to what are called ideograms, the sign for words, and the sign for tongue combined to make speech. The sign for roof and the sign for pig make home for in the early domestic economy of China the pig was as important as it used to be in Ireland. But, as we have already noted earlier, the Chinese language consists of a comparatively few elementary monosyllabic sounds, which are all used in a great variety of meanings. 
and the Chinese soon discovered that a number of these pictographs and ideographs could be used also to express other ideas, not so conveniently pictured, but having the same sound. Characters so used are called phonograms. For example, the sound fong meant not only boat, but a place, spinning, fragrant, inquire, and several other meanings according to the context. But while a boat is easy to draw most of the other meanings are undrawable. How can one draw, fragrant, or, inquire? The Chinese, therefore, took the same sign for all these meanings of fang, but added to each of them another distinctive sign, the determinative, to show what sort of fang was intended. A, place, was indicated by the same sign as for, boat, fang, and the determinative sign for, earth, spinning, by the sign for fang and the sign for, silk, inquire, by the sign for fong and the sign for, words, and so on. One may perhaps make this development of pictographs, ideographs, and phonograms a little clearer by taking an analogous case in English. Suppose we were making up a sort of picture writing in English, then it would be very natural to use a square with a slanting line to suggest a lid, for the word and thing box. That would be a pictograph. But now suppose we had a round sign for money, and suppose we put this sign inside the box sign, that would do for, cash box, or, treasury. That would be an ideogram. But the word, box, is used for other things than boxes. There is the box shrub which gives us boxwood. It would be hard to draw a recognizable box tree distinct from other trees, but it is quite easy to put our sign, box. And add our sign for shrub as a determinative to determine that it is that sort of box and not a common box that we want to express. And then there is, box, the verb, meaning to fight with fists. Here, again, we need a determinative, we might add the two crossed swords, a sign which is used very often upon maps to denote a battle. A box at a theater needs yet another determinative, and so we go on, through a long series of phonograms. Now it is manifest that here in the Chinese writing is a very peculiar and complex system of sign writing. A very great number of characters have to be learnt and the mind habituated to their use. The power it possesses to carry ideas and discussion is still ungaged by Western standards, but we may doubt whether with this instrument it will ever be possible to establish such a wide common mentality as the simpler and swifter alphabets of the Western civilizations permit. In China it created a special reading class, the Mandarins, who were also the ruling and official class. Their necessary concentration upon words and classical forms, rather than upon ideas and realities, seems, in spite of her comparative peacefulness and the very high individual intellectual quality of her people, to have greatly hampered the social and economic development of China. Probably it is the complexity of her speech and writing, more than any other imaginable cause, that has made China today politically, socially, and individually a vast pool of backward people rather than the foremost power in the whole world. Section 2. But while the Chinese mind thus made for itself an instrument which is probably too elaborate in structure, too laborious in use, and too inflexible in its form to meet the modern need for simple, swift, exact, and lucid communications. The growing civilizations of the West were working out the problem of a written record upon rather different and, on the whole, more advantageous lines. They did not seek to improve their script to make it swift and easy, but circumstances conspired to make it so. The Sumerian picture writing, which had to be done upon clay and with little styles, which made curved marks with difficulty and inaccurately. Rapidly degenerated by a conventionalized dabbing down of wedged shaped marks, cuneiform equals wedge-shaped, into almost unrecognizable hints of the shapes intended. It helped the Sumerians greatly to learn to write, that they had to draw so badly. They got very soon to the Chinese pictographs, ideographs, and phonograms, and beyond them. Most people know a sort of puzzle called a rebus. It is a way of representing words by pictures, not of the things the words represent, but by the pictures of other things having a similar sound. For example, two gates and a head is a rebus for gates head. A little streamlet, beck, a crowned monarch, and a ham, beckingham. The Sumerian language was a language well adapted to this sort of representation. 
It was apparently a language of often quite vast polysyllables, made up of very distinct inalterable syllables, and many of the syllables taken separately were the names of concrete things. So that this cuneiform writing developed very readily into a syllabic way of writing, in which each sign conveys a syllable just as each act in a charade conveys a syllable. When presently the Semites conquered Sumeria, they adapted the syllabic system to their own speech, and so this writing became entirely a sign for a sound writing. It was so used by the Assyrians and by the Chaldeans. But it was not a letter writing, it was a syllable writing. This cuneiform script prevailed for long ages over Assyria, Babylonia, and the Near East generally, there are vestiges of it in some of the letters of our alphabet today. Section 3 But, meanwhile, in Egypt and upon the Mediterranean coast another system of writing grew up. Its beginnings are probably to be found in the priestly picture writing, hieroglyphics, of the Egyptians, which also in the usual way became partly a sound sign system. As we see it on the Egyptian monuments, the hieroglyphic writing consists of decorative but stiff and elaborate forms, but for such purpose as letter writing and the keeping of recipes and the like. The Egyptian priests used a much simplified and flowing form of these characters, the hieratratic script. Side by side with this hieratratic script rose another, probably also derivative from the hieroglyphs, a script now lost to us, which was taken over by various non-Egyptian peoples in the Mediterranean, the Phoenicians, Libyans, Lydians, Cretans, and Celtiberians, and used for business purposes. Possibly a few letters were borrowed from the later cuneiform. In the hands of these foreigners this writing was, so to speak, cut off from its roots, it lost all but a few traces of its early pictorial character. It ceased to be pictographic or ideographic, it became simply a pure sound sign system, an alphabet. There were a number of such alphabets in the Mediterranean differing widely from each other. It may be noted that the Phoenician alphabet, and perhaps others, omitted vowels. Possibly they pronounced their consonants very hard and had rather indeterminate vowels, as is said to be still the case with tribes of South Arabia. Quite probably, too, the Phoenicians used their alphabet at first not so much for writing as for single initial letters in their business accounts and tallies. One of these Mediterranean alphabets reached the Greeks, long after the time of the Iliad, who presently set to work to make it express the clear and beautiful sounds of their own highly developed Aryan speech. It consisted at first of consonants, and the Greeks added the vowels. They began to write for record, to help and fix their bardic tradition. Section 4 So it was by a series of very natural steps that writing grew out of the life of man. At first and for long ages it was the interest and the secret of only a few people in a special class, a mere accessory to the record of pictures. But there were certain very manifest advantages, quite apart from the increased expressiveness of mood and qualification, to be gained by making writing a little less plain than straightforward pictures, and in conventionalizing and codifying it. One of these was that so messages might be sent understandable by the sender and receiver, but not plain to the uninitiated. Another was that so one might put down various matters and help one's memory and the memory of one's friends, without giving away too much to the common herd. Among some of the earliest Egyptian writings, for example, are medical recipes and magic formulae. Accounts, letters, recipes, name lists, itineraries, these were the earliest of written documents. Then, as the art of writing and reading spread, came that odd desire, that pathetic desire so common among human beings, to astonish some strange and remote person by writing down something striking, some secret one knew, some strange thought. Or even one's name, so that long after one had gone one's way, it might strike upon the sight and mind of another reader. Even in Sumeria men scratched on walls, and all that remains to us of the ancient world, its rocks, its buildings, is plastered thickly with the names and the boasting of those foremost among human advertisers, its kings. Perhaps half the early inscriptions in that ancient world are of this nature, if, that is, we group with the name writing and boasting the epitaphs, which were probably in many cases prearranged by the deceased. For long the desire for crude self-assertion of the name-scrawling sort and the love of secret understandings kept writing within a narrow scope, but that other, more truly social desire in men, 
the desire to tell, was also at work. The profounder possibilities of writing, the possibilities of a vast extension and definition and settlement of knowledge and tradition, only grew apparent after long ages. But it will be interesting at this point and in this connection to recapitulate certain elemental facts about life, upon which we laid stress in our earlier chapters. Because they illuminate not only the huge value of writing in the whole field of man's history, but also the role it is likely to play in his future. 1. Life had at first, it must be remembered, only a discontinuous repetition of consciousness, as the old died and the young were born. Such a creature as a reptile has in its brain a capacity for experience, but when the individual dies, its experience dies with it. Most of its motives are purely instinctive, and all the mental life that it has is the result of heredity, birth inheritance. 2. But ordinary mammals have added to pure instinct tradition, a tradition of experience imparted by the imitated example of the mother, and in the case of such mentally developed animals as dogs, cats or apes, by a sort of mute precept also. For example, the mother cat chastises her young for misbehavior. So do mother apes and baboons. 3. Primitive man added to his powers of transmitting experience, representative art and speech. Pictorial and sculptured record and verbal tradition began. Verbal tradition was developed to its highest possibility by the bards. They did much to make language what it is to the world today. 4. With the invention of writing, which developed out of pictorial record, human tradition was able to become fuller and much more exact. Verbal tradition, which had hitherto changed from age to age, began to be fixed. Men separated by hundreds of miles could now communicate their thoughts. An increasing number of human beings began to share a common written knowledge and a common sense of a past and a future. Human thinking became a larger operation in which hundreds of minds in different places and in different ages could react upon one another, it became a process constantly more continuous and sustained. 5. For hundreds of generations the full power of writing was not revealed to the world, because for a long time the idea of multiplying writings by taking prints of a first copy did not become effective. The only way of multiplying writings was by copying one copy at a time, and this made books costly and rare. Moreover, the tendency to keep things secret, to make a cult and mystery of them, and so to gain an advantage over the generality of men, has always been very strong in men's minds. It is only nowadays that the great masses of mankind are learning to read, and reaching out towards the treasures of knowledge and thought already stored in books. Nevertheless, from the first writings onward a new sort of tradition, an enduring and immortal tradition, began in the minds of men. Life, through mankind, grew thereafter more and more distinctly conscious of itself and its world. It is a thin streak of intellectual growth we trace in history, at first in a world of tumultuous ignorance and forgetfulness, it is like a mere line of light coming through the chink of an opening door into a darkened room. But slowly it widens, it grows. At last came a time in the history of Europe when the door, at the push of the printer, began to open more rapidly. Knowledge flared up, and as it flared it ceased to be the privilege of a favored minority. For us now that door swings wider, and the light behind grows brighter. Misty it is still, glowing through clouds of dust and reek. The door is not half open, the light is but a light new lit. Our world today is only in the beginning of knowledge. 19. Gods and Stars, Priests and Kings Section 1. Nomadic and Settled Religion Section 2. The Priest Comes into History Section 3. Priests and the Stars Section 4. Priests and the Dawn of Learning Section 5. King Against Priest Section 6. How Belmarduk Struggled Against the Kings Section 7. The God Kings of Egypt Section 8. Sher Huang Ti Destroys the Books Section 1. We have already told what there is to tell of the social life of the Aryan tribes when they were settling down to the beginnings of civilized life. We have seen how they were associated in great households, grouped together under tribal leaders, 
who made a sort of informal aristocracy rather like that of the sixth form and prefects in an English boys' school. We have considered the role of the bards in the creation of an oral tradition, and we have glanced at their not very complex religious ideas. We may note one or two points of difference from the equivalent life of the nomadic Semites. Like the early Aryan life, it was a life in a sort of family tribe household. But it had differences due originally perhaps to the warmer, drier climate. Though both groups of races had cattle and sheep, the Aryans were rather herdsmen, the Semites, shepherds. The Semites had no long winter evenings and no bardic singing. They never sat in hall. They have consequently no epics. They had stories, campfire stories, but not verbally beautified story recitations. The Semite also was more polygamous than the Aryan, his women less self-assertive, and the tendency of his government more patriarchal. The head of the household for the tribe was less of a leader and more of a master, more like the Paleolithic old man. And the Semitic nomads were closer to the earlier civilizations, a thing that fitted in with their greater aptitude for trade and counting. But the religion of the nomadic Semite was as little organized as the religion of the Aryan. In either case the leading man performed most of the functions of the priest. The Aryan gods were little more than a kind of magical super-prince. They were supposed to sit in hall together, and to talk and make scenes with one another under Jupiter or Thor. The early Semitic gods, on the other hand, were thought of as tribal patriarchs. As peoples developed towards nomadism, they seemed to lose even such primitive religion and magic as their Neolithic ancestors professed. Nomadism cuts men off from fixed temples and intense local associations. They take a broader and simpler view of the world. They tend towards religious simplification. We write here of the nomadic peoples, the Aryan herdsmen and Semitic shepherds, and we write in the most general terms. They had their undercurrent of fables and superstitions, their phases of fear and abjection and sacrificial fury. These people were people like ourselves, with brains as busy and moody and inconsistent, and with even less training and discipline. It is absurd to suppose, as so many writers about early religion do seem to suppose, that their religious notions can be reduced to the consistent logical development of some one simple idea. We have already glanced, in chapter 12, at the elements of religion that must have arisen necessarily in the minds of those early peoples. But for most of the twenty-four hours these nomads were busy upon other things, and there is no sign that their houses, their daily routines, their ordinary acts, were dominated or their social order shaped by any ideas that we should now call religious. As yet life and its ideas were too elementary for that. But directly we turn our attention to these new accumulations of human beings that are beginning in Egypt and Mesopotamia, we find that one of the most conspicuous objects in every city is a temple or a group of temples. In some cases there arises beside it in these regions a royal palace, but as often the temple towers over the palace. This presence of the temple is equally true of the Phoenician cities and of the Greek and Roman as they arise. The palace of Knossos, with its signs of comfort and pleasure-seeking, and the kindred cities of the Aegean peoples, include religious shrines, but in Crete there are also temples standing apart from the palatial city households. All over the ancient civilized world we find them. Wherever primitive civilization set its foot in Africa, Europe, or Western Asia, a temple arose, and where the civilization is most ancient, in Egypt and in Sumer, there the temple is most in evidence. When Hanno reached what he thought was the most westerly point of Africa, he set up a temple to Hercules. We have, in fact, come now to a new stage in the history of mankind, the temple stage. Section 2. In all these temples there was a shrine. Dominating the shrine there was commonly a great figure, usually of some monstrous half-animal form, before which stood an altar for sacrifices. This figure was either regarded as the god or as the image or symbol of the god, for whose worship the temple existed. And connected with the temple there were a number, and often a considerable number, of priests or priestesses, and temple servants, generally wearing a distinctive costume and forming an important part of the city population. They belonged to no household, as did the simple priest of the primitive Aryan, they made up a new kind of household of their own. 
They were a caste and a class apart, attracting intelligent recruits from the general population. The primary duty of this priesthood was concerned with the worship of and the sacrifices to the god of the temple. And these things were done, not at any time, but at particular times and seasons. There had come into the life of man with his herding and agriculture a sense of a difference between the parts of the year and of a difference between day and day. Men were beginning to work, and to need days of rest. The temple, by its festivals, kept count. The temple in the ancient city was like the clock and calendar upon a writing desk. But it was a center of other functions. It was in the early temples that the records and tallies of events were kept and that writing began. And there was knowledge there. The people went to the temple not only en masse for festivals, but individually for help. The early priests were also doctors and magicians. In the earliest temples we already find those little offerings for some private and particular end, which are still made in the chapels of Catholic churches today, ex votos, little models of hearts relieved and limbs restored. Acknowledgement of prayers answered and accepted vows. It is clear that here we have that comparatively unimportant element in the life of the early nomad, the medicine man, the shrine keeper, and the memorist, developed. With the development of the community and as a part of the development of the community from barbarism to civilized settlement, into something of very much greater importance. And it is equally evident that those primitive fears of, and hopes of help from, strange beings, the desire to propitiate unknown forces. The primitive desire for cleansing and the primitive craving for power and knowledge have all contributed to crystallize out this new social fact of the temple. The temple was accumulated by complex necessities, it grew from many roots and needs, and the god that dominated the temple was the creation of many imaginations and made up of all sorts of impulses, ideas, and half-ideas. Here there was a god in which one sort of ideas predominated, and there another. It is necessary to lay some stress upon this confusion and variety of origin in gods, because there is a very abundant literature now in existence upon religious origins, in which a number of writers insist. Some on this leading idea and some on that, we have noted several in our chapter 12 on early thought, as though it were the only idea. Professor Max Muller in his time, for example, harped perpetually on the idea of sun stories and sun worship. He would have had us think that early man never had lusts or fears, cravings for power, nightmares or fantasies, but that he meditated perpetually on the beneficent source of light and life in the sky. Now dawn and sunset are very moving facts in the daily life, but they are only two among many. Early men, three or four hundred generations ago, had brains very like our own. The fancies of our childhood and youth are perhaps the best clue we have to the ground stuff of early religion, and anyone who can recall those early mental experiences will understand very easily the vagueness, the monstrosity, and the incoherent variety of the first gods. There were sun gods, no doubt, early in the history of temples, but there were also hippopotamus gods and hawk gods. There were cow deities, there were monstrous male and female gods, there were gods of terror and gods of an adorable quaintness, there were gods who were nothing but lumps of meteoric stone that had fallen amazingly out of the sky. And gods who were mere natural stones that had chanced to have a queer and impressive shape. Some gods, like Marduk of Babylon and the Baal, equals the Lord, of the Phoenicians, Canaanites, and the like, were quite probably at bottom just legendary wonder beings, such as little boys will invent for themselves today. The early Semites, it is said, as soon as they thought of a god, invented a wife for him, most of the Egyptian and Babylonian gods were married. But the gods of the nomadic Semites had not this marrying disposition. Children were less eagerly sought by the inhabitants of the food-grudging steppes. Even more natural than to provide a wife for a god is to give him a house to live in to which offerings can be brought. Of this house the knowing man, the magician, would naturally become the custodian. A certain seclusion, a certain aloofness, would add greatly to the prestige of the god. The steps by which the early temple and the early priesthood developed so soon as an agricultural population settled and increased are all quite natural and understandable, up to the stage of the long temple with the image. Shrine and altar at one end and the long nave in which the worshippers stood. 
And this temple, because it had records and secrets, because it was a center of power, advice, and instruction, because it sought and attracted imaginative and clever people for its service, naturally became a kind of brain in the growing community. The attitude of the common people who tilled the fields and herded the beasts towards the temple would remain simple and credulous. There, rarely seen and so imaginatively enhanced, lived the God whose approval gave prosperity, whose anger meant misfortune, he could be propitiated by little presence and the help of his servants could be obtained. He was wonderful, and of such power and knowledge that it did not do to be disrespectful to him even in one's thoughts. Within the priesthood, however, a certain amount of thinking went on at a rather higher level than that. Section 3 and now we have to note a very interesting fact about the chief temples of Egypt and, so far as we know, because the ruins are not so distinct, of Babylonia, and that is that they were oriented, that is to say, that the same sort of temple was built so that the shrine and entrance always faced in the same direction. In Babylonian temples this was most often due east, facing the sunrise on March 21st and September 21st, the equinoxes and it is to be noted that it was at the spring equinox that the Euphrates and Tigris came down in flood. The pyramids of Gizeh are also oriented east and west, and the Sphinx faces due east, but very many of the Egyptian temples to the south of the delta of the Nile do not point due east. But to the point where the sun rises at the longest day, and in Egypt the inundation comes close to that date. Others, however, pointed nearly northward, and others again pointed to the rising of the star Sirius or to the rising point of other conspicuous stars. The fact of orientation links up with the fact that there early arose a close association between various gods and the sun and various fixed stars. Whatever the mass of people outside were thinking, the priests of the temples were beginning to link the movements of those heavenly bodies with the power in the shrine. They were thinking about the gods they served and thinking new meanings into them. They were brooding upon the mystery of the stars. It was very natural for them to suppose that these shining bodies, so irregularly distributed and circling so solemnly and silently, must be charged with portents to mankind. Among other things, this orientation of the temples served to fix and help the great annual festival of the new year. On one morning in the year, and one morning alone, in a temple oriented to the rising place of the sun at midsummer day, the sun's first rays would smite down through the gloom of the temple and the long alley of the temple pillars. And light up the god above the altar and irradiate him with glory. The narrow, darkened structure of the ancient temples seems to be deliberately planned for such an effect. No doubt the people were gathered in the darkness before the dawn, in the darkness there was chanting and perhaps the offering of sacrifices. The god alone stood mute and invisible. Prayers and invocations would be made. Then upon the eyes of the worshippers, sensitized by the darkness, as the sun rose behind them, the god would suddenly shine. So, at least, one explanation of orientation is found by such students of orientation as Sir Norman Lockyer. Not only is orientation apparent in most of the temples of Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, and the East, it is found in the Greek temples. Stonehenge is oriented to the midsummer sunrise, and so are most of the megalithic circles of Europe, the Temple of Heaven in Peking is oriented to midwinter. In the days of the Chinese Empire, up to a few years ago, one of the most important of all the duties of the Emperor of China was to sacrifice and pray in this temple upon midwinter's day for a propitious year. The Egyptian priests had mapped out the stars into the constellations, and divided up the zodiac into twelve signs, by 300 BC. Section 4 This clear evidence of astronomical inquiry and of a development of astronomical ideas is the most obvious, but only the most obvious. Evidence of the very considerable intellectual activities that went on within the temple precincts in ancient times. There is a curious disposition among many modern writers to deprecate priesthoods and to speak of priests as though they had always been impostors and tricksters, preying upon the simplicity of mankind. But, indeed, they were for long the only writing class, the only reading public, the only learned and the only thinkers, they were all the professional classes of the time. You could have no intellectual life at all, you could not get access to literature or any knowledge except through the priesthood. 
the temples were not only observatories and libraries and clinics, they were museums and treasure houses. The original periplus of Hanno hung in one temple in Carthage, skins of his gorillas were hung and treasured in another. Whatever there was of abiding worth in the life of the community sheltered there. Herodotus, the early Greek historian, 485 to 425 BC, collected most of his material from the priests of the countries in which he traveled, and it is evident they met him generously and put their very considerable resources completely at his disposal. Outside the temples the world was still a world of blankly illiterate and unspeculative human beings, living from day to day entirely for themselves. Moreover, there is little evidence that the commonalty felt cheated by the priests, or had anything but trust and affection for the early priesthoods. Even the great conquerors of later times were anxious to keep themselves upon the right side of the priests of the nations and cities whose obedience they desired, because of the immense popular influence of these priests. No doubt there were great differences between temple and temple and cult and cult in the spirit and quality of the priesthood. Some probably were cruel, some vicious and greedy, many dull and doctrinaire, stupid with tradition, but it has to be kept in mind that there were distinct limits to the degeneracy or inefficiency of a priesthood. It had to keep its grip upon the general mind. It could not go beyond what people would stand, either towards the darkness or towards the light. Its authority rested, in the end, on the persuasion that its activities were propitious. Section 5. It is clear that the earliest civilized governments were essentially priestly governments. It was not kings and captains who first set men to the plow and a settled life. It was the ideas of the gods and plenty, working with the acquiescence of common men. The early rulers of Sumer we know were all priests, kings only because they were chief priests. And priestly government had its own weaknesses as well as its peculiar deep-rooted strength. The power of a priesthood is a power over their own people alone. It is a subjugation through mysterious fears and hopes. The priesthood can gather its people together for war, but its traditionalism and all its methods unfit it for military control. Against the enemy without, a priest-led people is feeble. Moreover, a priest is a man vowed, trained, and consecrated, a man belonging to a special corps, and necessarily with an intense esprit de corps. He has given up his life to his temple and his god. This is a very excellent thing for the internal vigor of his own priesthood, his own temple. He lives or dies for the honor of his particular god. But in the next town or village is another temple with another god. It is his constant preoccupation to keep his people from that god. Religious cults and priesthoods are sectarian by nature, they will convert, they will overcome, but they will never coalesce. Our first perceptions of events in Sumer, in the dim uncertain light before history began, is of priests and gods in conflict, until the Sumerians were conquered by the Semites they were never united. And the same incurable conflict of priesthood scars all the temple ruins of Egypt. It was impossible that it could have been otherwise, having regard to the elements out of which religion arose. An Assyrian king and his chief minister. It was out of those two main weaknesses of all priesthoods, namely, the incapacity for efficient military leadership and their inevitable jealousy of all other religious cults. That the power of secular kingship arose. The foreign enemy either prevailed and set up a king over the people, or the priesthoods who would not give way to each other set up a common fighting captain, who retained more or less power in peacetime. This secular king developed a group of officials about him and began, in relation to military organization, to take a share in the priestly administration of the people's affairs. So, growing out of priestcraft and beside the priest, the king, the protagonist of the priest, appears upon the stage of human history, and a very large amount of the subsequent experiences of mankind is only to be understood as an elaboration. Complication and distortion of the struggle, unconscious or deliberate, between these two systems of human control, the temple and the palace. And it was in the original centers of civilization that this antagonism was most completely developed. The Aryan peoples never passed through a phase of temple rule on their way to civilization, they came to civilization late. They found that drama already half-played. They took over the ideas of both temple and kingship, 
when those ideas were already elaborately developed, from the more civilized Hamitic or Semitic people they conquered. The greater importance of the gods and the priests in the earlier history of the Mesopotamian civilization is very apparent, but gradually the palace won its way until it was at last in a position to struggle definitely for the supreme power. At first, in the story, the palace is ignorant and friendless in the face of the temple, the priests alone read, the priests alone know, the people are afraid of him. But in the dissensions of the various cults comes the opportunity of the palace. From other cities, from among captives, from defeated or suppressed religious cults, the palace gets men who also can read and who can do magic things. The court also becomes a center of writing and record. The king thinks for himself and becomes politic. Traders and foreigners drift to the court, and if the king has not the full records and the finished scholarship of the priests, he has a wider and fresher first-hand knowledge of many things. The priest comes into the temple when he is very young, he passes many years as a neophyte, the path of learning the clumsy letters of primitive times is slow and toilsome, he becomes erudite and prejudiced rather than a man of the world. Some of the more active-minded young priests may even cast envious eyes at the king's service. There are many complications and variations in this ages-long drama of the struggle going on beneath the outward conflicts of priest and king, between the made man and the born man, between learning and originality between established knowledge and settled usage on the one hand, and creative will and imagination on the other. It is not always, as we shall find later, the priest who is the conservative and unimaginative antagonist. Sometimes a king struggles against narrow and obstructive priesthoods. Sometimes priesthoods uphold the standards of civilization against savage, egotistical, or reactionary kings. One or two outstanding facts and incidents of the early stages of this fundamental struggle in political affairs are all that we can note here between 400 BC and the days of Alexander. Section 6. In the early days of Sumeria and Akkadia the city kings were priests and medicine men rather than kings. And it was only when foreign conquerors sought to establish their hold in relation to existing institutions that the distinction of priest and king became definite. But the god of the priests remained as the real overlord of the land and of priest and king alike. He was the universal landlord, the wealth and authority of his temples and establishments outshone those of the king. Especially was this the case within the city walls. Hammurabi, the founder of the first Babylonian empire, is one of the earlier monarchs whom we find taking a firm grip upon the affairs of the community. He does it with the utmost politeness to the gods. In an inscription recording his irrigation work in Sumeria and Akkadia, he begins, When Anu and Bel entrusted me with the rule of Sumer and Akkad. We possess a code of laws made by this same Hammurabi, it is the earliest known code of law, and at the head of this code we see the figure of Hammurabi receiving the law from its nominal promulgator, the god Shamash. An act of great political importance in the conquest of any city was the carrying off of its god to become a subordinate in the temple of its conqueror. This was far more important than the subjugation of king by king. Merodach, the Babylonian Jupiter, was carried off by the Elamites, and Babylon did not feel independent until its return. But sometimes a conqueror was afraid of the god he had conquered. In the collection of letters addressed to Amenophis III and IV at Telamarna in Egypt, to which allusion has already been made, is one from a certain king, Tushrata, king of Mitanni, who has conquered Assyria and taken the statue of the goddess Ishtar. Apparently he has sent this statue into Egypt, partly to acknowledge the overlordship of Amenophis, but partly because he fears her anger. Winkler In the Bible is related, Sam, I, V. 1. How the Ark of the Covenant of the God of the Hebrews was carried off by the Philistines, as a token of conquest, into the temple of the fish god, Dagon, at Ashdod, and how Dagon fell down and was broken. And how the people of Ashdod were smitten with disease. In the latter story particularly the gods and priests fill the scene, there is no king in evidence at all. Right through the history of the Babylonian and Assyrian empires no monarch seems to have felt his tenure of power secure in Babylon until he had taken the hand of Bel, that is to say, that he had been adopted by the priesthood of Bel as the god's son and representative. 
As our knowledge of Assyrian and Babylonian history grows clearer, it becomes plainer that the politics of that world, the revolutions, usurpations, changes of dynasty, intrigues with foreign powers, turned largely upon issues between the great wealthy priesthoods and the growing but still inadequate power of the monarchy. The king relied on his army, and this was usually a mercenary army of foreigners, speedily mutinous if there was no pay or plunder, and easily bribed. We have already noted the name of Sennacherib, the son of Sargon II, among the monarchs of the Assyrian Empire. Sennacherib was involved in a violent quarrel with the priesthood of Babylon, he never took the hand of Bel. And finally struck at that power by destroying altogether the holy part of the city of Babylon, 691 BC, and removing the statue of Bel Marduk to Assyria. He was assassinated by one of his sons, and his successor, Esarhaddon, his son, but not the son who was his assassin, found it expedient to restore Bel Marduk and rebuild his temple, and make his peace with the god. Asurbanipal, Greek, Sardanapalus, the son of this Esarhaddon, is a particularly interesting figure from this point of view of the relationship of priesthood and king. His father's reconciliation with the priests of Bel Marduk went so far that Sardanapalus was given a Babylonian instead of a military Assyrian education. He became a great collector of the clay documents of the past, and his library, which has been unearthed, is now the most precious source of historical material in the world. But for all his learning he kept his grip on the Assyrian army. He made a temporary conquest of Egypt, suppressed a rebellion in Babylon, and carried out a number of successful expeditions. As we have already told in chapter 16, he was almost the last of the Assyrian monarchs. The Aryan tribes, who knew more of war than of priestcraft, and particularly the Scythians, the Medes and Persians, had long been pressing upon Assyria from the north and northeast. The Medes and Persians formed an alliance with the nomadic Semitic Chaldeans of the south for the joint undoing of Assyria. Nineveh, the Assyrian capital, fell to these Aryans in 606 BC. Sixty-seven years after the taking of Nineveh by the Aryans, which left Babylonia to the Semitic Chaldeans, the last monarch of the Chaldean Empire, the second Babylonian Empire, Nabonidus, the father of Belshazzar, was overthrown by Cyrus. The Persian. This Nabonidus, again, was a highly educated monarch, who brought far too much intelligence and imagination and not enough of the short-range wisdom of this world to affairs of state. He conducted antiquarian researches, and to his researches it is that we owe the date of 3750 BC, assigned to Sargon I and still accepted by many authorities. He was proud of this determination, and left inscriptions to record it. It is clear he was a religious innovator, he built and rearranged temples and attempted to centralize religion in Babylon by bringing a number of local gods to the temple of Belmarduk. No doubt he realized the weakness and disunion of his empire due to these conflicting cults, and had some conception of unification in his mind. Events were marching too rapidly for any such development. His innovation had manifestly raised the suspicion and hostility of the priesthood of Bel. They sided with the Persians. The soldiers of Cyrus entered Babylon without fighting. Nabonidus was taken prisoner, and Persian sentinels were set at the gates of the Temple of Bel, where the services continued without intermission. Cyrus did, in fact, set up the Persian Empire in Babylon with the blessing of Bel Marduk. He gratified the conservative instincts of the priests by packing off the local gods back to their ancestral temples. He also restored the Jews to Jerusalem. These were merely matters of immediate policy to him. But in bringing in the irreligious Arians, the ancient priesthood was paying too highly for the continuation of its temple services. It would have been wiser to have dealt with the innovations of Nabonidus, that earnest heretic, to have listened to his ideas, and to have met the needs of a changing world. Cyrus entered Babylon 539 BC, by 521 BC. Babylon was in insurrection again, and in 520 BC another Persian monarch, Darius, was pulling down her walls. Within 200 years the life had altogether gone out of those venerable rituals of Belmarduk, and the temple of Belmarduk was being used by builders as a quarry. Section 7 The story of priest and king in Egypt is similar to, but by no means parallel with, 
that of Babylonia. The kings of Samaria and Assyria were priests who had become kings, they were secularized priests. The pharaoh of Egypt does not appear to have followed precisely that line. Already in the very oldest records the pharaoh has a power and importance exceeding that of any priest. He is, in fact, a god, and more than either priest or king. We do not know how he got to that position. No monarch of Sumeria or Babylonia or Assyria could have induced his people to do for him what the great pyramid-building pharaohs of the IVTH dynasty made their people do in those vast directions. The earlier pharaohs were not improbably regarded as incarnations of the dominant god. The falcon god Horus sits behind the head of the great statue of Chephren. So late a monarch as Ramesses III, XXTH dynasty, is represented upon his sarcophagus, now at Cambridge, bearing the distinctive symbols of the three great gods of the Egyptian system. He carries the two scepters of Osiris, the god of day and resurrection, upon his head are the horns of the cow goddess Hathor, and also the sun ball and feathers of Amun Ra. He is not merely wearing the symbols of these gods as a devout Babylonian might wear the symbols of Belmarduk, he is these three gods in one. Ramses III as Osiris, between the goddesses Nephthys and Isis. Relief on the cover of the sarcophagus, at Cambridge. After Sharp. Inscription, round the edges of cover, as far as decipherable. Osiris, king of Upper and Lower Egypt, lord of the two countries. Son of the sun, beloved of the gods, lord of diadems, Ramesses, prince of Heliopolis, triumphant. Thou art in the condition of a god, thou shalt arise as USR, there is no enemy to thee, I give to thee triumph among them. Budge, Catalogue, Egyptian Collection, Fitzwilliam Museum, Cambridge. The student will find much more in Sir J. G. Fraser's Golden Bough about the ancient use of human beings as well as statues to represent gods. Here we have merely to point to an apparent difference of idea between the Asiatic and African monarchies in this respect. We find also a number of sculptures and paintings to enforce the idea that the pharaohs were the actual sons of gods. The divine fathering and birth of Amenophis III, for instance, of the Xviith dynasty, is displayed in extraordinary detail in a series of sculptures at Luxor. Moreover, it was held that the pharaohs, being of so divine a strain, could not marry common clay, and consequently they were accustomed to marry blood relations within the degrees of consanguinity now prohibited, even marrying their sisters. The struggle between palace and temple came into Egyptian history, therefore, at a different angle from that at which it came into Babylonia. Nevertheless, it came in. Professor Maspiro, in his New Light on Ancient Egypt, gives a very interesting account of the struggle of Amenophis IV with the priesthoods, and particularly with priests of the great god, Amun Ra, lord of Karnak. The mother of Amenophis IV was not of the race of Pharaoh. It would seem that his father, Amenophis III, made a love match with a subject, a beautiful Syrian named T. And Professor Maspiro finds in the possible opposition to and annoyance of this queen by the priests of Amun Ra the beginnings of the quarrel. She may, he thinks, have inspired her son with a fanatical hatred of Amun Ra. But Amenophis IV may have had a wider view. Like the Babylonian Nabonidus, who lived a thousand years later, he may have had in mind the problem of moral unity in his empire. We have already noted that Amenophis III ruled from Ethiopia to the Euphrates, and that the store of letters to himself and his son found at Tel Amarna show a very wide range of interest and influence. At any rate, Amenophis IV set himself to close all the Egyptian and Syrian temples, to put an end to all sectarian worship throughout his dominions, and to establish everywhere the worship of one god, Aten, the solar disk. He left his capital, Thebes, which was even more the city of Amun Ra than later Babylon was the city of Belmarduk, and set up his capital at Tel Amarna. He altered his name from Amenophis, which consecrated him to Amun, Amen, to Akhenaten the sun's glory, and he held his own against all the priesthoods of his empire for eighteen years and died a pharaoh. Opinions upon Amenophis IV, or Akhenaten, differ very widely. There are those who regard him as the creature of his mother's hatred of Ammon and the uxorious spouse of a beautiful wife. 
certainly he loved his wife very passionately. He showed her great honor, Egypt honored women, and was ruled at different times by several queens, and he was sculptured in one instance with his wife seated upon his knees, and in another in the act of kissing her in a chariot. But men who live under the sway of their womenkind do not sustain great empires in the face of the bitter hostility of the most influential organized bodies in their realm. Others write of him as a gloomy fanatic. Matrimonial bliss is rare in the cases of gloomy fanatics. It is much more reasonable to regard him as the pharaoh who refused to be a god. It is not simply his religious policy and his frank display of natural affection that seem to mark a strong and very original personality. His aesthetic ideas were his own. He refused to have his portrait conventionalized into the customary smooth beauty of the pharaoh god, and his face looks out at us across an interval of thirty-four centuries, a man amidst ranks of divine insipidities. A reign of eighteen years was not long enough for the revolution he contemplated, and his son-in-law who succeeded him went back to Thebes and made his peace with Amenare. To the very end of the story the divinity of kings haunted the Egyptian mind, and infected the thoughts of intellectually healthier races. When Alexander the Great reached Babylon, the prestige of Belmarduk was already far gone in decay, but in Egypt, Amenare was still god enough to make a snob of the conquering Grecian. The priests of Amenare, about the time of the XVIIth or XXTH dynasty, circa 1400 BC, had set up in an oasis of the desert a temple and oracle. Here was an image of the god which could speak, move its head, and accept or reject scrolls of inquiry. This oracle was still flourishing in 332 BC. The young master of the world, it is related, made a special journey to visit it. He came into the sanctuary, and the image advanced out of the darkness at the back to meet him. There was an impressive exchange of salutations. Some such formula as this must have been used, says Professor Maspiro, come, son of my loins, who loves me so that I give thee the royalty of Are and the royalty of Horus. I give thee valiance, I give thee to hold all countries and all religions under thy feet, I give thee to strike all the peoples united together with thy arm. So it was that the priests of Egypt conquered their conqueror, and an Aryan monarch first became a god. Section 8 The struggle of priest and king in China cannot be discussed here at any length. It was different again, as in Egypt it was different from Babylonia, but we find the same effort on the part of the ruler to break up tradition because it divides up the people. The Chinese emperor, the son of heaven, was himself a high priest, and his chief duty was sacrificial, in the more disorderly phases of Chinese history he ceases to rule and continues only to sacrifice. The literary class was detached from the priestly class at an early date. It became a bureaucratic body serving the local kings and rulers. That is a fundamental difference between the history of China and any Western history. While Alexander was overrunning Western Asia, China, under the last priest emperors of the Chao dynasty, was sinking into a state of great disorder. Each province clung to its separate nationality and traditions, and the Huns spread from province to province. The king of Tsin, who lived about eighty years after Alexander the Great, impressed by the mischief tradition was doing in the land, resolved to destroy the entire Chinese literature, and his son, Shi Huang Ti, the first universal emperor, made a strenuous attempt to seek out and destroy all the existing classics. They vanished while he ruled, and he ruled without tradition, and welded China into a unity that endured for some centuries, but when he had passed, the hidden books crept out again. China remained united, though not under his descendants, but after a civil war under a fresh dynasty, the Han Dynasty, 206 BC. The first Han monarch did not sustain this campaign of Shi Huang Ti against the literati, and his successor made his peace with them and restored the texts of the classics. XX. Serfs, slaves, social classes, and free individuals. Section 1. The Common Man in Ancient Times. Section 2. The Earliest Slaves. Section 3. The First Independent Persons. Section 4. Social Classes 3000 Years Ago. Section 5. Classes Hardening into Castes. 
Section 6. Caste in India. Section 7. The System of the Mandarins. Section 8. A Summary of 5,000 Years. Section 1. We have been sketching in the last four chapters the growth of civilized states out of the primitive Neolithic agriculture that began in Mesopotamia perhaps 15,000, perhaps 20,000, years ago. It was at first horticulture rather than agriculture, it was done with the hoe before the plow, and at first it was quite supplementary to the sheep, goat, and cattle tending that made the living of the family tribe. We have traced the broad outlines of the development in regions of exceptional fruitfulness of the first settled village communities into more populous towns and cities. And the growth of the village shrine and the village medicine man into the city temple and the city priesthood. We have noted the beginnings of organized war, first as a bickering between villages, and then as a more disciplined struggle between the priest king and god of one city and those of another. Our story has passed on rapidly from the first indications of conquest and empire in Sumer, perhaps 6000 or 7000 BC, to the spectacle of great empires growing up, with roads and armies, with inscriptions and written documents, with educated priesthoods and kings and rulers sustained by a tradition already ancient. We have traced in broad outline the appearance and conflicts and replacements of these empires of the great rivers. We have directed attention, in particular, to the evidence of a development of still wider political ideas as we find it betrayed by the actions and utterances of such men as Nabonidus and Amenophis IV. It has been an outline of the accumulations of human experience for ten or fifteen thousand years, a vast space of time in comparison with all subsequent history. But a brief period when we measure it against the succession of endless generations that intervenes between us and the first rude flint using human creatures of the Pleistocene dawn. But for these last four chapters, we have been writing almost entirely not about mankind generally, but only about the men who thought, the men who could draw and read and write, the men who were altering their world. Beneath their activities, what was the life of the mute multitude? The life of the common man was, of course, affected and changed by these things, just as the lives of the domestic animals and the face of the cultivated country were changed. But for the most part it was a change suffered and not a change in which the common man upon the land had any voice or will. Reading and writing were not yet for the likes of him. He went on cultivating his patch, loving his wife and children, beating his dog and tending his beasts, grumbling at hard times, fearing the magic of the priests and the power of the gods. Desiring little more except to be left alone by the powers above him. So he was in 10,000 BC, so he was, unchanged in nature and outlook, in the time of Alexander the Great, so over the greater part of the world he remains today. He got rather better tools, better seeds, better methods, a slightly sounder house, he sold his produce in a more organized market as civilization progressed. A certain freedom and a certain equality passed out of human life when men ceased to wander. Men paid in liberty for safety, shelter, and regular meals. By imperceptible degrees the common man found the patch he cultivated was not his own. It belonged to the god, and he had to pay a fraction of his produce to the god. Or the god had given it to the king, who exacted his rent and tax. Or the king had given it to an official, who was the lord of the common man. And sometimes the god or the king or the noble had work to be done, and then the common man had to leave his patch and work for his master. How far the patch he cultivated was his own was never very clear to him. In ancient Assyria the land seems to have been held as a sort of freehold and the occupier paid taxes, in Babylonia the land was the gods, and he permitted the cultivator to work thereon. In Egypt the temples or Pharaoh the god or the nobles under Pharaoh were the owners and rent receivers. But the cultivator was not a slave. He was a peasant, and only bound to the land in so far that there was nothing else for him to do but cultivate, and nowhere else for him to go. He lived in a village or town, and went out to his work. The village, to begin with, was often merely a big household of related people under a patriarch headman, the early town a group of householders under its elders. There was no process of enslavement as civilization grew, but the headmen and leaderly men grew in power and authority, 
and the common men did not keep pace with them, and fell into a tradition of dependence and subordination. On the whole, the common men were probably well content to live under lord or king or god and obey their bidding. It was safer. It was easier. All animals, and man is no exception, begin life as dependents. Most men never shake themselves loose from the desire for leading and protection. Section 2. Egyptian peasants seized for non-payment of taxes. Pyramid Age. The earlier wars did not involve remote or prolonged campaigns, and they were waged by levies of the common people. But war brought in a new source of possessions, plunder, and a new social factor, the captive. In the earlier, simpler days of war, the captive man was kept only to be tortured or sacrificed to the victorious god, the captive women and children were assimilated into the tribe. But later many captives were spared to be slaves because they had exceptional gifts or peculiar arts. It would be the kings and captains who would take these slaves at first, and it would speedily become apparent to them that these men were much more their own than were the peasant cultivators and common men of their own race. The slave could be commanded to do all sorts of things for his master at the quasi-free common man would not do so willingly because of his attachment to his own patch of cultivation. From a very early period the artificer was often a household slave, and the manufacture of trade goods, pottery, textiles, metalware, and so forth, such as went on vigorously in the household city of the Minas of Knossos, was probably a slave industry from the beginning. Sais, in his Babylonians and Assyrians, quotes Babylonian agreements for the teaching of trades to slaves, and dealing with the exploitation of slave products. Slaves produced slave children, enslavement and discharge of debts added to the slave population. It is probable that as the cities grew larger, a larger part of the new population consisted of these slave artificers and slave servants in the large households. They were by no means abject slaves. In later Babylon their lives and property were protected by elaborate laws. Nor were they all outlanders. Parents might sell their children into slavery, and brothers their orphan sisters. Free men who had no means of livelihood would even sell themselves into slavery. And slavery was the fate of the insolvent debtor. Craft apprenticeship, again, was a sort of fixed-term slavery. Out of the slave population, by a converse process, arose the freedman and freedwoman, who worked for wages and had still more definite individual rights. Since in Babylon slaves could themselves own property, many slaves saved up and bought themselves. Probably the town slave was often better off and practically as free as the cultivator of the soil, and as the rural population increased, its sons and daughters came to mix with and swell the growing ranks of artificers, some bound, some free. As the extent and complexity of government increased, the number of households multiplied. Under the king's household grew up the households of his great ministers and officials, under the temple grew up the personal households of temple functionaries. It is not difficult to realize how houses and patches of land would become more and more distinctly the property of the occupiers, and more and more definitely alienated from the original owner god. The earlier empires in Egypt and China both passed into a feudal stage, in which families, originally official, became for a time independent noble families. In the later stages of Babylonian civilization we find an increasing propertied class of people appearing in the social structure, neither slaves nor peasants nor priests nor officials, but widows and descendants of such people. Or successful traders and the like, and all masterless folk. Traders came in from the outside. Babylon was full of Aramean traders, who had great establishments, with slaves, freedmen, employees of all sorts. Their bookkeeping was a serious undertaking. It involved storing a great multitude of earthenware tablets in huge earthenware jars. Upon this gathering mixture of more or less free and detached people would live other people, traders, merchants, small dealers, catering for their needs. Sais, opposite, gives the particulars of an agreement for the setting up and stocking of a tavern and beer house, for example. The passerby, the man who happened to be about, had come into existence. But another and far less kindly sort of slavery also arose in the old civilization, and that was gang slavery. 
If it did not figure very largely in the cities, it was very much in evidence elsewhere. The king was, to begin with, the chief entrepreneur. He made the canals and organized the irrigation, e.g. Hammurabi's enterprises noted in the previous chapter. He exploited mines. He seems, at Knossos, e.g. to have organized manufactures for export. The pharaohs of the first dynasty were already working the copper and turquoise mines in the peninsula of Sinai. For many such purposes gangs of captives were cheaper and far more controllable than levies of the king's own people. From an early period, too, captives may have tugged the oars of the galleys, though Tor, ancient ships, notes that up to the age of Pericles, 450 BC, the free Athenians were not above this task. And the monarch also found slaves convenient for his military expeditions. They were uprooted men, they did not fret to go home, because they had no homes to go to. The pharaohs hunted slaves in Nubia, in order to have black troops for their Syrian expeditions. Closely allied to such slave troops were the mercenary barbaric troops the monarchs caught into their service, not by positive compulsion, but by the bribes of food and plunder and under the pressure of need. As the old civilization developed, these mercenary armies replaced the national levies of the old order more and more, and servile gang labor became a more and more important and significant factor in the economic system. From mines and canal and wall building, the servile gang spread into cultivation. Nobles and temples adopted the gang slave system for their works. Plantation gangs began to oust the patch cultivation of the labor serf in the case of some staple products. Section 3 So, in a few paragraphs, we trace the development of the simple social structure of the early Sumerian cities to the complex city crowds, the multitude of individuals varying in race, tradition, education, and function, varying in wealth, freedom, authority, and usefulness, in the great cities of the last thousand years b. c. The most notable thing of all is the gradual increase amidst this heterogeneous multitude of what we may call free individuals, detached persons who are neither priests, nor kings, nor officials, nor serfs, nor slaves, who are under no great pressure to work, who have time to read and inquire. They appear side by side with the development of social security and private property. Coined money and monetary reckoning developed. The operations of the Arameans and such like Semitic trading people led to the organization of credit and monetary security. In the earlier days almost the only property, except a few movables, consisted of rights in land and in houses. Later, one could deposit and lend securities, could go away and return to find one's property faithfully held and secure. Towards the middle of the period of the Persian Empire there lived one free individual, Herodotus, who has a great interest for us because he was among the first writers of critical and intelligent history. As distinguished from a mere priestly or court chronicle. It is worthwhile to glance here very briefly at the circumstances of his life. Later on we shall quote from his history. Brawl among boatmen. From Tomb of Tahitep, Pyramid Age. We have already noted the conquest of Babylonia by the Aryan Persians under Cyrus in 539 BC. We have noted, further, that the Persian Empire spread into Egypt, where its hold was precarious. And it extended also over Asia Minor. Herodotus was born about 484 BC in a Greek city of Asia Minor, Halicarnassus, which was under the overlordship of the Persians, and directly under the rule of a political boss or tyrant. There is no sign that he was obliged either to work for a living or spend very much time in the administration of his property. We do not know the particulars of his affairs, but it is clear that in this minor Greek city, under foreign rule, he was able to obtain and read and study manuscripts of nearly everything that had been written in the Greek language before his time. He traveled, so far as one can gather, with freedom and comfort about the Greek archipelagos, he stayed wherever he wanted to stay, and he seems to have found comfortable accommodation. He went to Babylon and to Susa, the new capital the Persians had set up in Babylonia to the east of the Tigris. He toured along the coast of the Black Sea, and accumulated a considerable amount of knowledge about the Scythians, the Aryan people who were then distributed over South Russia. He went to the south of Italy, 
explored the antiquities of Tyre, coasted Palestine, landed at Gaza, and made a long stay in Egypt. He went about Egypt looking at temples and monuments and gathering information. We know, not only from him, but from other evidence, that in those days the older temples and the pyramids, which were already nearly three thousand years old, were visited by strings of tourists, a special sort of priests acting as guides. The inscriptions the sightseers scribbled upon the walls remain to this day, and many of them have been deciphered and published. Statuettes from middle-class Egyptian tombs showing low-class social types in the ancient communities. As his knowledge accumulated, he conceived the idea of writing a great history of the attempts of Persia to subdue Greece. But in order to introduce that history he composed an account of the past of Greece, Persia, Assyria, Babylonia, Egypt, Scythia, and of the geography in peoples of those countries. He then set himself, it is said, to make his history known among his friends in Halicarnassus by reciting it to them, but they failed to appreciate it, and he then betook himself to Athens, the most flourishing of all Greek cities at that time. There his work was received with applause. We find him in the center of a brilliant circle of intelligent and active-minded people, and the city authorities voted him a reward of ten talents, a sum of money equivalent to two thousand four hundred pounds, in recognition of his literary achievement. But we will not complete the biography of this most interesting man, nor will we enter into any criticism of his garrulous, marvel-telling, and most entertaining history. It is a book to which all intelligent readers come sooner or later, abounding as it does in illuminating errors and Boswellian charm. We give these particulars here simply to show that in the 5th century BC, a new factor was becoming evident in human affairs. Reading and writing had already long escaped from the temple precincts and the ranks of the court scribes. Record was no longer confined to court and temple. A new sort of people, these people of leisure and independent means, were asking questions, exchanging knowledge and views, and developing ideas. So beneath the march of armies and the policies of monarchs, and above the common lives of illiterate and incurious men, we note the beginnings of what is becoming at last nowadays a dominant power in human affairs, the free intelligence of mankind. Of that free intelligence we shall have more to say when in a subsequent chapter we tell of the Greeks. Section 4. We may summarize the discussion of the last two chapters here by making a list of the chief elements in this complicated accumulation of human beings which made up the later Babylonian and Egyptian civilizations of from 2500 to 3000 years ago. These elements grew up and became distinct one from another in the great river valleys of the world in the course of five or six thousand years. They developed mental dispositions and traditions and attitudes of thought one to another. The civilization in which we live today is simply carrying on and still further developing and working out and rearranging these relationships. This is the world from which we inherit. It is only by the attentive study of their origins that we can detach ourselves from the prejudices and immediate ideas of the particular class to which we may belong, and begin to understand the social and political questions of our own time. One, first, then, came the priesthood, the temple system, which was the nucleus and the guiding intelligence about which the primitive civilizations grew. It was still in these later days a great power in the world, the chief repository of knowledge and tradition, an influence over the lives of every one, and a binding force to hold the community together. But it was no longer all-powerful, because its nature made it conservative and inadaptable. It no longer monopolized knowledge nor initiated fresh ideas. Learning had already leaked out to other less pledged and controlled people, who thought for themselves. About the temple system were grouped its priests and priestesses, its scribes, its physicians, its magicians, its lay brethren, treasurers, managers, directors, and the like. It owned great properties and often hoarded huge treasures. Two, over against the priesthood, and originally arising out of it, was the court system, headed by a king or a king of kings, who was in later Assyria and Babylonia a sort of captain and lay controller of affairs, and in Egypt a godman, who had released himself from the control of his priests. About the monarch were accumulated his scribes, counselors, record keepers, agents, captains, and guards. 
Many of his officials, particularly his provincial officials, had great subordinate establishments and were constantly tending to become independent. The nobility of the old river valley civilizations arose out of the court system. It was, therefore, a different thing in its origins from the nobility of the early Aryans, which was a republican nobility of elders and leading men. 3. At the base of the social pyramid was the large and most necessary class in the community, the tillers of the soil. Their status varied from age to age and in different lands. They were free peasants paying taxes, or serfs of the god, or serfs or tenants of king or noble, or of a private owner, paying him a rent, in most cases tax or rent was paid in produce. In the states of the river valleys they were high cultivators, cultivating comparatively small holdings. They lived together for safety in villages, and had a common interest in maintaining their irrigation channels and a sense of community in their village life. The cultivation of the soil is an exacting occupation. The seasons and the harvest sunsets will not wait for men. Children can be utilized at an early age, and so the cultivator class is generally a poorly educated, close toiling class, superstitious by reason of ignorance and the uncertainty of the seasons, ill-informed and easily put upon. It is capable at times of great passive resistance, but it has no purpose in its round but crops and crops, to keep out of debt and hoard against bad times. So it has remained to our own days over the greater part of Europe and Asia. For, differing widely in origin and quality from the tillers of the soil was the artisan class. At first, this was probably in part a town slave class, in part it consisted of peasants who had specialized upon a craft. But in developing an art and mystery of its own, a technique that had to be learnt before it could be practiced, each sort of craft probably developed a certain independence and a certain sense of community of its own. The artisans were able to get together and discuss their affairs more readily than the toilers on the land, and they were able to form guilds to restrict output, maintain rates of pay, and protect their common interest. 5. As the power of the Babylonian rulers spread out beyond the original areas of good husbandry into grazing regions and less fertile districts, a class of herdsmen came into existence. In the case of Babylonia these were nomadic Semites, the Bedouin, like the Bedouin of today. They probably grazed their flocks over great areas much as the sheep ranchers of California do. They were paid and esteemed much more highly than the husbandmen. 6. The first merchants in the world were shipowners, like the people of Tyre and Gnosis, or nomads who carried and traded goods as they wandered between one area of primitive civilization and another. In the Babylonian and Assyrian world the traders were predominantly the Semitic Arameans, the ancestors of the modern Syrians. They became a distinct factor in the life of the community, they formed great households of their own. Usually developed largely in the last thousand years BC traders needed accommodation, cultivators wished to anticipate their crops. Sais, op sit. Gives an account of the Babylonian banking house of Ejibai, which lasted through several generations and outlived the Chaldean Empire. 7. A class of small retailers, one must suppose, came into existence with the complication of society during the later days of the first empires, but it was not probably of any great importance. It is difficult to understand how there could be much active retailing without small change, and there is little evidence of small change to be found either in Egypt or Mesopotamia. Shekels and half-shekels of silver, weighing something between a quarter and half an ounce, are the lightest weights of stamped metal of which we find mention. 8. A growing class of independent property owners. 9. As the amenities of life increased, there grew up in the court, temples, and prosperous private houses a class of domestic servants, slaves or freed slaves, or young peasants taken into the household. 10. Gang workers. These were prisoners of war or debt slaves, or impressed or deported men. 11. Mercenary soldiers. These also were often captives or impressed men. Sometimes they were enlisted from friendly foreign populations in which the military spirit still prevailed. 12. Seamen. In modern political and economic discussions we are apt to talk rather glibly of labor. Much has been made of the solidarity of labor and its sense of community. It is well to note that in these first civilizations, 
what we speak of as labor, is represented by five distinct classes dissimilar in origin, traditions, and outlook, namely, classes 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, and the ortugging part of 12. The solidarity of labor is, we shall find when we come to study the mechanical revolution of the 19th century AD, a new idea and a new possibility in human affairs. Section 5. Let us, before we leave this discussion of the social classes that were developing in these first civilizations, devote a little attention to their fixity. How far did they stand aloof from each other, and how far did they intermingle? So far as the classes we have counted as 9, 10, 11, and 12 go, the servants, the gang laborers and slaves, the gang soldiers, and, to a lesser extent, the sailors, or at any rate the galley rowers among the sailors. They were largely recruited classes, they did not readily and easily form homes, they were not distinctively breeding classes. They were probably replenished generation after generation by captives, by the failures of other classes, and especially from the failures of the class of small retailers, and by persuasion and impressment from among the cultivators. But so far as the sailors go, we have to distinguish between the mere rower and the navigating and shipowning seamen of such ports as Tyre and Sidon. The shipowners pass, no doubt, by insensible gradations into the mercantile class, but the navigators must have made a peculiar community in the great seaports, having homes there and handing on the secrets of seacraft to their sons. The eighth class we have distinguished was certainly a precarious class, continually increased by the accession of the heirs and dependents, the widows and retired members of the wealthy and powerful and continually diminished by the deaths or speculative losses of these people and the dispersal of their properties. The priests and priestesses too, so far as all this world west of India went, were not a very reproductive class, many priesthoods were celibate, and that class, too, may also be counted as a recruited class. Nor are servants, as a rule, reproductive. They live in the households of other people, they do not have households and rear large families of their own. This leaves us as the really vital classes of the ancient civilized community. a. The royal and aristocratic class, officials, military officers, and the like. b. The mercantile class. c. The town artisans. d. The cultivators of the soil. and e. The herdsmen. Each of these classes reared its own children in its own fashion, and so naturally kept itself more or less continuously distinct from the others. General education was not organized in those ancient states, education was mainly a household matter, as it is still in many parts of India today. And so it was natural and necessary for the sons to follow in the footsteps of their father and to marry women accustomed to their own sort of household. Except during times of great political disturbance therefore, there would be a natural and continuous separation of classes, which would not, however, prevent exceptional individuals from intermarrying or passing from one class to another. Poor aristocrats would marry rich members of the mercantile class, ambitious herdsmen, artisans, or sailors would become rich merchants. So far as one can gather, that was the general state of affairs in both Egypt and Babylonia. The idea was formerly entertained that in Egypt there was a fixity of classes, but this appears to be a misconception due to a misreading of Herodotus. The only exclusive class in Egypt which did not intermarry was, as in England today, the semi-divine royal family. At various points in the social system there were probably developments of exclusiveness, an actual barring out of interlopers. Artisans of particular crafts possessing secrets, for example, have among all races and in all ages tended to develop guild organizations restricting the practice of their craft and the marriage of members outside their guild. Conquering people have also, and especially when there were marked physical differences of race, been disposed to keep themselves aloof from the conquered peoples, and have developed an aristocratic exclusiveness. Such organizations of restriction upon free intercourse have come and gone in great variety in the history of all long-standing civilizations. The natural boundaries of function were always there, but sometimes they have been drawn sharply and laid stress upon, and sometimes they have been made little of. There has been a general tendency among the Aryan peoples to distinguish noble, patrician, from common, plebeian, families. 
The traces of it are evident throughout the literature and life of Europe today, and it has received a picturesque enforcement in the science of heraldry. This tradition is still active even in democratic America. Germany, the most methodical of European countries, had in the Middle Ages a very clear conception of the fixity of such distinctions. Below the princes, who themselves constituted an exclusive class which did not marry beneath itself, there were the a. Knights, the military and official caste, with heraldic coats of arms. b. and c. The burger stand, the merchants, shipping people, and artisans, and d. The bauern stand, the cultivating serfs or peasants. Medieval Germany went as far as any of the western heirs of the first great civilizations towards a fixation of classes. The idea is far less congenial both to the English-speaking people and to the French and Italians, who, by a sort of instinct, favor a free movement from class to class. Such exclusive ideas began at first among, and were promoted chiefly by, the upper classes. But it is a natural response and a natural nemesis to such ideas that the mass of the excluded should presently range themselves in antagonism to their superiors. It was in Germany, as we shall see in the concluding chapters of this story, that the conception of a natural and necessary conflict, the class war, between the miscellaneous multitudes of the disinherited, the class-conscious proletariat, of the Marxist, and the rulers and merchants first arose. It was an idea more acceptable to the German mind than to the British or French. But before we come to that conflict, we must traverse a long history of many centuries. Section 6 If now we turn eastward from this main development of civilization in the world between Central Asia and the Atlantic, to the social development of India in the two thousand years next before the Christian era. We find certain broad and very interesting differences. The first of these is that we find such a fixity of classes in process of establishment as no other part of the world can present. This fixity of classes is known to Europeans as the institution of caste. Its origins are still in complete obscurity, but it was certainly well rooted in the Ganges Valley before the days of Alexander the Great. It is a complicated horizontal division of the social structure into classes or castes, the members of which may neither eat nor intermarry with persons of a lower caste under penalty of becoming outcasts. And who may also lose caste for various ceremonial negligences and defilements. By losing caste a man does not sink to a lower caste, he becomes outcast. The various subdivisions of caste are very complex, many are practically trade organizations. Each caste has its local organization which maintains discipline, distributes various charities, looks after its own poor, protects the common interests of its members, and examines the credentials of newcomers from other districts. There is little to check the pretensions of a traveling Hindu to be of a higher caste than is legitimately his. Originally, the four main castes seem to have been the Brahmins, the priests and teachers, the Kshatriyas, the warriors, the Vaishyas, herdsmen, merchants, moneylenders, and landowners. The Sudras. And, outside the castes, the Pariahs. But these primary divisions have long been superseded by the disappearance of the second and third primary castes, and the subdivision of the Brahmins and Sudras into a multitude of minor castes, all exclusive. Each holding its members to one definite way of living and one group of associates. Next to this extraordinary fission and complication of the social body we have to note that the Brahmins, the priests and teachers of the Indian world, unlike so many Western priesthoods, are a reproductive and exclusive class. Taking no recruits from any other social stratum. Whatever may have been the original incentive to this extensive fixation of class in India, there can be little doubt of the role played by the Brahmins as the custodians of tradition and the only teachers of the people in sustaining it. By some it is supposed that the first three of the four original castes, known also as the twice-born, were the descendants of the Vedic Aryan conquerors of India, who established these hard and fast separations to prevent racial mixing with the conquered Sudras and Pariahs. The Sudras are represented as a previous wave of northern conquerors, and the Pariahs are the original Dravidian inhabitants of India. But those speculations are not universally accepted, and it is, perhaps, 
Rather the case that the uniform conditions of life in the Ganges Valley throughout long centuries served to stereotype a difference of classes that have never had the same steadfastness of definition under the more various and variable conditions of the greater world to the West. However caste arose, there can be no doubt of its extraordinary hold upon the Indian mind. In the 6th century BC, arose Gautama, the great teacher of Buddhism, proclaiming, as the four streams that flow into the Ganges lose their names as soon as they mingle their waters in the holy river, so all who believe in Buddha cease to be Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Sudras. His teaching prevailed in India for some centuries, it spread over China, Tibet, Japan, Burma, Ceylon, Turkestan, Manchuria. It is today the religion of one-third of the human race, but it was finally defeated and driven out of Indian life by the vitality and persistence of the Brahmins and of their caste ideas. Section 7 In China we find a social system traveling along yet another and only a very roughly parallel line to that followed by the Indian and Western civilizations. The Chinese civilization even more than the Hindu is organized for peace, and the warrior plays a small part in its social scheme. As in the Indian civilization, the leading class is an intellectual one. Less priestly than the Brahmin and more official. But unlike the Brahmins, the Mandarins, who are the literate men of China, are not a caste, one is not a Mandarin by birth, but by education. They are drawn by education and examination from all classes of the community, and the son of a Mandarin has no prescriptive right to succeed his father. As a consequence of these differences, while the Brahmins of India are, as a class, ignorant even of their own sacred books, mentally slack, and full of a pretentious assurance, the Chinese Mandarin has the energy that comes from hard mental work. But since his education so far has been almost entirely a scholarly study of the classical Chinese literature, his influence has been entirely conservative. Before the days of Alexander the Great, China had already formed itself and set its feet in the way in which it was still walking in the year 1900 AD. Invaders and dynasties had come and gone, but the routine of life of the Yellow Civilization remained unchanged. The traditional Chinese social system recognized for main classes below the priest emperor. A. The literary class, which was equivalent partly to the officials of the Western world and partly to its teachers and clerics. In the time of Confucius its education included archery and horsemanship. Rites and music, history and mathematics completed the six accomplishments. B. The cultivators of the land. C. The artisans. D. The mercantile class. But since from the earliest times it has been the Chinese way to divide the landed possessions of a man among all his sons, there has never been in Chinese history any class of great landowners, renting their land to tenants. Such as most other countries have displayed. The Chinese land has always been cut up into small holdings, which are chiefly freeholds, and cultivated intensively. There are landlords in China who own one or a few farms and rent them to tenants, but there are no great, permanent estates. When a patch of land, by repeated division, is too small to sustain a man, it is sold to some prospering neighbor, and the former owner drifts to one of the great towns of China to join the mass of wage earning workers there. In China, for many centuries, there have been these masses of town population with scarcely any property at all, men neither serfs nor slaves, but held to their daily work by their utter impecuniousness. From such masses it is that the soldiers needed by the Chinese government are recruited, and also such gang labor as has been needed for the making of canals, the building of walls, and the like has been drawn. The war captive and the slave class play a smaller part in Chinese history than in any more westerly record of these ages before the Christian era. One fact, we may note, is common to all these three stories of developing social structure, and that is the immense power exercised by the educated class in the early stages before the crown or the commonalty began to read and, consequently, to think for itself. In India, by reason of their exclusiveness, the Brahmins, the educated class, retain their influence to this day. Over the masses of China, along entirely different lines and because of the complexities of the written language, the Mandarinate has prevailed. 
The diversity of race and tradition in the more various and eventful world of the West has delayed, and perhaps arrested forever, any parallel organization of the specially intellectual elements of society into a class ascendancy. In the Western world, as we have already noted, education early, slopped over, and soaked away out of the control of any special class, it escaped from the limitation of castes and priesthoods and traditions into the general life of the community. Writing and reading had been simplified down to a point when it was no longer possible to make a cult and mystery of them. It may be due to the peculiar elaboration and difficulty of the Chinese characters, rather than to any racial difference, that the same thing did not happen to the same extent in China. Section 8 In these last six chapters we have traced and outlined the whole process by which, in the course of five thousand or six thousand years, that is to say, in something between 150 and 200 generations, mankind passed from the stage of early Neolithic husbandry, in which the primitive skin-clad family tribe reaped and stored in their rude mud huts the wild-growing fodder and grain-bearing grasses with sickles of stone, to the days of the 4th century B. C. When all round the shores of the Mediterranean and up the Nile, and across Asia to India, and again over the great alluvial areas of China, spread the fields of human cultivation in busy cities, great temples, and the coming and going of human commerce. Galleys and Latin-sailed ships entered and left crowded harbors, and made their careful way from headland to headland and from headland to island, keeping always close to the land. Phoenician shipping under Egyptian owners was making its way into the East Indies and perhaps even further into the Pacific. Across the deserts of Africa and Arabia and through Turkestan toiled the caravans with their remote trade. Silk was already coming from China, ivory from Central Africa, and tin from Britain to the centers of this new life in the world. Men had learned to weave fine linen and delicate fabrics of colored wool, they could bleach and dye. They had iron as well as copper, bronze, silver, and gold, they had made the most beautiful pottery and porcelain, there was hardly a variety of precious stone in the world that they had not found and cut and polished, they could read and write. Divert the course of rivers, pile pyramids, and make walls a thousand miles long. The fifty or sixty centuries in which all this had to be achieved may seem a long time in comparison with the threescore and ten years of a single human life, but it is utterly inconsiderable in comparison with the stretches of geological time. Measuring backward from these Alexandrian cities to the days of the first stone implements, the rostrocarinate implements of the Pliocene age, gives us an extent of time fully a hundred times as long. We have tried in this account, and with the help of maps and figures and time charts, to give a just idea of the order and shape of these fifty or sixty centuries. Our business is with that outline. We have named but a few names of individuals though henceforth the personal names must increase in number. But the content of this outline that we have drawn here in a few diagrams and charts cannot but touch the imagination. If only we could look closelier, we should see through all these sixty centuries a procession of lives more and more akin in their fashion to our own. We have shown how the naked Paleolithic savage gave place to the Neolithic cultivator, a type of man still to be found in the backward places of the world. We have given an illustration of Sumerian soldiers copied from a carved stone that was set up long before the days when the Semitic Sargon I conquered the land. Day by day some busy brownish man carved those figures, and, no doubt, whistled as he carved. In those days the plain of the Egyptian delta was crowded with gangs of swarthy workmen unloading the stone that had come down the Nile to add a fresh course to the current pyramid. One might paint a thousand scenes from those ages of some hawker merchant in Egypt spreading his stock of Babylonish garments before the eyes of some pretty, rich lady. Of a miscellaneous crowd swarming between the pylons to some temple festival at Thebes. Of an excited, dark-eyed audience of Cretans like the Spaniards of today, watching a bullfight, with the bullfighters in trousers and tightly girded, exactly like any contemporary bullfighter. Of children learning their cuneiform signs. At Nippur the clay exercise tiles of a school have been found, of a woman with a sick husband at home slipping into some great temple in Carthage to make a vow for his recovery. Or perhaps it is a wild Greek, skin-clad and armed with a bronze axe, standing motionless on some Illyrian mountain crest. 
struck with amazement at his first vision of a many-oared Cretan galley crawling like a great insect across the amethystine mirror of the Adriatic Sea. He went home to tell his folk a strange story of a monster, Briarius with his hundred arms. Of millions of such stitches in each of these two hundred generations is the fabric of this history woven. But unless they mark the presence of a primary seam or join, we cannot pause now to examine any of these stitches. Book 4. Judea, Greece, and India. XXI. The Hebrew Scriptures and the Prophets. Section 1. The Place of the Israelites in History. Section 2. Saul, David, and Solomon. Section 3. The Jews a people of mixed origin. Section 4. The Importance of the Hebrew Prophets. Section 1. We are now in a position to place in their proper relationship to this general outline of human history the Israelites, and the most remarkable collection of ancient documents in the world. That collection which is known to all Christian peoples as the Old Testament. We find in these documents the most interesting and valuable lights upon the development of civilization. And the clearest indications of a new spirit that was coming into human affairs during the struggles of Egypt and Assyria for predominance in the world of men. All the books that constitute the Old Testament were certainly in existence, and in very much their present form, at latest by the year 100 BC. They were probably already recognized as sacred writings in the time of Alexander the Great, 330 BC. And known and read with the utmost respect a hundred years before his time. At that time some of them were of comparatively recent composition, others were already of very considerable antiquity. They were the sacred literature of a people, the Jews, who, except for a small remnant of common people, had recently been deported to Babylonia from their own country in 587 BC by Nebuchadnezzar II, the Chaldean. They had returned to their city, Jerusalem, and had rebuilt their temple there under the auspices of Cyrus, that Persian conqueror who, we have already noted, in 539 BC overthrew Nabonidus, the last of the Chaldean rulers in Babylon. The Babylonian captivity had lasted about fifty years, and many authorities are of opinion that there was a considerable admixture during that period both of race and ideas with the Babylonians. The position of the land of Judea and of Jerusalem, its capital, is a peculiar one. The country is a band-shaped strip between the Mediterranean to the west and the desert beyond the Jordan to the east. Through it lies the natural high road between the Hittites, Syria, Assyria, and Babylonia to the north and Egypt to the south. It was a country predestined, therefore, to a stormy history. Across it Egypt, and whatever power was ascendant in the north, fought for empire, against its people they fought for a trade route. It had itself neither the area, the agricultural possibilities, nor the mineral wealth to be important. The story of its people that these scriptures have preserved runs like a commentary to the greater history of the two systems of civilization to the north and south and of the sea peoples to the west. These scriptures consist of a number of different elements. The first five books, the Pentateuch, were early regarded with peculiar respect. They begin in the form of a universal history with a double account of the creation of the world and mankind, of the early life of the race, and of a great flood by which, except for certain favored individuals, mankind was destroyed. Excavations have revealed Babylonian versions of both the creation story and the flood story of prior date to the restoration of the Jews. And it is therefore argued by biblical critics that these opening chapters were acquired by the Jews during their captivity. They constitute the first ten chapters of Genesis. There follows a history of the fathers and founders of the Hebrew nation, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are presented as patriarchal Bedouin chiefs, living the life of nomadic shepherds in the country between Babylonia and Egypt. The existing biblical account is said by the critics to be made up out of several pre-existing versions. But whatever its origins, the story, as we have it today, is full of color and vitality. What is called Palestine today was at that time the land of Canaan, inhabited by a Semitic people called the Canaanites, closely related to the Phoenicians who founded Tyre and Sidon, and to the Amorites who took Babylon and, under Hammurabi, founded the first Babylonian Empire. 
The Canaanites were a settled folk in the days, which were perhaps contemporary with the days of Hammurabi, when Abraham's flocks and herds passed through the land. The God of Abraham, says the Bible narrative, promised this smiling land of prosperous cities to him and to his children. To the book of Genesis the reader must go to read how Abraham, being childless, doubted this promise, and of the births of Ishmael and Isaac. And in Genesis 2, he will find the lives of Isaac and Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and of the twelve sons of Israel, and how in the days of a great famine they went down into Egypt. With that, Genesis, the first book of the Pentateuch, ends. The next book, Exodus, is concerned with the story of Moses. The story of the settlement and slavery of the children of Israel in Egypt is a difficult one. There is an Egyptian record of a settlement of certain Semitic peoples in the land of Goshen by the Pharaoh Ramesses II, and it is stated that they were drawn into Egypt by want of food. But of the life and career of Moses there is no Egyptian record at all, there is no account of any plagues of Egypt or of any Pharaoh who was drowned in the Red Sea. There is much about the story of Moses that has a mythical flavor, and one of the most remarkable incidents in it, his concealment by his mother in an ark of bulrushes has also been found in an ancient Sumerian inscription made at least a thousand years before his time by that Sargonai who founded the ancient Akkadian Sumerian Empire. It runs. Sargon, the powerful king, the king of Akkadia am I, my mother was poor, my father I knew not, the brother of my father lived in the mountains. My mother, who was poor, secretly gave birth to me. She placed me in a basket of reeds, she shut up the mouth of it with bitumen, she abandoned me to the river, which did not overwhelm me. The river bore me away and brought me to Aki the Irrigator. Aki the Irrigator received me in the goodness of his heart. Aki the Irrigator reared me to boyhood. Aki the Irrigator made me a gardener. My service as a gardener was pleasing unto Ister and I became king. This is perplexing. Still more perplexing is the discovery of a clay tablet written by the Egyptian governors of a city in Canaan to the pharaoh Amenophis IV, who came in the Xviith dynasty before Ramesses II, apparently mentioning the Hebrews by name and declaring that they are overrunning Canaan. Manifestly, if the Hebrews were conquering Canaan in the time of the Xviith dynasty, they could not have been made captive and oppressed, before they conquered Canaan, by Ramesses II of the XXTH dynasty. But it is quite understandable that the Exodus story, written long after the events it narrates, may have concentrated and simplified, and perhaps personified and symbolized, what was really a long and complicated history of tribal invasions. One Hebrew tribe may have drifted down into Egypt and become enslaved, while the others were already attacking the outlying Canaanite cities. It is even possible that the land of the captivity was not Egypt, Hebrew, Misraim, but Mizrim in the north of Arabia, on the other side of the Red Sea. These questions are discussed fully and acutely in the Encyclopedia Biblica, Articles Moses and Exodus, to which the curious reader must be referred. Two other books of the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy and Leviticus, are concerned with the law and the priestly rules. The Book of Numbers takes up the wanderings of the Israelites in the desert and their invasion of Canaan. Whatever the true particulars of the Hebrew invasion of Canaan may be, there can be no doubt that the country they invaded had changed very greatly since the days of the legendary promise, made centuries before, to Abraham. Then it seems to have been largely a Semitic land, with many prosperous trading cities. But great waves of strange peoples had washed along this coast. We have already told how the dark Iberian or Mediterranean peoples of Italy and Greece, the peoples of that Aegean civilization which culminated at Knossos, were being assailed by the southward movement of Aryan-speaking races. Such as the Italians and Greeks, and how Knossos was sacked about 1400 B.C., and destroyed altogether about 1000 B.C. It is now evident that the people of these Aegean seaports were crossing the sea in search of securer land nests. They invaded the Egyptian delta and the African coast to the west, they formed alliances with the Hittites and other Aryan or Aryanized races. This happened after the time of Ramesses II, in the time of Ramesses III. Egyptian monuments record great sea fights, and also a march of these people along the coast of Palestine towards Egypt. 
Their transport was in the ox carts characteristic of the Aryan tribes, and it is clear that these Cretans were acting in alliance with some early Aryan invaders. No connected narrative of these conflicts that went on between 1300 BC and 1000 BC has yet been made out, but it is evident from the Bible narrative, that when the Hebrews under Joshua pursued their slow subjugation of the promised land, they came against a new people, the Philistines, unknown to Abraham, who were settling along the coast in a series of cities of which Gaza, Gath, Ashdod, Ascalon, and Joppa became the chief, who were really, like the Hebrews, newcomers, and probably chiefly these Cretans from the sea and from the north. The invasion, therefore, that began as an attack upon the Canaanites, speedily became a long and not very successful struggle for the coveted and promised land with these much more formidable newcomers, the Philistines. It cannot be said that the promised land was ever completely in the grasp of the Hebrews. Following after the Pentateuch in the Bible come the books of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, a digression, Samuel 1 and 2, and Kings 1 and 2, with chronicles repeating with variation much of the matter of Samuel 2 and Kings. There is a growing flavor of reality in most of this latter history, and in these books we find the Philistines steadfastly in possession of the fertile lowlands of the south, and the Canaanites and Phoenicians holding out against the Israelites in the north. The first triumphs of Joshua are not repeated. The Book of Judges is a melancholy catalogue of failures. The people lose heart. They desert the worship of their own god Jehovah, and worship Baal and Ashtaroth, equals Bel and Ishtar. They mixed their race with the Philistines, with the Hittites, and so forth, and became, as they have always subsequently been, a racially mixed people. Under a series of wise men and heroes they wage a generally unsuccessful and never very united warfare against their enemies. In succession they are conquered by the Moabites, the Canaanites, the Midianites, and the Philistines. The story of these conflicts, of Gideon and of Samson and the other heroes who now and then cast a gleam of hope upon the distresses of Israel, is told in the book of Judges. In the first book of Samuel is told the story of their great disaster at Ebenezer in the days when Eli was judge. This was a real pitched battle in which the Israelites lost 30,000 men. They had previously suffered a reverse and lost 4,000 men, and then they brought out their most sacred symbol, the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood, that the Ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is come into the camp, and they said, Woe unto us! For there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us! Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you, quit yourselves like men, and fight. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent, and there was a very great slaughter for their fell of Israel thirty thousand footmen. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army, and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent, and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, what meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily, and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim, that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God, 
that Eli fell from off his seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died, for he was an old man, and heavy. And he had judged Israel forty years. And his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered, and when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed. For her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. 1 Sam, Chapter 4 The successor of Eli and the last of the judges was Samuel, and at the end of his rule came an event in the history of Israel which paralleled and was suggested by the experience of the greater nations around. A king arose. We are told in vivid language the plain issue between the more ancient rule of priestcraft and the newer fashion in human affairs. It is impossible to avoid a second quotation. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel, when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me, and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and shew them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you, he will take your sons, and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands, and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war, and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectioners, and to be cooks, and to be bakers. And he will take your fields, and your vineyards, and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed, and of your vineyards, and give to his officers, and to his servants. And he will take your men servants, and your maid servants, and your goodliest young men, and your asses, and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep, and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us, and fight our battles. I Sam. Chapter 8. Section 2. But the nature and position of their land was against the Hebrews, and their first king Saul was no more successful than their judges. The long intrigues of the adventurer David against Saul are told in the rest of the first book of Samuel, and the end of Saul was utter defeat upon Mount Gilboa. His army was overwhelmed by the Philistine archers. And it came to pass on the morrow, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head, and stripped off his armor, and sent into the land of the Philistines roundabout, to publish it in the house of their idols, and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth. And they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. I Sam, Chap, 31. David, 990 BC roughly, was more politic and successful than his predecessor, and he seems to have placed himself under the protection of Hiram, king of Tyre. This Phoenician alliance sustained him, and was the essential element in the greatness of his son Solomon. His story, with its constant assassinations and executions, reads rather like the history of some savage chief than of a civilized monarch. It is told with great vividness in the second book of Samuel. 
The first book of Kings begins with the reign of King Solomon, 960 BC roughly. The most interesting thing in that story, from the point of view of the general historian, is the relationship of Solomon to the national religion and the priesthood, and his dealings with the tabernacle, the priest Zadok, and the prophet Nathan. The opening of Solomon's reign is as bloody as his father's. The last recorded speech of David arranges for the murder of Shimei, his last recorded word is, blood. But his whorehead bring thou down to the grave with blood, he says, pointing out that though old Shimei is protected by a vow David had made to the Lord so long as David lives, there is nothing to bind Solomon in that matter. Solomon proceeds to murder his brother, who has sought the throne but quailed and made submission. He then deals freely with his brother's party. The weak hold of religion upon the racially and mentally confused Hebrews at that time is shown by the ease with which he replaces the hostile chief priest by his own adherent Zadok, and still more strikingly by the murder of Joab by Benaiah. Solomon's chief ruffian, in the tabernacle, while the victim is claiming sanctuary in holding to the very horns of Jehovah's altar. Then Solomon sets to work, in what was for that time a thoroughly modern spirit, to recast the religion of his people. He continues the alliance with Hiram, king of Sidon, who uses Solomon's kingdom as a high road by which to reach and build shipping upon the Red Sea, and a hitherto unheard of wealth accumulates in Jerusalem as a result of this partnership. Gang labor appears in Israel, Solomon sends relays of men to cut cedar wood in Lebanon under Hiram, and organizes a service of porters through the land. There is much in all this to remind the reader of the relations of some Central African chief to a European trading concern. Solomon then builds a palace for himself, and a temple not nearly as big for Jehovah. Hitherto, the Ark of the Covenant, the divine symbol of these ancient Hebrews, had abode in a large tent, which had been shifted from one high place to another. And sacrifices had been offered to the God of Israel upon a number of different high places. Now the ark is brought into the golden splendors of the inner chamber of a temple of cedar sheathed stone, and put between two great winged figures of gilded olive wood, and sacrifices are henceforth to be made only upon the altar before it. This centralizing innovation will remind the reader of both Akhenaten and Nabonidus. Such things as this are done successfully only when the prestige and tradition and learning of the priestly order has sunken to a very low level. And he appointed, according to the order of David his father, the courses of the priests to their service, and the Levites to their charges, to praise and minister before the priests, as the duty of every day required. The porters also by their courses at every gate, for so had David the man of God commanded. And they departed not from the commandment of the king unto the priests and Levites concerning any matter, or concerning the treasures. Neither Solomon's establishment of the worship of Jehovah in Jerusalem upon this new footing, nor his vision of and conversation with his God at the opening of his reign, stood in the way of his developing a sort of theological flirtatiousness in his declining years. He married widely, if only for reasons of state and splendor, and he entertained his numerous wives by sacrificing to their national deities, to the Sidonian goddess Ashtaroth, Ishtar, to Chemosh, a Moabitish god, to Moloch, and so forth. The Bible account of Solomon does, in fact, show us a king in a confused people, both superstitious and mentally unstable, in no way more religious than any other people of the surrounding world. A point of considerable interest in the story of Solomon, because it marks a phase in Egyptian affairs, is his marriage to a daughter of Pharaoh, this must have been one of the pharaohs of the Exexist dynasty, in the great days of Amenophis III. As the Tel Amarna letters witness, Pharaoh could condescend to receive a Babylonian princess into his harem, but he refused absolutely to grant so divine a creature as an Egyptian princess in marriage to the Babylonian monarch. It points to the steady decline of Egyptian prestige that now, three centuries later, such a petty monarch as Solomon could wed on equal terms with an Egyptian princess. There was, however, a revival with the next Egyptian dynasty, XXAI. And the pharaoh Shishak, the founder, taking advantage of the cleavage between Israel and Judah, which had been developing through the reigns of both David and Solomon, took Jerusalem and looted the all-too-brief splendors both of the new temple and of the king's house. Shishak seems also to have subjugated Philistia. 
From this time onward it is to be noted that the Philistines fade in importance. They had already lost their Cretan language and adopted that of the Semites they had conquered, and although their cities remain more or less independent, they merge gradually into the general Semitic life of Palestine. There is evidence that the original rude but convincing narrative of Solomon's rule, of his various murders, of his association with Hiram, of his palace and temple building, and the extravagances that weakened and finally tore his kingdom in twain, has been subjected to extensive interpolations and expansions by a later writer, anxious to exaggerate his prosperity and glorify his wisdom. It is not the place here to deal with the criticism of Bible origins, but it is a matter of ordinary common sense rather than of scholarship to note the manifest reality and veracity of the main substance of the account of David and Solomon. An account explaining sometimes and justifying sometimes, but nevertheless relating facts, even the harshest facts, as only a contemporary or almost contemporary writer, convinced that they cannot be concealed, would relate them. And then to remark the sudden lapse into adulation when the inserted passages occur. It is a striking tribute to the power of the written assertion over realities in men's minds that this Bible narrative has imposed, not only upon the Christian, but upon the Muslim world. The belief that King Solomon was not only one of the most magnificent, but one of the wisest of men. Yet the first book of Kings tells in detail his utmost splendors, and beside the beauty and wonder of the buildings and organizations of such great monarchs as Thotmes III or Ramesses II or half a dozen other pharaohs or of Sargon II or Sardanapalus or Nebuchadnezzar the Great, they are trivial. His temple, measured internally, was twenty cubits broad, about thirty-five feet, that is, the breadth of a small villa residence, and sixty cubits, say, one hundred feet, long. And as for his wisdom and statescraft, one need go no further than the Bible to see that Solomon was a mere helper in the wide-reaching schemes of the traitor king Hiram, and his kingdom a pawn between Phoenicia and Egypt. His importance was due largely to the temporary enfeeblement of Egypt, which encouraged the ambition of the Phoenician and made it necessary to propitiate the holder of the key to an alternate trade route to the east. To his own people Solomon was a wasteful and oppressive monarch, and already before his death his kingdom was splitting, visibly to all men. With the reign of King Solomon the brief glory of the Hebrews ends. The northern and richer section of his kingdom, long oppressed by taxation to sustain his splendors, breaks off from Jerusalem to become the separate kingdom of Israel. And this split ruptures that linking connection between Sidon and the Red Sea by which Solomon's gleam of wealth was possible. There is no more wealth in Hebrew history. Jerusalem remains the capital of one tribe, the tribe of Judah, the capital of a land of barren hills, cut off by Philistia from the sea and surrounded by enemies. The tales of wars, of religious conflicts, of usurpations, assassinations, and of fratricidal murders to secure the throne goes on for three centuries. It is a tale frankly barbaric. Israel wars with Judah and the neighboring states. Forms alliances first with one and then with the other. The power of Aramean Syria burns like a baleful star over the affairs of the Hebrews, and then there rises behind it the great and growing power of the last Assyrian Empire. For three centuries the life of the Hebrews was like the life of a man who insists upon living in the middle of a busy thoroughfare, and is consequently being run over constantly by omnibuses and motor lorries. Poole, apparently the same person as Tiglath Pileser III, is, according to the Bible narrative, the first Assyrian monarch to appear upon the Hebrew horizon, and Menahem buys him off with a thousand talents of silver, 738 BC. But the power of Assyria is heading straight for the now aged and decadent land of Egypt, and the line of attack lies through Judea. Tiglath Pileser III returns and Shalmaneser follows in his steps, the king of Israel intrigues for help with Egypt, that broken reed, and in 721 BC, as we have already noted, his kingdom is swept off into captivity and utterly lost to history. The same fate hung over Judah, but for a little while it was averted. The fate of Sennacherib's army in the reign of King Hezekiah, 701 BC, and how he was murdered by his sons, 2 Kings 19. 37, we have already mentioned. The subsequent subjugation of Egypt by Assyria finds no mention in Holy Writ, but it is clear that before the reign of Sennacherib, 
King Hezekiah had carried on a diplomatic correspondence with Babylon, 700 BC, which was in revolt against Sargon II of Assyria. There followed the conquest of Egypt by Esarhaddon, and then for a time Assyria was occupied with her own troubles. The Scythians and Medes and Persians were pressing her on the north, and Babylon was in insurrection. As we have already noted, Egypt, relieved for a time from Assyrian pressure, entered upon a phase of revival, first under Semeticus and then under Necho II. Again the little country in between made mistakes in its alliances. But on neither side was there safety. Josiah opposed Necho, and was slain at the Battle of Megiddo, 608 BC. The king of Judah became an Egyptian tributary. Then when Necho, after pushing as far as the Euphrates, fell before Nebuchadnezzar II, Judah fell with him, 604 BC. Nebuchadnezzar, after a trial of three puppet kings, carried off the greater part of the people into captivity in Babylon, 586 B. C., and the rest, after a rising and a massacre of Babylonian officials, took refuge from the vengeance of Chaldea in Egypt. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God and brake down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. 2 Kron, 36. 18, 19, 20. So the four centuries of Hebrew kingship comes to an end. From first to last it was a mere incident in the larger and greater history of Egypt, Syria, Assyria, and Phoenicia. But out of it there were now to arise moral and intellectual consequences of primary importance to all mankind. Section 3 The Jews who returned, after an interval of more than two generations, to Jerusalem from Babylonia in the time of Cyrus were a very different people from the warring Baal worshippers and Jehovah worshippers. The sacrificers in the high places and sacrificers at Jerusalem of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. The plain fact of the Bible narrative is that the Jews went to Babylon barbarians and came back civilized. They went a confused and divided multitude, with no national self-consciousness, they came back with an intense and exclusive national spirit. They went with no common literature generally known to them, for it was only about forty years before the captivity that King Josiah is said to have discovered a book of the law in the temple, 2 Kings 22. And, besides that, there is not a hint in the record of any reading of books, and they returned with most of their material for the Old Testament. It is manifest that, relieved of their bickering and murderous kings, restrained from politics and in the intellectually stimulating atmosphere of that Babylonian world, the Jewish mind made a great step forward during the captivity. It was an age of historical inquiry and learning in Babylonia. The Babylonian influences that had made Sardanapalus collect a great library of ancient writings in Nineveh were still at work. We have already told how Nabonidus was so preoccupied with antiquarian research as to neglect the defense of his kingdom against Cyrus. Everything, therefore, contributed to set the exiled Jews inquiring into their own history, and they found an inspiring leader in the prophet Ezekiel. From such hidden and forgotten records as they had with them, genealogies, contemporary histories of David, Solomon, and their other kings, legends and traditions, they made out and amplified their own story, and told it to Babylon and themselves. The story of the creation and the flood, much of the story of Moses, much of Samson, were probably incorporated from Babylonian sources. When the Jews returned to Jerusalem, only the Pentateuch had been put together into one book, but the grouping of the rest of the historical books was bound to follow. The rest of their literature remained for some centuries as separate books, to which a very variable amount of respect was paid. Some of the later books are frankly post-captivity compositions. Over all this literature were thrown certain leading ideas. There was an idea, which even these books themselves gainsay in detail, that all the people were pure-blooded children of Abraham. There was next an idea of a promise made by Jehovah to Abraham that he would exalt the Jewish race above all other races. 
And, thirdly, there was the belief first of all that Jehovah was the greatest and most powerful of tribal gods, and then that he was a god above all other gods, and at last that he was the only true god. The Jews became convinced at last, as a people, that they were the chosen people of the one God of all the earth. And arising very naturally out of these three ideas, was a fourth, the idea of a coming leader, a savior, a messiah who would realize the long postponed promises of Jehovah. This welding together of the Jews into one tradition cemented people in the course of the seventy years, is the first instance in history of the new power of the written word in human affairs. It was a mental consolidation that did much more than unite the people who returned to Jerusalem. This idea of belonging to a chosen race predestined to preeminence was a very attractive one. It possessed also those Jews who remained in Babylonia. Its literature reached the Jews now established in Egypt. It affected the mixed people who had been placed in Samaria, the old capital of the kings of Israel when the ten tribes were deported to Media. It inspired a great number of Babylonians and the like to claim Abraham as their father, and thrust their company upon the returning Jews. Ammonites and Moabites became adherents. The book of Nehemiah is full of the distress occasioned by this invasion of the privileges of the chosen. The Jews were already a people dispersed in many lands and cities, when their minds and hopes were unified and they became an exclusive people. But at first their exclusiveness is merely to preserve soundness of doctrine and worship, warned by such lamentable lapses as those of King Solomon. To genuine proselytes of whatever race, Judaism long held out welcoming arms. To Phoenicians after the falls of Tyre and Carthage, conversion to Judaism must have been particularly easy and attractive. Their language was closely akin to Hebrew. It is possible that the great majority of African and Spanish Jews are really of Phoenician origin. There were also great Arabian accessions. In South Russia, as we shall note later, there were even Mongolian Jews. Section 4 the historical books from Genesis to Nehemiah, upon which the idea of the promise to the chosen people had been imposed later, were no doubt the backbone of Jewish mental unity. But they by no means complete the Hebrew literature from which finally the Bible was made up. Of such books as Job, said to be an imitation of Greek tragedy, the Song of Solomon, the Psalms, Proverbs, and others, there is no time to write in this outline but it is necessary to deal with the books known as, the prophets, with some fullness. For those books are almost the earliest and certainly the best evidence of the appearance of a new kind of leading in human affairs. These prophets are not a new class in the community. They are of the most various origins, Ezekiel was of the priestly caste and of priestly sympathies, and Amos was a shepherd. But they have this in common, that they bring into life a religious force outside the sacrifices and formalities of priesthood and temple. The earlier prophets seem most like the earlier priests, they are oracular, they give advice and foretell events. It is quite possible that at first, in the days when there were many high places in the land and religious ideas were comparatively unsettled, there was no great distinction between priest and prophet. The prophets danced, it would seem, somewhat after the dervish fashion, and uttered oracles. Generally they wore a distinctive mantle of rough goatskin. They kept up the nomadic tradition as against the new ways of the settlement. But after the building of the temple and the organization of the priesthood, the prophetic type remains over and outside the formal religious scheme. They were probably always more or less of an annoyance to the priests. They became informal advisors upon public affairs, denouncers of sin and strange practices, self-constituted, as we should say, having no sanction but an inner light. Now the word of the Lord came unto, so and so, that is the formula. In the latter and most troubled days of the kingdom of Judah, as Egypt, North Arabia, Assyria, and then Babylonia closed like a vice upon the land, these prophets became very significant and powerful. Their appeal was to anxious and fearful minds, and at first their exhortation was chiefly towards repentance, the pulling down of this or that high place, the restoration of worship in Jerusalem, or the like. But through some of the prophecies there runs already a note like the note of what we call nowadays a social reformer. The rich are grinding the faces of the poor, the luxurious are consuming the children's bread. 
Influential and wealthy people make friends with and imitate the splendors and vices of foreigners, and sacrifice the common people to these new fashions, and this is hateful to Jehovah, who will certainly punish the land. But with the broadening of ideas that came with the captivity, the ten hour of prophecy broadens and changes. The jealous pettiness that disfigures the earlier tribal ideas of God give place to a new idea of a God of universal righteousness. It is clear that the increasing influence of prophets was not confined to the Jewish people, it was something that was going on in those days all over the Semitic world. The breaking down of nations and kingdoms to form the great and changing empires of that age, the smashing up of cults and priesthoods. The mutual discrediting of temple by temple in their rivalries and disputes, all these influences were releasing men's minds to a freer and wider religious outlook. The temples had accumulated great stores of golden vessels and lost their hold upon the imaginations of men. It is difficult to estimate whether, amidst these constant wars, life had become more uncertain and unhappy than it had ever been before, but there can be no doubt that men had become more conscious of its miseries and insecurities. Except for the weak and the women, there remained little comfort or assurance in the sacrifices, ritual and formal devotions of the temples. Such was the world to which the later prophets of Israel began to talk of the one God, and of a promise that some day the world should come to peace and unity and happiness. This great God that men were now discovering lived in a temple, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. There can be little doubt of a great body of such thought and utterance in Babylonia, Egypt, and throughout the Semitic East. The prophetic books of the Bible can be but specimens of the prophesyings of that time. We have already drawn attention to the gradual escape of writing and knowledge from their original limitation to the priesthood and the temple precincts, from the shell in which they were first developed and cherished. We have taken Herodotus as an interesting specimen of what we have called the free intelligence of mankind. Now here we are dealing with a similar overflow of moral ideas into the general community. The Hebrew prophets, and the steady expansion of their ideas towards one God in all the world, is a parallel development of the free conscience of mankind. From this time onward there runs through human thought, now weakly and obscurely, now gathering power, the idea of one rule in the world, and of a promise and possibility of an active and splendid peace and happiness in human affairs. From being a temple religion of the old type, the Jewish religion becomes, to a large extent, a prophetic and creative religion of a new type. Prophet succeeds prophet. Later on, as we shall tell, there was born a prophet of unprecedented power, Jesus, whose followers founded the great universal religion of Christianity. Still later Muhammad, another prophet, appears in Arabia and founds Islam. In spite of very distinctive features of their own, these two teachers do in a manner arise out of, and in succession to these Jewish prophets. It is not the place of the historian to discuss the truth and falsity of religion, but it is his business to record the appearance of great constructive ideas. 2,400 years ago, and six or seven or eight thousand years after the walls of the first Sumerian cities arose, the ideas of the moral unity of mankind and of a world peace had come into the world. XXI. The Greeks and the Persians. Section 1. The Hellenic Peoples. Section 2. Distinctive Features of Hellenic Civilization Section 3 Monarchy, Aristocracy, and Democracy in Greece Section 4 The Kingdom of Lydia Section 5 The Rise of the Persians in the East Section 6 The Story of Croesus Section 7 Darius Invades Russia Section 8 the Battle of Marathon. Section 9. Thermopylae and Salamis. Section 10. Plataea and Mycale. Section 1. And now our history must go back again to those Aryan speaking peoples of whose early beginnings we have given an account in chapters 14 and 15. We must, for the sake of precision, repeat here two warnings we have already given the reader first, that we use the word Aryan in its widest sense. To express all the early peoples who spoke languages of the Indo-Germanic or Indo-European group. And, secondly, 
that when we use the word Aryan we do not imply any racial purity. The original speakers of the fundamental Aryan language, 2000 or 3000 years BC, were probably a specialized and distinctive Nordic race of fair white men, accustomed to forests and cattle, who wandered east of the Rhine and through the forests of the Danube Valley, the Balkan Peninsula, Asia Minor, and eastward to the north and west of the Great Central Asian Sea. But very early they had encountered and mixed themselves extensively, and as they spread they continued to mix themselves with other races. With races of uncertain affinities in Asia Minor and with Iberian and Mediterranean peoples of the dark-haired white race. For instance, the Aryans, spreading and pressing westward in successive waves of Celtic-speaking peoples through Gaul and Britain and Ireland, mixed more and more with Iberian races. And were affected more and more by that Iberian blood and their speech by the characteristics of the language their Celtic tongue superseded. Other waves of Celtic peoples washed with diminishing force into Spain and Portugal, where to this day the pre-Celtic strain is altogether dominant although the languages spoken are Aryan. Northward, in Europe, the Aryan peoples were spreading into hitherto uninhabited country, and so remaining racially more purely Nordic blondes. They had already reached Scandinavia many centuries BC. From their original range of wandering, other Aryan tribes spread to the north as well as to the south of the Black Sea, and ultimately, as these seas shrank and made way for them, to the north and east of the Caspian. And so began to come into conflict with and mix also with Mongolian peoples of the Ural-Altaic linguistic group, the horse-keeping people of the grassy steppes of Central Asia. From these Mongolian races the Aryans seem to have acquired the use of the horse for riding and warfare. There were three or four prehistoric varieties or subspecies of horse in Europe and Asia, but it was the steppe or semi-desert lands that first gave horses of a build adapted to other than food uses. All these peoples, it must be understood, shifted their ground rapidly, a succession of bad seasons might drive them many hundreds of miles, and it is only in a very rough and provisional manner that their beats can now be indicated. Every summer they went north, every winter they swung south again. This annual swing covered sometimes hundreds of miles. On our maps, for the sake of simplicity, we represent the shifting of nomadic peoples by a straight line. But really they moved in annual swings, as the broom of a servant who is sweeping out a passage swishes from side to side as she advances. Spreading round the north of the Black Sea, and probably to the north of the Caspian, from the range of the original Teutonic tribes of Central and North Central Europe to the Iranian peoples who became the Medes and Persians and Aryan Hindus, were the grazing lands of a confusion of tribes, about whom it is truer to be vague than precise, such as the Sumerians, the Sarmatians, and those Scythians who, together with the Medes and Persians, came into effective contact with the Assyrian Empire by 1000 B.C. or earlier. East and south of the Black Sea, between the Danube and the Medes and Persians, and to the north of the Semitic and Mediterranean peoples of the sea coasts and peninsulas, ranged another series of equally ill-defined Aryan tribes. Moving easily from place to place and intermixing freely, to the great confusion of historians. They seem, for instance, to have broken up and assimilated the Hittite civilization, which was probably pre-Aryan in its origin. They were, perhaps, not so far advanced along the nomadic line as the Scythians of the Great Plains. The general characteristics of the original Aryan peoples we have already discussed in Chapter 15. They were a forest people, not a steppe people, and, consequently, wasteful of wood, they were a cattle people and not a horse people. The Greeks appear in the dim light before the dawn of history, say 1500 BC. As one of the wandering imperfectly nomadic Aryan peoples who were gradually extending the range of their pasturage southward into the Balkan Peninsula and coming into conflict and mixing with that preceding Aegean civilization of which Gnosis was. The Crown In the Homeric poems these Greek tribes speak one common language, and a common tradition upheld by the epic poems keeps them together in a loose unity, they call their various tribes by a common name, Hellenes. They probably came in successive waves. Three main variations of the ancient Greek speech are distinguished, the Ionic, the Ialic, and the Doric. There was a great variety of dialects in Greece, 
almost every city having its own output of literature. The Doric apparently constituted the last and most powerful wave of the migration. These Hellenic tribes conquered and largely destroyed the Aegean civilization that had preceded their arrival. Upon its ashes they built up a civilization of their own. They took to the sea and crossed by way of the islands to Asia Minor. And, sailing through the Dardanelles and Bosphorus, spread their settlements along the south, and presently along the north borders of the Black Sea. They spread also over the south of Italy, which was called at last Magna Graecia, and round the northern coast of the Mediterranean. They founded the town of Marseilles on the site of an earlier Phoenician colony. They began settlements in Sicily in rivalry with the Carthaginians as early as 735 BC. In the rear of the Greeks proper came the kindred Macedonians and Thracians, on their left wing, the Phrygians crossed by the Bosphorus into Asia Minor. An Early Greek Sea Fight From a painted vase, about 550 BC. We find all this distribution of the Greeks effected before the beginnings of written history. By the 7th century BC. That is to say, by the time of the Babylonian captivity of the Jews, the landmarks of the ancient world of the pre-Hellenic civilization in Europe have been obliterated. Tyrans and Knossos are unimportant sites, Mycenae and Troy survive in legend. The great cities of this new Greek world are Athens, Sparta, the capital of Lacedaemon, Corinth, Thebes, Samos, Miletus. The world our grandfathers called ancient Greece had arisen on the forgotten ruins of a still more ancient Greece, in many ways as civilized and artistic, of which today we are only beginning to learn through the labors of the excavator. But the newer ancient Greece, of which we are now telling, still lives vividly in the imaginations and institutions of men because it spoke a beautiful and most expressive Aryan tongue akin to our own. And because it had taken over the Mediterranean alphabet and perfected it by the addition of vowels, so that reading and writing were now easy arts to learn and practice. And great numbers of people could master them and make a record for later ages. Section 2 now this Greek civilization that we find growing up in South Italy and Greece and Asia Minor in the 7th century BC is a civilization differing in many important respects from the two great civilized systems whose growths we have already traced, that of the Nile and that of the two rivers of Mesopotamia. These civilizations grew through long ages where they are found, they grew slowly about a temple life out of a primitive agriculture, Priest kings and god kings consolidated such early city states into empires. But the barbaric Greek herdsmen raiders came southward into a world whose civilization was already an old story. Shipping and agriculture, walled cities and writing, were already there. The Greeks did not grow a civilization of their own. They wrecked one and put another together upon and out of the ruins. To this we must ascribe the fact that there is no temple state stage, no stage of priest kings, in the Greek record. The Greeks got at once to the city organization that in the east had grown round the temple. They took over the association of temple and city, the idea was ready made for them. What impressed them most about the city was probably its wall. It is doubtful if they took to city life and citizenship straight away. At first they lived in open villages outside the ruins of the cities they had destroyed, but there stood the model for them, a continual suggestion. They thought first of a city as a safe place in a time of strife, and of the temple uncritically as a proper feature of the city. They came into this inheritance of a previous civilization with the ideas and traditions of the woodlands still strong in their minds. The heroic social system of the Iliad took possession of the land, and adapted itself to the new conditions. As history goes on the Greeks became more religious and superstitious as the faiths of the conquered welled up from below. We have already said that the social structure of the primitive Aryans was a two-class system of nobles and commoners, the classes not very sharply marked off from each other. And led in warfare by a king who was simply the head of one of the noble families, primus inter pares, a leader among his equals. With the conquest of the aboriginal population and with the building of towns there was added to this simple social arrangement of two classes a lower stratum of farm workers and skilled and unskilled workers, who were for the most part slaves. But all the Greek communities were not of this conquest type. 
Some were refugee cities representing smashed communities, and in these the aboriginal substratum would be missing. In many of the former cases the survivors of the earlier population formed a subject class, slaves of the state as a whole, as, for instance, the helots in Sparta. The nobles and commoners became landlords and gentlemen farmers. It was they who directed the shipbuilding and engaged in trade. But some of the poorer free citizens followed mechanic arts, and, as we have already noted, would even pull an or in a galley for pay. Such priests as there were in this Greek world were either the guardians of shrines and temples or sacrificial functionaries, Aristotle, in his politics, makes them a mere subdivision of his official class. The citizen served as warrior in youth, ruler in his maturity, priest in his old age. The priestly class, in comparison with the equivalent class in Egypt and Babylonia, was small and insignificant. The gods of the Greeks proper, the gods of the heroic Greeks, were, as we have already noted, glorified human beings, and they were treated without very much fear or awe. But beneath these gods of the conquering freemen lurked other gods of the subjugated peoples, who found their furtive followers among slaves and women. The original Aryan gods were not expected to work miracles or control men's lives. But Greece, like most of the Eastern world in a thousand years BC, was much addicted to consulting oracles or soothsayers. Delphi was particularly famous for its oracle. When the oldest men in the tribe could not tell you the right thing to do, says Gilbert Murray, you went to the blessed dead. All oracles were at the tombs of heroes. They told you what was Themis, what was the right thing to do, or, as religious people would put it now, what was the will of the god. Rowers in an Athenian warship, about 400 BC. Fragment of relief found on the Acropolis. The priests and priestesses of these temples were not united into one class, nor did they exercise any power as a class. It was the nobles and free commoners, two classes which, in some cases, merged into one common body of citizens, who constituted the Greek state. In many cases, especially in great city-states, the population of slaves and unenfranchised strangers greatly outnumbered the citizens. But for them the state did not exist, it existed for the select body of citizens alone. It might or might not tolerate the outsider and the slave, but they had no legal voice in their treatment, any more than if it had been a despotism. This is a social structure differing widely from that of the Eastern monarchies. The exclusive importance of the Greek citizen reminds one a little of the exclusive importance of the children of Israel in the later Jewish state, but there is no equivalent on the Greek side to the prophets and priests. Nor to the idea of an overruling Jehovah. Another contrast between the Greek states and any of the human communities to which we have hitherto given attention is their continuous and incurable division. The civilizations of Egypt, Sumeria, China, and no doubt North India, all began in a number of independent city-states, each one a city with a few miles of dependent agricultural villages and cultivation around it. But out of this phase they passed by a process of coalescence into kingdoms and empires. But to the very end of their independent history the Greeks did not coalesce. Commonly, this is ascribed to the geographical conditions under which they lived. Greece is a country cut up into a multitude of valleys by mountain masses and arms of the sea that render intercommunication difficult, so difficult that few cities were able to hold many of the others in subjection for any length of time. Moreover, many Greek cities were on islands and scattered along remote coasts. To the end the largest city-states of Greece remained smaller than many English counties, and some had an area of only a few square miles. Athens, the largest of the Greek cities, at the climax of its power had a population of perhaps a third of a million. Hardly any other Greek cities ever exceeded 50,000. Of this, half or more were slaves and strangers, and two-thirds of the free-body women and children. Section 3. The government of these city-states varied very widely in its nature. As they settled down after their conquests the Greeks retained for a time the rule of their kings, but these kingdoms drifted back more and more to the rule of the aristocratic class. In Sparta, Lacedaemon, kings were still distinguished in the 6th century BC. The Lacedaemonians had a curious system of a double kingship, 
two kings, drawn from different royal families, ruled together. But most of the Greek city-states had become aristocratic republics long before the 6th century. There is, however, a tendency toward slackness and inefficiency in most families that rule by hereditary right, sooner or later they decline. And as the Greeks got out upon the seas and set up colonies and commerce extended, new rich families arose to jostle the old and bring new personalities into power. These nouveau riches became members of an expanded ruling class, a mode of government known as oligarchy, in opposition to aristocracy, though, strictly. The term oligarchy, equals government by the few, should of course include hereditary aristocracy as a special case. In many cities persons of exceptional energy, taking advantage of some social conflict or class grievance, secured a more or less irregular power in the state. This combination of personality and opportunity has occurred in the United States of America, for example, where men exercising various kinds of informal power are called bosses. In Greece they were called tyrants. But the tyrant was rather more than a boss, he was recognized as a monarch, and claimed the authority of a monarch. The modern boss, on the other hand, shelters behind legal forms which he has got hold of and uses for his own ends. Tyrants were distinguished from kings, who claimed some sort of right, some family priority, for example, to rule. They were supported, perhaps, by the poorer class with a grievance. Pisistratus, for example, who was tyrant of Athens, with two intervals of exile, between 560 and 527 BC, was supported by the poverty-struck Athenian hillmen. Sometimes, as in Greek Sicily, the tyrant stood for the rich against the poor. When, later on, the Persians began to subjugate the Greek cities of Asia Minor, they set up pro-Persian tyrants. Aristotle, the great philosophical teacher, who was born under the hereditary Macedonian monarchy, and who was for some years tutor to the king's son, distinguishes in his politics between kings who ruled by an admitted and inherent right. Such as the king of Macedonia, whom he served, and tyrants who ruled without the consent of the governed. As a matter of fact, it is hard to conceive of a tyrant ruling without the consent of many, and the active participation of a substantial number of his subjects. And the devotion and unselfishness of your true kings has been known to rouse resentment and questioning. Aristotle was also able to say that while the king ruled for the good of the state, the tyrant ruled for his own good. Upon this point, as in his ability to regard slavery as a natural thing and to consider women unfit for freedom and political rights, Aristotle was in harmony with the trend of events about him. A third form of government that prevailed increasingly in Greece in the 6th, 5th, and 4th centuries BC, was known as democracy. As the modern world nowadays is constantly talking of democracy, and as the modern idea of democracy is something widely different from the democracy of the Greek city-states. It will be well to be very explicit upon the meaning of democracy in Greece. Democracy then was government by the commonalty, the demos, it was government by the whole body of the citizens, by the many as distinguished from the few. But let the modern reader mark that word, citizen. The slave was excluded, the freedman was excluded, the stranger, even the Greek born in the city, whose father had come eight or ten miles from the city beyond the headland, was excluded. The earlier democracies, but not all, demanded a property qualification from the citizen, and property in those days was land. This was subsequently relaxed, but the modern reader will grasp that here was something very different from modern democracy. At the end of the 5th century BC this property qualification had been abolished in Athens, for example. But Pericles, a great Athenian statesman of whom we shall have more to tell later, had established a law, 451 BC, restricting citizenship to those who could establish Athenian descent on both sides. Thus, in the Greek democracies quite as much as in the oligarchies, the citizens formed a close corporation, ruling sometimes, as in the case of Athens in its great days, a big population of serfs, slaves, and outlanders. A modern politician used to the idea, the entirely new and different idea, that democracy in its perfected form means that every adult man and woman shall have a voice in the government, would. If suddenly spirited back to the extremist Greek democracy, regard it as a kind of oligarchy. 
The only real difference between a Greek oligarchy and a Greek democracy was that in the former, the poorer and less important citizens had no voice in the government, and in the latter every citizen had. Aristotle, in his Politics, betrays very clearly the practical outcome of this difference. Taxation sat lightly on the rich in the oligarchies. The democracies, on the other hand, taxed the rich and generally paid the impecunious citizen a maintenance allowance and special fees. In Athens fees were paid to citizens even for attending the general assembly. But the generality of people outside the happy order of citizens worked and did what they were told, and if one desired the protection of the law, one sought a citizen to plead for one. For only the citizen had any standing in the law courts. Greek democracy was, in fact, a sort of government by a swarm of hereditary barristers. Our modern idea, that anyone in the state is a citizen, would have shocked the privileged democrats of Athens profoundly. One obvious result of this monopolization of the state by the class of citizens was that the patriotism of these privileged people took an intense and narrow form. They would form alliances, but never coalesce with other city-states. That would have obliterated every advantage by which they lived. There would have been no more fees, no more privileges. The narrow geographical limits of these Greek states added to the intensity of their feeling. A man's love for his country was reinforced by his love for his native town, his religion, and his home, for these were all one. Of course the slaves did not share in these feelings, and in the oligarchic states very often the excluded class got over its dislike of foreigners in its greater dislike of the class at home which oppressed it. But in the main, patriotism in the Greek was a personal passion of an inspiring and dangerous intensity. Like rejected love, it was apt to turn into something very like hatred. The Greek exile resembled the French or Russian émigré in being ready to treat his beloved country pretty roughly in order to save her from the devils in human form who had taken possession of her and turned him out. In the 5th century BC, Athens formed a system of relationships with a number of other Greek city-states which is often spoken of by historians as the Athenian Empire. But all the other city-states retained their own governments. One new fact added by the Athenian Empire was the complete and effective suppression of piracy, another was the institution of a sort of international law. The law, indeed, was Athenian law. But actions could now be brought and justice administered between citizens of the different states of the League, which of course had not been possible before. The Athenian Empire had really developed out of a League of Mutual Defense against Persia, its seat had originally been in the island of Delos, and the Allies had contributed to a common treasure at Delos. The treasure of Delos was carried off to Athens because it was exposed to a possible Persian raid. Then one city after another offered a monetary contribution instead of military service, with the result that in the end Athens was doing almost all the work and receiving almost all the money. She was supported by one or two of the larger islands. The League in this way became gradually an empire, but the citizens of the allied states remained, except where there were special treaties of intermarriage and the like, practically foreigners to one another. And it was chiefly the poorer citizens of Athens who sustained this empire by their most vigorous and incessant personal service. Every citizen was liable to military service at home or abroad between the ages of 18 and 60, sometimes on purely Athenian affairs and sometimes in defense of the cities of the empire whose citizens had bought themselves off. There was probably no single man over twenty-five in the Athenian assembly who had not served in several campaigns in different parts of the Mediterranean or Black Sea, and who did not expect to serve again. Modern imperialism is denounced by its opponents as the exploitation of the world by the rich, Athenian imperialism was the exploitation of the world by the poorer citizens of Athens. Another difference from modern conditions, due to the small size of the Greek city-states, was that in a democracy every citizen had the right to attend and speak and vote in the popular assembly. For most cities this meant a gathering of only a few hundred people, the greatest had no more than some thousands of citizens. Nothing of this sort is possible in a modern democracy with, perhaps, several million voters. The modern citizen's voice in public affairs is limited to the right to vote for one or other of the party candidates put before him. He, or she, 
is then supposed to have assented to the resultant government. Aristotle, who would have enjoyed the electoral methods of our modern democracies keenly, points out very subtly how the outlying farmer class of citizens in a democracy can be virtually disenfranchised by calling the popular assembly too frequently for their regular attendance. In the later Greek democracies, 5th century, the appointment of public officials, except in the case of officers requiring very special knowledge, was by casting lots. This was supposed to protect the general corporation of privileged citizens from the continued predominance of rich, influential, and conspicuously able men. Some democracies, Athens and Miletus, e.g., had an institution called the ostracism, by which in times of crisis and conflict the decision was made whether some citizen should go into exile for ten years. This may strike a modern reader as an envious institution, but that was not its essential quality. It was, says Gilbert Murray, a way of arriving at a decision in a case when political feeling was so divided as to threaten a deadlock. There were in the Greek democracies parties and party leaders, but no regular government in office and no regular opposition. There was no way, therefore, of carrying out a policy, although it might be the popular policy, if a strong leader or a strong group stood out against it. But by the ostracism, the least popular or the least trusted of the chief leaders in the divided community was made to retire for a period without loss of honor or property. Professor Murray suggests that a Greek democracy, if it had found itself in such a position of deadlock as the British Empire did upon the question of home rule for Ireland in 1914, would have probably first ostracized Sir Edward Carson and then proceeded to carry out the provisions of the Home Rule Bill. This institution of the ostracism has immortalized one obscure and rather illiterate member of the democracy of Athens. A certain Aristides had gained a great reputation in the law court for his righteous dealing. He fell into a dispute with Themistocles upon a question of naval policy, Aristides was for the army, Themistocles was a strong navy man, and a deadlock was threatened. There was resort to an ostracism to decide between them. Plutarch relates that as Aristides walked through the streets while the voting was in progress, he was accosted by a strange citizen from the agricultural environs unaccustomed to the art of writing, and requested to write his own name on the proffered potsherd. But why? he asked. Has Aristides ever injured you? No, said the citizen. No. Never have I set eyes on him. But, oh! I am so bored by hearing him called Aristides the Just. Whereupon, says Plutarch, without further parley Aristides wrote as the man desired. When one understands the true meaning of these Greek constitutions, and in particular the limitation of all power, whether in the democracies or the oligarchies, to a locally privileged class. One realizes how impossible was any effective union of the hundreds of Greek cities scattered about the Mediterranean region, or even of any effective cooperation between them for a common end. Each city was in the hands of a few or a few hundred men, to whom its separateness meant everything that was worth having in life. Only conquest from the outside could unite the Greeks, and until Greece was conquered they had no political unity. When at last they were conquered, they were conquered so completely that their unity ceased to be of any importance even to themselves, it was a unity of subjugation. Yet there was always a certain tradition of unity between all the Greeks, based on a common language and script, on the common possession of the heroic epics, and on the continuous intercourse that the maritime position of the states made possible. And, in addition, there were certain religious bonds of a unifying kind. Certain shrines, the shrines of the god Apollo in the island of Delos and at Delphi, for example, were sustained not by single states, but by leagues of states or Amphictyonies, equals league of neighbors. Which in such instances as the Delphic Amphictyony became very wide-reaching unions. The league protected the shrine and the safety of pilgrims, kept up the roads leading thereunto, secured peace at the time of special festivals, upheld certain rules to mitigate the usages of war among its members. And, the Delian League especially, suppressed piracy. A still more important link of Hellenic Union was the Olympian Games that were held every four years at Olympia. Foot races, boxing, wrestling, javelin throwing, quoit throwing, 
jumping, and chariot and horse racing were the chief sports, and a record of victors and distinguished visitors was kept. From the year 776 BC. Onward these games were held regularly for over a thousand years, and they did much to maintain that sense of a common Greek life, Pan-Hellenic, transcending the narrow politics of the city-states. Such links of sentiment and association were of little avail against the intense separatism of the Greek political institutions. From the history of Herodotus the student will be able to gather a sense of the intensity and persistence of the feuds that kept the Greek world in a state of chronic warfare. In the old days, say, to the 6th century BC, fairly large families prevailed in Greece, and something of the old Aryan great household system, see chapter 15, with its strong clan feeling and its capacity for maintaining an enduring feud, still remained. The history of Athens circles for many years about the feud of two great families, the Alcmeonidae and the Pisistratidae. The latter equally an aristocratic family, but founding its power on the support of the poorer class of the populace and the exploitation of their grievances. Later on, in the 6th and 5th centuries, a limitation of births and a shrinkage of families to two or three members, a process Aristotle notes without perceiving its cause, led to the disappearance of the old aristocratic clans. And the later wars were due rather to trade disputes and grievances caused and stirred up by individual adventurers than to family vendettas. It is easy to understand, in view of this intense separatism of the Greeks, how readily the Ionians of Asia and of the islands fell first under the domination of the kingdom of Lydia, and then under that of the Persians when Cyrus overthrew Croesus. The king of Lydia. They rebelled only to be reconquered. Then came the turn of European Greece. It is a matter of astonishment, the Greeks themselves were astonished, to find that Greece itself did not fall under the dominion of the Persians, these barbaric Aryan masters of the ancient civilizations of Western Asia. But before we tell of this struggle we must give some attention to these Asiatics against whom they were pitted, and particularly to these Medes and Persians who, by 538 BC, were already in possession of the ancient civilizations of Assyria, Babylonia, and about to subjugate Egypt. Section 4 We have had occasion to mention the kingdom of Lydia, and it may be well to give a short note here upon the Lydians before proceeding with our story. The original population of the larger part of Asia Minor may perhaps have been akin to the original population of Greece and Crete. If so, it was of Mediterranean race. Or it may have been another branch of those still more generalized and fundamental Darkish peoples from whom arose the Mediterranean race to the west and the Dravidians to the east. Remains of the same sort of art that distinguishes Gnosis and Mycenae are to be found scattered over Asia Minor. But just as the Nordic Greeks poured southward into Greece to conquer and mix with the Aborigines, so did other and kindred Nordic tribes pour over the Bosphorus into Asia Minor. Over some areas these Aryan peoples prevailed altogether, and became the bulk of the inhabitants and retained their Aryan speech. Such were the Phrygians, a people whose language was almost as close to that of the Greeks as the Macedonian. But over other areas the Aryans did not so prevail. In Lydia the original race and their language held their own. The Lydians were a non-Aryan people speaking a non-Aryan speech, of which at the present time only a few words are known. Their capital city was Sardis. Their religion was also non-Aryan. They worshipped a great mother goddess. The Phrygians also, though retaining their Greek-like language, became infected with mysterious religion, and much of the mystical religion and secret ceremonial that pervaded Athens at a later date was Phrygian, when not Thracian, in origin. At first the Lydians held the western seacoast of Asia Minor, but they were driven back from it by the establishment of Ionian Greeks coming by the sea and founding cities. Later on, however, these Ionian Greek cities were brought into subjection by the Lydian kings. The history of this country is not clearly known, and were it known it would scarcely be of sufficient importance to be related in this historical outline, but in the 8th century BC one monarch, named Gyges, becomes noteworthy. The country under his rule was subjected to another Aryan invasion, certain nomadic tribes called the Sumerians came pouring across Asia Minor, and they were driven back with difficulty by Gyges and his son and grandson. Sardis was twice taken and burnt by these barbarians. 
and it is on record that Gyges paid tribute to Sardanapalus, which serves to link him up with our general ideas of the history of Assyria, Israel, and Egypt. Later, Gyges rebelled against Assyria, and sent troops to help Semeticus I to liberate Egypt from its brief servitude to the Assyrians. It was Aliats, the grandson of Gyges, who made Lydia into a considerable power. He reigned for seven years, and he reduced most of the Ionian cities of Asia Minor to subjection. The country became the center of a great trade between Asia and Europe. It had always been productive and rich in gold, and now the Lydian monarch was reputed the richest in Asia. There was a great coming and going between the Black and Mediterranean seas, and between the East and West. We have already noted that Lydia was reputed to be the first country in the world to produce coined money, and to provide the convenience of inns for travelers and traders. The Lydian dynasty seems to have been a trading dynasty of the type of Minas in Crete, with a banking and financial development. So much we may note of Lydia by way of preface to the next section. Section 5 Now while one series of Aryan-speaking invaders had developed along the lines we have described in Greece, Magna Graecia, and around the shores of the Black Sea, another series of Aryan-speaking peoples, whose originally Nordic blood was perhaps already mixed with a Mongolian element, were settling and spreading to the north and east of the Assyrian and Babylonian empires. We have already spoken of the arc-like dispersion of the Nordic Aryan peoples to the north of the Black and Caspian Seas. It was probably by this route that the Aryan-speaking races gradually came down into what is now the Persian country, and spread, on the one hand, eastward to India. 2000 to 1000 BC. And on the other, increased and multiplied in the Persian uplands until they were strong enough to assail first Assyria, 650 BC, and then Babylon, 538 BC. There is much that is not yet clear about the changes of climate that have been going on in Europe and Asia during the last 10,000 years. The ice of the last glacial age receded gradually, and gave way to a long period of steppe or prairie-like conditions over the Great Plain of Europe. About 12,000 or 10,000 years ago, as it is reckoned now, this state of affairs was giving place to forest conditions. We have already noted how, as a consequence of these changes, the Salutrian horse hunters gave place to Magdalenian fishers and forest deer hunters, and these, again, to the Neolithic herdsmen and agriculturists. For some thousands of years the European climate seems to have been warmer than it is today. A great sea spread from the coast of the Balkan Peninsula far into Central Asia and extended northward into Central Russia. And the shrinkage of that sea and the consequent hardening of the climate of South Russia and Central Asia was going on contemporaneously with the development of the first civilizations in the river valleys. Many facts seem to point to a more genial climate in Europe and Western Asia, and still more strongly to a greater luxuriance of plant and vegetable life, 4,000 to 3,000 years ago, than we find today. There were forests then in South Russia and in the country which is now Western Turkestan, where now steppes and deserts prevail. On the other hand, between 1500 and 2000 years ago, the Aral Caspian region was probably drier and those seas smaller than they are at the present time. We may note in this connection that Thotmes III, say, the 15th century BC, in his expedition beyond the Euphrates, hunted a herd of 120 elephants in that region. Again, an Aegean dagger from Mycenae, dating about 2000 BC, shows a lion hunt in progress. The hunters carry big shields and spears, and stand in rows one behind the other. The first man spears the lion, and when the wounded beast leaps at him, drops flat under the protection of his big shield, leaving the next man to repeat his stroke, and so on, until the lion is speared to death. This method of hunting is practiced by the Maasai today, and could only have been worked out by a people in a land where lions were abundant. But abundant lions imply abundant game, and that again means abundant vegetation. About 2000 BC The hardening of the climate in the central parts of the Old World, to which we have already referred, which put an end to elephants and lions in Asia Minor and Greece, was turning the faces of the nomadic Aryan peoples southward towards the fields and forests of the more settled and civilized nations. 
These Aryan peoples come down from the East Caspian regions into history about the time that Mycenae and Troy and Gnosis are falling to the Greeks. It is difficult to disentangle the different tribes and races that appear under a multitude of names in the records and inscriptions that record their first appearance, but, fortunately, these distinctions are not needed in an elementary outline such as this present history. A people called the Sumerians appear in the districts of Lake Euromia and Van, and shortly after Aryans have spread from Armenia to Elam. In the 9th century BC, a people called the Medes, very closely related to the Persians to the east of them, appear in the Assyrian inscriptions. Tiglath Pileser III and Sargon II, names already familiar in this story, profess to have made them pay tribute. They are spoken of in the inscriptions as the dangerous Medes. They are as yet a tribal people, not united under one king. About the 9th century BC, Elam and the Elamites, whose capital was Susa, a people which possessed a tradition and civilization at least as old as the Sumerian, suddenly vanished from history. We do not know what happened. They seem to have been overrun and the population absorbed by the conquerors. Susa is in the hands of the Persians. Scythians, as portrayed by a Greek artist. One of the few existing representations of the ancient Scythians. From a Greek electrum vase. A fourth people, related to these Aryan tribes, who appear at this time in the narrative of Herodotus, are the Scythians. For a while the monarchs of Assyria play off these various kindred peoples, the Sumerians, the Medes, the Persians, and the Scythians, against each other. Assyrian princesses, a daughter of Esarhaddon, e.g., are married to Scythian chiefs. Nebuchadnezzar the Great, on the other hand, marries a daughter of Syaxares, who has become king of all the Medes. The Aryan Scythians are for the Semitic Assyrians, the Aryan Medes for the Semitic Babylonians. It was this Syaxares who took Nineveh, the Assyrian capital, in 606 BC, and so released Babylon from the Assyrian yoke to establish, under Chaldean rule, the Second Babylonian Empire. The Scythian allies of Assyria drop out of the story after this. They go on living their own life away to the north without much interference with the peoples to the south. A glance at the map of this period shows how, for two-thirds of a century, the Second Babylonian Empire lay like a lamb within the embrace of the Median lion. Into the internal struggles of the Medes and Persians, that ended at last in the accession of Cyrus, the Persian, to the throne of Cyaxares in 550 BC, we will not enter. In that year Cyrus was ruling over an empire that reached from the boundaries of Lydia to Persia and perhaps to India. Nabonidus, the last of the Babylonian rulers, was, as we have already told, digging up old records and building temples in Babylonia. Section 6 But one monarch in the world was alive to the threat of the new power that lay in the hands of Cyrus. This was Croesus, the Lydian king. His son had been killed in a very tragic manner, which Herodotus relates, but which we will not describe here. Says Herodotus. For two years then, Croesus remained quiet in great mourning, because he was deprived of his son. But after this period of time, the overt rowing of the rule of the son of Cyaxares by Cyrus, and the growing greatness of the Persians, caused Croesus to cease from his mourning and led him to a care of cutting short the power of the Persians if by any means he might, while yet it was in growth and before they should have become great. He then made trial of the various oracles. His method of trial we will not relate here, but it led him to the belief that the Delphi oracle was alone trustworthy. What follows is rather a lengthy passage, but it is so characteristic of the garrulousness and wonder-loving mind of the father of history, and with such a pleasant touch of spite against the Lacedaemonians. That it is impossible to resist the quotation. After this, with great sacrifices, he endeavored to win the favor of the god at Delphi, for of all the animals that are fit for sacrifice he offered three thousand of each kind. And he heaped up couches overlaid with gold and overlaid with silver, and cups of gold, and robes of purple, and tunics, making of them a great pyre, and this he burnt up hoping by these means the more to win over the god to the side of the Lydians. And he proclaimed to all the Lydians that every one of them should make sacrifice with that which each man had. 
And when he had finished the sacrifice, he melted down a vast quantity of gold, and of it he wrought half plinths, making them six palms in length and three in breadth, and in height one palm, and their number was one hundred and seventeen. Of these four were of pure gold weighing two talents and a half each, and the others of gold alloyed with silver weighing two talents. And he caused to be made also an image of a lion of pure gold weighing ten talents. Which lion, when the temple at Delphi was being burnt down, fell from off the half plinths, for upon these it was set, and is placed now in the treasury of the Corinthians, weighing six talents and a half. For three talents and a half were melted away from it. So Croesus, having finished all these things, sent them to Delphi, and with them these besides, two mixing bowls of great size, one of gold and the other of silver, of which the golden bowl was placed on the right hand as one enters the temple. And the silver on the left, but the places of these also were changed after the temple was burnt down. Moreover, Croesus sent four silver wine jars, which stand in the treasury of the Corinthians, and two vessels for lustral water, one of gold and the other of silver, of which the gold one is inscribed from the Lacedaemonians. Who say that it is their offering? Therein, however, they do not speak rightly, for this also is from Croesus, but one of the Delphians wrote the inscription upon it, desiring to gratify the Lacedaemonians, and his name I know, but I will not make mention of it. And many other votive offerings Croesus sent with these, not specially distinguished, among which are certain castings of silver of a round shape, and also a golden figure of a woman three cubits high. Which the Delphians say is a statue of the baker of Croesus. Moreover, Croesus dedicated the ornaments from his wife's neck and her girdles. To the Lydians who were to carry these gifts to the temples Croesus gave charge that they should ask the oracles this question also, whether Croesus should march against the Persians, and, if so, whether he should join with himself any army of men as his friends. And when the Lydians had arrived at the places to which they had been sent and had dedicated the votive offerings, they inquired of the oracles, and said, Croesus, king of the Lydians and of other nations. Considering that these are the only true oracles among men, presents to you gifts such as your revelations deserve, and asks you again now whether he shall march against the Persians, and, if so, whether he shall join with himself any army of men as allies. They inquired thus, and the answers of both the oracles agreed in one, declaring to Croesus that if he should march against the Persians he should destroy a great empire. So when the answers were brought back and Croesus heard them, he was delighted with the oracles, and expecting that he would certainly destroy the kingdom of Cyrus, he sent again to Pytho, and presented to the men of Delphi. Having ascertained the number of them, two staters of gold for each man, and in return for this the Delphians gave to Croesus and to the Lydians precedence in consulting the oracle and freedom from all payments. And the right to front seats at the games, with this privilege also for all time, that any one of them who wished should be allowed to become a citizen of Delphi. But here we may not run on as Herodotus loved to do. Suffice it to say that Croesus made a defensive alliance both with the Lacedaemonians and the Egyptians. We will not quote the story of how a great bronze mixing bowl that the Lacedaemonians sent to Croesus went astray, but we will note a light on the life of the Medes and Persians of that time. Thus, then, it happened about the mixing bowl. But meanwhile Croesus, mistaking the meaning of the oracle, was making a march into Cappadocia, expecting to overthrow Cyrus and the power of the Persians. And while Croesus was preparing to march against the Persians, one of the Lydians, who even before this time was thought to be a wise man, but in consequence of this opinion got a very great name for wisdom among the Lydians, had advised Croesus as follows, O king, thou art preparing to march against men who wear breeches of leather, and the rest of their clothing is of leather also. And they eat food not such as they desire, but such as they can obtain, dwelling in a land which is rugged, and, moreover, they make no use of wine but drink water, and no figs have they for dessert, nor any other good thing. On the one hand, if thou shalt overcome them, what wilt thou take away from them, seeing they have nothing? And, on the other hand, if thou shalt be overcome, consider how many good things thou wilt lose. For once having tasted our good things, they will cling to them fast, and it will not be possible to drive them away. I, for my own part, 
feel gratitude to the gods that they do not put it into the minds of the Persians to march against the Lydians. Thus he spoke not persuading Croesus. For it is true indeed that the Persians before they subdued the Lydians had no luxury nor any good thing. Croene Cyrus fought an indecisive battle at Tyria, from which Cro retreated. Cyrus followed him up, and he gave battle outside his capital town of Sardis. The chief strength of the Lydians lay in their cavalry, they were excellent, if undisciplined, horsemen, and fought with long spears. Cyrus, when he saw the Lydians being arrayed for battle, fearing their horsemen, did on the suggestion of Harpagos, a Mede, as follows, all the camels which were in the train of his army carrying provisions and baggage he gathered together. And he took off their burdens and set men upon them provided with the equipment of cavalry. And, having thus furnished them, forth he appointed them to go in front of the rest of the army towards the horsemen of Croesus, and after the camel troop he ordered the infantry to follow. And behind the infantry he placed his whole force of cavalry. Then, when all his men had been placed in their several positions, he charged them to spare none of the other Lydians, slaying all who might come in their way, but Croesus himself they were not to slay. Not even if he should make resistance when he was being captured. Such was his charge, and he set the camels opposite the horsemen for this reason, because the horse has a fear of the camel and cannot endure either to see his form or to scent his smell. For this reason then the trick had been devised, in order that the cavalry of Croesus might be useless, that very force wherewith the Lydian king was expecting most to shine. And as they were coming together to the battle, so soon as the horses scented the camels and saw them, they turned away back, and the hopes of Croesus were at once brought to naught. The Lydians, however, for their part did not upon that act as cowards, but when they perceived what was coming to pass, they leapt from their horses and fought with the Persians on foot. At length, however, when many had fallen on either side, the Lydians turned to flight, and having been driven within the wall of their fortress, they were besieged by the Persians. In fourteen days Sardis was stormed and Croesus taken prisoner. So the Persians having taken him brought him into the presence of Cyrus. And he piled up a great pyre and caused Croesus to go up upon it bound in fetters, and along with him twice seven sons of Lydians, whether it was that he meant to dedicate this offering as firstfruits of his victory to some god or whether he desired to fulfill a vow, or else had heard that Croesus was a God-fearing man, and so caused him to go up on the pyre because he wished to know if any one of the divine powers would save him, so that he should not be burnt alive. He, they say, did this, but to Croesus as he stood upon the pyre there came, although he was in such evil case, a memory of the saying of Solon, how he had said with divine inspiration that no one of the living might be called happy. And when this thought came into his mind, they say that he sighed deeply and groaned aloud, having been for long silent, and three times he uttered the name of Solon. Hearing this, Cyrus bade the interpreters ask Croesus who was this person on whom he called, and they came near and asked. And Croesus for a time, it is said, kept silence when he was asked this, but afterwards, being pressed, he said, one whom more than much wealth I should have desired to have speech with all monarchs. Then, since his words were of doubtful import, they asked again of that which he said. And as they were urgent with him and gave him no peace, he told how once Solon, an Athenian, had come and having inspected all his wealth had made light of it, with such and such words. And how all had turned out for him according as Solon had said, not speaking at all especially with a view to Croesus himself, but with a view to the whole human race, and especially those who seemed to themselves to be happy men. And while Croesus related these things, already the pyre was lighted and the edges of it round about were burning. Then they say that Cyrus, hearing from the interpreters what Croesus had said, changed his purpose and considered that he himself also was but a man, and that he was delivering another man, who had been not inferior to himself in felicity. Alive to the fire. And, moreover, he feared the requital, and reflected that there was nothing of that which men possessed which was secure. Therefore, they say, he ordered them to extinguish as quickly as possible the fire that was burning, and to bring down Croesus and those who were with him from the pyre, and they, using endeavors, were not able now to get the mastery of the flames. Then it is related by the Lydians that Croesus, having learned how Cyrus had changed his mind, and seeing that everyone was trying to put out the fire, 
but that they were no longer able to check it, cried aloud. Entreating Apollo that if any gift had ever been given by him which was acceptable to the god, he would come to his aid and rescue him from the evil which was now upon him. So he with tears entreated the god, and suddenly, they say, after clear sky and calm weather clouds gathered and a storm burst, and it rained with a very violent shower, and the pyre was extinguished. Then Cyrus, having perceived that Croesus was a lover of the gods and a good man, caused him to be brought down from the pyre and asked him as follows, Croesus. Tell me who of all men was it who persuaded thee to march upon my land and so to become an enemy to me instead of a friend? And he said, O king, I did this to thy felicity and to my own misfortune, and the causer of this was the god of the Hellenes, who incited me to march with my army. For no one is so senseless as to choose of his own will war rather than peace, since in peace the sons bury their fathers, but in war the fathers bury their sons. But it was pleasing, I suppose, to the divine powers that these things should come to pass thus. But Herodotus is too alluring a companion for one who would write an outline of history. And the rest of the life of Croesus, and how he gave wise counsels to Cyrus, must be read in his ampler page. When Lydia was subdued, Cyrus turned his attention to Nabonidus in Babylon. He defeated the Babylonian army, under Belshazzar, outside Babylon, and then laid siege to the town. He entered the town, 538 BC, probably as we have already suggested, with the connivance of the priests of Bel. Section 7 Cyrus was succeeded by his son Cambyses, who took an army into Egypt, 525 BC. There was a battle in the delta, in which Greek mercenaries fought on both sides. Herodotus declares that he saw the bones of the slain still lying on the field fifty or sixty years later, and comments on the comparative thinness of the Persian skulls. After this battle Cambyses took Memphis and most of Egypt. In Egypt, we are told, Cambyses went mad. He took great liberties with the Egyptian temples, and remained at Memphis opening ancient tombs and examining the dead bodies. He had already murdered both Croesus, ex-king of Lydia, and his own brother Smyrtes before coming to Egypt, and he died in Syria on the way back to Susa of an accidental wound, leaving no heirs to succeed him. He was presently succeeded by Darius the Mede, 521 BC, the son of Histasps, one of the chief counselors of Cyrus. The empire of Darius I was larger than any one of the preceding empires whose growth we have traced. It included all Asia Minor and Syria, that is to say, the ancient Lydian and Hittite empires, all the old Assyrian and Babylonian empires, Egypt, the Caucasus and Caspian regions, Media, Persia, and it extended, perhaps, into India to the Indus. The nomadic Arabians alone of all the peoples of what is nowadays called the Near East, did not pay tribute to the satraps, provincial governors, of Darius. The organization of this great empire seems to have been on a much higher level of efficiency than any of its precursors. Great arterial roads joined province to province, and there was a system of royal posts. At stated intervals post horses stood always ready to carry the government messenger, or the traveller if he had a government permit, on to the next stage of his journey. Apart from this imperial right-of-way and the payment of tribute, the local governments possessed a very considerable amount of local freedom. They were restrained from internecine conflict, which was all to their own good. And at first the Greek cities of the mainland of Asia paid the tribute and shared in this Persian peace. Darius was first incited to attack the Greeks in Europe by a homesick Greek physician at his court, who wanted at any cost to be back in Greece. Darius had already made plans for an expedition into Europe, aiming not at Greece, but to the northward of Greece, across the Bosphorus and Danube. He wanted to strike at South Russia, which he believed to be the home country of the Scythian nomads who threatened him on his northern and northeastern frontiers. But he lent an attentive ear to the tempter, and sent agents into Greece. This great expedition of Darius opens out our view in this history. It lifts a curtain upon the Balkan country behind Greece about which we have said nothing hitherto, it carries us to and over the Danube. The nucleus of his army marched from Susa, gathering up contingents as they made their way to the Bosphorus. Here Greek allies, Ionian Greeks from Asia, had made a bridge of boats, 
and the army crossed over while the Greek allies sailed on in their ships to the Danube, and, two days sail up from its mouth, landed to make another floating bridge. Meanwhile, Darius and his host advanced along the coast of what is now Bulgaria, but which was then called Thrace. They crossed the Danube, and prepared to give battle to the Scythian army and take the cities of the Scythians. But the Scythians had no cities, and they evaded a battle, and the war degenerated into a tedious and hopeless pursuit of more mobile enemies. Wells were stopped up and pastures destroyed by the nomads. The Scythian horsemen hung upon the skirts of the great army, which consisted mostly of foot soldiers, picking off stragglers and preventing foraging. And they did their best to persuade the Ionian Greeks, who had made and were guarding the bridge across the Danube, to break up the bridge, and so ensure the destruction of Darius. So long as Darius continued to advance, however, the loyalty of his Greek allies remained unshaken. But privation, fatigue, and sickness hindered and crippled the Persian army. Darius lost many stragglers and consumed his supplies, and at last the melancholy conviction dawned upon him that a retreat across the Danube was necessary to save him from complete exhaustion and defeat. In order to get a start in his retreat he sacrificed his sick and wounded. He had these men informed that he was about to attack the Scythians at nightfall, and under this pretense stole out of the camp with the pick of his troops and made off southward. Leaving the camp fires burning and the usual noises and movements of the camp behind him. Next day the men left in the camp realized the trick their monarch had played upon them, and surrendered themselves to the mercy of the Scythians. But Darius had got his start, and was able to reach the bridge of boats before his pursuers came upon him. They were more mobile than his troops, but they missed their quarry in the darkness. At the river the retreating Persians, were brought to an extremity of fear, for they found the bridge partially broken down and its northern end destroyed. At this point a voice echoes down the centuries to us. We see a group of dismayed Persians standing about the great king upon the bank of the streaming river, we see the masses of halted troops, hungry and war-worn. A trail of battered transport stretches away towards the horizon, upon which at any time the advance guards of the pursuers may appear. There is not much noise in spite of the multitude, but rather an inquiring silence. Standing out like a pier from the further side of the great stream are the remains of the bridge of boats, an enigma. We cannot discern whether there are men over there or not. The shipping of the Ionian Greeks seems still to be drawn up on the further shore, but it is all very far away. Now there was with Darius an Egyptian who had a voice louder than that of any other man on earth, and this man Darius ordered to take his stand upon the bank of the Ister, Danube, and to call Histiaeus of Miletus. This worthy, a day is to come, as we shall presently tell, when his decapitated head will be sent to Darius at Susa, appears approaching slowly across the waters in a boat. There is a parley, and we gather that it is, all right. The explanation Histiaeus has to make is a complicated one. Some Scythians have been and have gone again. Scouts, perhaps, these were. It would seem there had been a discussion between the Scythians and the Greeks. The Scythians wanted the bridge broken down, they would then, they said, undertake to finish up the Persian army and make an end to Darius and his empire, and the Ionian Greeks of Asia could then free their cities again. Miltiades, the Athenian, was for accepting this proposal. But Histiaeus had been more subtle. He would prefer, he said, to see the Persians completely destroyed before definitely abandoning their cause. Would the Scythians go back and destroy the Persians to make sure of them while the Greeks on their part destroyed the bridge? Anyhow, whichever side the Greeks took finally, it was clear to him that it would be wise to destroy the northern end of the bridge, because otherwise the Scythians might rush it. Indeed, even as they parleyed the Greeks set to work to demolish the end that linked them to the Scythians as quickly as possible. In accordance with the suggestions of Histiaeus the Scythians rode off in search of the Persians, and so left the Greeks safe in either event. If Darius escaped they could be on his side. If he was destroyed, there was nothing of which the Scythians could complain. Histiaeus did not put it quite in that fashion to Darius. He had at least kept the shipping and most of the bridge. He represented himself as the loyal friend of Persia, and Darius was not disposed to be too critical. 
the Ionian ships came over. With a sense of immense relief the remnant of the wasted Persians were presently looking back at the steely flood of the Danube streaming wide between themselves and their pursuers. The pleasure and interest had gone out of the European expedition for Darius. He returned to Susa, leaving an army in Thrace, under a trusted general Megabasis. This Megabasis set himself to the subjugation of Thrace, and among other states which submitted reluctantly to Darius was a kingdom, which thus comes into our history for the first time, the Kingdom of Macedonia. A country inhabited by a people so closely allied to the Greeks that one of its princes had already been allowed to compete and take a prize in the Olympian Games. Darius was disposed to reward Histiaeus by allowing him to build a city for himself in Thrace, but Megabasis had a different opinion of the trustworthiness of Histiaeus, and prevailed upon the king to take him to Susa, and, under the title of counselor, to keep him a prisoner there. Histiaeus was at first flattered by this court position, and then realized its true meaning. The Persian court bored him, and he grew homesick for Miletus. He set himself to make mischief, and was able to stir up a revolt against the Persians among the Ionian Greeks on the mainland. The twistings and turnings of the story, which included the burning of Sardis by the Ionians and the defeat of a Greek fleet at the Battle of Lade, for 95 BC, are too complicated to follow here. It is a dark and intricate story of treacheries, cruelties, and hate, in which the death of the wily Histiaeus shines almost cheerfully. The Persian governor of Sardis, through which town he was being taken on his way back to Susa as a prisoner, having much the same opinion of him as Megabasis had, and knowing his ability to humbug Darius, killed him there and then. And sent on the head only to his master. Cyprus and the Greek islands were dragged into this contest that Histiaeus had stirred up, and at last Athens. Darius realized the error he had made in turning to the right and not to the left when he had crossed the Bosphorus, and he now set himself to the conquest of all Greece. He began with the islands. Tyre and Sidon were subject to Persia, and ships of the Phoenician and of the Ionian Greeks provided the Persians with a fleet by means of which one Greek island after another was subjugated. Section 8. The first attack upon Greece proper was made in 490 B. C. It was a sea attack upon Athens, with a force long and carefully prepared for the task, the fleet being provided with specially built transports for the conveyance of horses. This expedition made a landing near Marathon in Attica. The Persians were guided into Marathon by a renegade Greek, Hippias, the son of Pisistratus, who had been tyrant of Athens. If Athens fell, then Hippias was to be its tyrant, under the protection of the Persians. Meanwhile, so urgent was the sense of a crisis in the affairs of Hellas, that a man, a herald and runner, went from Athens to Sparta, forgetful of all feuds, to say, Lacedaemonians, the Athenians make request of you to come to their help. And not to allow a city most anciently established among the Hellenes to fall into slavery by the means of barbarians. For even now Eritrea has been enslaved and Hellas has become the weaker by a city of renown. This man, Phidippides, did the distance from Athens to Sparta, nearly a hundred miles as the crow flies, and much more if we allow for the contours and the windings of the way, in something under eight and forty hours. But before the Spartans could arrive on the scene the battle was joined. The Athenians charged the enemy. They fought, in a memorable fashion for they were the first of all the Hellenes about whom we know who went to attack the enemy at a run, and they were the first also who endured to face the Median garments and the men who wore them. Whereas up to this time the very name of the Medes was to the Hellenes a terror to hear. The Persian wings gave before this impetuous attack, but the center held. The Athenians, however, were cool as well as vigorous. They let the wings run and closed in on the flanks of the center, whereupon the main body of the Persians fled to their ships. Seven vessels fell into the hands of the Athenians. The rest got away, and, after a futile attempt to sail round to Athens and seize the city before the army returned thither, the fleet made a retreat to Asia. Let Herodotus close the story with a paragraph that still further enlightens us upon the tremendous prestige of the Medes at this time. Of the Lacedaemonians there came to Athens two thousand after the full moon, making great haste to be in time. 
so that they arrived in Attica on the third day after leaving Sparta, and though they had come too late for the battle, yet they desired to behold the Medes. And accordingly they went on to Marathon and looked at the bodies of the slain, then afterwards they departed home, commending the Athenians and the work which they had done. Section 9 So Greece, unified for a while by fear, gained her first victory over Persia. The news came to Darius simultaneously with the news of a rebellion in Egypt, and he died while still undecided in which direction to turn. His son and successor, Xerxes, turned first to Egypt and set up a Persian satrap there, then for four years he prepared a second attack upon Greece. Says Herodotus, who was, one must remember, a patriotic Greek, approaching now to the climax of his history. For what nation did Xerxes not lead out of Asia against Hellas? And what water was not exhausted, being drunk by his host, except only the great rivers? For some supplied ships, and others were appointed to serve in the land army. To some it was appointed to furnish cavalry, and to others vessels to carry horses, while they served in the expedition themselves also, others were ordered to furnish ships of war for the bridges, and others again ships with provisions. Monument of Athenian foot soldier, found near Marathon. Xerxes passed into Europe, not as Darius did at the half-mile crossing of the Bosphorus, but at the Hellespont, the Dardanelles. In his account of the assembling of the great army, and its march from Sardis to the Hellespont, the poet in Herodotus takes possession of the historian. The great host passes in splendor by Troy, and Xerxes, who although a Persian and a barbarian, seems to have had the advantages of a classical education, turns aside, says our historian, to visit the citadel of Priam. The Hellespont was bridged at Abydus, and upon a hill was set a marble throne from which Xerxes surveyed the whole array of his forces. And seeing all the Hellespont covered over with the ships and all the shores and the plains of Abydus full of men, then Xerxes pronounced himself a happy man, and after that he fell to weeping. Artabanus, his uncle, therefore perceiving him, the same who at first boldly declared his opinion advising Xerxes not to march against Hellas, this man, I say, having observed that Xerxes wept, asked as follows, O king! How far different from one another are the things which thou hast done now and a short while before now! For having pronounced thyself a happy man, thou art now shedding tears. He said, Yeah, for after I had reckoned up, it came into my mind to feel pity at the thought how brief was the whole life of man, seeing that of these multitudes not one will be alive when a hundred years have gone by. This may not be exact history, but it is great poetry. It is as splendid as anything in the dynasts. The Persian fleet, coasting from headland to headland, accompanied this land multitude during its march southward. But a violent storm did the fleet great damage and four hundred ships were lost, including much corn transport. At first the united Hellenes marched out to meet the invaders at the Vale of Tempe near Mount Olympus, but afterwards retreated through Thessaly, and chose at last to await the advancing Persians at a place called Thermopylae. Where at that time, two thousand three hundred years have altered these things greatly, there was a great cliff on the landward side and the sea to the east, with a track scarcely wide enough for a chariot between. The great advantage to the Greeks of this position at Thermopylae was that it prevented the use of either cavalry or chariots, and narrowed the battle front so as to minimize their numerical inequality. And there the Persians joined battle with them one summer day in the year 480 BC. For three days the Greeks held this great army, and did them much damage with small loss to themselves, and then on the third day a detachment of Persians appeared upon the rear of the Greeks. Having learnt of a way over the mountains from a peasant. There were hasty discussions among the Greeks, some were for withdrawing, some for holding out. The leader of the whole force, Leonidas, was for staying, and with him he would keep, he said, three hundred Spartans. The rest of the Greek army could, meanwhile, make good its retreat to the next defensible pass. The Thespian contingent of seven hundred, however, refused to fall back. They preferred to stay and die with the Spartans. Also a contingent of four hundred Thebans remained. As Thebes afterwards joined the Persians, there is a story that these Thebans were detained by force against their will, which seems on military as well as historical grounds improbable. 
These 1400 stayed, and were, after a conflict of heroic quality, slain to a man. Two Spartans happened to be away, sick with ophthalmia. When they heard the news, one was too ill to move. The other made his helot guide him to the battle, and there struck blindly until he was killed. The other, Aristodemus, was taken away with the retreating troops, and returned to Sparta, where he was not actually punished for his conduct, but was known as Tresses, the man who retreated. It was enough to distinguish him from all other Spartans, and he got himself killed at the Battle of Plataea a year later, performing prodigies of reckless courage. For a whole day this little band had held the pass, assailed in front and rear by the whole force of the Persians. They had covered the retreat of the main Greek army, they had inflicted great losses on the invaders, and they had raised the prestige of the Greek warrior over that of the Mede higher even than the victory of Marathon had done. The Persian cavalry and transport filtered slowly through the narrow passage of Thermopylae, and marched on towards Athens, while a series of naval encounters went on at sea. The Hellenic fleet retreated before the advance of the Persian shipping, which suffered seriously through its comparative ignorance of the intricate coasts and of the tricks of the local weather. Weight of numbers carried the Persian army forward to Athens, now that Thermopylae was lost, there was no line of defense nearer than the Isthmus of Corinth, and this meant the abandonment of all the intervening territory, including Athens. The population had either to fly or submit to the Persians. Thebes with all Boeotia submitted, and was pressed into the Persian army, except one town, Plataea, whose inhabitants fled to Athens. The turn of Athens came next, and great efforts were made to persuade her to make terms, but, instead, the whole population determined to abandon everything and take to the shipping. The women and non-combatants were carried to Salamis and various adjacent islands. Only a few people too old to move and a few dissensions remained in the town, which was occupied by the Persians and burnt. The sacred objects, statues, etc. which were burnt at this time, were afterwards buried in the Acropolis by the returning Athenians, and have been dug up in our own day with the marks of burning visible upon them. Xerxes sent off a mounted messenger to Susa with the news, and he invited the sons of Pisistratus, whom he had brought back with him, to enter upon their inheritance and sacrifice after the Athenian manner upon the Acropolis. Meanwhile, the Hellenic Confederate fleet had come round to Salamis, and in the council of war there were bitter differences of opinion. Corinth and the states behind the Isthmus wanted the fleet to fall back to that position, abandoning the cities of Megara and Aegina. Themistocles insisted with all his force on fighting in the narrows of Salamis. The majority was steadily in favor of retreat, when there suddenly arrived the news that retreat was cut off. The Persians had sailed round Salamis and held the sea on the other side. This news was brought by that Aristides the Just, of whose ostracism we have already told, his sanity and eloquence did much to help Themistocles to hearten the hesitating commanders. These two men had formerly been bitter antagonists. But with a generosity rare in those days, they forgot their differences before the common danger. At dawn the Greek ships pulled out to battle. The fleet before them was a fleet more composite and less united than their own. But it was about three times as great. On one wing were the Phoenicians, on the other Ionian Greeks from Asia and the islands. Some of the latter fought stoutly, others remembered that they too were Greeks. The Greek ships, on the other hand, were mostly manned by freemen fighting for their homes. Throughout the early hours the battle raged confusedly. Then it became evident to Xerxes, watching the combat, that his fleet was attempting flight. The flight became disaster. Xerxes had taken his seat to watch the battle. He saw his galleys rammed by the sharp prows of other galleys, his fighting men shot down, his ships boarded. Much of the sea fighting in those days was done by ramming. The big galleys bore down their opponents by superior weight of impact, or sheared off their oars and so destroyed their maneuvering power and left them helpless. Presently, Xerxes saw that some of his broken ships were surrendering. In the water he could see the heads of Greeks swimming to land, but, of the barbarians the greater number perished in the sea, not knowing how to swim. The clumsy attempt of the hard-pressed first line of the Persian fleet to put about led to indescribable confusion. 
some were rammed by the rear ships of their own side. This ancient shipping was poor, unseaworthy stuff by any modern standards. The west wind was blowing and many of the broken ships of Xerxes were now drifting away out of his sight to be wrecked on the coast beyond. Others were being towed toward Salamis by the Greeks. Others, less injured and still in fighting trim, were making for the beaches close beneath him that would bring them under the protection of his army. Scattered over the further sea, beyond the headlands, remote and vague, were ships in flight and Greek ships in pursuit. Slowly, incident by incident, the disaster had unfolded under his eyes. We can imagine something of the coming and going of messengers, the issuing of feudal orders, the changes of plan, throughout the day. In the morning Xerxes had come out provided with tables to mark the most successful of his commanders for reward. In the gold of the sunset he beheld the sea power of Persia utterly scattered, sunken and destroyed, and the Greek fleet over against Salamis unbroken and triumphant, ordering its ranks, as if still incredulous of victory. The Persian army remained as if in indecision for some days close to the scene of this sea fight, and then began to retreat to Thessaly, where it was proposed to winter and resume the campaign. But Xerxes, like Darius I before him, had conceived a disgust for European campaigns. He was afraid of the destruction of the bridge of boats. With part of the army he went on to the Hellespont, leaving the main force in Thessaly under a general, Mardonius. Of his own retreat the historian relates. Whithersoever they came on the march and to whatever nation they seized the crops of that people and used them for provisions. And if they found no crops, then they took the grass which was growing up from the earth, and stripped off the bark from the trees and plucked down the leaves and devoured them, alike of the cultivated trees and of those growing wild. And they left nothing behind them, thus they did by reason of famine. Then plague too seized upon the army and dysentery, which destroyed them by the way, and some of them also who were sick the king left behind, laying charge upon the cities where at the time he chanced to be in his march to take care of them and support them. Of these he left some in Thessaly, and some at Cyrus in Paeonia, and some in Macedonia. When, passing on from Thrace they came to the passage, they crossed over the Hellespont in haste to Abydus by means of the ships, for they did not find the floating bridges still stretched across, but broken up by a storm. While staying there for a time they had distributed to them an allowance of food more abundant than they had had by the way. And from satisfying their hunger without restraint and also from the changes of water there died many of those in the army who had remained safe till then. The rest arrived with Xerxes at Sardis. Section 10 The rest of the Persian army remained in Thessaly under the command of Mardonius, and for a year he maintained an aggressive campaign against the Greeks. Finally, he was defeated and killed in a pitched battle at Plataea, 479 BC, and on the same day the Persian fleet and a land army met with joint disaster under the shadow of Mount Mycale on the Asiatic mainland, between Ephesus and Miletus. The Persian ships, being in fear of the Greeks, had been drawn up on shore and a wall built about them, but the Greeks disembarked and stormed this enclosure. They then sailed to the Hellespont to destroy what was left of the bridge of boats, so that later the Persian fugitives, retreating from Plataea, had to cross by shipping at the Bosphorus, and did so with difficulty. Encouraged by these disasters of the imperial power, the Ionian cities in Asia began for a second time to revolt against the Persians. With this the ninth book of the history of Herodotus comes to an end. He was born about 484 BC. So that at the time of the Battle of Plataea he was a child of five years old. Much of the substance of his story was gathered by him from actors in, and eyewitnesses of, the great events he relates. The war still dragged on for a long time. The Greeks supported a rebellion against Persian rule in Egypt, and tried unsuccessfully to take Cyprus, it did not end until about 449 BC. Then the Greek coasts of Asia Minor and the Greek cities in the Black Sea remained generally free, but Cyprus and Egypt continued under Persian rule. Herodotus, who had been born a Persian subject in the Ionian city of Halicarnassus, was five and thirty years old by that time, and he must have taken an early opportunity after this piece of visiting Babylon and Persia. He probably went to Athens, with his history ready to recite, about 438 BC. 
The idea of a great union of Greece for aggression against Persia was not altogether strange to Herodotus. Some of his readers suspect him of writing to enforce it. It was certainly in the air at that time. He describes Aristagoras, the son-in-law of Histiaeus, as showing the Spartans, a tablet of bronze on which was engraved a map of the whole earth with all the seas and rivers. He makes Aristagoras say, these barbarians are not valiant in fight. You, on the other hand, have now attained to the utmost skill in war. They fight with bows and arrows and a short spear, they go into battle wearing trousers and having caps on their heads. You have perfected your weapons and discipline. They are easily to be conquered. Not all the other nations of the world have what they possess, gold, silver, bronze, embroidered garments, beasts and slaves, all this you might have for yourselves, if you so desired. It was a hundred years before these suggestions bore fruit. Xerxes was murdered in his palace about 465 BC, and thereafter Persia made no further attempts at conquest in Europe. We have no such knowledge of the things that were happening in the empire of the great king as we have of the occurrences in the little states of central Greece. Greece had suddenly begun to produce literature, and put itself upon record as no other nation had ever done hitherto. After 479 BC, Plataea, the spirit seems to have gone out of the government of the Medes and Persians. The empire of the great king enters upon a period of decay. An Artaxerxes, a second Xerxes, a second Darius, pass across the stage, there are rebellions in Egypt and Syria, the Medes rebel. A second Artaxerxes and a second Cyrus, his brother, fight for the throne. This history is even as the history of Babylonia, Assyria, and Egypt in the older times. It is autocracy reverting to its normal state of palace crime, blood-stained magnificence, and moral squalor. But the last-named struggle produced a Greek masterpiece, for this second Cyrus collected an army of Greek mercenaries and marched into Babylonia, and was there killed at the moment of victory over Artaxerxes II. Thereupon, the ten thousand Greeks, left with no one to employ them, made a retreat to the coast again, 401 BC, and this retreat was immortalized in a book, one of the first of personal war books, the Anabasis, by their leader Xenophon. Murders, revolts, chastisements, disasters, cunning alliances, and base betrayals, and no Herodotus to record them. Such is the texture of Persian history. An Artaxerxes III, covered with blood, flourishes dimly for a time. Artaxerxes III is said to have been murdered by Bagoas, who places Arses, the youngest of the king's sons, on the throne only to slay him in turn when he seemed to be contemplating independent action. So it goes on. Beneath the crimes and disorders of the palaces, the life of the city and country ran a similar course. Justice was fitful and law venal. Wars that were unmeaning catastrophes swept down upon any little gleam of prosperity or decency to which this or that community clambered. Athens, prospering for a time after the Persian repulse, was smitten by the plague, in which Pericles, its greatest ruler, died, 428 BC. But, as a noteworthy fact amidst these confusions, the ten thousand of Xenophon were scattering now among the Greek cities. Repeating from their own experience the declaration of Aristagoras that the Persian Empire was a rich confusion which it would be very easy to conquer. Exei. Greek Thought and Literature. Section 1. The Athens of Pericles. Section 2. Socrates. Section 3. What was the quality of the common Athenians? Section 4. Greek Tragedy and Comedy. Section 5. Plato and the Academy. Section 6. Aristotle and the Lyceum. Section 7. Philosophy becomes unworldly. Section 8. The quality and limitations of Greek thought. Section 1. Greek history for the next forty years after Plataea and Mycale is a story of comparative peace and tranquility. There were wars, but they were not intense wars. For a little while in Athens, for a section of the prosperous, there was leisure and opportunity. 
and by a combination of accidents and through the character of a small group of people, this leisure and opportunity produced the most remarkable and memorable results. A beautiful literature was produced. The plastic arts flourished, and the foundations of modern science were laid. Then, after an interlude of fifty-odd years, the long-smoldering hostility between Athens and Sparta broke out into a fierce and exhausting war, which sapped at last the vitality of this creative movement. This war is known in history as the Peloponnesian War, it went on for nearly thirty years, and wasted all the power of Greece. At first Athens was in the ascendant, then Sparta. Then arose Thebes, a city not fifty miles from Athens, to overshadow Sparta. Once more Athens flared into importance as the head of a confederation. The story must be told at considerable length or not told at all. It is a story of narrow rivalries and inexplicable hatreds that would have vanished long ago out of the memories of men, were it not that it is recorded and reflected in a great literature. Through all this time Persia appears and reappears as the ally first of this league and then of that. About the middle of the 4th century BC, Greece becomes aware of a new influence in its affairs, that of Philip, king of Macedonia. Macedonia does, indeed, arise in the background of this incurably divided Greece as the Medes and Persians arose behind the Chaldean Empire. A time comes when the Greek mind turns round, so to speak, from its disputes, and stares in one united dismay at the Macedonian. Planless and murderous squabbles are still planless and murderous squabbles even though Thucydides tells the story, even though the great beginnings of a new civilization are wrecked by their disorders. And in this general outline we can give no space at all to the particulars of these internecine feuds, to the fights and flights that sent first this Greek city and then that up to the sky in flames. Upon a one-foot globe Greece becomes a speck almost too small to recognize. And in a short history of mankind, all this century and more of dissension between the days of Salamis and Plataea and the rise of King Philip, shrinks to a little, almost inaudible clash of disputation. To a mere note upon the swift passing of opportunity for nations as for men. But what does not shrink into insignificance, because it has entered into the intellectual process of all subsequent nations, because it is inseparably a part of our mental foundation. Is the literature that Athens produced during such patches and gleams of tranquility and security as these times afforded her? Says Professor Gilbert Murray. Their outer political history, indeed, like that of all other nations, is filled with war and diplomacy, with cruelty and deceit. It is the inner history, the history of thought and feeling and character, that is so grand. They had some difficulties to contend with which are now almost out of our path. They had practically no experience, but were doing everything for the first time, they were utterly weak in material resources, and their emotions, their desires and fears and rages, were probably wilder and fiercer than ours. Yet they produced the Athens of Pericles and of Plato. This remarkable outbreak of creative power, which for three and twenty centuries has been to men of intelligence a guiding and inspiring beacon out of the past, flared up after the battles of Marathon and Salamis had made Athens free and fearless. And, without any great excesses of power, predominant in her world. It was the work of a quite small group of men. A number of her citizens lived for the better part of a generation under conditions which, in all ages, have disposed men to produce good and beautiful work. They were secure, they were free, and they had pride, and they were without that temptation of apparent and unchallenged power which disposes all of us to inflict wrongs upon our fellow men. When political life narrowed down again to the waste and crimes of a fratricidal war with Sparta, there was so broad and well fed a flame of intellectual activity burning that it lasted through all the windy distresses of this war and beyond the brief lifetime of Alexander the Great. For a period altogether of more than a hundred years after the wars began, Athens, it must be understood, was by far the largest of all the Greek city democracies. Flushed with victory in the sense of freedom fairly won, her people did for a time rise towards nobility. Under the guidance of a great demagogue, Pericles, the chief official of the Athenian General Assembly, and a politician statesman rather of the caliber of Gladstone or Lincoln in modern history, they were set to the task of rebuilding their city and expanding their commerce. 
For a time they were capable of following a generous leader generously, and fate gave them a generous leader. In Pericles there was mingled in the strangest fashion political ability with a real living passion for deep and high and beautiful things. He kept in power for over thirty years. He was a man of extraordinary vigor and liberality of mind. He stamped these qualities upon his time. As Winkler has remarked, the Athenian democracy had for a time the face of Pericles. He was sustained by what was probably a very great and noble friendship. There was a woman of unusual education, Aspasia, from Miletus, whom he could not marry because of the law that restricted the citizenship of Athens to the homeborn, but who was in effect his wife. She played a large part in gathering about him men of unusual gifts. All the great writers of the time knew her, and several have praised her wisdom. Plutarch, it is true, accuses her of instigating a troublesome and dangerous but finally successful war against Samos, but, as he himself shows later, this was necessitated by the naval hostility of the Samians, which threatened the overseas trade of Athens, upon which all the prosperity of the Republic depended. Men's ambitions are apt to reflect the standards of their intimates. Pericles was content, at any rate, to serve as a leader in Athens rather than to dominate as a tyrant. Alliances were formed under his guidance, new colonies and trading stations were established from Italy to the Black Sea, and the treasures of the League at Delos were brought to Athens. Convinced of his security from Persia, Pericles spent the war horde of the Allies upon the beautification of his city. This was an unrighteous thing to do by our modern standards, but it was not a base or greedy thing to do. Athens had accomplished the work of the Delian League, and is not the laborer worthy of his hire. This sequestration made a time of exceptional opportunity for architects and artists. The Parthenon of Athens, whose ruins are still a thing of beauty, was but the crown set upon the clustering glories of the Athens Pericles rebuilt. Such sculptures as those of Phidias, Myron, and Polycletus that still survive, witness to the artistic quality of the time. The reader must bear in mind that illuminating remark of Winkler's, which says that this renaissance Athens bore for a time the face of Pericles. It was the peculiar genius of this man and of his atmosphere that let loose the genius of men about him, and attracted men of great intellectual vigor to Athens. Athens wore his face for a time as one wears a mask, and then became restless and desired to put him aside. There was very little that was great and generous about the common Athenian. We have told of the spirit of one sample voter for the ostracism of Aristides, and Lloyd, in his Age of Pericles, declares that the Athenians would not suffer the name of Miltiades to be mentioned in connection with the Battle of Marathon. The sturdy self-respect of the common voters revolted presently against the beautiful buildings rising about them, against the favors shown to such sculptors as Phidias over popular worthies in the same line of business. Against the donations made to a mere foreigner like Herodotus of Halicarnassus, against the insulting preference of Pericles for the company and conversation of a Milesian woman. The public life of Pericles was conspicuously orderly, and that presently set the man in the street thinking that his private life must be very corrupt. One gathers that Pericles was superior in his demeanor. He betrayed at times a contempt for the citizens he served. Pericles acquired not only an elevation of sentiment, and a loftiness and purity of style far removed from the low expression of the vulgar, but likewise a gravity of countenance which relaxed not into laughter, a firm and even tone of voice. An easy deportment, and a decency of dress which no vehemence of speaking ever put into disorder. These things, and others of a like nature, excited admiration in all that saw him. Such was his conduct, when a vile and abandoned fellow loaded him a whole day with reproaches and abuse. He bore it with patience and silence, and continued in public for the dispatch of some urgent affairs. In the evening he walked softly home, this impudent wretch following, and insulting him all the way with the most scurrilous language. And as it was dark when he came to his own door, he ordered one of his servants to take a torch and light the man home. The poet Ion, however, says he was proud and supercilious in conversation, and that there was a great deal of vanity and contempt of others mixed with his dignity of manner. He appeared not in the streets except when he went to the Forum or the Senate House. 
he declined the invitations of his friends, and all social entertainments and recreations. Insomuch that in the whole time of his administration, which was a considerable length, he never went to sup with any of his friends but once, which was at the marriage of his nephew Eurypolemus. And he stayed there only until the ceremony of libation was ended. He considered that the freedom of entertainments takes away all distinction of office, and that dignity is but little consistent with familiarity. There was as yet no gutter journalism to tell the world of the vileness of the conspicuous and successful, but the common man, a little out of conceit with himself, found much consolation in the art of comedy, which flourished exceedingly. The writers of comedy satisfied that almost universal craving for the depreciation of those whose apparent excellence offends our self-love. They threw dirt steadily and industriously at Pericles and his friends. Pericles was portrayed in a helmet. A helmet became him, and it is to be feared he knew as much. This led to much joy and mirth over the pleasant suggestion of a frightfully distorted head, an onion head. The goings-on of Aspasia were of course a fruitful vineyard for the inventions of the street. Dreaming souls, weary of the vulgarities of our time, have desired to be transferred to the sublime age of Pericles. But, plumped down into that Athens, they would have found themselves in very much the atmosphere of the lower sort of contemporary music hall, very much in the vein of our popular newspapers. The same hot blast of braying libel, foul imputation, greedy patriotism, and general baseness would have blown upon them, the modern note would have pursued them. As the memories of Plataea and Salamis faded and the new buildings grew familiar, Pericles and the pride of Athens became more and more offensive to the homely humor of the crowd. He was never ostracized, his prestige with the quieter citizens saved him from that, but he was attacked with increasing boldness and steadfastness. He lived and died a poor man, he was perhaps the most honest of demagogues. But this did not save him from an abortive prosecution for peculation. Defeated in that, his enemies resorted to a more devious method, they began to lop away his friends. Religious intolerance and moral accusations are the natural weapons of the envious against the leaders of men. His friend Damon was ostracized. Phidias was attacked for impiety. On the shield of the great statue of the goddess Athene, Phidias had dared to put, among the combatants in a fight between Greeks and Amazons, portraits of Pericles and himself. Phidias died in prison. Anaxagoras, a stranger welcome to Athens by Pericles, when there were plenty of honest fellows already there quite willing to satisfy any reasonable curiosities, was saying the strangest things about the sun and stars. And hinting not obscurely that there were no gods, but only one animating spirit, Nous, in the world. The comedy writers suddenly found they had deep religious feelings that could be profoundly and even dangerously shocked, and Anaxagoras fled the threat of a prosecution. Then came the turn of Aspasia. Athens seemed bent upon deporting her, and Pericles was torn between the woman who was the soul of his life and the ungracious city he had saved, defended, and made more beautiful and unforgettable than any other city in history. He stood up to defend Aspasia, he was seized by a storm of very human emotion, and as he spoke he wept, a gleeful thing for the rabble. His tears saved Aspasia for a time. The Athenians were content to humiliate Pericles, but he had served them so long that they were indisposed to do without him. He had been their leader now for a third of a century. In 431 BC came the war with Sparta. Plutarch accuses Pericles of bringing it on, because he felt his popularity waned so fast that a war was needed to make him indispensable. And as he himself was become obnoxious to the people upon Phidias's account, and was afraid of being called in question for it, he urged on the war, which as yet was uncertain, and blew up that flame which till then was stifled and suppressed. By this means he hoped to obviate the accusations that threatened him, and to mitigate the rage of envy, because such was his dignity and power, that in all important affairs, and in every great danger, the Republic could place its confidence in him alone. But the war was a slow and dangerous war, and the Athenian people were impatient. A certain Cleon arose, ambitious to oust Pericles from his leadership. There was a great clamor for a swift ending of the war. Cleon set out to be the man who won the war. 
the popular poets got to work in this fashion. Thou king of satyrs, why boast thy prowess? Yet shudder at the sound of sharpened swords. Spite of the flaming Cleon. An expedition under the leadership of Pericles was unsuccessful, and Cleon seized the opportunity for a prosecution. Pericles was suspended from his command and fined. The story goes that his oldest son, this was not the son of Aspasia, but of a former wife, turned against him, and pursued him with vile and incredible accusations. This young man was carried off by the plague. Then the sister of Pericles died, and then his last legitimate son. When, after the fashion of the time, he put the funeral garlands on the boy he wept aloud. Presently he himself took the contagion and died, for 28 BC. The salient facts of this brief summary will serve to show how discordant Pericles was with the normal life of his time and city. This intellectual and artistic outbreak in Athens was no doubt favored by the conditions of the time, but it was also due in part to the appearance of some very unusual men. It was not a general movement. It was the movement of a small group of people exceptionally placed and gifted. Section 2. Another leading figure in this Athenian movement, a figure still more out of harmony with the life around him, and quite as much an original source and stimulant of the enduring greatness of his age, was a man called Socrates. The son of a stonemason. He was born about sixteen years later than Herodotus, and he was beginning to be heard of about the time when Pericles died. He himself wrote nothing, but it was his custom to talk in public places. There was in those days a great searching for wisdom going on, there was a various multitude of teachers called sophists who reasoned upon truth, beauty, and right living, and instructed the developing curiosities and imaginations of youth. This was so because there were no great priestly schools in Greece. And into these discussions this man came, a clumsy and slovenly figure, barefooted, gathering about him a band of admirers and disciples. His method was profoundly skeptical. He believed that the only possible virtue was true knowledge, he would tolerate no belief, no hope that could not pass the ultimate acid test. For himself this meant virtue, but for many of his weaker followers it meant the loss of beliefs and moral habits that would have restrained their impulses. These weaklings became self-excusing, self-indulging scoundrels. Among his young associates were Plato, who afterwards immortalized his method in a series of philosophical dialogues, and founded the philosophical school of the academy, which lasted nine hundred years, Xenophon, of the ten thousand. Who described his death, and Isocrates, one of the wisest of Greek political thinkers. But there were also Critias, who, when Athens was utterly defeated by Sparta, was leader among the thirty tyrants appointed by the Spartans to keep the crushed city under, Carmides, who was killed beside Critias when the thirty were overthrown. And Alcibiades, a brilliant and complex traitor, who did much to lead Athens into the disastrous expedition against Syracuse which destroyed her strength, who betrayed her to the Spartans. And who was at last assassinated while on his way to the Persian court to contrive mischief against Greece. These latter pupils were not the only young men of promise whose vulgar faith and patriotism Socrates destroyed, to leave nothing in its place. His most inveterate enemy was a certain Anatus, whose son, a devoted disciple of Socrates, had become a hopeless drunkard. Through Anatus it was that Socrates was at last prosecuted for corrupting the youth of Athens, and condemned to death by drinking a poisonous draught made from Hemlock, 399 BC. His death is described with great beauty in the dialogue of Plato called by the name of Phaedo. Section 3 The preceding section raised an interesting discussion between Professor Gilbert Murray and the writer upon the character and quality of the common Athenian citizen. Professor Murray thought several phrases used by the writer harsh and unjust. But what he had to say was so interesting and informing, and the writer was so entirely in agreement with his spirit, that it seemed better, instead of modifying what had been written in section 1. To leave that as it stood and to supplement it by quoting Professor Murray. He objected to the parallelism with a twentieth-century crowd. What I want you to do, he wrote, is to take them at the level of the people round them and before them and see how they differ. For example, the first thing that strikes one is that they use all their powers for a different purpose than most peoples, 
for intellectual and artistic things. No more enormous works here to glorify divine kings. No private splendor, no luxury, but a wonderful output of art, poetry, philosophy, and, within limits, science. Compare them with Rome. In the matter of slavery, all nations had slaves, some treated them very cruelly, some with moderate cruelty. The Greeks alone argued whether it was right to have them, and Cranks occasionally proposed emancipation. You get strong testimony, sometimes indignant testimony, that the Athenians were too soft altogether in their treatment of slaves. As soon as you get to Carthaginian or Roman history you get appalling cruelty, the six thousand crucified by Crassus, the gladiatorial games, the habitual leg-breaking of slaves, etc., such things seem never to have occurred in Greece. As soon as you get to Alexander you get, of course, the oriental despotic touch, fantastic vanity in cruelty, and at length the recurrence of human sacrifice. The greatness of Greece comes out only in the art and literature and thought. Not in the political and social history, except in dim flashes. By all means emphasize clearly to start with that the Greeks of, say, the ninth century, were practically savages, and those of even the sixth and in places right on to the fifth and fourth were in many things on the lower culture's level. Clothes like Polynesians, tools very poor, religion, fragments of the Polynesian all about, when you got outside the educated Attic world. But the characteristic is that, on this very low level, you have extraordinary flashes of very high inspiration, as the poetry in art and philosophy witness. Also, an actual achievement in social life, what one calls Hellenism, i.e. Republicanism, simplicity of life, sobriety of thought, almost complete abolition of torture, mutilation, etc., and an amazing emancipation of the individual and of the human intellect. It is impossible to speak, really, of the Greek view of anything. Because all the different views are put forward and represented, polytheism, monotheism, atheism, pro-slavery, anti-slavery, duty to animals, no duty to animals. Democracy, monarchy, aristocracy. The characteristic is that human thought got free. Not absolutely, of course, only to an amazing extent. This emancipation was paid for by all sorts of instability. Awful political instability, because stability in such things is produced exactly by the opposite, by long firm tradition and cohesiveness. It is not fair to say I idealize the Athenian mob, see, for example, my Euripides and his age. But I don't think it was like our music hall mob. It was much more artistic, much more intellectual and yet more primitive, more indecent but less lascivious, more capable of atrocious misconduct, also probably more capable of idealism. But we don't really know much about the crowd. It is only a hostile average sensual man background against which the philosophers and poets stand out. There was no city mob, as in Rome. They were nearly all small farmers or craftsmen. I can't help thinking that their badness was more like the faults of a superior South Sea Islander than like the viler side of the crowd today. Section 4 The most characteristic feature of the opening years of this brilliant century and a half, 475 to 325 BC, of Greek intellectual life was the appearance of the great tragedies. Before the age of Pericles the main literature of the Greek peoples had been their epic poetry, of which we have already said something in our account of the earlier nomadic Aryan life. It was made up of songs of free adventure, aristocratic and valiant in spirit. The main Greek epics were reduced to writing, and the text of the chief ones put in its present order in the time of the tyrant Pisistratus, i.e. immediately before the first Persian wars. Chanted originally to the chiefs and leading men in hall, they were now recited at the public festivals. In addition, there were also poems of more homely character, love songs, war lyrics, and the like. A third stream of poetry also ran into the Greek tradition, perhaps not of Aryan origin at all, but preserving the religious ideas of the dark whites whom the Greeks had conquered. There were religious chants and hymns associated with the secret religious practices of the worship of Demeter, the earth goddess, and of Orpheus and Dionysus. They are mixed up with ideas of self-abasement, self-mutilation, and the like, 
that were altogether foreign to the healthy directness of the hardy barbarians from the north. These ideas were creeping out from their hiding places, and expressing themselves in Greek in Athens during this period in the Orphic religious poetry. It seems probable that in the Athenian population among all the Greek cities the pre-Aryan strain was unusually strong. This dark strain was subtle, artistic, creative, Gnosis witnesses to that, but it had no great courage of the mind. It was afraid of the stars and of life. Whenever that strain is found in any race, there are to be found also thoughts and legends of sacrificial murders. And perhaps also indigenous to the Greek soil, rooted deeply there in the time of the worldwide ancient Heliolithic culture, were religious dances. Such dances we can trace from the Atlantic to Peru. There is a drawing in a Spanish cave at Kogol, near the Ebro, which is supposed to represent a later Paleolithic ritual dance. There is little evidence of the primitive Aryans engaging in religious dances. But running through the rural life of Greece was the tradition of a dressing up and a dancing and chanting associated with the worship of another god, who is killed and lives again as a part of the ceremonies, the god Dionysus. After the coming of the Aryans into Greece, the vocal element became stronger in these proceedings, and thrust into the dance came a recitation. There was first one reciter, then two, and then three, and the rest of the company became the chorus to the declamations of these principal actors. Out of the public performance at festivals and anniversaries of these choir songs or dithyrams with one actor grew the great art of tragedy with three and more. Side by side with tragedy, comedy developed from another and merrier series of dressings up and singing. Here we can but name those who were supreme in these arts who flourished in the days of Pericles, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, the masters of tragedy, and Aristophanes, the writer of comedies. We can say nothing of the splendor and beauty of the former, nor of the fantastic invention and wit of the latter. Aeschylus won his first prize for tragedy in the year that Herodotus was born, 484 BC. Sophocles came some eighteen years later. Euripides was four years old when Aeschylus was beginning his career. The mockery of Aristophanes broke out, 427 BC, only when the days of great tragedy in sculpture and building were drawing to a close. Section 5. The influence of Socrates also began to bear fruit after the days of Pericles and Aspasia. This old questioner, at whose touch faith, speculation, and illusion shriveled together, was the center of a group of young men who lived through and after the years of the Peloponnesian War. Of all these young men, one stands out as the greatest of them all, Plato. He was born 427 BC, the year of the first performance of the work of Aristophanes, and he lived for eighty years. In mental temperament Plato was of an altogether different type from the older man. He was a most artistic and delicate writer, and Socrates could write nothing consecutive. He cared for beautiful things and Socrates despised them. He was supremely concerned with the ordering of public affairs and the scheming of happier human relationships, while Socrates, heedless of heat and cold and the opinion of his fellow creatures, concentrated his mind upon a serene disillusionment. Life, said Socrates, was deception, only the soul lived. Plato had a very great affection for this rugged old teacher, he found his method of the utmost value in disentangling and cleaning up opinions, and he made him the central figure of his immortal dialogues. But his own thoughts and disposition turned him altogether away from the skeptical attitude. In many of the dialogues the voice is the voice of Socrates, but the thought is the thought of Plato. Plato was living in a time of doubt and questioning about all human relationships. In the great days of Pericles, before 450 BC, there seems to have been a complete satisfaction in Athens with social and political institutions. Then there seemed no reason for questioning. Men felt free, the community prospered, one suffered chiefly from jealousy. The history of Herodotus displays little or no dissatisfaction with Athenian political institutions. But Plato, who was born about the time Herodotus died, and who grew up in the atmosphere of a disastrous war and great social distress and confusion, was from the first face to face with human discord and the misfit of human institutions. To that challenge his mind responded. 
One of his earlier works and his latest are bold and penetrating discussions of the possible betterment of social relations. Socrates had taught him to take nothing for granted, not even the common relations of husband and wife or parent and child. His Republic, the first of all utopian books, is a young man's dream of a city in which human life is arranged according to a novel and a better plan. His last unfinished work, The Laws, is a discussion of the regulation of another such utopia. There is much in Plato at which we cannot even glance here, but it is a landmark in this history, it is a new thing in the development of mankind, this appearance of the idea of willfully and completely recasting human conditions. So far mankind has been living by tradition under the fear of the gods. Here is a man who says boldly to our race, and as if it were a quite reasonable and natural thing to say, take hold of your lives. Most of these things that distress you, you can avoid, most of these things that dominate you, you can overthrow. You can do as you will with them. One other thing besides the conflicts of the time perhaps stimulated the mind of Plato in this direction. In the days of Pericles Athens had founded many settlements overseas, and the setting up of these settlements had familiarized men with the idea that a community need not grow, it could also be made. Closely associated with Plato was a younger man, who later also maintained a school in Athens and lived to an even greater age. This was Isocrates. He was what we should call a publicist, a writer rather than an orator, and his peculiar work was to develop the idea of Herodotus, the idea of a unification of Greece against the Persian Empire. As a remedy for the baseness and confusion of her politics and the waste and destruction of her internecine wars. His political horizon was in some respects broader than Plato's, and in his later years he looked towards monarchy, and particularly towards the Macedonian monarchy of Philip. As a more unifying and broadening method of government than city democracy. The same drift to monarchist ideas had occurred in the case of that Xenophon whose anabasis we have already mentioned. In his old age this retired mercenary wrote the Cyropedia, a vindication both theoretically and practically of absolute monarchy as shown in the organization of the Persian Empire. Section 6. Plato taught in the academy. To him in his old age came a certain good-looking youngster from Stagira in Macedonia, Aristotle, who was the son of the Macedonian king's physician, and a man with a very different type of mind from that of the great Athenian. He was naturally skeptical of the imaginative will, and with a great respect for and comprehension of established fact. Later on, after Plato was dead, he set up a school at the Lyceum in Athens and taught, criticizing Plato and Socrates with a certain hardness. When he taught, the shadow of Alexander the Great lay across the freedom of Greece, and he favored slavery and constitutional kings. He had previously been the tutor of Alexander for several years at the court of Philip of Macedon. Intelligent men were losing heart in those days, their faith in the power of men to make their own conditions of life was fading. There were no more utopias. The rush of events was manifestly too powerful for such organized effort as was then practicable between men of fine intelligence. It was possible to think of recasting human society when human society was a little city of a few thousand citizens, but what was happening about them was something cataclysmal. It was the political recasting of the whole known world, of the affairs of what even then must have amounted to something between fifty and a hundred million people. It was recasting upon a scale no human mind was yet equipped to grasp. It drove thought back upon the idea of a vast and implacable fate. It made men snatch at whatever looked stable and unifying. Monarchy, for instance, for all its manifest vices, was a conceivable government for millions. It had, to a certain extent, worked, it imposed a ruling will where it would seem that a collective will was impossible. This change of the general intellectual mood harmonized with Aristotle's natural respect for existing fact. If, on the one hand, it made him approve of monarchy and slavery and the subjection of women as reasonable institutions. On the other hand it made him eager to understand fact and to get some orderly knowledge of these realities of nature and human nature that were now so manifestly triumphant over the creative dreams of the preceding generation. He is terribly sane and luminous, and terribly wanting in self-sacrificial enthusiasm. He questions Plato when Plato would exile poets from his utopia, 
for poetry is a power. He directs his energy along a line diametrically opposed to Socrates' depreciation of Anaxagoras. He anticipates Bacon and the modern scientific movement in his realization of the importance of ordered knowledge. He set himself to the task of gathering together and setting down knowledge. He was the first natural historian. Other men before him had speculated about the nature of things, but he, with every young man he could win over to the task, set himself to classify and compare things. Plato says in effect, let us take hold of life and remodel it. This soberer successor, let us first know more of life and meanwhile serve the king. It was not so much a contradiction as an immense qualification of the master. The peculiar relation of Aristotle to Alexander the Great enabled him to procure means for his work such as were not available again for scientific inquiry for long ages. He could command hundreds of talents, a talent equals about 240 pounds, for his expenses. At one time he had at his disposal a thousand men scattered throughout Asia and Greece, collecting matter for his natural history. They were, of course, very untrained observers, collectors of stories rather than observers. But nothing of the kind had ever been attempted, had even been thought of, so far as we know, before his time. Political as well as natural science began. The students of the Lyceum under his direction made an analysis of 158 political constitutions. This was the first gleam of organized science in the world. The early death of Alexander and the breaking up of his empire almost before it had begun, put an end to endowments on this scale for 2000 years. Only in Egypt at the Alexandria Museum did any scientific research continue, and that only for a few generations. Fifty years after Aristotle's death the Lyceum had already dwindled to insignificance. Section 7 The general drift of thought in the concluding years of the 4th century BC was not with Aristotle, nor towards the laborious and necessary accumulation of ordered knowledge. It is possible that without his endowments from the king he would have made but a small figure in intellectual history. Through them he was able to give his splendid intelligence substance and effect. The ordinary man prefers easy ways so long as they may be followed, and is almost willfully heedless whether they end at last in a cul-de-sac. Finding the stream of events too powerful to control at once. The generality of philosophical teachers drifted in those days from the scheming of model cities and the planning of new ways of living into the elaboration of beautiful and consoling systems of evasion. Perhaps that is putting things coarsely and unjustly. But let Professor Gilbert Murray speak upon this matter. The cynics cared only for virtue and the relation of the soul to God, the world and its learning and its honors were as dross to them. The Stoics and Epicureans, so far apart at first sight, were very similar in their ultimate aim. What they really cared about was ethics, the practical question how a man should order his life. Both, indeed, gave themselves to some science, the Epicureans to physics, the Stoics to logic and rhetoric, but only as a means to an end. The Stoic tried to win men's hearts and convictions by sheer subtlety of abstract argument and dazzling sublimity of thought and expression. The Epicurean was determined to make humanity go its way without cringing to capricious gods and without sacrificing free will. He condensed his gospel into four maxims, God is not to be feared, death cannot be felt, the good can be won. All that we dread can be born and conquered. And meanwhile the stream of events flowed on, with a reciprocal indifference to philosophy. Section 8. If the Greek classics are to be read with any benefit by modern men, they must be read as the work of men like ourselves. Regard must be had to their traditions, their opportunities, and their limitations. There is a disposition to exaggeration in all human admiration. Men will treat the rough notes of Thucydides or Plato for work they never put in order as miracles of style, and the errors of their transcribers as hints of unfathomable mysteries. Most of our classical texts are very much mangled, and all were originally the work of human beings in difficulties, living in a time of such darkness and narrowness of outlook as makes our own age by comparison a period of dazzling illumination. What we shall lose in reverence by this familiar treatment, we shall gain in sympathy for that group of troubled, uncertain, and very modern minds. The Athenian writers were, 
indeed, the first of modern men. They were discussing questions that we still discuss, they began to struggle with the great problems that confront us today. Their writings are our dawn. They began an inquiry, and they arrived at no solutions. We cannot pretend today that we have arrived at solutions to most of the questions they asked. The mind of the Hebrews, as we have already shown, awoke suddenly to the endless miseries and disorders of life, saw that these miseries and disorders were largely due to the lawless acts of men. And concluded that salvation could come only through subduing ourselves to the service of the one God who rules heaven and earth. The Greek, rising to the same perception, was not prepared with the same idea of a patriarchal deity, he lived in a world in which there was not God but the gods. If perhaps he felt that the gods themselves were limited, then he thought of fate behind them, cold and impersonal. So he put his problem in the form of an inquiry as to what was right living, without any definite correlation of the right living man with the will of God. To us, looking at the matter from a standpoint purely historical, the common problem can now be presented in a form that, for the purposes of history, covers both the Hebrew and Greek way of putting it. We have seen our kind rising out of the unconsciousness of animals to a continuing racial self-consciousness, realizing the unhappiness of its wild diversity of aims realizing the inevitable tragedy of individual self-seeking. And feeling its way blindly toward some linking and subordinating idea to save it from the pains and accidents of mere individuality. The gods, the god-king, the idea of the tribe, the idea of the city. Here are ideas that have claimed and held for a time the devotion of men, ideas in which they have a little lost their individual selfishness and escaped to the realization of a more enduring life. Yet, as our wars and disasters prove, none of these greater ideas have yet been great enough. The gods have failed to protect, the tribe has proved itself vile and cruel, the city ostracized one's best and truest friends, the god-king made a beast of himself. As we read over the speculative literature of this great period of the Greeks, we realized three barriers set about the Greek mind, from which it rarely escaped, but from which we now perhaps are beginning to escape. The first of these limitations was the obsession of the Greek mind by the idea of the city as the ultimate state. In a world in which empire had followed empire, each greater than its predecessor, in a world through which men and ideas drove ever more loosely and freely, in a world visibly unifying even then, the Greeks, because of their peculiar physical and political circumstances, were still dreaming impossibly of a compact little city-state, impervious to outer influences, valiantly secure against the whole world. Plato's estimate of the number of citizens in a perfect state varied between 1,000, the Republic, and 5040, the laws, citizens. This state was to go to war and hold its own against other cities of the same size. And this was not a couple of generations after the hosts of Xerxes had crossed the Hellespont. Perhaps these Greeks thought the day of world empires had passed forever, whereas it was only beginning. At the utmost their minds reached out to alliances and leagues. There must have been men at the court of Artaxerxes thinking far away beyond these little ideas of the rocky creek, the island, and the mountain-encircled valley. But the need for unification against the greater powers that moved outside the Greek-speaking world, the Greek mind disregarded willfully. These outsiders were barbarians, not to be needlessly thought about. They were barred out now from Greece forever. One took Persian money, everybody took Persian money, what did it matter? Or one enlisted for a time in their armies, as Xenophon did, and hoped for his luck with a rich prisoner. Athens took sides in Egyptian affairs, and carried on minor wars with Persia, but there was no conception of a common policy or a common future for Greece. Until at last a voice in Athens began to shout, Macedonia. To clamor like a watchdog, Macedonia. This was the voice of the orator and demagogue Demosthenes, hurling warnings and threats and denunciations at King Philip of Macedon, who had learned his politics not only from Plato and Aristotle, but also from Isocrates and Xenophon. And from Babylon and Susa, and who was preparing quietly, ably, and steadfastly to dominate all Greece, and through Greece to conquer the known world. There was a second thing that cramped the Greek mind, the institution of domestic slavery. Slavery was implicit in Greek life, 
men could conceive of neither comfort nor dignity without it. But slavery shuts off one's sympathy not only from a class of one's fellow subjects, it puts the slave owner into a class and organization against all stranger men. One is of an elect tribe. Plato, carried by his clear reason and the noble sanity of his spirit beyond the things of the present, would have abolished slavery, much popular feeling and the new comedy were against it. The Stoics and Epicureans, many of whom were slaves, condemned it as unnatural, but finding it too strong to upset, decided that it did not affect the soul and might be ignored. With the wise there was no bound or free. To the matter-of-fact Aristotle, and probably to most practical men, its abolition was inconceivable. So they declared that there were in the world men naturally slaves. Finally, the thought of the Greeks was hampered by a want of knowledge that is almost inconceivable to us today. They had no knowledge of the past of mankind at all, at best they had a few shrewd guesses. They had no knowledge of geography beyond the range of the Mediterranean basin and the frontiers of Persia. We know far more today of what was going on in Susa, Persepolis, Babylon, and Memphis in the time of Pericles than he did. Their astronomical ideas were still in the state of rudimentary speculations. Anaxagoras, greatly daring, thought the sun and moon were vast globes, so vast that the sun was probably as big as all the Peloponnesus. The 47th proposition of the first book of Euclid was regarded as one of the supreme triumphs of the human mind. Their ideas in physics and chemistry were the results of profound cogitation. It is wonderful that they did guess at atomic structure. One has to remember their extraordinary poverty in the matter of experimental apparatus. They had colored glass for ornament, but no white glass. No accurate means of measuring the minor intervals of time, no really efficient numerical notation, no very accurate scales, no rudiments of telescope or microscope. A modern scientific man dumped down in the Athens of Pericles would have found the utmost difficulty in demonstrating the elements of his knowledge, however crudely, to the men he would have found there. He would have had to rig up the simplest apparatus under every disadvantage, while Socrates pointed out the absurdity of seeking truth with pieces of wood and string and metal such as small boys use for fishing. And our professor of science would also have been in constant danger of a prosecution for impiety. Our world today draws upon relatively immense accumulations of knowledge of fact. In the age of Pericles scarcely the first stone of our comparatively tremendous cairn of things recorded and proved had been put in place. When we reflect upon this difference, then it ceases to be remarkable that the Greeks, with all their aptitude for political speculation, were blind to the insecurities of their civilization from without and from within. To the necessity for effective unification, to the swift rush of events that was to end for long ages these first brief freedoms of the human mind. It is not in the results it achieved, but in the attempts it made that the true value for us of this group of Greek talkers and writers lies. It is not that they answered questions, but that they dared to ask them. Never before had man challenged his world and the way of life to which he found his birth had brought him. Never had he said before that he could alter his conditions. Tradition and a seeming necessity had held him to life as he had found it grown up about his tribe since time immemorial. Hitherto he had taken the world as children still take the homes and habits in which they have been reared. So in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, we perceive, most plainly in Judea and in Athens, but by no means confined to those centers, the beginnings of a moral and an intellectual process in mankind. An appeal to righteousness and an appeal to the truth from the passions and confusions and immediate appearances of existence. It is like the dawn of the sense of responsibility in a youth, who suddenly discovers that life is neither easy nor aimless. Mankind is growing up. The rest of history for three and twenty centuries is threaded with the spreading out and development and interaction and the clearer and more effective statement of these main leading ideas. Slowly more and more men apprehend the reality of human brotherhood, the needlessness of wars and cruelties and oppression, the possibilities of a common purpose for the whole of our kind. In every generation thereafter there is the evidence of men seeking for that better order to which they feel our world must come. 
But everywhere and wherever in any man the great constructive ideas have taken hold, the hot greeds, the jealousies, the suspicions and impatience that are in the nature of every one of us. War against the struggle towards greater and broader purposes. The last twenty-three centuries of history are like the efforts of some impulsive, hasty immortal to think clearly and live rightly. Blunder follows blunder, promising beginnings end in grotesque disappointments. Streams of living water are poisoned by the cup that conveys them to the thirsty lips of mankind. But the hope of men rises again at last after every disaster. We pass on now to the story of one futile commencement, one glorious shattered beginning of human unity. There was in Alexander the great knowledge and imagination, power and opportunity, folly, egotism, detestable vulgarity, and an immense promise broken by the accident of his early death while men were still dazzled by its immensity. Ziv. The Career of Alexander the Great. Section 1. Philip of Macedonia. Section 2. The Murder of King Philip. Section 3. Alexander's First Conquests. Section 4. The Wanderings of Alexander. Section 5. Was Alexander indeed great?